Welcome to the audiobook His Lost Love, written by Swaram, narrated by Owen Samuels. Catherine sat on the couch with a small smile on her face, sipping a cup of coffee and lost in her own thoughts. When she heard Ashton's car entering into their garage, she looked up at the wall clock. It was half past four in the evening and surely wasn't the usual time for Ashton to come home that early. She got up from the couch to invite him in, with a smile on her face, for she had good news to share with Ashton. The moment he entered, she wound her hand around his neck, pulling him closer toward her lips. However, Ashton put his palm between them and pushed her slightly away from him, which made Catherine's eyes pool with tears. She knew things were not okay between them lately, but they always reconciled after every argument. They would easily forget that they ever had an argument, and they would be cuddling in each other's arms the next moment. Moreover, she knew that he would be over the moon after listening to the happy news she was planning to share with him. Catherine was about to open her mouth to say something, but he was quick enough to interrupt her. Kathy, let's get divorced. Catherine stared at him with a bewildering look on her face as if he had grown two horns. Wh what Catherine was beyond shock to even speak. She choked a few times before trying to speak again. Are you out of your mind? What is wrong with you, Ashton? How can you even say so? Catherine started bombarding him with questions. Tears kept rolling down her cheeks. We cannot keep doing this, Kathy. Each time we try to talk, we end up fighting and arguing. Don't you see? Yes, that's because you don't believe what I say. Or should I say that you don't want to believe me? Asked Catherine with a trembling voice. It's her, isn't it? She sobbed. Ashton bent his head looking down in guilt. He felt ashamed of himself. He never thought that he was capable of cheating someone. He hated himself for hurting Catherine, for breaking her heart. He loved her. He had to let her go. He knew she would never forgive him for what he did. I hope you will be happy with her. Saying those words, she left the room. I missed you, Kaylee said, hugging Ashton. He had returned back to school after two weeks of soccer practice in San Diego. He kissed Kaylee's forehead gently. I missed you, baby. Anyone who doesn't know that you two are best friends from the age of three would think that you two are dating. Noah said laughing and giving Ashton a brotherly hug. Wouldn't that be great if you both dated? We all want you two to be together. You both make such a wonderful pair. Judy squealed with a dreamy expression. Ooh, that isn't happening ever, guys. Ashton said, shaking his head, scrunching his nose, feeling disgusted by his friend's idea. Hugging Kaylee again, who was laughing at their friends, he locked his black Bentley behind him. They started walking towards the cafeteria for breakfast when they joined their two other friends, Michael and Laura. All of the six were deeply involved in their conversation when Ashton's eyes fell on the opposite table. What he saw was a girl with blue eyes, baby pink face, and dark brown hair tied into a loose ponytail. She was dressed in a light violet summer dress, with no makeup at all. He felt so attracted to those ocean blue eyes that he thought he could drown in them forever. <clears throat> Michael cleared his throat, nudging slightly at Ashton's arm. She's a beauty, isn't she? Kaylee turned back and asked, Who is she? Never seen her here before. She is the new transfer student. Don't know exactly where she is from, but looks like someone here is smitten by her. Answered Laura, looking at Ashton, who was eyeing that mysterious new girl with a smirk on his face. Don't you think that she doesn't belong to this school? Heard that she's here under a scholarship program. She isn't anything special. Looks like a charity case said Judy with a bitter expression for which she got a glare from Ashton. He never understood how she became friends with Kaylee. Don't say that, Judy. That's very mean, and you know what? She looks really pretty, and I find nothing wrong with her, snapped Kaylee back at Judy. Ashton smiled at his friend, thinking that she was the sweetest person he ever knew. Dude, do you want me to go talk to her for you? Laura asked, for which she got a hard smack on her head from Ashton. Ow, that really hurt, she said, rubbing her head. That was my intention. Ashton had to peel his eyes away from that beautiful girl, who now stood up and walked out of the cafeteria with her friend. He looked at Laura, who had a scowl on her face and was still rubbing her head. Laughing at her, he joined in the conversation that his friends were having. Laura, Kaylee, and Ashton were family friends and knew each other their whole life. Noah and Michael had joined them during middle school and Judy during high school. They all have been best friends from then on. Out of all the six friends, Kaylee and Ashton were very close to each other. They did almost everything together. 
Ashton was very protective of Kaylee. He put her before everyone so that many of his schoolmates thought they were dating. However, both of them were very clear that they were nothing more than best friends. After school, Ashton dropped Laura at her home and headed towards Kaylee's home, where they spent their time studying until dinner. Stay for dinner? You missed dinner for the last two weeks with me, she demanded, pouting her lips. Okay, Ashton said, rubbing his neck. Both of them reached the big dining hall, which had a dark brown oak table and a huge chandelier hanging above it. The walls were painted cream. Kaylee was the only daughter of David and Maria Jones. Likewise, Ashton was the only son to his parents. Both their parents were very busy people, which left Kaylee and Ashton lonely for most of their childhood. That was the reason why they were so close to each other. They had each other to look after, and they did not need anyone else. For both of their surprise, Kaylee's parents were home for dinner that night. Kaylee's mom had made dinner, and they both were waiting for their dear daughter. Seeing Ashton, Kaylee's mom spread her hands to invite him into a tight hug and asked him to join for dinner. All four of them had dinner with mild occasional conversation taking place in between. After dinner, Ashton left kissing her goodnight. Driving back home, all he could think about was the new girl. He wanted to know more about her. Reaching home, he was greeted by his parents, Kate and George. After wishing them both goodnight, he took a quick shower and opened his Mac, for he still had to finish his math assignment. He was almost done with the assignment when his phone chimed. Looking at the screen, he saw a message from Laura. Laura. Hey, buddy. Hope you're not asleep. Ashton. Not really. What's up? Laura. Her name's Catherine Earnshaw. Ashton. Huh? Who? Laura. The new girl you were looking at. You really looked interested. I've never seen you staring at a girl like a lovesick puppy, so I thought of asking her name for you. By the way, she's very nice to talk to. I'm already friends with her. With a huge grin, he turned off his phone and turned to face the ceiling. Catherine, he murmured, before he falling deep into a slumber. It had been a month since Catherine started her classes at Richmond High School, and since day one, she's been friends with Anne and Hudson. They were also here through their scholarship program like her. They had grown closer, had few classes together. She also made few other friends. One of them was Laura. She met her at the library. Apparently, Catherine was searching for a book when Laura helped her find it for her. She was a year senior to them. All the three knew that she belonged to the rich class of people, but somehow she was very sweet and friendly with them. They were comfortable around her. They wondered what made her become their friend. He is doing it again, Hudson whispered to Catherine and Anne, covering his mouth with his hand so that no one would read his lip movement. Who is doing what again? asked Anne, chewing her sandwich. Catherine was enjoying her meal as she felt that the school food was much better than her hostel food. She did not mind her friends and continued eating. That guy is staring openly and stupidly at Catherine again, informed Hudson. Catherine's hands, which were holding the burger, stopped midway listening to that and she turned to look back. To say that she was shocked would be an understatement. A handsome, tall guy with sharp facial features was looking at her. The moment he saw Catherine looking at him, he smirked slightly, giving her a wink. Catherine's heart skipped a beat. She immediately blinked away her eyes and turned away from him. Clearing her throat, Catherine said, I don't think so. Looks like he's looking at someone else. Are you kidding? Don't you see he's clearly gawking at you? Added Anne with an amused face. Whatever, he is rich and that means trouble. Let's just ignore him. Saying that, Catherine started eating her meal again. Nodding at her, both Anne and Hudson started talking about other things. It was the weekend. Catherine and Hudson were walking together towards the gym after their math class when they saw Laura coming in their direction. She was waving at them with a huge grin plastered on her face. Hey, buddies, said Laura, hugging them both. Hey, said both of them in unison. I'm heading to the soccer ground. Want to come with me? I'll introduce you to my group of friends, asked Laura. Hudson was more than happy, as he did not have any friends other than Anne and Catherine, and he was really in need of a male friend, since he felt like he was missing all the guy talks, so he said yes right away, whereas Catherine stood there, hesitating at first, but had to say okay, as Laura did not leave her with a choice. They had to wait for Anne before they all left together to the soccer field. There was a game going on between two teams of boys. Laura dragged them all towards where her friends were sitting. Reaching their usual spot, she introduced them to Judy and Kaylee. Kaylee shook her hands with Hudson and hugged both girls. She had a pretty smile and a warm nature. 
She had long blonde hair with amber-brown big eyes. She was dressed in a pink off-shoulder crop top and a denim jean. Whereas her friend Judy was dressed in a miniskirt and a button-up shirt. She just nodded her head and possessed a dark expression. One could easily say that she did not like them being around her anywhere. You still have to meet three more of our friends, said Laura. They're at the game. After a greeting, they took places on the empty seats and watched the match. Hudson and Kaylee were soon clapping and cheering along with the crowd. Catherine was sitting and watching the match silently munching on her popcorn. She was not much into sports and did not have a damn clue about the game, but still pretended to follow it. She was just waiting for the match to get over with so that she could go to her hostel room and do whatever she wants. She was always an introvert and liked to spend time alone rather than being in company. Much to her happiness, the game ended pretty early. All the students sitting on the bleachers started disappearing. We are all going to Burger Inn. Why don't you all join us? Asked Kaylee, to which Judy clicked her tongue, turning her face with an annoyed expression. She immediately got a glare from both Laura and Kaylee. What? Whined Judy. Ignoring her whines, Anne just said, It's okay. It's already late. We would join you guys some other time. Please join us. It won't take too long. You'll be back to your hostel in an hour. I'll be really happy if you joined us, pleaded Laura with puppy eyes, as to which no one could say no. She was hell-bent on introducing Catherine to Ashton. She had never seen her friend so interested in anyone before, like he was now. Laura, they seem really in a hurry. Why don't you let them go? Asked Judy, acting all sweet. Catherine, Hudson, and Anne really wanted to run away from them. They were not even slightly comfortable around that rich brat, Judy. But they also did not want to break Kaylee and Laura's heart, for they were nothing but nice to them. They looked at each other and finally nodded their head positively. Where is Noah, Ashton, and Mike? Asked Laura, looking around. It will take them some more time to get out of the field. I had texted Ashton. He said he would join us at the inn, replied Kaylee. Getting into Laura's Lamborghini Aventador, they headed off to Burger Inn. Laura parked her car at the parking lot outside the inn, which was packed with teenagers. All the students who were at the game were now in the inn enjoying their time with their friends. Laura and her group of friends had to wait outside to get a table. They were waiting impatiently when they saw a black Bentley coming toward them and being parked at the parking space. There they are, exclaimed Kaylee, waving at them. Catherine felt nervous as she didn't know what kind of people they were. She wished they were not like the rude girl standing next to Kaylee who was nothing but insolent. Three guys got out of the car and started approaching them. The car was parked at a distance, hence they could not see their faces clearly. Kaylee and Laura rushed towards their friends to congratulate them for winning the game. Catherine was looking down and fidgeting with her hair nervously when Anne pulled both Catherine's and Hudson's arm and pointed at something. They followed her gaze and gasped loudly seeing the guy who has been gawking at Catherine for the past two weeks. She felt so furious at Laura for doing this. Is this why Laura was friends with them? Did he ask her to be their friend so he could get to her? She thought, fuming with anger. She had to act calm. Maybe all this was just a coincidence and she was overthinking. She did not want to create a scene over such a silly matter. She made a mental note of asking Laura later. Now, she would concentrate on finishing her dinner as fast as she could and leave this place. She was already feeling suffocated. Do you want to leave? Asked Hudson. Concern filled his eyes. I can manage. It's just a single dinner. Nothing can go wrong, I guess. She assured him, giving him a small smile. We can leave whenever you want. Feel free and let us know if you don't want to stay, said Anne, giving her a side hug. Catherine nodded her head positively. They were acting all calm and normal when the group had come near them. Catherine noticed that Laura's eyes were twinkling with excitement. Hey, guys, meet my new friends, Kathy, Hudson, and Anne. This is Michael, Noah, and this here is our soccer team captain, Ashton, said Laura, all excited. Hudson shook hands with all three of them. He was eyeing Ashton suspiciously. The girls just nodded their head with a small smile, which was not genuine at all. Noah grabbed Anne's hand and kissed her on her knuckles, which made her giggle like a four-year-old. Ashton, as usual, was eyeing Catherine with a small smirk. Now she was really annoyed and wanted to smack away that irritating smirk off his face. You were amazing at the game. You gave a tough time to the opposite team. We saw Justin was about to cry when they lost the match. Kaylee interrupted Ashton's staring much to her relief. Yeah, I made sure to make him cry. He deserved it for he was over confidently nagging us about his victory. 
so we were sure to not let them win, he said smiling. He hugged and kissed her forehead. His eyes did not leave Catherine's. Now Catherine was relieved because she thought they both looked like they were dating. Shall we go in now? Looks like we have some tables available, asked Judy, irritated. I'm famished. All of them walked in. Ashton wound his hand around Kaylee's hip. Are you okay? asked Laura, eyeing Catherine. Yeah, why wouldn't I be? assured Catherine with a quick nod. You look extremely quiet, said Laura. Oh, it is nothing. I'm just tired and hungry. Don't worry, said Catherine and took a seat near Anne. Laura sat next to her and Michael on her left. Ashton and Kaylee were sitting together, talking amongst themselves. Noah and Judy sat next to Kaylee on her left. So, we basically know about you two. You are from the same neighborhood. We just haven't talked to you before, said Michael, pointing at Anne and Hudson. Where are you from, Catherine? Heard you were a transfer student. By now, Ashton suddenly stopped talking to Kaylee and paid all his attention toward Catherine. I'm from Staten Island, did my schooling there, and now I'm here in Manhattan under my scholarship program said Catherine in a very low voice, avoiding any eye contacts, but she could feel two eyes drilling holes through her. Have you moved with your family? asked Judy, suddenly acting all interested. No. She did not like proceeding further with sharing her personal information anymore, but Judy had other plans. Ah, so where do your parents live and what do they do? She was not ready to end the conversation yet. Now, that felt annoying to Catherine. She stopped fidgeting with her fingers and looked into Judy's eyes. That bitch had an evil smile on her face. Catherine acted all cool and said, sighing, Nothing much. My father left us for his mistress when I was around three years old, putting my mom into deep depression who later took her life. So basically, I've lived my entire life alone. I was able to complete my education with the help of funds and donations. Everyone stopped talking for a moment and stared at Catherine like she was an alien. They were all kids from rich families, and no one had a difficult or troublesome childhood like Catherine. They were all well pampered and looked after. Even Hudson and Anne, who were friends with Catherine for a month now, did not have any idea about her childhood. Laura cleared her throat and changed the topic as she could feel the tension in the air. So, what are we ordering? Everyone averted their eyes and started ordering their food. Kaylee started talking with Ashton again, but his mind was constantly thinking about the brave girl sitting in front of him. He liked her even more now. Really felt like she was different from all the girls he had ever seen in his life. She must be beautiful with brains to get an admission in such a great school where only either rich or highly brilliant students can get into. He knew all his friends could get in here because of their parents' money, unlike him and Catherine. It was around 8.30 when everyone was done with dinner. Laura offered to drop Hudson and Judy and Michael since their houses were on her way home. Catherine, you have to go to your hostel, right? It is on the way to Ashton's place, so I guess he will have no problem dropping you? asked Laura, looking at Ashton, whose eyes were twinkling like night stars. Of course not. I can do that for you, spoke Ashton animatedly, hugging Laura slightly. But you told me that you'll be spending some time with me. It's the weekend, you know, whined Kaylee. It is okay. I can walk. It's not that far, assured Catherine nervously. Are you kidding? No way you can walk two miles at night, and that too all alone, said Ashton, looking into Catherine's eyes. Babe, I'll meet you tomorrow morning. We have to finish the bio assignment, remember? Said Ashton, rubbing Kaylee's arm. Will you be okay with the plan? Do you want me to come drop you at your place? Asked Hudson with concern. I'll be okay. Looks like they both are seeing each other, so he won't be hitting on me, whispered Catherine in Hudson's ear with a naughty smile. I don't think so. He's been staring at you the whole time, said Anne quietly, shaking her head in denial. Maybe that guy is a cross eyesight? Uttered Catherine with an amused smile. I'll call you after I reach my dorm. Bye. Saying that, Catherine walked silently behind Ashton, Noah, and Kaylee. Kaylee took the passenger seat, whereas Noah and Catherine sat at the back seats. Ashton drove his car to Noah's place, dropping him first. Aren't we going to drop Catherine first? Asked Kaylee. Nope. I'll have to come again all the way back if I drop her first. I'll drop her after you. That way I can save 20 minutes. Lied Ashton, rubbing his neck. He knew that his best friend would find out that he was lying, but he really wanted to spend at least some time while with Catherine alone. Kaylee eyed him weirdly, to which he just shrugged. He got down, reaching Kaylee's place, and kissed her goodnight. Kaylee said her goodbyes to Ashen and Catherine before running towards her front door. You can come to the passenger seat, said Ashton, walking around the driver's seat. I'm okay. It's just for a while, said Catherine, hesitating. Come on. I won't eat you, and moreover, I do not intend on being your driver. 
Ashton said, looking back at Catherine. She sighed and got out of the car and silently into the passenger seat as he steered the car back on the road. Ashton focused on the road, glancing at Catherine from time to time, who was looking highly strung. There was this silence between them which suffocated Catherine. She wanted to ask him the reason why he was looking at her for the last two weeks, but somehow she couldn't. What if she was just imagining things? He looked like he was in a relationship with that girl, Kaylee. Are you nervous about something? Asked Ashton, breaking the silence between them. He gently touched her hands. She immediately pulled her hands away, glaring at him. He is way too much, she thought. This is the right time to question him. He cannot continue staring at her. Why do you always stare at me so openly? Questioned Catherine with an irritated look on her face. Ah, so that's what it's all about. What if I tell you that you're very beautiful to look at and I like staring at your pretty face? She cringed her nose. What? Are you serious? Aren't you and Kaylee dating or something? And are you jealous? Asked Ashton, lifting his brow. Of course not, confirmed Kathy. So, here it is. Stop staring at me. Really makes me uncomfortable. I do not intend on stopping. Sorry, said Ashton, stopping the car in front of the hotel gate, placing his elbow on the steering and cupping his chin. You are unbelievable, muttered Catherine, getting out of the car. Thanks for the ride. He really liked her feisty persona. Ashton had seen girls throwing themselves at him all the time, but she was way different from all those girls. He started the engine and the car roared back to life. Reaching home, he checked his phone, which had two calls from Kaylee and a text message from Laura. He decided to call Kaylee the next morning, texting Laura back. Laura, hope you drop my friend safe at her place, XX. Ashton, yep, XX. Laura, did you guys talk? How was she? Ashton, well, played all along, bringing her for dinner and asking me to drop her at her place. Suddenly his phone started ringing. It was, of course, Laura. What are you talking about? I did not do anything like that, mused Laura over the phone. Laura, babe, that looks so obvious, even a child could tell, laughed Ashton on the other side. Whatever, but did you talk to her? You like her, right? Isn't she cute? Yes, that she is, admitted Ashton. Judy was being a bitch to her, said Laura in a low voice. That's nothing new about that girl, murmured Ashton. So, no thank yous for helping you, asked Laura. Ashton knew probably she would be pouting her lips. For what? I was anyway going to ask her out before you, said Ashton playfully. But you didn't. Okay, fine, fine. Thank you, a lot. So are you going to ask her out anytime soon? Yeah, probably next weekend. Can I ask you a favor? Asked Ashton doubtfully. What is it? Can I have her number, please? What do I get in return? Asked Laura. You tell me. Helping me with my math homework? Asked Laura. Consider it done, he said firmly. Okay, I'll text you her number. Thanks a lot. Okay, good luck with that. Thank you. See you on Monday. Good night. With that, they both hung up their phone. Catherine was woken up by the sun's rays peeking through the window curtains, kissing her cheeks softly. She rubbed her eyes, groaning, and turned her head to look at the bedside clock. It was 8 a.m., and she did not have much to do as it was a Saturday. Though she had to go to mugs and coffees around 5 in the evening, where she had to work part-time. She was free until then. Covering her head with a blanket, he dozed back to sleep with a smile on her face. It was after an hour that she stirred up to the constantly tinkering sound of her phone. She stretched her hands towards the side table to pick up the phone and glanced at it with half-opened eyes. Her eyes took a few seconds to adjust to the harsh light coming through the screen. Rubbing the sleep off her eyes, she sat leaning on the headboard. She saw some text messages from an unknown number. Unknown. Hey, beautiful, XX. Unknown. Good morning. Unknown. Are you still asleep? Gosh, who is it early in the morning butting in on my beauty sleep? Muttered Catherine peevishly to herself when she again received a text message. Unknown. Wake up, sleepyhead. It is nine in the morning, XX. Vexed at the constant chiming of her phone, she started texting back. Catherine. Who is this? Do I know you? Unknown. Think of me as your secret admirer. Now, want to go out, grab some breakfast? XX. Catherine was exasperated. She knew exactly who was messing with her early that morning. Where did he even get my number from, she thought. Catherine. Why do you think I'll go out to grab anything with you? 
And what's with the hugs and kisses? How did you get my number? It was Laura who gave it to you, isn't it? Unknown. I didn't know you would recognize me this soon. Unknown. Save my number for now, but remember, I'll definitely take you out someday. XX. Catherine rolled her eyes. The nerve of this guy. She really hated Laura for this. She threw her phone beside her on the bed and covered her head with the pillow to go back to sleep. Ashton got up around 5.30 in the morning. He was always an early bird right from childhood. He was well organized and spent his time wisely unlike other guys of his age. His parents were very proud of their son. He was an all-rounder. He was a chess champion in the under-15 category, school football team captain and a straight-A grade student. In addition to that, he was the only heir to the Schwimmer group of companies which mainly dealt with production and supply of computers and mobile hardware around the globe. He wished to pursue a bachelor's in business studies from University of Southern California. He always loved the weather at California, and he also wanted to spend some time away from his parents' constant attention. Wearing his gray roadster hoodie and Adidas sports shoes, he left his home running in a gentle, steady pace. He would always start his day with an hour of jogging, followed by working at a gym for half an hour. By seven, he would be at home for a quick shower and then breakfast with his parents, where they would be talking about their business-related stuff. His father would always feel that his son had to be kept in the loop about the family business, for he has to take up the responsibility at any time soon. Ashton loved the business talks with his father. He also usually goes with him to attend certain meetings, which his father felt important for Ashton to know about. Entering into his room, he remembered he had to call Kaylee. Picking up his mobile, he dialed her number. After a few minutes of ringing, the call disconnected. Thinking she was still asleep, he went through his messages. He had received a text from Laura late last night, which he hadn't seen. Opening it, his lips curved into a cute grin. As it said, she had sent Catherine's number along with a reminder about the math assignment that he had to help her with. Replying to her text message with a good morning and a thank you, he saved Catherine's mobile number to his phone. He was feeling excited to message Catherine, but waited as it was still early, and he did not want to look like an annoying person. To pass away the time, he took out his Mac and started working on his literature assignment. He worked on his assignment for an hour when he felt exhausted. He couldn't concentrate on his work, and his mind was continuously thinking about texting Catherine. He felt like he could no longer wait to text her, and that's when he took out his phone and started texting her. Ashton. Hey, beautiful. XX. Ashton. Good morning. After waiting for more than 20 minutes when he did not receive a text back from Catherine, he was starting to feel extremely anxious. He had never felt so restless because of a girl before in his life. Was she doing it on purpose? No, no. She must probably be sleeping still. He consoled his chaotic mind and decided to send her a text message once again. Ashton, are you still asleep? Ashton, wake up, sleepyhead. It is nine in the morning. XX. Thinking that she wouldn't be replying anytime soon, Ashton decided to visit Kaylee as he had promised her to spend the day at her place. He wore a black t-shirt along with his jeans and denim jacket. It was 10 a.m. by the time he reached Kaylee's house. He was asked to wait in the living room as Kaylee was taking a shower. After 10 minutes, Kaylee came down to the living room and eyed Ashton with a mild reproach for leaving her and not spending the time with her as promised. Hey doll, good morning, greeted Ashton hesitantly. He knew she was angry at him for leaving her yesterday. Hey, she smiled and the smile did not reach her eyes. Let's go to my room. Entering the room, Ashton scratched the back of his head and continued speaking. Babe, are you upset about something? Nope. Are you sure you're okay? Because I think you're angry at me for leaving you early yesterday night, said Ashton. Kaylee stared at him for a few minutes. She did not want to look like a nagging friend to him, so she decided to say, Yes, I felt bad at first, but then I understood. You like that girl, don't you? Yeah, sorry about that. That's okay. Next time, just let me know if you're going to cancel on me, spoke Kaylee, assuring him. Don't worry, I won't be canceling on you. With a small smile, she hugged Ashton. They decided to start with their biology assignment. I cannot draw this diagram. It looks so complicated, complained Kaylee. Come on, it is not as difficult as it looks. Let me help you, Ashton said, pulling the notebook from her lap and helping her. I'll get us both some snacks. Kaylee walked out of the room, leaving Ashton alone. He was almost done with the diagram when his phone vibrated. His heart felt stuck at his throat when he saw the sender's name appearing on the screen. 
Catherine, who is this? Do I know you? Grinning like a fool, he started typing on his mobile. Ashton, think of me as your secret admirer. Now, want to go out, grab some breakfast? XX. Catherine, why do you think I'll go out to grab anything with you? And what's with the hugs and kisses? How did you get my number? It was Laura who gave it to you, isn't it? Love her feistiness, thought Ashton. He was also happy that she recognized him instantly. He thought she had lots of secret admirers like him and she wouldn't recognize him that soon. His heart did a mini dance to that. Ashton, I didn't know you would recognize me this soon. Ashton, save my number for now, but remember I'll definitely take you out someday. XX. What's with the stupid grin on your face? Asked Kaylee, entering the room with an amused smile on her face. I was texting Catherine. He replied with a lopsided smile. What? Are you serious? How did you get her number? Asked Kaylee, looking shocked. I got it from Laura. Why, is something wrong? Nope. I just never thought you would ever approach a girl on your own, she said in a teasing tone. You really like her, don't you? Ashton just nodded his head, agreeing with his friend. Are you going to ask her out? Asked Kaylee. I already did. And? She kind of refused, muttered Ashton, pressing his lips into a thin line. She must be crazy to do that. Does she even know that many girls are dying to talk to you? Asked Kaylee, shaking her head. That's what I love about her, Kaylee. She is not like the other girls I have seen. Said Ashton proudly, to which she smiled at him happily. But don't worry. I will make her like me back. If you say so, said Kaylee. He messed with her hair, and they continued with their assignments. Catherine hated Monday mornings. She hated getting herself out of her room, and go anywhere, for that matter. Anne had texted her saying that she would meet her in the cafeteria at 8 sharp. Catherine reached the school canteen, ordering a chicken sandwich and potato wedges, along with fresh orange juice. Laura, who was sitting with her friends, waved at her. Noah and Judy were sitting next to her. Catherine waved back at her with her lips pressed into a thin line. She was still pissed at her for sharing her number with Ashton without asking her in the first place. She noticed that Noah waved at her too, whereas that little bitch, Judy, rolled her eyes, turning her face away from Catherine. Kathy was least bothered by her childish behavior and kept on eating. She had been waiting more than ten minutes now, but there was no sign of Anne. She was about to leave the place when her mobile vibrated, indicating a message. She opened it and rolled her eyes, seeing the sender's name. Ashton! Hey! Smile! You are too beautiful to frown. Is there something I could do to remove that frown from your face? XX. She scanned the place for Ashton. Her eyes fell on the handsome fellow entering into the cafeteria. He threw his backpack on the table where his friends were sitting and took a chair nearby. As always, Kaylee sat next to him. Now that really irritated Catherine not because Kaylee was with him, but because he was flirting with her when he had a girlfriend of his own. He had placed both his hands under the table and was happily chatting with his friends. There was no sign of him messaging her. For a minute, Catherine doubted if the unknown sender was really Ashton. She was unknowingly staring at him when her mobile vibrated again. Ashton, baby, are you staring at me? Not that I've got a problem with that. With an annoyed expression, Catherine lifted her gaze from her mobile with a raised brow looking at Ashton. He was still talking to his friends. The moment she was about to move her eyes away, Ashton's gray orbs pierced through her blue ones. He placed his hands on the table holding the mobile and started typing something on it, smiling without looking at it. He continued talking to his friends and also looked at Catherine's beautiful face. Pressing the send button, he smirked and winked at Catherine. At that very instance, she was damn sure that he was the one texting her. Confirming it, she received a text message. She unlocked her phone with her thumb, still looking at him. Ashton, I'm sending this text just to clear your doubt. See you later, XX. He must be a real multitasker and a mind reader. Shaking her head, she thought to herself and walked out of the cafeteria. Where were you? What took you so long? I was waiting for you like forever, complained Catherine walking to her next class with Anne. It was after three classes that Anne had reached school looking tired and sweaty. My car broke down, so had to leave it there and walk all the way to school. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry, said Catherine looking at her friend worriedly. That's okay. I had asked my dad to take it to a nearby workshop, so I had to wait till he arrived at the spot. I suppose I will have to walk back home today, said Anne, holding Catherine at the crook of her arms. What time is it, and what class do we have now? It is eleven, and we should be heading to our art class, Catherine informed Anne, pulling her towards their class, when they heard Laura calling them from the end of the hallway. Hey, girls, heading to your next class, squealed Laura. Anne nodded her head slightly, whereas Catherine just kept staring at her. 
She really wanted to confront her for giving Ashton her number without her knowledge, but did not know where to start. Is something wrong, Catherine? asked Laura, cutting the thickness surrounding them. She could sense that something was wrong and probably knew the reason as well. Anne was about to shake her head in denial when Catherine snapped at Laura. Yes, there is something I want to ask you. Anne had no idea what she was talking about, and both the girls kept waiting for Catherine to continue. Did you by chance give my contact number to your friend, Laura? Laura just opened her mouth to say something, but instead stopped midway and just stared at her foot. That gives the answer to my question, muttered Catherine, and started walking away from them. Wait, Catherine, please listen. What I did was wrong, okay? I'm sorry. But believe me, I've known Ashton for my entire life, and he's such a great guy. I'm sure he will never misuse or do any harm to you. I think he really, really likes you. You should give him a chance, and I'm sure you will like him. She tried justifying herself, guilt written all over her face. And you deduced that all by yourself? Didn't you want to ask me before giving him my number? Is that why you're being friends with me, Laura? Catherine just stared at Laura for a few seconds and then just turned her face away angrily. Anne just stood there staring silently at the two girls with little idea of what must have happened for Catherine to become so angry. Of course not, denied Laura, clearly hurt from Catherine's accusations, but she knew that Catherine was straightforward and was ready to face the consequences for sharing her number with her friend. See, I know you are angry right now, and I'm terribly sorry for breaking your trust, but please give it a thought. And also, I'm not your friend just for Ashton. I really like being in your company, Catherine. I will continue to be your friend even if you decide to ignore Ashton. Believe me. She said gently, pulling Catherine's palms. He is a great guy you will ever come across in your life, Catherine. Catherine sighed. You don't understand, Laura. You do not know anything about me. You cannot decide on things like this for me. I'm not comfortable around rich people, and dating one would be the last thing I would ever do. Catherine mumbled the last few words more to herself. Okay, I will not force you into this, but let me tell you something. I do not know why you feel such hatred towards rich people, but Catherine, there are also some of them who are good and humble to everyone around them. Ashton being the first on that list, he is not like any rich guys you've ever met. So please give it a thought for me, all right? I'm sorry again and do not be angry for me for too long, please, pleaded Laura with puppy eyes, to which Catherine just nodded her head. I'll see you both later then, said Laura before disappearing into a nearby classroom. Phew, she is really something. Anne released her breath that she did not know she was holding. When did you know that she gave him your number? Inquired Anne. Since he started texting me two days back, said Catherine in a low voice. Two days back? And you did not speak a word about it to me yesterday when we met at the cafe? Whined Anne. I did not want to make a big deal of it, confessed Catherine. What did he say? Catherine just took out her phone and handed it to Anne, unlocking the screen. He asked you out and you said no? Girl, you gotta be kidding me, she exclaimed. You know me, Anne. I haven't dated anyone before, and I wish to be like that for some more time. But there should be a start to everything, Kathy. I think you should give it a try. He seems really interested in you. Any other girl in your situation would be on cloud nine right now, she said politely, trying to make Catherine understand. Catherine, who had a very thick skull, denied to agree with her friend. She was more than paranoid to date rich boys right from a very young age. She never wanted a fate similar to her mum's. Moreover, she felt that dating would divert her from her studies and was not worth her valuable time. She just nodded. I'll think about it. Let's go now. We're already late by ten minutes. It was Wednesday, and Catherine was working late that night at the cafe. It was almost closing time, but customers kept pouring in. Catherine was just waiting for the customers to leave so that she could finish her work and go back to her hostel. Mr. Randall, the cafe owner, was a middle-aged man. He was kind but strict when it came to work. Catherine, along with David, her co-worker, had to wait for the customers to leave, then clean the tables and rearrange them, tables and chairs, for the next day before leaving. Catherine, it's getting late. I have a test tomorrow. I should be leaving now. Can you please take care? They are the last ones, I guess, requested David. Sure, I'll take care. You carry on. Thanks a lot. Take care. Good night, said David, packing his bag. Catherine mumbled a good night and started cleaning the tables. She was stocking up the meat in the freezer section when a group of boys entered the cafe. Catherine, dear, there are a few more customers. Please get their order. I have to close the accounts for today, said Randall with an apologetic look. Muttering few curses, Catherine went to the customers, taking out her notepad to get their orders. Who would want to have coffee at this time, she thought, feeling annoyed. 
Welcome. Can I get your order? Catherine stopped speaking when her eyes fell on Ashton, Noah, and Michael. Michael whistled, looking at Catherine and Ashton's shocked faces. They were both staring at each other. It was clear Ashton did not have a clue that she was working there. What are you doing here? Asked Ashton with concern-filled eyes. Working, replied Catherine in a dull tone. I can see that, but why are you here so late? Isn't it like closing time? It's because of people like you want to have coffee at 11 in the night that I have to work so late. She wanted to say, but she kept quiet. She knew her boss would not tolerate such behavior, so instead she just stared at Ashton for a minute. What would you like to order? She asked politely. Noah opened his mouth, but was interrupted by Ashton. Anything which you feel is easier to make and which doesn't take too long. Catherine turned around and started walking towards the food preparation counter. Mike and Noah threw a questioning glare at Ashton. What? retorted Ashton. I just don't want to be sitting here like forever, and she looks clearly exhausted, he said, looking back at her from his seat. She made coffee and chicken mayo sandwiches, spending very little time to prepare just as he wanted. She walked back and put their orders on the table and waited for them to leave so that she could get to her hostel soon. All of the three boys ate with simple conversation taking place in between. She saw that Ashton was in a hurry to finish his coffee and was often looking at her. After paying the bill, Ashton started talking to her boss. He pointed toward Ashton, and Mr. Randall just shook his head. She just kept staring at them, not knowing what they were talking about, but it was clear that they were talking about her. She was feeling a bit self-conscious. Kathy, darling, please come here, called Randall. Now she thought that she was in some sort of trouble. Did I upset my customers by any chance? She kept thinking about something that she must have done unknowingly. But why would I be worried when I clearly did nothing wrong? She thought as she made her way to the cash counter where they were all standing. Catherine, this gentleman here says that he knows you and he offers to drop you at your hostel. Is it okay for you? Do you know him, dear? Asked Randall in a soft tone. Yeah, we study in the same school, said Catherine. But it is okay, I still have to clean the tables. Oh, you do not have to worry about that, honey. It is already late and it is not safe for you to walk alone all the way to your hostel. Catherine, you'll be safe with Ashton. He will drop you at your place, assured Noah. Okay, I'll get my bag and be there in a minute, murmured Kathy. As much as she hated the idea of riding along with Ashton, she knew that it wasn't safe for her to walk alone so late at night, so she agreed to go with him without arguing any more. Hey, no funny business, okay? Make sure to drop her safely. Noah and Michael were smirking while wishing him good night. Ashton smacked at the back of Noah's head for mocking him. As they left, Ashton waited for five more minutes near his car for Catherine to come out. Where is Noah and Michael? asked Catherine. Are they not coming with us? Nope, they have their own cars. I'm not their driver, said Ashton, opening the passenger door for Catherine. Thanks, she said in a low voice. Running around to the driver's seat, he buckled up the seatbelt and started driving his car. Do you work here every day? asked Ashton. Yeah, replied Catherine curtly. And do you always leave this late every day? Not always. Ashton just looked at her and turned his attention back on the road. She was unbelievable, he thought. There was a complete silence all along the way. Every now and then, Ashton kept looking at her. The silence was suffocating her, and so she wanted to end it. What were you doing out so late? Asked Catherine to Ashton's surprise. We were group studying at my place for tomorrow's test when Noah wanted to have some fresh air and coffee, said Ashton with a small smile tugging at his lips. He never thought she would initiate a conversation with him. Nodding her head, she turned her head towards the window and stared out of the window. There was silence again. Catherine turned on the radio. The city looked quiet and peaceful. Reaching the hostel gate, Catherine turned to Ashton with a small smile. She did not want to be rude at him. Thanks for the ride, she said. It's my pleasure, Ashton said with a smirk. Good night, drive safe. Good night, he said with a lopsided smile. She quickly turned around and started walking into the gate without looking back. His smiles were doing unexplainable things to her, and she hated it. Climbing the stairs to her floor, she saw Ashton still waiting for her to enter her room. Catherine's heart skipped a beat. Deep inside her heart, she knew that he was the most handsome guy she has ever met. Now she was also realizing that he was a responsible and caring person. But she was aware that liking him would break her heart. She was too scared of getting hurt, so she had to build a wall around her heart. She knew that Ashton did not have any bad intention for her, but what concerned her even more was, why would someone like Ashton be worried about her? He was nothing to him, but still he cared for her safety. As for Ashton, Catherine was the most beautiful and headstrong girl he had ever come across. 
He knew that it was not very easy to make her like him back like he did, but he was also not the one to give up easily. He was truly worried about her safety. He did not know how to stop her from working late at the cafe. He wanted to drop her at her place every night after her shift, which obviously she would never agree to. So instead, he decided to do the one thing that he felt was right. For the next few weeks, Ashton would always wait for her outside the cafe till she finished her shift, and he would drive behind her slowly till she reached her hostel safely. Initially, she was not aware of the car that followed her, but one night, she noticed that a great car, which looked really expensive, was following her slowly. Fear crept through her spine. When Ashton noticed Catherine walking fast, scared like a kitten, he slowed down the car. Reaching her hostel gates, she saw the gray car parked under a tree with its headlights on. Was someone following me? Why would someone follow me, and what was the motive behind it, was all she could think. This routine continued for a few weeks, and she was damn scared that she even considered talking to someone about it. Anne had invited Catherine for lunch on a Sunday morning, and suggested spending the afternoon watching chick flicks with random girly talks. Catherine initially refused the idea, but later accepted since she wanted to talk to her friend about her stalker. She woke up at nine o'clock in the morning, took a quick shower, and changed into a yellow polka-dotted dress, which reached her mid-thigh. She tied her hair into a loose ponytail, letting her ringlets hang near her ears. She looked pretty even, though. Her face lacked basic makeup. She texted Anne, telling her that she would reach her house in 20 minutes and started walking towards her destination. Reaching her friend's house, she was greeted by Anne's brother Ryder and her parents, Mr. and Mrs. Watson. Mr. Watson was a dentist, and Mrs. Watson was a primary school teacher. They had heard a lot about Catherine from their daughter, and hence they were really anxious to see her. The Watsons received Catherine with warm and cheerful smiles. Mrs. Watson pulled her into a tight hug and invited her inside. Have a seat, dear, said Mr. Watson, while Mrs. Watson called Anne down to the living room. Anne came down the stairs, running towards Catherine, and hugged her affectionately. Come, let's go to my room, spoke Anne, dragging Catherine to her room. Mom, we'll be in my room. Call us when lunch is ready. Anne's house was not huge, but perfect for a small family of four. Her room walls were painted in purple, which had a small bed in the middle and a study table to the side. One of the walls had a wooden window, and the curtains were pushed to the sides, letting the sunlight illuminate the room brightly. Your room is really nice, said Catherine, looking around. Thanks, girl. Catherine's eyes fell on the pictures hanging on the wall. It had pictures of Anne and her family members framed and arranged neatly. Catherine looked at them with longing eyes. She had always wanted a perfect family like that, but that would always remain a dream that would never happen in reality. She had always wanted to be part of a loving family. She never remembered her father's face since he left them while she was still very young. The only family she had was her mother who didn't show any affection towards Catherine. Looking at her friend's sad expression, Anne tried to cheer her up. Do you think we should have called Hudson? He will be throwing a fit if he knew we spent the day without him. Hell no, he's definitely not a big fan of rom-coms. He will be happy that we let him be, said Catherine, laughing. How about we nag him a bit, amused Anne, giggling. Leave the poor guy alone, Anne. Come on, what's the fun in that? Anne took out her mobile to call Hudson, turning on the loudspeaker. Hello, came Hudson's voice groggily. Hey, Dumbo, are you still sleeping? Chided Anne. Not anymore. Why have you called me so early in the morning? Asked Hudson peevishly. Early? Are you kidding me? It's 11, idiot. So it's Sunday. So it is still early for me. Anyway, guess who was with me? Questioned Anne playfully. Huh? Brad Pitt? Mocked Hudson, making the two girls giggle. Is that Catherine? What are you girls doing without me? Enjoying the day without you, spoke Anne. Hey, Hudson, greeted Catherine. Did you two not think of calling me? Said Hudson. They knew he would be pouting by now. You are welcome, but on one condition, added Anne. And what's that? You need to watch chick flicks with us. You can join us if that's okay with you. Thanks, but no thanks. I will happily spend my Sunday afternoon sleeping rather than watching some boring chick flicks, snorted Hudson. See, this is why we didn't invite you, coaxed Anne. Hey, Hudson, will you be able to join us in the evening if you're free? We can all spend some time together, then have dinner together at Burger Inn, suggested Catherine, glaring at Anne feeling bad for leaving him out. That sounds better. I'll join you two at five near the town park, said Hudson. Okay, squealed the girls in unity, ending the call. Throwing the mobile aside, Anne slouched on the bed. 
Both the girls talked about random things for a while before Catherine felt like telling Anne about the recent events happening in her life. Anne? Uh, I wanted to tell you something, started Catherine slowly. Anne paid her whole attention towards her friend. Tell me what? Do not panic but what I'm going to say, okay? You're scaring me, Caddy. Don't tell me you're a cold-blooded murderer, joked Anne. She smiled slightly before starting shaking her head. Uh, I feel like... I'm being followed by someone, said Catherine carefully. Anne's eyes widened. Her throat became suddenly dried and she felt speechless at the moment. Blinked a few times, not knowing what to say. Anne, are you listening to me? How, how, how do you know for sure, stuttered Anne, because I've been seeing the same gray car follow me from the cafe to the hostel for more than a month now, finished Catherine with a slight fear visible in her eyes. For more than a month? Why did you not tell me earlier, Kathy? exclaimed Anne. Shh, shh, Catherine jumped onto her and covered Anne's mouth, trying to muffle her voice. Initially, I thought I was imagining things, but then after some time, I confirmed it. Who do you think is following you? I have no idea, Anne. Girl, do you really think you should go to the cafe to work anymore? Is it even safe for you? Questioned Anne. I have no other choice left. You know, I'm saving money for college, murmured Catherine. Did you try to see the driver's face at least? Inquired Anne. No. Then should we talk to someone like my parents or Hudson? No, no, Anne. Promise me you, you will not tell anyone. Maybe it, it's all just in my head. Anne sighed and nodded her head. Okay, I won't tell anyone, but you have to promise me that you will call me every night after you reach your room safely. I can do that, assured Catherine, smiling at her friend. After lunch, the two friends watched Princess Diaries. At four in the evening, they left the house to the town park to meet their other friend. They reached the park ten minutes early and bought some snacks. Hudson got there on time. Hey, besties, how was your day? Cooed Hudson. Great, though we missed you, said Catherine. Ah, how sweet of you two to miss me, he joked while taking a seat next to them. All three friends spent the evening together laughing and talking. Come, let's have some ice cream before I leave for my work, called Catherine, pulling her friends up from the bench. They reached the inn and had an early dinner before Hudson dropped Catherine at the cafe. Anne took out something from her bag and placed it into Catherine's hand, saying, Be safe. Call me once you reach home. Hudson looked at them in confusion, then shrugged away before he drove the car to drop Anne. Catherine opened her palms to see a small pepper spray can. She smiled at her friend's loving gesture. She thought she was lucky to have friends like Hudson and Anne. After a shift at the cafe, Catherine helped Mr. Randall with closing the cafe and started walking towards her hostel. She spotted the great car at the end of the road. Fearing for her dear life, she got hold of the pepper spray can from her bag and started walking as fast as she could. She tried to look back and have a look at the person driving the car, but failed miserably since the glass was tainted pinch black. She increased her pace and reached the hostile gate with a record-breaking speed. As soon as she reached the gate, she released her breath, which she was holding for a very long time now, and decided to call Anne. Anne on the other end was relieved hearing her friend's voice. Changing into her nightwear, Catherine jumped onto her bed and drifted off to sleep. All the students at the school were feeling exhilarated about the upcoming carnival at their town. Anne had told Catherine that the carnival was a prime celebration in the town. Every resident, rich or poor, living there came together to celebrate it once a year. It was grand every year. She was really excited to take Catherine to witness the carnival. The students from various schools were asked to help in setting up entertainment and food stalls. Maybe you'll be able to meet your Prince Charming there, Anne nudged on Catherine's arm with a toothy smile. I don't need a Prince Charming, Anne, replied Catherine with a boring countenance. I know, because you already have one. Excuse me. There, don't look immediately, three o'clock. Anne pointed her eyes to Ashton, who strode across the hall towards Catherine. Ashton was looking dashing in his light blue shirt and dark colored pants. His shirt sleeves were rolled near his elbow. His hair was disheveled and falling on his forehead. He stopped right in front of Catherine, towering over her petite form. Every student walking by the hall stood on their track to watch the scene which was taking place. Catherine stood there dumbstruck, not knowing how to react. What? What are you doing here? She stammered. He looked at her shocked face for a few seconds and felt that she was the most pretty creature in the whole world. She had amazing big blue eyes, which were wide open, and her baby pink lips were slightly ajar as if she had difficulty breathing through her nose. Her chest heaved up and down. He wanted the moment to freeze right there and get lost in her beauty. 
Will you accompany me to the carnival, Catherine? Asked Ashton nonchalantly, moving more closely to her, so that she could almost feel his breath on her forehead. Her nostrils were filled with his musky scent, which were making the butterflies in her stomach flutter violently. Her breath became uneven and her legs were becoming weak that they could no longer balance her weight. For a moment she thought of giving in and agreeing to him, but the sane part of her mind stopped her from doing so. Mustering up all the strength left in her body, she brought both her hands in between them and pushed him away with all the force that she had. She started walking away from him, turning on her heels when he pulled at her arms. Can you at least have the courtesy of answering my question? Ashton gritted his teeth. What answers do you want? I already gave you my damn answer. I do not want to go out with you. She emphasized the last sentence and started walking. Ashton looked around only to see so many people looking at the scene with shock written all over their faces. Who in their right mind would reject Ashton Schwimmer, the town's most attractive guy? But Ashton knew that Catherine would reject him. That is why she was different from the other girls, but he would do anything to make her accept him one day. He took it as a challenge to make her fall for him, and he was not the type to back away from it. He just shook his head and walked toward his friends, who were equally shocked like the others. Ashton, are you out of your effing mind? cried out Judy. What does she even think about herself to insult you like that in front of so many people? He looked at her friends. Except for Laura, who was having a sympathetic look on her face, all his other friends were fuming with anger. Callie was seething in anger at him for asking that conceited girl out yet again, but she chose to remain silent. She is so dull and haughty. What do you like so much about that bitch? added Judy. Ashton was enraged hearing those words coming from her mouth. If you speak another word ill about her, then that will be the end of our friendship. He held her shoulders and pushed her away. No one dared to speak another word after that. Callie walked away angrily, clearly showing her disapproval. It's okay, Ashton. Give her some time. She just got some trust issues, but I know she will agree to you soon. Just don't give up hope, all right? Laura comforted her friend, rubbing his back. Ashton smiled at her. I know, and no way I'm giving up on her. Thanks for your support, Laura. I'll see you later. I have a class in another ten minutes. Patting her shoulder, Ashton walked to his class. Are you crazy, Laura? Why are you giving him fake hopes? That girl is clearly not interested, rebuked Michael. Who knows? Maybe she is already seeing someone, added Noah. I think Ashton should be dating Callie. You were unnecessarily bringing that new girl in between them. Laura's eyes welled up with unshed tears from the accusations. She quietly started walking away without answering her friends. She sauntered behind Judy and Callie, stopping behind the door. Ashton is so out of his mind. Why is he going all crazy about that lass? She heard Judy speaking to Callie. She did not hear any response from Callie in return. For a minute, she thought if she was really driving a wedge between Callie and Ashton by bringing Catherine into the picture. I think you should be the one to date him. You two make the best couple together. What if he is scared of asking you out, thinking you would be upset with him? You should ask him out if he doesn't ask you first. Judy, I'm not waiting for him to ask me out. Neither is he. We are best friends and we're not going to date, she chided Judy. Are you sure about that? Because I could see the frustration in your eyes when he asked her out, Cal. That's because I was upset with him, just the way you are with him. I couldn't stand seeing my friend getting insulted by anyone. Nothing more than that. She tried to make her understand the reason for her gloomy mood in the most polite manner. All right, if you say so, mumbled Judy. Laura was more than relieved hearing that. At least, now she knew for sure that she hadn't done any damage to their friendship. She would have happily helped them if they wanted to date each other, but she knew better than anyone that Ashton and Callie were nothing but best buddies. Now all she wanted was Catherine to understand Ashton and agree to give it a try. At the same time, she couldn't risk Catherine's friendship by pressuring her to date Ashton. Catherine went and locked herself up in a nearby restroom. She sat on the toilet seat, placing her elbow on her thigh, resting her forehead on her palms. What was he thinking? How can she even think of something like that? Agreeing to Ashton means knowingly breaking her own heart. She could not understand her own emotions. How can she be feeling so weak and fragile because of Ashton? What was he doing to her that no other guy has? She kept thinking when she heard Anne calling her. Catherine, are you all right? Yeah, yeah, just give me a minute. She came out and saw her friend pacing up and down worriedly. That was so brave of you, Catherine. No one would have ever done that, though he could have been your Prince Charming. Anne felt a bit sorry for Ashton there. I told you. Anne did not let her finish her sentence. 
I know, I know. You don't need a Prince Charming, she said, shaking her head. But think about it, Catherine. He may be the one for you. I do not want to talk about this, Anne. Let's go. Nodding her head, Anne trailed behind her friend silently. She was aware how stubborn her friend could be at times, and she did not want to pry any more. In the evening, Catherine was working at the cafe when she saw Ashton enter in. She did not want to take the order, so she sent Myra, the other girl working there. She happily accepted her offer after drooling over Ashton. Oh my gosh, he's so hot. I thought you were straight. Entering the freezer room, Myra questioned Catherine. I am straight, replied Catherine, smiling at her. Then how could you not take his order? Myra eagerly asked her. That's because he makes my insides turn out. And I want to stay the hell away from him, she wanted to say. But instead she said, that's because I'm busy. Seriously? I would never give up taking an order from such a guy for anything, though. Anyway, he winked at me, squealed Myra like a four-year-old. Good for you, said Kathy blandly. Catherine handed her Ashton's order and helped the others. Myra came back with the plate in her hand, wearing a sour expression, and handed her the plate. What's wrong? Catherine asked, confused. He wants you to bring his order. Do you know him? She was clearly pissed off at Catherine. She stayed silent for a while. Why was he doing that to her? As if it was not enough for the whole school to know, now everyone in the cafe would know that he is interested in her, and she would look like a vain, arrogant person for not going out with him. Snatching the plate from her hand, she walked to where he was seated. He smirked the moment he saw her walking, fuming with anger. Oh, how pretty she looked when her cheeks were red with anger. He was thinking while tapping the table softly with his fingertips. He made no attempt to look away from Catherine, even for a millisecond. The moment she placed the plate on the table, Ashton caught her hand and pulled her on to the nearby chair. To say Catherine was shocked would be an understatement. She turned around to see if anyone was looking at them. Ashton, she whispered, yelled through gritted teeth. My name sounds so wonderful when it rolls off of your tongue like that. I could hear that my whole life. What are you doing? I'm not supposed to eat with the customers. It's against the rules. She tried to convince him to let her go on her way. I want you to sit and eat with me. I don't like eating alone. Then I'll send my friend Myra to sit and eat with you. Who? The one who took my order? No, no, no. She talks a lot, said Ashton, faking scared. And moreover, I want you to be here. If you want, I can ask your boss's permission for you. Mr. Rand? His voice was muffled by Catherine's palm pressed tightly on his lips. Ashton smirked and Catherine just withdrew her hands awkwardly. She sighed heavily, leaning her back against the chair. Just stop it. Don't make a scene over here, okay? Gladly, if you agree to sit with me and eat. Giving up, Catherine threw her hands up in the air and nodded her head. He ordered another plate of mac and cheese for her. He silently started eating the contents on her plate, not sparing a glance at him. Ashton did not look away from Catherine, though, and just kept eating. He offered to wait and take her back to her hostel. Catherine did not have the energy to argue with him, so she just agreed with him for once. He drove her to her hostel in his black Bentley, and strangely... The gray car did not follow her tonight. Like every year, the carnival was being celebrated in St. Auburn Square. The celebration started on a Tuesday of February, before the Lent fast, and the weather was still very cold. Groups of people were dressed up in bright-colored costumes and big hats with feathers. There were many mask balls going on, and some sort of jazz music was being played. The streets of the town were decorated with fairy lights and candles, giving it a warm appearance. There were lots of food and games booths set up, and people were swamping all over the place to buy tickets. Watching all the people dressed in various costumes and masks, Kathy walked across the cavalcade, proceeding through the town along with Anne and Laura. There were up to 500 men and boys parading on the streets wearing costumes and wooden shoes, dancing and breathing out fire from their mouths. Catherine was astonished as she had never been to such a grand carnival before. Every small thing caught her eyes, and she was in awe. Hudson came back from a nearby stall, holding a few apple candies, and handed it to his friends. So, what do you think about the carnival so far? Do you like it? He asked Kathy. I just love it. I'd like to come here every year with you guys. She spoke loud among the crowd. Can we please go on the Ferris wheel now? Pleaded Anne, holding Catherine's arms. No, Anne, I'm really scared of heights. Why don't you all go while I wait here for you guys? Don't be a baby, Kathy. You'll love it. Come on, please. Laura and Anne started pulling her towards the queue. Okay, okay, let's go, said Kathy, lifting her hands in surrender. They waited near the booth to collect their tickets. 
when they saw Noah and Michael sitting there distributing tickets. Immediately, Kathy's eyes wandered over the place in search of someone. Looking for someone, Kathy? mocked Noah with an evil smile. Huh? N no, stammered Kathy nervously. Was she that obvious? she thought. He shook his head laughing and gave Hudson four tickets to the ride. Wasn't it amazing? Laura asked as they all walked down the ride. Yeah, it was amazing. I think we should go for another ride, replied Kathy, giggling. Someone was so scared to get on the ride a few minutes ago, teased Hudson, and Kathy glared at him playfully. Let's try the haunted house, suggested Anne. Nah, it's so boring, denied Hudson. Let's go see the magic show. Don't tell me you're scared, Hudson, Kathy said, mocking him. Of course not. Let's go then. Catherine and her friends walked in, dragging Hudson, who had a poker face. After spending some time in the entertainment stalls, they decided to have dinner in a nearby Chinese diner. They had ordered their food and were waiting when the doorbell made a noise, indicating the entry of new customers. They saw Judy and Callie enter the restaurant. Seeing Laura sitting with them, Callie walked to the group and Judy trailed behind her. Mind if we join you? asked Callie politely. Not at all, said Hudson and moved slightly to make space for them when the doorbell dinged again. Kathy choked on her own saliva at the sight of the person who had entered the diner. Standing there was Ashton, looking as breathtaking as ever, dressed in a gray polo, full sleeve t-shirt, which was pulled up to his elbow, and black jeans along with a black jacket. He was just as shocked as she was, since he did not expect her there, but quickly masked his expression quite well. Greeting everyone, he took a place on a chair. We need two more chairs for Noah and Mike, informed Judy. Then we should shift to a bigger table, suggested Callie. Meanwhile, Kathy quickly turned to Laura suspiciously. Did you by any chance call them here? She widened her eyes and said, I swear I did not do anything like that. I did not know that they would join us. Kathy felt bad for accusing her friend and nodded slightly. Soon their orders were placed in front of them. Hudson was very involved in the conversation taking place among the boys. It was clear that he liked being in their company. Catherine was happy for him since he finally made some male friends. Unlike every other day, Ashton did not look at Catherine even once, but kept talking with his friends, which made Kathy really uncomfortable. Earlier I had a problem because he was staring at me. Now, here I am, unhappy because he did not look at me even once. What is wrong with me? I should be happy that he is not staring at me, she thought with a frown on her face, which did not go unnoticed by Anne. Are you okay? She placed her palm on Catherine's hand and asked. Yeah, I was thinking where we should go next after eating, she lied. She knew that something was bothering her friend, but she just smiled at her and turned to talk with Laura. Is he hurt because of the school incident that took place earlier? But we met after that in the cafe. He was fine. What now? Maybe he's not interested anymore. But why am I bothered? Shouldn't I be happy about it? Her mind was overthinking now, and she fiddled with her food. Soon the group decided to go out and spend time together. They watched the magic show for some time, and when they felt it boring, they decided to go to the balloon shooting booth. The boys were excited and took turns shooting the balloons. Hudson had shot three balloons, Mike six, and Noah none, out of ten chances. The group mocked Noah for his bad aiming. When Noah handed the long gun to Ashton, feeling embarrassed, he simply refused to try. Maybe he did not want to get insulted like Noah in front of so many girls, thought Kathy. I will try next, jumped in Kaylee. She had successfully shot two balloons. Anne, Laura, and Judy followed Kaylee, and no one shot any balloons. You next, Judy shoved the heavy gun into Kathy's hands arrogantly. I'm not very good at aiming. I don't think I can do, stammered Catherine nervously, since she did not want to get tantalized in front of Ashton. Ashton did not let her finish her sentence. He encircled her and helped her hold the gun in her hands firmly from behind. Catherine froze there for a moment, she tried to get out of his hold, but he was too strong for her. Don't move. Hold your breath. Focus at the target, he instructed her. Hold your breath? I don't think I'm breathing anymore, she mocked herself in her mind. She stopped biting and closed her eyes. She had never let a guy come so close to her before. Ashton gently placed his one hand over her hand on the barrel and held her finger with the other hand, which was placed at the trigger. He placed his chin on her shoulder. She could feel his breath tickling at her neck. She felt weak, and she unknowingly leaned back on his hard chest. He aimed the target and pressed the trigger. A balloon was shot with a pop sound, then it was followed by several pop sounds. Kathy felt the warmth from his body creeping through her own. He was so close to her, but his touch wasn't indecent in any way. He was such a gentleman after all. 
She was lost in the moment. She felt safe and wanted to stay there forever. Forever? She was suddenly brought back to the reality by the clapping sounds from her friends. You shot all the ten balloons! Wow! screamed Laura. Anne clapped her hands and walked towards Kathy. The girls were mesmerized by the scene taking place in front of them. She immediately freed herself from his arms and looked at him. He had a proud look of victory on his beautiful face. Her breath caught at her throat at the sight. She walked to her friends and they all congratulated her. She stood there quietly, not daring to look at anyone's face, but she knew everyone was in awe. Callie smiled at her and patted her slightly while Judy was throwing her annoyed looks. Ashton walked to her with a big teddy bear in his hands and placed it on her hands with the usual smirk on his lips. That's for you, for shooting all the balloons, he said. He noticed that her cheeks were red from embarrassment. She did not lift her head to look at him. Thanks, was all she could say. It was past eleven in the night and they all decided to leave. Kathy's hostel had given permission for late entry due to the carnival. Everyone walked to the parking lot and bid farewell. Hudson offered to take Catherine back to her hostel and they were currently on their way when Anne spoke. I see something for you in his eyes. I guess he really likes you. Yeah, I agree with her, said Hudson. Kathy knew they were right. He saw how Ashton looked at her. She saw something in those eyes, but she was scared. Scared of getting hurt. Scared of ending up like her mother did. So she decided to ignore her friends while looking out of the window, hugging the huge teddy bear. See you guys later, she wished her friends goodnight after reaching her hostel. Hudson drove away his car along with Anne. Reaching her room, she fell onto her bed with the teddy bear in her hands. Her mind traveling back to the moment when she was in Ashton's arms, a small smile crept on her lips. She hugged the teddy bear more closely to her, and she closed her eyes to drift off to sleep. Ashton wanted to invite Catherine and his friends to his grandparents' lake house on the following Saturday for a weekend trip to celebrate his 18th birthday. He decided to invite her personally. He knew where exactly he could find her. So he went to the library where he found her seated on a chair and taking notes from a huge book. She was wearing white jeans with a sky blue shirt. Her hair was left loose and the shorter front ones were falling onto her face. Ashton stood there drinking in her beauty. She shone like the brightest star in the sky. He sighed shortly and decided to talk to her. Kathy was oblivious of his presence until he pulled the nearby chair to sit on it. He placed his arms on the table and leaned on it. She was startled at first, but calmed down eventually. What are you doing here? She asked quietly. I came to see you, he said calmly. And may I ask why? He heaved a long sigh. I want to invite you and your friends for a weekend trip to my lake house. I've also invited my friends. I don't think I can join you. I'm sorry. She refused bluntly, but politely but Ashton would not take no for an answer. So he tried to persuade her more. He placed his palm on her hand and squeezed it gently. It's my birthday, Catherine, and I want you to come with us. I've already talked to Anne and Hudson, and they have agreed to come. Please think about it and give me your answer tonight. He got up and walked away. She couldn't concentrate anymore and sat there in deep thoughts. Should I go? Of course not. Probably I will put myself in more trouble by going there. Anne and Hudson can go and have fun. I will stay here. That's final. She was very much aware of how she was attracted by his charming personality and good looks. For the same reason, she wanted to avoid going and spending the weekend anywhere near him would definitely not put her heart at ease. Stuffing her things into her bag, she walked out of the library. Anne and Hudson decided to convince Kathy during lunch break. They knew she could be very stubborn at times, but they still wanted to try their luck. Kathy acted cool and did not speak a word about it until they started the conversation first. Anne nudged Hudson's hand, asking him to begin the conversation. Mm, Kathy, are you free this weekend? Why do you ask? Kathy remained calm and kept eating her meal, acting like she had no idea about their plan. I, we actually met Ashton in gym class, and he invited us all to his lake house to celebrate his birthday this weekend. How about we all go together? He asked carefully. You two can go. I will not be able to join you. I have some work to do this weekend. She smiled. She did not want to sound like an arrogant person. We will not go if you don't join us, pouted Anne. That's up to you to decide, she said a little rudely this time. She sighed, feeling terribly sorry for snapping at her friend. Look, I'm sorry, but I really don't want to go there. I hope you understand me. She looked at her friends with an apologizing look. I have to leave now. 
See you two later. What shall we do now? I promised Ashton that I would convince her to go with us, whined Anne, looking sad. Who asked you to promise him something like that? Don't you know how stubborn she is? He retorted at her. You're not helping me, Hudson. I know she is stubborn, but Ashton is a great guy and I want her to give it a try. Help me, Hudson. Give me some ideas, pleaded Anne with a serious look. I seriously do not have the courage to talk to her, Anne, but I believe there must be some way to make her understand Ashton's feelings. Be patient till then. He tried to console her. Nodding her head, she got up and together they walked out of the cafeteria. Kathy had to work very late that night since there were lots of customers to attend to. She received a text from Ashton asking for her reply. Ashton, Catherine, have you decided yet? Will you be joining us? Kathy didn't have to think much. She was determined not to go with them. Kathy, I'm sorry, Ashton. I won't be joining you guys. Something came up. Enjoy your trip. Ashton knew that Catherine wasn't pompous or the one who was full of herself. He understood from Laura that she had some trust issues due to her rough childhood, but he still couldn't help but feel downhearted that she did not accept his invite. It was almost midnight when she closed the cafe. It was pitch dark on the streets. There was not a single soul on the road except for some cars passing by. She swallowed hard and started walking as fast as she could. She held the pepper spray can tightly in her hands. She turned back to see if the gray car was following her. She was glad that the car wasn't anywhere in sight tonight. She kept walking, turning back time and again. She had hardly gone half a mile when clouds started gathering in the sky. Lightning began to flash and the wind became biting cold. She took a left turn after the junction and stopped dead for a split second, when she saw a few muggers standing on the roadside fooling around. She was nervous but continued walking quietly. She tried to stay low and keep walking, not daring to look at them even once. Suddenly, one of the muggers called her in a rough tone and ordered her to stop. She stopped in her tracks, breathing unevenly as she slowly turned around. She stood there innocently as if she did not know who they were, but her hand was ready to grab her spray can. The guy who looked like he was in his late forties came closer to her and took out a small knife. He placed it slowly near her neck. Her breath hitched and she felt that she was about to collapse on the ground. She was ready to make a run at the smallest chance, that is, if she had any. Take out your purse, he ordered her roughly. Hand us any money that you have. Money was the most valuable thing for Kathy. She would save it bit by bit very carefully for her college, but for now, she did not want anything more than to get out of there. She never kept more than what she needed in her purse. She hardly had any money in it, so she took out whatever little money she had and shoved it into his hands. He grabbed the money and shook the knife away, indicating her to go away. When he was about to let her go, a much younger one who was silently watching her all this time asked her to stop. You have all the cash, and let me have the last, eh? said the guy, rubbing his hands up and down her arms. He moved his body closer to her. She began to struggle in his hold and started to scream for help. Stop screaming, will you? No one is coming to save you, sweetie. Let me go, let me go, you moron. She started hitting him on his chest. She tried taking out her spray can, but that went all in vain when the other guy pushed it out of her hand. They did not notice a car coming their way at full speed and stop near them. Suddenly, the robbers were pulled away from Kathy. She sobbed out of fear and scurried back to the end of the road. Her vision was blurred with tears. In addition to it all, it started raining heavily. All she could see was a tall, muscular figure punching a life out of the three mobsters. She struggled to sit up and wiped her tears. The first thing that caught her eyes was the gray, expensive car, parked on the other side of the road. She straight away looked at the owner of the car, and she could only see his back facing her, and he was vigorously punching the thugs. The robbers were motionless and seemed to have passed out. She slowly got up on her knees and crawled to him. She placed her hand on his shoulders and gently pulled him away from the criminals. She was left speechless when she saw her rescuer's face. Ash, Ashton, are you okay, Catherine? He studied her from head to toe, worriedly. She was shaking and there were a few scratch marks and bruises on her arms, but other than that, she seemed fine. I'm okay. Are you all right? She stammered and started sobbing, placing her head on his chest. It's okay. Look, look, you're okay now. He hugged her and comforted her. We should go now. I'll call the police on our way. He slowly walked her to his car. He made her sit on the passenger seat and buckled up the seatbelt. He was about to close the door, but suddenly grunted in pain. She saw the younger guy standing behind Ashton. Ashton's face turned beet red, and he had difficulty standing on his legs. 
Kathy saw bloodstains on his hip and abdomen. She tried to rush out of the car, but he pushed her back inside. St stay here. Do not come out of the car. Call the cops. He instructed her and locked the car from outside. She started pounding hard in the window from the inside, asking him to unlock the car and let her help him, but that would be the last thing Ashton would do. She felt helpless sitting inside, not able to do anything to help Ashton. Dial the numbers and inform the police about the situation. Ashton was pushed on the ground but immediately got up and started punching the guy brutally until his knuckles started bleeding. All the three goons laid there without any movements. Soon the sirens from police cars were heard and the robbers were under arrest. Ashton dragged himself towards his car and opened it. Kathy had never felt so relieved in her life before and she rushed to his aid. She noticed two coin-sized holes punched through his t-shirt and blood was oozing out of it making the white shirt crimson. Oh my God, Ashton, you're bleeding. Call the ambulance, please. Somebody call the ambulance, she screamed hysterically. Shh, shh, Catherine, it's, it's just a small br- He didn't get to finish and collapsed on the ground. Catherine had managed to admit him in a nearby hospital and she asked Hudson to come there since she wanted someone near her for moral support. She was trembling like a leaf seeing Ashton unconscious and bleeding. She hated seeing him lying like that, bloodied and ragged. His bruises were becoming more prominent as minutes passed. By the time Hudson reached there, she had tried to calm down and filled in the admission form for the hospital. Hudson helped her reach Ashton's parents and notified them about his condition. They rushed into the hospital and Kathy instantly witnessed a dreaded shadow on their faces. She could tell that they held a dislike for her in their eyes as the police filled them in with the events of the night. Ashton had to undergo a minor surgery to stop the internal bleeding caused due to the stab wounds and he was shifted to the VIP ward within a couple of hours. He woke up four hours after the surgery. His parents were at his bedside all the while. He opened his eyes slowly, blinking it a few times, adjusting to the surrounding lights. He tried to sit up holding his abdomen with a growl but was pushed back slowly by his dad. He scanned around the room to see his parents and friends standing there anxiously waiting for him to regain consciousness. He spotted his mom who was sitting at the edge of the bed and wiping away her tears. He opened his arms and his mom rushed to hug him and started sobbing loudly. Oh, Ashton, for a moment we thought we lost you. His dad rubbed his mom's shoulder. He looked pale and his eyes were red from crying. Why will he not be since Ashton was his only son? Shh, shh, I'm okay, mom. Stop crying now. He cooed into her ears, trying to reassure her, but his mom kept crying loudly for a good long while. He could see Noah, Mike, and Laura standing near the door looking at him fretfully. Judy was seated on the couch and Callie was standing next to his mom, consoling her. His friends slowly started gathering next to his bed and started to wish for a speedy recovery. We will be waiting outside if you want us. His parents got up to give him some space with his friends. You scared the shit out of us, man, stated Mike. We are glad to have you back. How did I end up in a hospital? Asked Ashton, trying to remember. Catherine had called the ambulance and she brought you here. She had called Laura from your mobile. Noah narrated the whole incident. You were lucky that they got you to the hospital on time, spoke Callie for the first time after he woke up. I just don't understand why you had picked a fight with those robbers. What were you doing there so late in the night? Anything could have happened to you. And what were you doing until they stabbed you? She berated him for his foolish act. Is she here? he asked, ignoring the lecture from his friend. Callie was in utter shock. They were all worried about his health, but even then, all he wanted to do was to see that girl. Shaking her head in disbelief, she stood up from the bed and walked to the couch, sitting next to Judy. She's been waiting outside the whole time with Ann and Hudson. Do you want me to call her in? Laura queried her friend before he nodded his head to let her in. Laura came back with Kathy, trailing behind her with a worried expression. She looked up at Ashton and suddenly tears welled up in her eyes. She was the only one in the room other than Ashton to know what exactly had happened earlier that night. If not for Ashton, she would have been probably dead by now. She felt grateful to him, but at the same time, she blamed herself for his condition. She stood behind Laura, hanging her head now, feeling sorry for Ashton. Can you guys give us a second, please? Ashton requested his friends politely to leave them alone for a while, and immediately, everyone started moving out of the room. Judy walked away throwing daggers at Catherine. She had a feeling that Ashton was somehow here because of Catherine. Kathy did not try to move at all and stood there staring at the ground. How long are you going to stand there? He broke the silence that lingered between them. 
She walked closer to Ashton's bed and looked at him carefully. He was wearing a light blue hospital dress, and he had a cervical collar around his neck. An IV was connected to his veins, which was held in place by tapes and bandages. Sit. He patted the space near him on the bed, and she surprisingly obeyed him. Don't look at me like that. I'm not going to die. He tried to joke, but right at that moment, Catherine's eyes welled up, and she started shedding the tears that she was trying to hold back for a long time. Was it you that followed me all this time? She asked him between her sobs. Catherine, let me explain, okay? Don't freak out. He tried to warn her and continued when she sobbed. Yes, it was me, but believe me, I did not have any bad intentions behind it. Remember when I first saw you in the cafe late one night? Since then, I was really worried about you walking back all alone to your hostel. I wanted to make sure you reached your place safe every night. Hence, I decided to follow you, and I'm not a bit sorry about it. In fact, I'm glad I did so. If she was crying earlier, now she cried even more. It's all because of me that you had to go through all this. She shook her head, burying it into her palms, and continued sobbing. Catherine, look at me. He pulled her hands away from her face and dragged her closer to him. Stop blaming yourself for what had happened. I'm glad that I was there and around when it happened. She suddenly lifted his green shirt up to his chest and observed the stab wound. It was well dressed by bandages and gauze. She cautiously traced her hands over the dressing. You did not have to do that for me, Ashton, she murmured sadly. She had never imagined that someone would risk their life for her. No one has ever done that for her. I would do that again if needed. His smirk was back on his face. She tried hard not to blush, but failed miserably. Um, about that weekend trip you were asking me earlier, I would love to go with you, she said, smiling lightly. And will you go out on a dinner date with me? He asked her, grinning from ear to ear. Yeah, and that too. She agreed shyly, pushing her locks behind her ear. So, all I had to do was get a few knife stabs to make you go out with me. He mused playfully, keeping his finger on his chin. If I had known, I would have done that earlier. Don't say that, she chided him. Should I call everyone inside? He simply nodded his head, and Catherine opened the door for their friends. Is everything okay here? Laura asked, entering the room along with the others. Ashton just smiled and waved at them to come inside. So what exactly happened yesterday night? Why were you two there? Judy started throwing questions at them. Both kept quiet for a while, then eventually Ashton, narrating the previous night's events one by one, began. Ashton's friends did not know how to react. They certainly did not believe he would go to such lengths for this new girl in front of him. Oh my God, so it was you all along who followed Kathy? That great car belonged to you? Anne was shocked to know that Ashton was the one following her friend. So we were worrying unnecessarily all this time, huh? I did not even know that she was being followed by someone, whined Hudson. Why would you two keep something like that from me? We just did not want to worry you, Hudson. Anne stroked his arm, but that did not convince him even to the slightest. So are we still going on the weekend trip? Asked Noah. Yes, however, we are postponing it for the next week. Catherine, Anne, and Hudson will be joining us, he informed, winking at Catherine. Wow, that would be fun. Laura jumped in excitement. Ashton woke up to the continuous banging sound on his room door. He groaned loudly and rubbed his eyes. He caught a glimpse of the clock. It was early in the morning and dark outside. Even now, he had some discomfort from the pain in his abdomen while moving around. He could make out who exactly was standing at his door and knocking so early in the morning. He opened the door with a small grin on his lips. Happy birthday, Ashton. He tucked his head into his folded arms to save his ears from all the howling and shouting. He was immediately engulfed in Noah's warm embrace, followed by Mike and Laura. Ashton's parents were also present there, his dad holding a small box, which was gift-wrapped neatly. Happy birthday, son. They both kissed him and handed the small velvet box in his hands. He opened it to find a car key inside. A new Audi. Thanks, Mom and Dad. You really didn't have to give me that, Mom, he said, hugging his mom. Ashton turned to Callie, who beamed a smile, seeing his happy face. Happy birthday. How are you feeling now? She asked, hugging him and placing a chaste kiss on his cheeks. Thanks, I'm better, he said after which Judy came over wishing him and hugged him slightly. The morning was simply spent chit-chatting and having fun. Ashton had received several calls from his friends and family members. Later that morning, he decided to check out his latest Audi Q7 Black Edition, driving around the town with his friends. Each of the boys got to drive the car and reached back to Ashton's place for breakfast. Ashton's mom had prepared a special breakfast for her son and his friends. The huge dining table was overflowing with various kinds of dishes. 
The servants were rushing in and out of the dining room, carrying all the food items, which included baked bacon, scrambled eggs, roasted tomatoes, mushrooms, butter, toast, sausages, and pancakes. His mum walked inside the dining room with Ashton's favorite, a huge black forest cake which had Happy B-Day Ashton written on it. Mom, this is all too much. I'm not a baby. He felt embarrassed. Hush, you will always be our baby, she said, pointing to him to cut the cake. She shook his head and bent down to blow the candles. As soon as he blew the candles, the room roared with a huge round of applause and a happy birthday song. The cake was served by the maids after everyone was done with the sumptuous breakfast. He seemed to enjoy the precious moment with his family and friends before he got a call. His eyes sparkled like a twinkling star, and he smirked triumphantly upon glancing at his phone. Guys, I need to pick this up. Please excuse me. His fork and knife came flying down on the plate, making a clinking sound as he hurried to his room. From his sudden, spiced-up behavior, his friends knew exactly who the caller was. Hey, was all he could say as he was out of breath since he had to run up the stairs. Happy birthday, Catherine's voice came out like a soft melody to him from the other side. Thanks. There was a long silence after that since he did not expect her to call him, and hence he did not know how to react. Huh. How's your day so far? She tried to make small talk to kill the awkwardness. Catherine, listen. Do you mind going out for dinner tonight? That is, if you're free? Catherine was speechless at his bluntness. She did not expect that question so early. She kept quiet for a couple of minutes, thinking. Catherine, you there? It's okay if you're not ready. He sounded defeated when he did not get a reply from her. No, no, it's not that. And yes, I'm totally free tonight. I, I was actually planning to take a day off since it's been a long time. I guess it would be today then. She cut him off midway. Now that was unexpected for Ashton and he smiled brightly. Really? Yep. So I'll come and pick you up around one o'clock. It was more of a question. He still couldn't believe that she agreed to go out with him without arguing like she always did. Hmm, all right, I'll be waiting, she chimed. See you soon, Catherine. See you. She threw her phone on her bed and fell on the mattress. She couldn't believe that she was finally going out with someone. A few months ago, dating was the last thing on her mind, but Ashton surely had managed to alter her mind. She lay smiling, thinking about him. Phew! Ashton let out his breath that he was holding unknowingly for a long time. He started pacing up and down his room in excitement, running his hand through his hair, making it look messy. After spending the next 15 minutes striding nervously, he decided to calm down. He knew that he was sounding like a girl, but it was really happening. His first date was going to be with the most beautiful and headstrong Catherine. Oh, for the sake of God, shut up, Ashton. His brain screamed at him. He decided to join back with his friends to distract his mind for the time being. They were almost done with their breakfast by the time he reached them. What took you so long, man? Noah teased with a lopsided grin, and Ashton knew well that his friend was only pretending not to know what exactly happened. It was Catherine. I asked her out. He breathed without bothering to look at his friends. You asked her out again even after she rejected you the first time? Judy pinned him with an accusing look. Why are you being so desperate about her? I've never seen you behave like this before. Did she even agree this time? That's because I like her, and I don't take no for an answer very easily. He replied in a clipped tone with an irritated expression on his face. And yes, she is going out with me tonight. Wow, that's great. Callie tried to lighten the mood in the hall. So where are you guys going? I haven't decided yet. He sighed, clearly not having an idea about where he should take her. Let us help you then, Laura chirped. Take her to a movie, followed by a restaurant. That's it slinging her hands on either sides. Um, don't you think it's too plain? His eyebrows shut up and he stared unsurely. Then, how about... Callie was trying to put her mind to give him some idea, but was cut short by Ashton. Guys, guys, thanks for your ideas, but I think I can handle this on my own, he said in a low voice. I want to do something unique for her. Okay, buddy, all the best with that. Call us if you need any help, joked Mike. I think we should all be going now. Let's just give him some time to plan the evening with Catherine. With that, they all bid their farewell to Ashton. Ashton propped up against his headboard and sat thinking on ways to make his date with Catherine a memorable one. He wanted to make the best first impression, get to know her more, and have a great time together. Processing all these thoughts, he came up with the best first date ideas. He started making some calls for reservations, and he was done. He impatiently glanced at the wall clock for the ninth time. He still had an hour to go to pick up Catherine, but he was already dressed up in deep indigo jeans with a white dress shirt which was neatly tucked in. 
He wore a dark brown casual leather belt and paired it with similarly colored shoes. He completed his look wearing a dark brown jacket. He sent a quick text to Catherine informing her that he had already started from his place and immediately got an okay from Catherine for the reply. When he was about to leave his room, he got a call from Callie. Hey, Cals, what's up? Hey, buddy, ready for your date? Yeah, I'm just a little nervous. Wish me good luck, okay? Ashton, don't worry, you'll be fine. By the way, I too am going out on a dinner date with Ron, she informed him. Should I come, drop you, and warn that jerk? Can you really leave your date and come for me, Ashton? She asked him eagerly. She really wanted to know if he would do that for her. Of course I'll do that for you. Don't you know that, Cals? A smile crept on her lips hearing him say that. What was she thinking? Of course her Ashton would dump a million dates to keep her safe. She laughed on the other end. I do, and it means a lot to me, but I don't intend to spoil your first date. I wish you all the best. Take care. Talk to you later. He got the call with a happy smile. He hurried down the stairs only to meet his parents who were leisurely having a cup of mint tea. Are you going somewhere, Ashton? His mom inquired warmly. I have a date tonight. He pressed his lips into a thin line to control his grin. Is it with Callie? She looked surprised to know that her son had finally decided to date someone, yet she masked it with a small smile. Mom, no. Callie and I are not dating ever, he said firmly. I'm going out with Catherine, he mumbled. The girl you saved from the robbers? She asked with a poker face. With the girl who got me to the hospital on time, he spoke abruptly, clearly irritated by his mum's interference. All right, son, have a great time. His dad spoke this time to cut the tension lingering between them. He walked away, nodding his head. She stood in front of the long-sized mirror and glanced at her reflection for the hundredth time in the last 45 minutes. She felt nervous and jumpy since this was her first date, and not to mention with her heart throbbing Ashton. She straightened up her simple red printed dress, which reached below her knees, slightly flowy at the bottom. She decided to wear a gray jacket along with her black pumps. She felt like she was torn between anxiety, dread, and excitement all at once as she waited for Ashton. When she heard the sound of a car honking, instantly her hands became sweaty and her heart rate increased a hundred times. She felt that fluttery stomach feeling which she always had when she saw Ashton. She peeped through the window to confirm if it was Ashton, and when she saw him leaning on a brand new black car, her lips curved into a full smile. His hair was neatly gelled back, and he looked like a model pulled out of a magazine. She ran to the mirror and glanced at herself one last time. She wanted to check if she was a match to him. She immediately rushed down the stairs. Upon reaching the ground floor, she stopped midway and stood in the middle of the hallway to calm down her fast-beating heart for once. Relax. Breathe. Breathe, that's right. Breathe. She brought her hands near her chest, her palms facing the floor, and mimicked to slow down her breathing. She pretended to be collected and cool as a cucumber. She walked towards his car calmly. Hey, gorgeous, he said, handing her a bouquet of flowers, and she accepted it shyly. You look beautiful. Happy birthday to you. You look good, too, she replied shyly, looking at the beautiful collection of fresh white lilies. She was glad he had got her lilies rather than roses. Ashton opened the car door and helped her get inside before running around to get in the driver's seat. So, where are we going? She asked him anxiously. We will start with lunch at my favorite restaurant. He spoke as he kept his gaze on the road. He did not want to tell her anything about the place he had decided to take her. He wanted their first date to be more than memorable. They drove a little over an hour before arriving at a restaurant. They pulled the car at the almost occupied parking lot, and Ashton walked around the car to help Catherine out of it. They walked into the lounge of the restaurant. The place looked freakishly expensive. This place is stunning, Ashton. You didn't have to bring me all the way here. Burger Inn would have been fine for me, she said, looking mesmerized at the huge entrance. Don't worry, Catherine. It's fine. Besides, it's your first date. She wondered how he knew it in the first place that it was her very first date. Ashton placed his palms on the small of her back and guided her towards the reception. I have booked a table for two under the name... Ashton Schwimmer. The young female receptionist nodded at him, feeling flustered by the handsome man standing in front of her. She shifted her gaze between Ashton and Catherine with a pinch of jealousy visible in her eyes. She was already making poor Catherine uncomfortable. She looked into her laptop and led them to a table. Catherine felt relaxed as the receptionist walked out of their sight. Ashton handed her the menu. She grabbed it and had her head sank in it, checking at the list of Italian food. Ashton did not bother to look into the menu and found Catherine to be more fascinating to look at. 
Her loose tendrils were falling in her face as she bent down a bit to look at the menu. His hands itched to play with them and tucked them behind her ears. Her long and slender fingers ran over the list as she tried to decide on what to order. Her baby pink lips were moving slowly against one another as she read them silently. She looked so natural and cute. I would go with... She stopped when she saw Ashton engrossed in eyeing at her intently. Damn. She caught me staring at her again, he thought before grinning at her, not at all feeling sorry for his actions. She cleared her throat and looked back at the menu to hide her blush. Ashton lifted his hand to grab the attention of the waitress. What would you like to order, ma'am? Pancello with a glass of Prosecco. Thanks, Catherine said, placing the menu on the table. Mushroom risotto with a glass of red wine, Ashton said without bothering to look at the menu. He was a regular visitor to the restaurant, and he knew the list of dishes by heart. Thank you. He once again turned his attention back to Catherine. Ashton could feel the agitation in Catherine's eyes, and he tried to ease her by having simple conversation with her. By the time their food arrived, Ashton made sure that she was composed and laughed more freely. But why do you want to leave Manhattan? She asked him carefully, trying not to pry too much into it. I'm too tired of staying here. I want some freedom from my parents. I would say from their overprotectiveness. He instantly regretted saying that. He knew Catherine had no one to protect her. But not anymore. She had me, he thought. You are very lucky to have them, she said in a defeated tone. Yeah, but too much of anything would suffocate you at some point. I am at that point of my life right now. She smiled at him and nodded in understanding. Have you looked into colleges in California? Yeah, I have a few preferences. I want to get in through scholarship, though. She was surprised that he was nothing like she had imagined him to be. He was practical and responsible, unlike other rich boys of his age. After spending about an hour in the restaurant, they drove again and Catherine kept staring out of the window. The car slowed down and Ashton took a left, driving into a muddy and narrow pathway. Are you sure this is where you want to take me? She asked him humorously. The place looked isolated from the city. Absolutely. He spoke as he drove further inside before parking the car and helping her to get out of his car. A vineyard! She squealed excitedly. He took her hands in his and dragged her towards the field. They walked along the yard and met a man in his late seventies. He looked old and wrinkled, missing some of his teeth. He smiled and spread his arms as he saw them coming towards him. Ah, oh, my child, there you are. Happy birthday, Ashton. You have lost all your baby fat, he said, eyeing him from head to toe. Grandpa? Ashton whined at him for embarrassing him in front of his date. Who is this young lady? Noticing the presence of a pretty young woman next to Ashton, he immediately walked to her and kissed the back of her palms playfully, to which Ashton rolled his eyes, making Catherine giggle. Grandpa, it's nice to see you too. This here is Catherine. Mm, my friend. His grandpa knew the very instant that she was more than just a friend to his grandson. It was written all over his face and the way he looked at her. Good to see you, sir. Catherine extended her arm and he pulled her into a hug. Just call me Henry. Come on, children, let's get you two inside. He walked them towards the house, situated in the middle of the farm. The house looked old but elegant. They went in and were immediately welcomed by his wife. She rushed to the doorway and kissed Ashton before hugging him tightly. Then she eyed Catherine with surprise. Ashton had never got a girl home before. She worked her brain before Ashton introduced Catherine to her grandmother. Nice to meet you, Catherine. It's a surprise that Ashton has got a girl here for the very first time. You must be really special, she said, throwing a smile at Ashton. Special. Her mind repeated it several times. Catherine felt like her words were caught in her own throat when his grandma said that and did not know how to react to that. Did I really mean something special to him? Was it his first date as well? She kept looking at Ashton for answers. He simply flashed her his signature grin and took her hands in his, dragging her to the huge couch in the middle of the living room. They spent the early evening with the old couple. This wine is made from the finest grapes grown in our vineyard, you would want to taste them? Ashton's grandma, Jenny, offered them fresh non-alcoholic wine and homemade cookies. Sure. Catherine had never felt so comfortable with anyone before. They made her feel at home, which she never got to experience in her life. Why don't you show her around the house, Ashton? Henry suggested once they were done with the wine. Would you like to? He asked, stretching his hand out for Catherine to take it. I would love to. She grabbed his hand and excused herself from the couple in front of her. Catherine had never seen a house like that before in her whole life. It looked antiquated yet magnificent. One could enter the house from any direction as it had many entrances and French doors. 
The house was naturally lit and ventilated. It was surrounded by a huge portico and was situated right in the middle of the vineyard. Family photos were beautifully arranged on the walls along the stairs. In fact, most of the walls in the house held photo frames. Catherine took a moment to look at some of them while Ashton stood there studying her every move. There were pictures of his grandma and grandpa from their adulthood, then pictures with their children and grandchildren. A particular picture caught her eyes, one with a young couple with a toddler in their hand. The man, who was clad in a suit dress, looked exactly like Ashton, just a few years old, maybe, and the woman was elegantly dressed with a pearl necklace around her neck. It looked like a very formal picture in every sense. Is that your... She started with her finger pointed at the picture. Yes, that's my dad and mom, and that's me. Oh, there is a whole wall with Ashton's childhood pictures. Let me show you some. Ashton's grandma dragged her along the hallway excitedly. The wall of the hallway was full of Ashton's photos, right from birth to his teenage years. I have allotted a wall for each of my grandchildren. I love them all equally. She paused walking. This here is Ashton's first picture. She pointed at a photo which had Ashton's mother and father holding an infant Ashton. There were his first day at school photo, birthday photos, chess championship photos, and so much more. Then there came the one where a four-year-old Ashton was standing at a beach naked. Oh my God, that's so cute. Catherine laughed at it wholeheartedly. Grandma, if I remember correctly, I asked you to remove that one a long time ago. It is really not appropriate to hang in the hallway, he complained while trying to take it away from the wall, but it was stopped by his grandma. Hush, that is one of my favorites and I want it right here, she said, hanging it right back at its place. Catherine, you want to see more of his cute pics? All right, we are out of here, Ashton announced, tugging at Catherine's elbow. Catherine and his grandma roared with laughter, seeing his annoyance. Ashton's grandmother asked the maids to prepare a picnic basket for them and handed it to Ashton. Thanks, Grams. We'll be back in an hour for an early dinner, he said, placing a chaste kiss on her cheeks. Bye, Jenny. Catherine waved at her before walking out with Ashton. He held the basket in one hand and held Catherine's hand in his other. They walked through the grapes yard until they reached under the shade of a huge tree and Ashton spread the blanket on the ground. The sun was about to go down and the weather couldn't be any more pleasant for a picnic. I've never been to a vineyard before, she said, looking around. Thanks for bringing me here. Anything for you, and I'm glad you like it. He was really glad to know that she liked this place for a first date. He was worried thinking if she would appreciate it if he took her to her grandparents' house for a date. He would have taken her to a movie date or a normal dinner, but it would have been too plain. He wanted to spend his time with Catherine, and there was no other place perfect than this. She was no more being shy and quiet. She was trying to make conversations with him, and they kept talking. Ashton took out the sandwiches from Basket and poured the wine into two glasses. Your grandparents are really amazing. You have no idea. They are like this to all their grandchildren, he said, taking a bite from his sandwich. How many cousins do you have? Five. Two are in high school, one is married, and the remaining two are into family business. They stayed for an hour before walking back to the house. Jenny had made sure that the dinner was ready by the time they reached home. They all had an early dinner with his grandparents, talking and laughing continuously. They seemed like a couple in so much love. They made her believe in love and compassion once again. She thought it was all made up, and nothing like love existed in this world after the epic failure of her parents' marriage. We should be getting back. They were standing near Ashton's car. Jenny had packed lots of fresh grapes, cookies, and a bottle of wine for Catherine. You're such an amazing company to have. I am happy that Ashton brought you here. Come here often, she said, grabbing Catherine's hands in her warm one. Thanks, Jenny. I had an amazing time with you all, and thanks for this. She lifted the basket which Jenny had given her. She got into the car and waved at them as Ashton drove out of the estate. There was a comfortable silence inside the car before Ashton switched on the radio. Post Malone's Sunflower was being played, Unless I stuck by you, you're the sunflower, you're the sunflower. Ashton sang, tapping his fingertips on the steering, and Catherine smiled at his carefree nature. The car soon came to a stop near Catherine's hostel. Ashton switched on the lights inside the car. It was such an amazing evening, he said, turning slightly on his seat to face her. An annoying single strand of her hair was falling on her beautiful face, and he stretched his hand to tuck it behind her ear. He, yeah was really special. Thanks. Catherine felt her heart would jump out of her chest. She had heard from her friends that it was a tradition to kiss on your first date. Was he planning to kiss? But I'm totally not ready for it. 
she sat fidgeting the hem of her gown. He leaned in, causing her heart to beat a thousand folds faster. He placed his palms on the side of her face, and Catherine closed her eyes tightly, scared that she would faint any minute now. Ashton enjoyed watching her nervous self and finally decided to free her from it. He closed the distance between their faces and placed a light peck on her forehead. Good night, Kathy. Catherine slowly opened her eyes and saw him smirking at her. She unknowingly let out a huge sigh of relief. She should have known it by now that he was nothing like the others. She felt embarrassed at her foolishness. Good night and thanks for tonight, she said getting down his car. He walked inside. The place he kissed on her forehead still felt warm, her heart as well. She had never felt so safe and comfortable around a guy before. She walked through the hallway and as she saw his car still parked outside, she thought, he is such a gentleman. You took her to your grandparents' house for a date? You're kidding, right? Noah studied Ashton's face with wide and amused eyes. Ashton, Noah, and Mike had planned to watch a big game together at Mike's house. Mike had also invited Hudson to join them, which he accepted without a second thought. Noah and Michael broke into a fit of laughter when they didn't get an answer from Ashton, except for a glare. Who takes a girl to their grandparents' place? Noah chortled, rolling on the sofa while clutching his stomach. Don't expect that girl to call you back, he said, wiping the single tear that had slipped his eyes from excessive laughing. Ashton wanted to smack Noah's head for ridiculing the best date of his life, but decided to go against it. It must have been the best date for him, but it was the same for Catherine. Maybe Noah was right in every sense. What if Catherine didn't enjoy the night? The thought was killing him from inside and left him in a shitty mood for the whole afternoon. To top it, Catherine hadn't called or texted him the whole day. Damn, I should have taken my friend's advice and taken her to a movie followed by dinner in a fancy restaurant wanted to punch himself for making a fool out of himself. The boys around him applauded and howled in between the game, but as for Ashton, the thoughts of Catherine were keeping his mind occupied, making it difficult for him to follow the game. He ran his hand several times between his hair, waiting for the stupid game to get over soon. Michael's phone buzzed, and seeing the caller ID, he put the call on speaker. Hey, Laura, you are interrupting our game. It was Noah who spoke to her. Big deal. I wanted to ask you guys if you're interested to go with us to watch a movie tonight. What do you mean by us? Callie, Judy, and me. Don't tell me we're watching some rom-coms. Michael and Noah giggled. Nope, you can choose the movie. Laura spoke on the other side. All right, we are in, Michael said, looking at Ashton. He looked zoned out once again. Hudson will also be joining us tonight. Maybe you can call Catherine and Anne too? Right on cue, Ashton broke his eye contact with the wall and turned towards Mike with sparkle in his eyes. Seeing his sudden change of mood, Noah said, Somebody here is already so excited. So, see you at five? Ashton looked into his watch. It was 3.45 and no one was dressed properly to go to a movie. Suddenly, no one looked interested in the game anymore and got up from the couch. I'll get changed and be there at five, said Ashton, walking out with Noah and Hudson. Hudson drove off in his car and Ashton dropped Noah at his place. Within the next 15 minutes, he was in his room, rummaging through his closet. After a quick shower, he wore a gray t-shirt and a dark blue jeans. He picked up his wallet and phone before walking out of his room. Laura had texted him, asking him to pick her up on his way to the theater. He drove to Laura's house and waited in his car for a few minutes before she came out and hopped into the passenger seat. Hey, she chirped at Ashton and immediately noticed the lack of excitement in his eyes. What's wrong? Huh? What? He looked at Laura with confusion. Why do you look so gloomy and dull? He was astonished at how easily Laura could read him. It's just that I feel like a complete idiot for taking Catherine to my grandparents' place. I should have taken your advice, he confessed, looking into the road ahead. Are you crazy? You have no idea what she told me when I texted her this morning, Laura said taking out her mobile from her sling bag. Not minding about the cars behind him, Ashton stopped his car abruptly in the middle of the road and got a loud honk from the red car that had somehow managed to avoid a hit right on time. He rolled down the glass and peeped out, lifting his hand up as a gesture of apology. He drove the car once again before he pulled it to the side of the road. When did she say? Laura had never seen Ashton look so impatient and longing in her 15 years of friendship. She wanted to laugh at the look on his face and mock him, but instead she smiled warmly, unlocking her phone. She swiped on the screen before handing it to Ashton. You may want to look at this. Ashton looked into the thread of messages between Laura and Catherine from the morning. Catherine. Hey, Laura. Good morning. Laura. Hi. How was your first date? 
Catherine. It was beyond incredible. Laura. Wow, that's great to know. Where did he take you? Catherine. We had lunch at his favorite restaurant. Then we visited his grandparents' vineyard. We were there till dinner before he dropped me back at my hostel. Laura. Did he really take you to his grandparents' farm? And you were okay with that? Catherine. Yes, but believe me when I say this, Laura. I've never spent my day so delightfully in my whole life. It was one of the best days of my life, and Ashton is such a thoughtful person to take me there on our first date. Anything else would have been too plain. A small grin crept on Ashton's lips, looking at that particular text which showed him how much similar their thoughts were. Laura. You are so unpredictable, but in a good way. I'm happy that I hooked up you two. He he he. Catherine. I'm glad you did. Any ounce of regret that he had earlier had been washed from Ashton's mind. It's Catherine Ashton. Of course he did well taking her there. So stop whining and move your ass. Ashton smiled at her, ruffling her hair playfully. Ouch, you messed up my hairstyle. She cried out, pushing his hand away, and he started his once again to hit on the road. He drove off to Callie's house to pick her up next. Reaching the theater, they decided to wait at the lounge for the others to come. Noah had picked up Mike and Judy. Hudson was bringing Catherine. It was almost time for the movie to start, and there was still no sign of Catherine and Hudson. Mike had called Hudson, and he informed that they were stuck in traffic and would be reaching in another ten minutes. Never knew you would agree to watch movies, Callie said, shoving the big bucket of popcorn into Ashton's hands. Yeah, I had nothing else to do for tonight. He lied to her, knowing she would be angry at him if he revealed that he was here for Catherine. She had asked him to accompany her for movies before, but he would always refuse. Anyways, what movie are we watching? Now that Callie had asked him, he realized that he had no idea what movie they were going to watch. All he knew was Catherine was joining him, and he wanted to be around her. Huh? He looked around him for clues and found few movie posters. Avengers Endgame. Oh. They would be here soon. Let's get in. The movie's about to start. Callie said, tugging at Ashton's hand. All right. Ashton's eyes were still at the entrance, expecting Catherine to walk through it any second now. With a deep sigh, he walked into the movie hall. Ashton took a seat, leaving his first two on his right empty for Catherine and Hudson. Callie was planted onto his left, followed by Laura and his other friends. I don't think they'll be able to make it on time, spoke Callie, causing Ashton to feel annoyed at her. He took out his phone and started typing on it. Ashton, where are you? Catherine, we are almost there, just five minutes away. He sighed and kept fidgeting his phone between his fingertips. I hope she makes it before the movie starts. Are we late? Ashton recognized that familiar sweet voice without having to look at her. She heaved breathlessly, standing next to Ashton. Nope, you are just on time. Ashton's eyes were twinkling once again and he patted the seat next to him. She smiled at him and placed herself beside him. Hudson followed her quickly. Hi, she said, turning to him. The hall was dark, nevertheless her eyes shone like the brightest star in a clear night sky. Hey, he said tucking her strand of hair behind her ear. Hi, everyone. Catherine leaned forward to greet all the others, and they all waved back at them. We thought you two weren't going to make it on time, spoke Callie. We thought the same thing, too, but Hudson made sure to drive here as fast as possible, she said, patting his shoulder and settling back on her seat. Within seconds, the movie started to play. Ashton, not being a big fan of movies, already started feeling bored somewhere after 20 minutes from the start. He would always prefer to read books for hours instead of watching a movie. He felt to be a total waste of time. He leaned his head against the back rest of his seat and turned towards Catherine, who was immersed in the movie. Her eyes were wide and her hands were slowly bringing a piece of popcorn to her mouth. What did she find so much interesting about this movie? He turned back his attention to the screen and watched those Avengers build a time machine. Bullshit, he thought. He once again glanced back at Catherine and let out a breath. How can someone look so adorable while just watching a movie? He sat next, thinking to her, placing his palms under his chin for support. Who cared about the damn movie? She looks much more entertaining. As if feeling Ashton's eyes boring holes through her spirit, Catherine turned her gaze towards him, and instantly their eyes were locked with each other's. Ashton's hand slowly crawled on the armrest until it was in close proximity to Catherine's baby-soft hand. He took her hand softly in his, as if she was the most delicate flower before his fingers intertwined with hers. His gaze on her was so intense that she could feel the rush of adrenaline in her veins. Her cheeks went into a shade deeper than cherries. She felt her breath skyrocketing and immediately lowered her head shyly, unable to match her eyes with his. 
She was surprised at how he could make her feel things that she had never felt before with just a simple touch. Callie noticed their interlaced hands and the thick tension lingering between the pair. She felt a slight pang of something in her heart which she couldn't figure out exactly. She quickly shifted her gaze away, forcing a smile on her lips. Ashton was feeling smug, knowing he could do all of that to Catherine. He wouldn't say he was completely immune to her innocent reactions. Her crimson cheeks were driving him crazy from the inside. Her baby pink lips were curved up into a small smile, and Ashton had never witnessed anything so irresistible before. He wished to run his fingers into her thick locks and devour those juicy lips until it left her breathless. He shook his head slightly in order to drive away those insanely wild thoughts from his mind. It was too early for him to do those things to Catherine. She wasn't any ordinary girl who would throw herself at Ashton. She was Catherine, and he would happily wait for her until she was ready for him, just the way he was. After the movie, the group decided to grab dinner at Burger Inn. They took the huge table next to the glass wall. Ashton never for a minute left Catherine's side. Noah was sitting on Ashton's right, and when Catherine was about to grab a seat, Ashton pulled her beside him, causing Callie to occupy a chair opposite to Ashton. For the very first time in their friendship, she wasn't next to her best friend, and she was definitely not happy about it. She watched how they were lost in their own world, talking among themselves and laughing often. They were clearly paying no heed to anyone around them. While Callie found it difficult to understand her own feelings, Judy could clearly see the insecurities perceptible in Callie's eyes. This is just going to be the best drama of the millennium, she thought, while taking a sip of Coke from her cup. After dinner, the friends decided to call it a night. Ashton drove Laura, Callie, and Catherine in his car. Callie sat on the passenger seat and looked at Ashton. He held a smirk on his lips, paying just a little attention on the road and more on Catherine from the rearview mirror. She turned back at Laura and Catherine, who were at the back seat, busy talking about how much they enjoyed the night. The Ashton she knew would always be talking and laughing with her during the whole ride back home. What had this girl done to him? It seemed as if he had completely changed into another person. Ashton and Catherine were standing outside her hostel after dropping Laura at her home. Don't go yet. Ashton tugged at Catherine's hand. Maybe we can drop Callie and then go on a long drive before I drop you back here. Callie was waiting in Ashton's car for him to drive her back home. I would love to go with you, but it's already past the entry time. I need to go, Catherine said with an apologetic look on her face. All right then, see you at school tomorrow, he said, placing a chaste kiss on her cheeks before letting her walk inside the campus. Callie was unusually silent on their way back home, and Ashton was too lost to even notice it. He kept thinking about Catherine, and there was a permanent grin etched on his lips. He suddenly remembered about Callie and realized that he hadn't had a proper conversation with her the entire evening. You okay, Cals? You look very quiet he asked as he stopped the car outside her mansion. Finally, he remembered to notice me. She was annoyed at him but couldn't figure out why. I'm fine, it's just the headache is killing me, she lied, massaging his temples. I'll be okay. Good night, she said, forcing a smile, not wanting to look like a bitch. Night, see you at school. Bye. Ashton waved at her before driving away. Callie went straight to her room and slammed her door behind her. She had never felt so miserable. Shouldn't I be happy for my friend? But why is it that I feel my stomach to be in knots? Why do I feel like I'm losing my Ashton? Catherine was excited to start her new life in Richmond High School as Ashton's girl. She had never been so happy in her whole 17 years of existence. It had been little more than three months since she started dating Ashton. The whole school witnessed how crazy Ashton was about Catherine. Anyone who thought that Ashton and Callie were a thing were proved wrong after seeing Catherine and Ashton's closeness. She slowly opened to him about her rough childhood with Ashton, which made him realize the hardships she had been through, and he understood the grounds for her insecurities. Ashton made sure to take her on frequent dates and made her feel special, and when they were not together, he would text her and it would continue till post-midnight. Catherine, Anne, and Hudson were officially included in Ashton's friends group. From sharing some tables for lunch to going for games, they started doing everything together. Catherine was learning to be more comfortable with Ashton's friends. For her, Laura was always pleasant to be around, but no matter what she did, she couldn't be close with Judy and Callie. She could never understand why Judy was always distant and cold towards her. Callie was never rude to her, but Catherine felt that Callie was trying hard to mask her true feelings with those fake smiles which did not reach her eyes. 
Callie was fighting hard not to look like a hurt and jealous best friend, but she did not know it would be so hard to pretend. The only solution was by spending time away from Ashton. So she started dating Felix, her senior, and a pass out of Richmond High in order to take her mind off Ashton. Ashton, being the caring friend that he always was, warned Felix not to hurt his best friend if he wished not to get kicked on the ass. Ashton's lake house plan, which kept on being postponed due to some or the other reasons, had been finalized to happen on the upcoming weekend. He had taken Catherine on several date nights after that very special first one, but he was really thrilled to take her to his lake house. After finishing his last class for the week, Ashton met shortly with Catherine near the parking lot before he headed back to his mansion to pack his things for the weekend trip. His parents had informed the maids working at the lake house about their arrival. They were asked to clean the lake house and take care of all their needs, including food and stay. Catherine shoved the last piece of cloth into her travel bag before looking around to check if she had everything needed for the trip. She heaved a long sigh and perched on her bed while fiddling with her phone. She was really going on this trip with Ashton. A couple of months ago, she had shown an obstinate refusal to go anywhere with him, but now everything seemed to have changed. He caused her to change her opinion about affluent people. She realized that not all rich people were like her father and that she could still trust some of them. She always presumed that being in a relationship would always be a hindrance to her education, but Ashton once again proved her wrong. Ashton did nothing to distract her from her studies, rather he was being encouraging and motivating at many times. He inspired her to do things that she never thought she could do earlier. He helped her in shortlisting colleges which she could afford with her savings. She believed that in a healthy relationship, you would want someone who would build with you, not take from you. He was exactly that kind of person, and she never knew she could trust someone so much until she met Ashton. She was interrupted from the river of thoughts by the buzzing sound of her mobile, and it was Ashton who had called her. She knew he was down, waiting for her. She picked up her travel bag and flung it over her shoulder before locking her room. As she walked out, she saw him scrolling down his mobile while waiting for her near his car. She immediately felt like her stomach was twisted into pretzel-sized knots. He was wearing a white polo and dark brown chinos, along with white sneakers. He looked classy and confident, wearing his Versace sunglasses. As soon as he noticed her walking towards him, he stuffed his phone into his pant pocket and moved forward to grab her bag from her hand. Hey there! He greeted her with a smack on her cheek, sending electric shocks throughout her body. She tried hard not to blush in front of him, however, she couldn't succeed in her actions. He walked towards the trunk to place her bag. Hey, Kathy! Catherine noticed Mike at the passenger seat, and Anne was at the back seat waving at her. She waved back at Anne with a huge grin. You ready? Ashton asked her, opening the back door for her. Yep. Where is everyone? Catherine asked Ashton as he drove the car towards Laura's house. Noah's picking them up, and we will meet them at Laura's place. Ashton made a short stop at Laura's house, where they all greeted each other before starting their journey. Callie was bringing Felix, and she decided to ride in his car. It was a two hours drive from the city and reached there just before lunch. Noah and Ashton parked their cars and everyone got their bags out before walking into the lake house, which was as pretty as a picture. Catherine unknowingly let out a breathy, wow, standing in front of the awesome looking house. Do you like it? Ashton whispered into her ears from behind. All their friends had already settled into the house. I already like it more than I should, she said, smiling at him warmly. Good, come, let's get you inside. He kissed her temple before walking her into the house. Earlier, if she thought she loved the house from the outside, then now she had no words to describe her feelings after entering it. It was constructed of wood and was lit brightly using vintage bulbs. It had a large fireplace chimney right in the center of the living area. It had several rooms, and the best thing was, the lake was just a few meters away from the back door. Hudson, Anne, and Catherine went around the house to have a look, while all the others just relaxed in the living room since they were here a lot of times before. Hey, doll, how was the drive? Ashton asked Callie, who was snuggled up next to Felix. Great as always, Ash. It's nice to come here every once in a while, but right now I'm famished, she said, rubbing her tummy. Ashton chuckled and went to check in the kitchen if lunch was ready. Everyone sat together and had a sumptuous meal. So what's the plan for today? Hudson was curious to know how they were going to start the weekend. We are going to go fishing in the evening, informed Ashton. After lunch, they left the house and walked for a few minutes towards a small wooden landing where they could find lots of fishes. Let's see who catches the most number of fishes, Noah said as Ashton, Mike, Hudson, Lori, and Callie sat on the edge of the stage with their fishing rods. 
Catherine, Felix, Anne, and Judy stood watching the ones who were good at fishing, cheering and waiting for the first catch. Wow, that's a big one! Everyone cheered Hudson as he pulled out his first big catch. I got one there, Ashton announced, tugging at his fishing rod. By the time they were done fishing, three small buckets were full of fishes. I haven't caught these many in a long time, Noah spoke, pointing at his bucket, which was close to full. They all walked back, and after reaching the house, the guy set up a barbecue at the backyard. Laura and Callie helped Catherine with preparing the herbs and spices for the fish, while Anne and Judy set the plates for everyone. Ashton walked over to where Catherine was with a plate of fish barbecued with herbs. Mmm, smells so good, she said, inhaling the smoky aroma of the fish. How about you taste it now? He poked a fork into the fish and brought a small piece near her lips. She smiled at him and parted her lips to grab it between her teeth before chewing it. Yum, she swallowed and continued. I didn't know you could cook so well. My cousins and I used to help my grandmother in kitchen during summers. He shrugged while stuffing a piece into his mouth. You amaze me with your multitasking skills. So is there anything that you cannot do? She teased him while she took another bite from his fork. Well, I cannot dance, he admitted with a million-dollar smile, which caused her stomach to flip backwards. They all spent some more time outside before deciding to get in due to the chilling winds. Ashton and Kathy coming in? Kelly asked as everyone moved inside. We will be in there in a while, Cals. Okay, see you guys. With that, she walked into the house. Want to take a walk? Ashton got up from his chair and stretched his hand out for Catherine. Sure. She extended her arm and grabbed his palms. He linked their fingers together and started walking towards the lake. It was quiet and cold out there. From the tall trees around the edge came not a single sound. No movement of branches, no birds calling. The only sound that was being heard was their footsteps on the gravel. The lake looked as flat as a mirror, reflecting the full moon. As they approached the waterline, Ashton sat down and patted the space beside him. The view is amazing, Catherine said, looking at the moon's reflection. Yes, it is. He picked up a rock and skimmed it over the surface of water, making ripples on the still lake and a sudden splash in the otherwise silent night. We used to come here as a family with my grandparents, parents, uncle, aunt, and cousins. Gone are those days. Now everyone is busy chasing their dreams. You are lucky to have such a big and loving family, spoke Catherine, her eyes manifested signs of loneliness. Ashton held her hand and kissed her on her knuckles. Tell me about your mother. Do you remember her? She was slightly taken back. No one has ever asked about her parents, but surprisingly, she felt like talking to him about her parents. I don't remember her much. After she passed away, I was in care of my granny for a while. She used to tell me a lot about my mother. My mom used to work as a secretary to my father. She was the eldest daughter and a responsible one, too. She had to take care of her ill father and young brothers. She fell in love with my father after a while and got pregnant with me. She convinced my father to get married, but he always thought that she had trapped him with the pregnancy. She tried a lot to stay in the marriage since it meant a lot to her. But as time passed, she learned about several mistresses my father had. He left us when I was three, I guess. I don't remember it, actually, but I heard she fell into severe depression after that. She fell silent for a few seconds. Ashton kissed her knuckles once again in an encouraging manner, asking her to continue. I have a picture of hers. She looks so beautiful in it. At times, I would be very angry on her for being so selfish and not thinking about me before deciding to give up on her life. She could have been there for me if she was strong enough. I wouldn't have had to spend my childhood in a home with no one to look after me. She could have raised me without my father's support, but I guess she hated me. She must have thought that I was the reason for her miserable marriage life. That's why she left me alone in this cruel world. Streaks of tears were rolling down her cheeks. Shh, it's okay. Look at you now. You are so brilliant and successful even without anyone to support you. Don't you ever think you are alone anymore? You have us, Ashton said, rubbing his hands over her arms to comfort her as she leaned her head on his shoulder. For the first time, he witnessed Catherine in such a vulnerable state. She was such a beautiful soul and he couldn't digest the fact that the world had been so unfair to her. They just lost a wonderful daughter. You have me to take care of you. He did not know where that came from, but he had never been so sure about anything like that before. Catherine looked up into his eyes and there was a sense of assurance and warmth, in which she wanted to drown. After that heart-rendering talk, they fell into a long silence, what she would call a comfortable silence. They continued to look into each other's eyes. Catherine had managed to intrigue him right from the first moment he laid eyes on her. He knew from being with her that she was perfect in everything she did, 
She was beauty and brains, yet she was the most humble creature he has ever known. She was scared of getting hurt. So she often wore a mask to keep the world at an arm's distance, but truth was, within this plucky and lion-hearted girl, he had a lonely child who craved for love and care. He bent forward and he tilted her face up by placing his finger on her chin. He stared at those inviting lips for too long and unintentionally she moistened them with her tongue. He gulped loudly before moving closer to her lips very slowly, inch by inch, scared that she would turn away. Catherine's heart was drumming against her chest, however. She wanted him to kiss her. She was aware that Ashton had waited more than enough for her, and now it was time for them to move forward in their relationship. She knew that it would be the right thing to do at that moment. She parted her lips as she found it to be a difficult task to breathe through her nose anymore and stretched her neck more towards him. Taking it as a go signal, Ashton buried his hand in her thick brown locks like he always wanted to. His eyes never leaving hers, he pressed a gentle kiss on her soft lips. It felt like a feather landing on her lips. She closed her eyes as their lips glided again each other. For him, she tasted like honey, sweet and pure. Her arms raised up and snaked around his neck, earning a groan from his. She buried her hands in his short hair at the back of his head, pressing his moor against her lips. They could hear each other's heartbeat in that silence of the night. They pulled away as they were out of breath, and he looked into her eyes once again. Any little amount of sadness was replaced with excitement and high spirits. He connected their foreheads and remained close to her for what felt like eternity. Kaylee stood at the window of a room that the girls were supposed to share for the night. She stared with teary eyes at Ashton and Catherine, who were literally eating each other's face. She felt the anger seep through her veins. She was pissed off at Ashton for not seeing her like he did Catherine. She was pissed off at Catherine for meddling up their friendship. She walked out of her room and knocked at the door where Felix was staying. He opened the door and let her in. Take me now, she said, slamming the door behind her. If she wanted to forget Ashton, it would be impossible only by sleeping with somebody else. For the past year, Catherine was walking on air, discovering happiness and solace in her newfound relationship with Ashton. Ashton was seen happy, like a child with a new toy. When he was just four months away from his graduation, he knew that it was more than just dating that was going on between them, but he did not want to rush into conclusions yet. He wanted to see how things would turn out between Catherine and him once he moved out off Manhattan. Would they be able to keep up a long-distance relationships? Until then, he wanted to spend as much time as possible with her and get to know her more. He spent more time with Catherine before he joined the University of California to pursue his bachelor's in business. He would lose interest in her once he moves away from her, and when he meets really beautiful blonde chicks, Judy once said to Callie. Callie shot a glance at her friend, not for saying he would move on from Catherine, but that he would fall for blonde chicks. Don't wish bad for him, Judy. She faked a stern tone, but deep inside, her heart, she hoped to see that day soon so she could take her rightful place next to Ashton as his girl for once and for all. She was stupid to think that whatever bond she shared with Ashton was just friendship and nothing more. Arrival of Catherine had made her realize that she had always been in love with Ashton, and she wanted her stupid best friend to realize that soon too. Judy rolled her eyes as she sensed that the tone of her words did nothing to coat her real intentions at her heart. Though Callie had never shared her really intentions with anyone, the hurtful stares and all the nail chewing that she did whenever she watched the couple together never went unnoticed by the sly Judy. Just a few weeks prior to his departure, Callie informed Ashton one evening that she was going to the same university as him to study fashion and designing. Really? But didn't you want to attend Manhattan Liberal College of Arts? He asked her, being seated at the couch in his house. Yeah, I wanted to, but California Fashion School sounds much more convincing to me right now, and that way I don't have to stay away from my buddy, she said with a playful pout. Ashton smiled at her and didn't ponder much into the matter. Where have you planned to stay? She asked, so that she can decide it on her accommodation. She was desperately trying her luck to make him see her more than just a childhood friend. I've rented a two-bedroom apartment near the university campus. What about you, Cal's? Where are you planning to stay? Can I share your apartment? She wanted to ask him, but she couldn't muster up the courage for that. She swallowed a few more times before opening her mouth. I haven't decided yet, Ash. It's also last minute. She couldn't look at him when she said that. When did she start lying to her best friend? She had been planning to go to California with him, this, for months now. You know, it would be safe if you take a room in the campus. 
I don't think it is a good idea to rent an apartment all alone in an unknown city. She was happy that he still cared for her like he always did, but her heart spasmed, knowing that he had no intentions of sharing a place with her. However, she thanked God silently for not making a fool out of herself by asking him that question which she had in her mind. It would have put both of them in an awkward situation, and it was the last thing she would have wanted. I will think about it. She brushed it off with a slight nod. The moment Ashton informed Catherine that Callie was going to California for college, she felt like swallowing a huge lump that was forming in her throat. Why did she choose California? That was her first thought. Catherine was becoming gloomy as days passed. She knew it was not fair to stop him from pursuing his dreams, but at the same time, she couldn't stop burdening her heart with melancholic thoughts. She did not want to look like a pestering girlfriend, but her insecurities and trust issues were taking a toll on her. In the last few weeks before he left to California, she tried to remain as away from Ashton as possible. He was going away from her. What if he started dating someone else there? She had grown too fond of him already. Will he break up once he left Manhattan? Her own thoughts were killing her from inside, and what's more, Callie was going to stay close to Ashton in California. Catherine had noticed Callie throwing daggers through her stare at her, not once, but often when they were together. There was something definitely being concocted inside her head. Of course she wouldn't bring it to Ashton's notice. Ashton and Callie were childhood best friends, and she wouldn't wish them to drift apart because of her. Noticing her strange behavior, Ashton took her to his grandparents' farm where he wanted to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with her. Baby, what's it that is keeping your brain so busy? He asked watching her chew her lower lip, which she did only when she was tensed or in serious thoughts. It's nothing, she shrugged. They were sitting under their usual spot one afternoon. He held her delicate wrist and pulled her closer to him so that their breaths were mingling with each other's. Come on, you cannot fool me. Tell me what is bothering you, he said looking into her eyes. I don't know, Ashton, I guess I'm just scared. She answered without looking into his eyes. She feared that she might cry and regret later. Scared of what, baby girl? Can we not discuss about this? She did not feel right to tell him that she was scared to let him go. She was scared that he would break up with her once he found someone else. Baby, by any chance is it bothering you that I'm leaving Manhattan? Are you upset that I'll be leaving you soon? His heart started dancing at the very thought. When he did not get a reply from her and instead she kept quiet, hanging her head low, his face split into a wide grin. She noticed that he was grinning smugly at her grief and pushed him away before landing off from his lap to the ground. I'm sorry, baby, but truth be told, it makes me so happy to know that you are sad about me leaving this place. I guess I'm not the only one who would be missing someone badly, he said sheepishly, rubbing the back of his head. Will you really miss me? It came out as a whisper from her lips. He pulled her once again back onto his lap and wound his hands around her waist. Of course I would miss you, but we will try to make it work, sweetheart. I have never felt this way with anyone. What we have is something special, and I do not want the distance between us ruining it. He spoke gently, kissing her lips. She buried her fingers in his silky black hair. Their soft and innocent kiss turned into a fervent and fiery one for the first time. His lips left her mouth and left trails along her slender neck. Her long and sleek fingers crawled on his chest, sending shivers down his spine. He nuzzled his nose into the crook of her neck, earning a soft moan from her. Capturing her petite form in his large arms, he suddenly flipped them over so that her back was on a blanket with Ashton on top of her. He once again took her lips into an ardent kiss. His hands tangled with her rich locks, and their breathing became uneven. She gasped against his lips when she felt his cold hands against her warm hips. An involuntary moan escaped as his lips started leaving wet, hot kisses along her shoulder blades. Realizing the situation was getting out of line, Ashton peeled away his lips from hers. He did not want their first time to be under a tree in his grandparents' farm. She deserved much better than that. Baby, let's stop before things go out of control. As he looked at her, a betraying flush crept along the sensitive skin on her neck up to her cheeks. Much against his heart, he pulled away from her soft body and sat up, helping her sit up. He sighed loudly and ran his hand through his messy hair to set it in its place after Catherine had been tugging at it a minute ago. You have no idea how much this thing between us means to me. Promise me that you would try to make this work as much as I do. She leaned forward to kiss him on his lips. This was the first time that she had initiated a kiss, and it had surely surprised him. I promise, Ashton, she assured him while rubbing her fingers against his jaws. Catherine accompanied Ashton and his friends to send him off to California. 
Ashton's parents and grandparents were also there to see him off. His mother had tears in her eyes, and she kept dabbing a tissue against them. Catherine tried hard to stay low profile in front of his parents. They were aware that their son was dating this girl from school, but they were always rigid in her presence. After biding his goodbyes to his family and friends, he walked towards Catherine and engulfed her into a tight hug. As if he was trying to make up for all the time he was going to miss her. As hard as she tried, she failed to control the tears that were pooling against her eyes. He took her face between his hands, placing his forehead against hers. He wiped her cheek with his thumbs. Not minding anyone next to them, he took her lips into a long and passionate kiss. I'll miss you. I'll miss you too, she said in between her soft sobs. With a heavy heart, he turned on his feet and walked further into the airport to check in. Callie had already left a week before Ashton as her classes were starting earlier than his. She rented a flat near Ashton's apartment and shared it with a female friend. The first few months were the most difficult phase of their long-distance relationship. Catherine was in her final year at high school. She tried to keep herself actively engaged with her studies. Hudson and Anne made sure to keep her company and never made her feel lonelier. However, nothing could help her from missing Ashton. Laura was still in Manhattan studying business, and she too tried to cheer her up in Ashton's absence. Ashton, on the other end of the country, was becoming busy with settling down amidst his new environment. Whatsoever kept him busy, he never would fail to call Catherine before going to sleep. He would tell her about his day and ask how hers was. He would often say how much he missed seeing her. They would FaceTime for long hours before drifting into sleep. Callie would visit him at his apartment on weekends, and they would spend time going out for dinners with their newfound friends. Callie would happily post all their pictures on her Instagram pages for the world to see they were still as close as ever. Many had even thought that he had finally broken up with Catherine and started dating his best friend. Do you think she's trying to prove something to the world by posting these pictures of hers with Ashton? Anne asked, feeling annoyed by looking at her latest Instagram post. Catherine did not want to answer her question, and she pulled her phone from Anne's hands before putting it back into her bag. Later that night, she had no intentions to call or text Ashton. She was certain that she would snap at him if she talked to him with that shitty mood of hers. She quietly finished her assignments and went to bed when her phone vibrated next to her. She knew it was calling her, even without having to look into it. She made no move to pick it up before it rang again and again. She sighed and swiped the screen to answer it. Hey, sweetie, were you asleep? Ashton asked on the other side. Yes, she answered monotonously. Are you all right? You sound low. I'm just feeling very tired, Ashton. Can I call you tomorrow? All right, baby. Good night. Good night. She cut the call bluntly and threw her mobile aside. He heard the end line. He knew something was terribly wrong. Did he do something that hurt her? He tried to recollect. She tossed and turned on her bed the whole night, but she couldn't sleep even for an hour. She felt bad for doing that to Ashton. He did not deserve to be treated like that. She looked at her phone screen to check the time. It would still be very early in California, but she wanted to try her luck. She dialed his number and waited for him to attend the call. Hello? His voice came groggily from the other end after exactly five rings or so. Ashton, I'm so sorry. She apologized wholeheartedly. I miss you so badly that it hurts me so much at times. I'm so scared that we won't be able to work it out. Her voice was as low as a whisper that he had almost missed it. Baby, I miss you too, but you have to have faith in us if you want it to work between us, he cooed softly. I know, and I'm sorry. You don't have to be. They talked for an hour or so before they decided to end the call. It was time for her class. He knew what he had to do to make her feel better. It had been two months since they had seen each other. He booked a ticket to Manhattan for the weekend. He did not even feel like informing Callie about his plans since he wanted to surprise Catherine in the best way possible. He had asked Anne and Laura to bring Catherine to a nightclub. A nightclub? She asked in a shocked tone. I don't think I'm the right person to accompany you guys to a nightclub. She said, shaking her head nervously. Come on, Kathy, don't be a killjoy. Please come with us. Hudson, Noah, and Mike will be there to look after us. Please, please say yes. And it's Anne's birthday after all. Laura intertwined both her hands in front of Catherine with a pleading look. All right. She hesitated a lot before agreeing to her crazy friend's request. Catherine was dressed in a black knee-length dress with a single sleeve reaching her wrist while leaving her other hand almost bare. The dress hugged every curve of her body. She had left her hair open and wore a black stilettos, which made her legs look endlessly long. Hudson picked her up to the nightclub. She notices that he was smirking at her secretly. What's wrong? Why are you smiling like a maniac? She asked, checking herself in the dashboard mirror. You'll know soon. Hudson smiled at her goofily. 
Hey, Kathy, you look so hot. Someone is going to lose his mind tonight. Laura teased her. Catherine frowned, trying to figure out what she meant while taking a stool between Anne and Laura. She ordered a non-alcoholic fruit punch and nipped at the brim of the glass. Hey, gorgeous. Someone whispered near her ear from behind. She froze on her seat at the too familiar and sexy tone. She slowly turned around and gulped at the handsome man standing in front of her. Ash? Ashton? She threw her fingers against her mouth to cover it. To say she was shocked would be an understatement. Oh my God, what are you doing here? Well, I heard that my baby girl had been missing me badly. He pulled her dangerously close to his body. You look stunning, he said, raking his eyes over that tightly cladded piece of clothing over her enticing body. She lunged herself onto him and wound her hands around his broad shoulders. I missed you badly, baby, he said, kissing her glistening lips. Anne took so many pictures of Ashton and Catherine that night that her mobile storage ran almost full. She did not waste another minute before uploading those cute pictures of them on her Instagram page. Callie was preparing to go to her bed when she received a call from Judy. Hey, Cals, is Ashton in Manhattan? She asked in a teasing tone. Not that I know. He was here yesterday evening. She sounded confident. Are you sure? Because you may want to have a look at Anne's Instagram pages before confirming. Callie quickly checked her Instagram page and her eyes became red with anger. She cut Judy's call and started calling Ashton, but it went unanswered for the fifth time. She looked at their picture more closely. Ashton hand wound his hand around Catherine in a possessive manner and he was kissing her temple. That bitch Catherine was standing too close to him. Her chest was heaving up and down with rage-filled eyes. She tightened her hold on her mobile before smashing it harshly onto her door, causing it to shatter into pieces. That night, she promised herself that she would go to any extent to make Ashton hers. Four years later, Ashton was back to Manhattan for his post-graduation. He also started working as an intern in Schwimmer's group of companies. He earned enough to buy his own penthouse in the city. He stayed there most of the time, but he also used to travel a lot to accompany his father to important business meets. He excelled in both his studies and managed his work efficiently. He worked very hard to create his own identity in his family conglomerate as he did not want to look like an unfit rich heir who got to the position just because of his birth. He wanted to prove to the board members that he was the rightful candidate. He was still as crazy about Catherine as he was when he saw her for the very first time. She never failed to impress him. She graduated high school with distinction, and there was a long list of colleges that were ready to give her a scholarship. Ashton helped her a lot with deciding what would be best for her. She chose a college in Staten Island where she studied electronics and communication. She had saved as much to rent a small single-bedroom apartment. She wasn't comfortable to share it with anyone, and hence decided to stay alone. She often visited Anne, Laura, and Hudson, who chose to remain in Manhattan. Ashton would always join her to visit them together. Their relationship was smooth throughout their college life. Even with his busy schedule and him being shuffling between studies and work, he would never fail to meet her at least once a month. They would never go out without seeing each other for more than two weeks. You become fuzzy like a child who has not seen his mother for too long when you don't visit her. His friends would tease him, and he knew it was true to the core. Ashton would ask her to come to his place in case he was too busy. They would cook together. Catherine would pick a movie and they would settle on the couch in each other's arms, cuddling and kissing. Sometimes they would end up making out heavily before Ashton would pull away from her, much to his heart's disappointment. He did not mind waiting for her until she was ready to share both her body and soul with him. Sometimes he would drive to Staten Island and spend the weekend at Catherine's apartment. He would sleep on the couch while she slept in her bed. She trusted Ashton more than her life and understood how much Callie meant to him so she tried not to bicker with him for silly things that Callie would do to provoke her. She instead started to ignore Callie. Callie came back to Manhattan after graduating from college and started working as a designer in her father's jewelry designing company. She was delighted that Catherine had finally left the city. She broke up with Felix right after moving to California, and she tried dating other guys before finally giving up on dating. She made no more effort to date anyone else except for Ashton, who was oblivious to her desires. She thought Catherine was a cunning gold digger, sticking to Ashton for so long like a gum under a footwear. Ashton's friends often had get-togethers at his huge penthouse, and when it was too late to drive, Callie would suggest to stay at his place for the night, but Catherine never let her insecurities mess up her mind anymore and did not doubt Ashton even for once. 
Michael moved to London to build his career in modeling, while Noah completed college and started working for his father. Judy couldn't get into any college. Being a pampered and spoiled brat, she remained at home idly and started dating George, the only son of her father's business partner. Right after completing her course, Catherine remained in Staten Island, where she got hired in an information technology company which produced CHIP for mobile phones. She was over the moon when she achieved her dream job, and Ashton was more than happy for her. During Christmas break that year, Catherine had planned to stay in Ashton's place like every year. It had been five years since they started dating, and life had never been so wonderful to both of them. Ashton was head over heels for Catherine, and he knew that he had fallen for this lovely girl a long way back, but he had to wait to say those three magical words since he did not want to scare her off. He knew how delicate she was, not only physically but also emotionally. He was aware that Catherine did not believe in love and happily ever after, after their parents' history. Welcome home! Ashton turned her around with such a force as soon as he slammed the door shut that her hair almost hit her face. His hands held her hips tightly and kissed her deeply. His mind-baffling kiss caused her to melt and loosen the grip on her bags, making it slip out of her hands before they fell on the floor with a thud. I missed you so much, baby. He didn't have to say that because his kiss was so intense and pretty much enough for Catherine to show how much he missed her. She gave in and deepened the kiss further, twining her hands around his neck. I missed you too, she said breathlessly. Go get dressed. Everyone is waiting for us. He let her loose and watched her walk to the room where she stayed each time she visited him to get ready for the afternoon. Everyone had planned to meet in a club just like old days since Mike and Catherine were back in town. Kathy! Laura squealed and hugged Catherine as soon as she saw her with Ashton. Hey, girlies. I missed you both. She threw her arms over on Laura and Anne's shoulders and hugged them both tightly. She greeted everyone before hugging Hudson. Hi there. Good to have you back, Kathy. Hudson was more like a brother to Catherine that she was never blessed with. Her friendship with Anne, Hudson, and Laura was becoming deep-rooted, and she considered herself lucky to have them in her life. Hi, Callie, how are you? Callie was busy talking to Ashton, and seeing that Callie had no intentions to talk to her, Catherine tried to initiate a conversation with her. Good. She forged an unnatural smile on her deep red painted lips. She had changed a lot in those five years, Everything about her looked different. The way she looked, the way she dressed, the way she talked. There was nothing left in her that reminded Catherine of that sweet girl who welcomed her as a friend a few years ago. She had grown a lot more colder than Judy. She shrugged and walked back to her other friends. She did not intend to spoil the night with any kind of negativity. They spent the evening drinking, laughing, and catching up on each other. Ashton had a bright smile on his face and he wound his arm around her waist the whole time protectively. Catherine looked amazingly beautiful in that maroon off-shoulder dress that she was wearing, and he was very certain that she made heads turn in her direction. He knew many of the men, and also some women around them were fantasizing to be her partner, but he was proud to be the one next to her. She was laughing at a joke that Noah was telling them when out of nowhere, Ashton pulled her closer and kissed her lips as if to claim her as his in front of everyone, leaving her blushing deeply. What was that for? She asked shyly, tucking her hair behind. Should there be a reason to kiss you? He cocked his thick brows, pulling her closer to him and kissing her once again. She shook her head as if to clear the fog that was forming on her dazed mind and then smiled at him. Not really. I would kiss you whenever I want to. He whispered against her lips seductively, sending sparks down to her existence. He grinned smugly, knowing she was melting in his arms before steadying her back on her seat. He placed a chaste kiss once, then again and once again before letting her go. Oh, how much he loved to make her turn crimson with those wild kisses. Hey, doll, you got a minute? I have something to tell you, Ashton said, grabbing the chair next to Callie, feeling nervous. He looked around to check if Catherine was anywhere near them, and when he saw her walking to the ladies' room with Laura and Anne, he let a deep breath. What is it, Ash? Her eyes gleamed brightly as soon as she got the attention from Ashton that she had been craving since he entered the club. I've been wanting to tell this from a very long time. He swallowed several times before continuing further. Just didn't get the right moment, he blurted nervously. Her heart began to beat crazily against her chest. Was he finally going to confess his feeling for me? Her palms became sweaty and moved on the edge of her seat, trying to grab his hand in her palms. He looked down and shot a breath, taking a smile at her. I, I am, well, he trailed off once again. Ashton, come on, what is it? He huffed. All right, all right. He raised his hands in front of him to calm her down. Callie, 
I don't know how to say this to you, but I have fallen in love. When Callie walked into the club, she did not expect Ashton to propose to her, but here he was, finally confessing his true feelings for her. She even thought of skipping the get-together in order to avoid Ashton and Catherine. Now that she thought, that would have been the most stupidest thing she would have done. She felt like her heart would jump out of her chest with happiness. I knew you would say this to me soon, she blushed, tightening her grip of his hand. She was unable to look into his eyes anymore. Finally, he had realized his love for me, and whatever he had for that orphan girl was nothing more than infatuation, she thought. Yeah, I guess I love Catherine so much that everyone could clearly see it in my eyes. He laughed, shaking his head from side to side. She froze at his words. He loves her? What the hell? Her eyes felt like they were burning with those tears that were threatening to roll down her cheeks. She blinked a few times and tried to smile. I'm planning to propose to her tonight. I seriously don't know what her reaction would be, but I think I can't wait to confess my feeling for her anymore. Callie, are you okay? He asked worriedly when he noticed a single tear slip out of her perfectly smoky eyes. She huffed a giggle between her tears. I'm okay. They're happy tears. I'm just too happy for you. My best friend has finally fallen in love with someone. She hugged him tightly, and that's when the dam broke and she cried out her eyes, knowing he would not be able to see her face anymore. She quickly wiped her eyes and pulled away. I'm so happy for you, Ash. I've got this for her. I wanted to show it to you first. He pulled out a red velvet box which had two hearts connected by a lifeline symbol. She gasped, looking at it. The brand symbol meant that it was handcrafted by one of the most famous and expensive designers in the country. As he opened it, she saw a huge blue diamond sandwiched between a line of several tiny white stones on each side. It certainly would have cost him more, 30 to 40 grands. She never imagined that she would have to see a day when he would pull out a ring in front of her and say that he was going to propose with it to some other girl. She always thought that what he felt towards Catherine was just infatuation, and it would wear off at some point of time in his life. She expected him to come back to her and realize that they were the one made for each other. She felt like throwing up, thinking about them as husband and wife. I was supposed to be his love, his wife. He would have loved me if not that bitch had entered our lives. She wanted to scream her anger out. What do you think? He pulled her out of her thoughts. Huh? She looked lost for a moment before she gathered herself back. I think it's beautiful, and she would love it. She said that after a great battle with her own heart. What she actually wanted to do was to snatch it and throw it somewhere into the dark where he would not be able to find it back. You think so? Yeah, she smiled at him. Ashton, excuse me, I need to use the bathroom. She excused herself before hugging him once again. I'm really happy for you. She ran to the restroom and shut the door before sliding down against it. She buried her face in her palms and let out all the frustration that she had been trying to conceal for so long. Her body shook violently. She did not mind about her makeup. She spent the next 15 minutes on the floor, crying her heart out before walking to the mirror. She looked at her reflection. She already had huge bags under her eyes and her cheeks had streaks of her mascara mixed with her tears. She looked miserable. She had long realized that she couldn't come to love anyone else other than Ashton when she tried to date much more handsome and richer guys than Ashton. She wanted no one else but him. For Callie, no one could replace her Ashton. It was all Catherine's fault that her life had become so vague and meaningless. I swear to God that I would destroy her. She would regret coming into our lives. She will be the one to lose Ashton and not me. She banged her fist against the granite around the sink. She was not going to lose her Ashton at any cost. He belonged to her, and only her. She splashed water on her face to wipe off any hint of sadness from her face and walked back to her friends. She stared at Catherine with bloodshot eyes which were filled with rage. She wanted to strangle her to death. Catherine was talking to her girlfriends, laughing happily, oblivious to Callie's murderous stares. Don't tell me you haven't slept with Ashton yet. Laura spoke too loud for Catherine's inconvenience. Laura? Catherine shushed her, feeling embarrassed. She checked if Ashton was nearby to have heard it. She has been saving her V card for her wedding night, giggled Anne. That's not true. I'm not saving anything for my wedding night. I'm just waiting for the right moment, she whined, clearly getting irritated with her besties. They kept teasing her until they watched Ashton walk near them. It was time to call it a night. Everyone around them wasted, but Ashton made sure not to get drunk while he proposed to his beloved. He wanted it to be the most memorable day of his life. He wanted to store her reaction in his mind forever. As for Catherine, she never liked hot drinks and always preferred fruit punch instead. That way, he was happy that neither of them were drunk that evening. Hey, babe, time for us to go home, he said, placing a peck on her cheeks. 
All right, see you guys on Christmas Eve. She bid her farewells to her friends. Good night, Callie. Catherine greeted Callie. Night. She wasn't in a mood to put up an act anymore. She clearly displayed her hatred towards Catherine this time and turned away. Good night, buddy. She hugged Ashton and walked away. She looked like she would soak her pillow with her tears. She doesn't like me much. Catherine spoke to Ashton about Callie for the first time. Ashton and Catherine were on their way back to his house. Who? His attention was still on the road. Callie, I think she hates me, she said in an extremely low voice. What? No, she likes you a lot. And why would she hate the girl I like so much? She's just drunk. He had not missed to notice how his friend pushed Catherine away when she was about to hug her. He tried to comfort her by placing his palm on her hand. As much as she wanted to believe him, she knew Callie had always disliked her for being close to Ashton. She smiled and nodded at him before turning to the window. As they reached the parking of his penthouse, Ashton helped her out of the car. He pecked her lips. Sweetheart, you go inside. I've got to review and sign few documents at work. It is kind of urgent and needs to be finished before tonight. I'll be back in an hour or two. He looked down at her apologetically. All right, just come home safe. She smiled at him. He knew that she was trying to hide her disappointment. He kissed her forehead before letting her walk inside the building. He knew she would be mad at him for leaving her alone. She was here to spend time with him, and it was not fair on his side to ditch her like that on her first day of arrival, but he had planned so much for her. To execute it without any flaws, it was justifiable to leave her for a few hours. He drove his car to Schwimmer Group of Companies after stopping shortly at the florist. As he reached the tall building, he parked his car and strode straight into his office. Being a weekend, it was almost empty, except for the security guards who were on duty and his secretary, Max. Max looked at the beautiful white lilies that Ashton was holding. Mr. Schwimmer, I did not know you were coming here today. Is there anything I can help you with? Max asked him while trailing behind him. Yes, I actually need your help with something. He pulled out the drawer under his desk and took out a few boxes which he had placed there earlier. He tucked them safely into a bag and handed it to Max. I want you to arrange someone who can deliver this to my girlfriend who is at my place right now. Oh, and also these. He pointed at the flowers. Yes, Mr. Schwimmer. Anything else, sir? No, thank you, Max. I'll be leaving shortly, he said, grabbing some files that needed his signatures. Catherine was lying on the couch in the living room, watching a Korean drama when the bell rang. It must be Ashton, she thought, before jumping out of the couch and rushing towards the door. As she opened, she saw a stranger holding several shopping bags and a bunch of flowers in his hands. Miss Catherine, these are for you from our boss, he said, handing over the flowers. He placed the bags at the foot of the door. Catherine was stunned into silence, and she stared at the white lilies with confusion. Um, where is Ashton? She asked the man standing in front of her. Mr. Schwimmer is still at work, and he will be here soon, miss, he replied to her. Thanks for delivering these. She smiled at him slightly. My pleasure, miss. He bowed his head and turned on his way into the elevator. Catherine quickly locked the door before picking up the bags on her way back to her room. She dropped the bags on her bed and placed the flowers in a vase. She loved getting them from Ashton, but why did he send these to her suddenly? Thinking that, she touched them softly and walked back to her bed. She pulled out the box from one of the bags and opened it. She gasped as she saw a beautiful army green gown neatly folded in it. On top of it was a small piece of paper. She opened it impatiently and found a note definitely written by Ashton. Hey, Angel, dinner at 7.30 tonight. Put this on and be ready, Ashton. A smile broke on her lips as she read the note, dropped it aside and picked up the dress in her hands. She placed it in front of her and walked to check in the mirror. Ashton had really done an amazing job by choosing that dress, which complimented her skin tone greatly. It would give her a classy look and would undoubtedly meet her modest standards. She opened another box to find a nude colored pumps. She placed them on the floor before opening the box. It was the smallest of them all. As she opened it, she saw a rectangular velvet box and she didn't have to ponder much since she knew exactly what was in it. It was a jewelry box. She kept staring at it and thought of all the possible reasons for Ashton to send her these gifts. It was not like Ashton never gave her gifts before. Ashton always wanted to buy her gifts, but she made it very clear to him that she did not like to receive expensive gifts from him. So instead he gifted her with books she loved to read, music she liked to listen, paintings she admired, and so on. Then why did he send this to her all of a sudden? Was she missing something? Was it a special occasion today? Her mind kept working on it. After a long moment of awaiting, she finally took a long breath and opened the box, only to see a beautiful necklace with green stones on it 
with a matching pair of earrings. They looked so delicate yet captivating. Catherine had never seen anything so mesmerizing before that she instantly fell in love with the fine piece of jewelry. For the first time, she wanted to accept such a precious gift from Ashton. She decided to take a quick shower before putting on minimal makeup. Within the next 20 minutes, she stood dolled up in front of the mirror, and soon enough, she heard the bell ring. She felt nervous as she approached the door. Her palms felt sweaty as she turned the doorknob open, and there stood Ashton, flashing a million-dollar smile which could melt the skin off her bones. She smiled at him and looked down shyly, unable to match his intense glare. Ashton seemed surprised that Catherine hadn't denied his present and instead stood there donning it gracefully. You look amazing. He walked closer to her and kissed the skin under her earlobes. And insanely hot, he added. His breath above her neck was sending erratic sparks throughout her body that she felt difficult to breathe. You look good too, she whispered, placing her hands on the lapel of his suit jacket. I love them, she said, placing her hand on the necklace, and Ashton smiled at her. They shine more when you wear them. He emphasized the you, which made her laugh. You ready? He grabbed her hands gently and asked her. Yeah, let me just get my phone. She came back, placing her mobile in her clutch, and walked out as Ashton locked the house. Where are we going? Catherine asked him. Now, it wouldn't be a surprise if I tell you that. He grinned at her, knowing how much she hated that kind of suspense. She waited for another hour and a half before they reached the outskirts of the city and entered into a lavish restaurant. It had huge lawns, which were decorated with palm trees and colorful flowers. The whole place was lit brightly with warm yellow lights, giving it a cozy appearance. Ashton parked the car and walked out to open the door for Catherine. He took her hand in his and walked her into the reception area. Good evening, sir. May I help you? The young woman at the desk spoke to them gently. I have booked a table in the name of Ashton Schwimmer, he replied. Just a moment. She checked on her laptop after which she led them to the rooftop. As Catherine looked around, she noticed that theirs was the only table placed there. The pool nearby had rose petals floating on it, and the walls around them were lit up with fairy lights. Wow, she breathed out, looking at the candlelight set up in front of her. A candlelight dinner. Ashton pulled out the chair for Catherine and occupied the one opposite to her. They quickly decided on their meal as they didn't want to waste much of their time in ordering the food. As the waiter moved away, Ashton held Catherine's hand and brought it closer to his lips which earned him a shy smile from her. So, what's the special occasion? She asked him. You'll know soon. Oh, come on, not again. She whined like a child, which made him let out a manly laugh. They talked about their work-related stuff. Catherine informed him that she wanted to move back to Manhattan, and he was glad to have her back in the city where he would be able to see her every day. Soon, the waiter came back with their food, and they ate with small talks taking place between them. Catherine... Without notice, Ashton stood up from his seat and walked in front of her. He took her hand and kneeled in front of her. Her breath almost got hitched in her throat and she began to hyperventilate with anticipation. Never in her wildest dream had she ever fantasized something like this. Baby, I really believe you were the greatest miracle that ever happened to me, and there are three words stuck in my mind that I'm dying to say to you. They burn in my heart like wildfire, and it ain't going out. Every time I try, I'm terrified. My hands tremble and my heart races. But I want you to know they are true because they are something that I can't hide or deny anymore. So here I go. Catherine, I love you. I want to hold you tight in my arms and never let you go, baby. He paused as if trying to read her mind before continue again. Baby, do you agree to grow old along with me and spend the rest of your life with me? He held a gentle smile on his lips and his eyes were twinkling like the brightest star in the darkest hour of the night. His hand simultaneously made its way into the pocket of his jacket and pulled out a small box. Catherine couldn't help but gasp at it with her hands covering her mouth. Her eyes were already welling up with unshed tears and she lost the ability to speak. She knew very well that she loved Ashton more than anything in her life and she wouldn't want to spend her life with anyone other than him. But this was all so unexpected. She stared at it with wide eyes for a few minutes, but Ashton almost thought that she was thinking of ways to reject his proposal. As he was about to give up, his eyes caught a smile in her baby soft lips that he could have missed if he had blinked his eyes even for a jiff of a second. Yes, he heard her whisper in the lowest voice possible. Yes, Ashton. Ashton felt like his heart had started to beat normally once again after a long pause. He let out a huge breath of relief before sliding the ring on her thin and long finger. She looked at the huge diamond ring. It's beautiful, Ashton, 
but I would have still said yes even without the ring. He stood up and held his hand out for her to take it before pulling her into a bone-crushing hug. I know, but it's a symbol of our love, and I want the world to know that you belong to me like I belong to you. Catherine nodded with tears in her eyes. She had never felt so loved in her life. I love you, Catherine, he said, wiping her tears before capturing her lips in a deep and passionate kiss that she thought she was going to melt into a puddle under him. I love you too, Ashton, she replied shyly. She wanted nothing more than to stay in his life forever. He tightened his hands around her thin waist and nuzzled his nose against her neck, kissing the exposed skin behind her earlobes. His kisses were sending sparks straight down to her core. If she wanted to share her body with someone, it was with and only with Ashton. He had been a perfect gentleman for too long, and it was time for them to move forward in their lives. Ashton, take me home right now, she managed to say in between those wild kisses that were making her go crazy. As you say, baby, Ashton quickly paid the bill and impatiently pulled her to his car. The car drive went in a blur with a comfortable silence and both of them throwing loving glances at each other. Ashton felt like his heart was going to explode with excessive contentment. He had never driven a car so fast in his life, but right in that moment, his passion for Catherine was overshadowing his ability to think. As soon as they entered the lift, Ashton pulled Catherine with such force that she collided into his hard chest. She slid her hands around his neck and kissed him back. He nibbled on her lower lip while his hands roamed on her lower back, causing her to moan. He did not mind where they were standing and kept caressing her lovingly. The temperature inside the elevator seemed to suddenly shoot up. By the time they reached his apartment, Catherine was a hot mess with her lipstick smudged and strands of hair sticking out from her loose bun as a result of Ashton fisting them while devouring her lips. He kicked the door close and carried her in his arms, making her yelp in surprise. His eyes not even once left hers as he made his way to his bedroom. She turned around and gasped when she saw the rose petals spread across the huge bed with scented candles all over the place, giving the room a golden glow and cozy feeling. How? When? Did you? She pointed at their surroundings, not able to continue with her questions. I have my means, baby. He winked at her before placing her carefully on his bed. He descended down slowly and kissed both her eyes, pecked the tip of her nose, and nibbled on her lower lips. He caressed and treasured her body. She twined her arms around his neck and pulled him into a fevered kiss which displayed an equal amount of passion she had for him. She sat up on the bed and hurriedly unbuttoned his shirt, kissing him all the while. The faintest self-control that she had previously seemed to have flown out of the window, and all she wanted was for Ashton to make love to her. She did not want to wait any more. His kiss became fierce and more demanding. He left a trail of kisses down the line of her throat and biting on her skin gently, making her moan pleasantly. Baby, I should stop here. When Ashton felt like they were about to cross their limits, he tried to pull away from her like he did always, but was stopped by Catherine immediately. He stared at her with confused eyes. Ashton, please don't stop. She stopped and hesitated a little before speaking again. Make me yours. She whispered against his lips. He could witness a combination of the love and longing in her words. Baby, are you sure about this? He had to think twice before acting on impulse. Sure, she was drunk in love, but he did not want her to regret it later. I have never been so sure about anything, she breathed out before pulling him down towards her. He was torn between taking her and stopping himself from hurting her. He laid her down slowly and kissed his way down to the valley between her bosom. He wrapped his hands under her and she arched her body slightly so that he could unzip her dress before peeling it off her body. He ran his hands all over her body, setting it on an untamable fire of desire. He caressed and worshipped every inch of her body, sending electric shocks down her core. He slid himself until he felt her barrier, and he suddenly stopped himself from moving any further, afraid of hurting her. When he saw her open her eyes and nodded at him encouragingly, he moved slowly. Baby, this is going to hurt, he said, caressing her cheeks. She held on to his arms for support, and he thrust it in with utmost care. You feel like heaven, darling, he murmured against her lips. His eyes were turning a shade deeper with lust, yet there was gentleness in them. He buried his face into the crook of her neck, inhaling her sweetness. As he broke through her, his lips came back to her lips, swallowing her cries. Oh God, Ashton, she moaned after a few minutes of pleasure as she felt her arousal building up at the pit of her stomach. He took her higher with each of his thrusts and made love to her that night. 
He intertwined their hands above her head and kissed her deeply. I love you so much, Catherine. He spoke through gritted teeth. That was all it took to send her to the edge of her sanity before she broke into a million pieces. I love you, Ashton, she moaned, and soon enough she heard him groan as he hit his climax and collapsed on top of her. That was amazing. You are amazing. I love you so much. He pecked her lips lightly. He looked thoroughly satiated and she felt an unfamiliar warmth spread all over her heart. They laid comfortably basking in the silence around them. You okay, baby? She smiled as he asked her with so much concern in his eyes. She was too exhausted to even say yes, and so she just nodded her head before he pulled and cocooned her against his muscular chest. He covered their naked bodies with a silk sheet while kissing her forehead. Catherine walked out of the bed towards the bathroom wearing Ashton's huge shirt. Even after folding them a few times, the sleeves looked long and were hanging loose around her arms. A few minutes later, she walked back to their bed where Ashton was sleeping soundly. He was lying on his stomach with his limbs stretched across the whole mattress. Catherine sat on the edge of the bed while running her fingers on his unruly hair that fell on his forehead. She watched him with a sweet smile on her lips. Ashton seemed relaxed while sleeping with his mouth slightly open that she almost did not have the heart to wake him up, but he had literally begged her to wake him up as soon as the sun's first rays hit the sky, since he had to attend an important meeting with the board of directors. It had been almost six months after Ashton proposed to Catherine. She still remembered it as if it had happened only yesterday. It was the most romantic and also the most erotic night of her life. Her friends were so happy for the couple that Anne and Laura had almost started planning their wedding right away. Ashton did not want to get married before building a prolific career for himself. For now, he just liked being in a committed relationship with Catherine, nothing more. Catherine was transferred about four months later to Manhattan, where her company's headquarters was situated. She quickly and happily pounced at the offer of coming back where she could be with Ashton and her other friends without having to go back. It was impossible for Ashton to let Catherine go back to Staten Island after tasting the heavenly gift of physical intimacy with her. At work, he would sit counting the days for weekends to approach so that he could be with her. They had dealt with their long-distant relationship for too long, and they weren't willing to be away from each other any further. Ashton, wake up, she nudged at his biceps. You're going to be late for your meeting. Go away, let me sleep, he groaned and turned toward the wall. He was dog-tired after those three rounds of love making with Catherine from the previous night. She had tried to remind him of his meeting the next morning, but his stupid brain was so clouded with lust that he couldn't think straight. He just couldn't get enough of her. She was like an enchantress on bed, he thought. Ashton? She started pulling at the sheets that covered his lower half. Geez, can't man have a proper night's sleep in this house? He said, turning towards her with droopy eyes and a frown on his forehead. He looked so cute with that pout on his lips that Catherine felt like kissing them, but she knew that if she did so, he would make her melt in his arms and that would lead to another passionate session, which in turn would make him late for work. We both could have had enough sleep, but you had other plans. All right, sleep if you want to be late for your meeting. She started to get up from the bed when he pulled at her wrist, causing her to fall on him. He didn't waste any time in capturing her petite body in his arms. Their faces were just inches apart when he released her hair from the loose bun, making it cascade down, covering their faces. His large palm cupped her face, and his thumb rubbed her cheeks gently. What shall I say? You are so beautiful and hot, too. He whispered against her lips, making her gulp loudly. He buried his hands in her silky long hair that were literally making him go crazy. He pulled her down and devoured her lips, her hands tangled in his short hair at the back, making him groan and flip under him. She knew this was exactly what she thought was going to happen, not that she was complaining. Her lustful eyes and pink blushing cheeks were causing him to think that he would explode any moment now. His breath tickled at her throat, which sent shiver all over her body. He suddenly pulled away and stared at her. She had her neck stretched up, anticipating a kiss from him, but when she realized that she wasn't getting any, she slowly opened her eyes and saw a naughty grin plastered on his lips. Someone was complaining about not getting enough sleep, but looks like it is all because of you. You are such a temptress, he said smugly. Red crept from all over her neck up to her cheeks. Get off! She slapped his shoulder and started pushing him away when he let out a deep-throated laugh. Baby, sorry, wait, wait! He ran behind her, still laughing, as she stormed out of their room, making her way into the kitchen. She started mixing the pancake batter as he walked behind her, wrapping his arms around her waist, placing his chin on her shoulder. 
She wasn't really angry on him, but she wanted to wipe that smug look off his face. He was such an arrogant jerk at times, she thought. Baby, don't be mad at me, he said, tightening his grip around her. She still didn't budge and remained quiet. He turned her slowly so that she was now facing him and took her lips into a sensual kiss, making her go weak in his arms. I love you, Kathy, he murmured. I love you more, she replied back with a heartwarming smile. I have something for you. He walked away and a few minutes later he came back with something in his hand, which looked like tickets. I was thinking that we could take a trip to South Padre Island this weekend, he said with a lopsided grin. Really? That means we are starting tonight? She screamed in excitement. Catherine circled her hands around his waist and looked up. Yep, he replied smugly. That's amazing, but... Her smile suddenly died down as if remembering something. What is it? He placed his forefinger on her chin and asked. I have a presentation to be done in the evening. My boss will be present, she informed him, looking down. Oh, if your boss will be present, then it seems like an important meeting and you shouldn't skip it. Don't worry, I will postpone the trip for the next month. He comforted her by rubbing her arm gently. No, no, don't cancel it. Let me first check with my assistant if he can present it on behalf of me. She picked up her mobile and dialed her assistant's number. Hey, Joshua? Yes? Yes? Can you do a favor for me? She started to explain him her situation. Really? Will you be able to do it? Yeah, sure, I can mail it to you right now. Thank you, thank you so much. See you soon. Bye. She turned to Ashton with a happy grin on her face. He said he will do it. So does it mean we are going on the trip? Asked Ashton. Yes. She looked really happy. Okay, I want you to pack your things and be ready at five in the evening. We will leave at seven. He placed a chaste kiss on her forehead. All right, now hurry up. You have a meeting in the next two hours. Catherine patted his shoulder before she started pushing him to get ready. Catherine spent the whole day briefing the presentation to her assistant so that he would be able to answer any questions raised at him. She looked at her phone, which was vibrating beside her, and picked it up with a smile. Hey, sweetheart, what are you doing? Ashton called Catherine during lunch to confirm about her plans. Hi, I'm just helping Joshua with the presentation. What about you? Have you had your lunch? She asked. Yeah, just had. The plan is still on, right? Of course it is. Catherine could sense that he was really looking forward to this trip, and she wouldn't want to disappoint him for anything. Awesome. Please don't forget to pack that pink silk nighty. You know which one, right? His voice became flirtatious on the other side. Ashton? She scolded him playfully, walking away from Joshua. What? You better pack it. Oh my God, you are unbelievable, she said, shaking her head, making him laugh loudly. Ashton was sure that she must be blushing red by now. I need to go now. Love you. See you soon, Ashton said as he heard his secretary knock on his door. Love you too. She ended the call with a permanent smile etched on her lips. At around five in the evening, she was done packing her things for the weekend when she called Ashton's number to ask if he had started from work. Darling, he spoke too happily. Don't tell me you're still at work, she whined. Sorry, baby, I'm in the lift. I'll reach in 20 minutes, he said, looking at his wristwatch. All right, drive safe, she spoke before hanging up. Are you sure you want to do this? Judy asked Callie, sitting in a bar. Ashton had informed Callie about their weekend plan a week before, and she was too pissed off at Catherine for clinging to him like forever. Catherine sure was a gold digger, Callie thought. Yes, no way I'm letting them go on the trip together, Callie said with a determined look. That bitch had stayed too long in his life. It's time for her to leave him. Okay. Judy started dialing Ashton's number. Callie had planned everything ahead, and she knew what she had to do in order to stop Ashton from going on that damn trip. Ashton was just a few blocks away from his apartment when he received a call from Callie's mobile. Hey, doll. How are you? He stopped when he thought he heard her cry. Hey, Ashton, can you please come to wine and dine? It was Judy who spoke this time. Why? What's wrong? It's Callie. She is drunk. Please, I want you to come here. She sounded tensed. He looked at the digital clock on his car screen. It was 5.30, but he could still make it home. Okay, I'll be there. He drove to the bar where Judy asked him to come. He walked in, and Judy immediately raised her hand up in the air to gain his attention among the crowd. He noticed that Callie was leaning on the table while Judy was standing near her with a worried expression. Judy, what's wrong with her? He asked, lifting her head up from the table. She had been too drunk. Her mascara was smudged. Her hair was sticking out in all directions. She literally looked like a mess. It's James, Judy informed. James was the guy she had started dating after Ashton proposed to Catherine. 
She had brought him along during various dinner outings with their friends, and he seemed like a decent guy to Ashton. He cheated on her. That bastard! He cursed under his breath. It broke his heart to see his friend in such a condition. She must have liked him a lot to suffer so much for him. It's okay, Cals. He doesn't deserve you. He gently guided her through the crowd towards the exit. Judy followed them to the parking. Callie had placed her head on Ashton's shoulder and kept on blabbering incoherent words. I'll take her home. Will you be able to go? He asked after helping Callie sit inside the car. Yeah, yeah, don't worry about me. I drove her in my car. She replied, dangling her keys in front of him. He nodded and made his way into the driver's seat. Catherine sat on the couch and waited for almost 45 minutes before she decided to call him again. And when he did not attend her calls, she called his office landline. Mr. Schwimmer's office. His secretary, Claire, was the one to pick her call. Hello, Miss Watson. Catherine here. Can you connect me to Ashton? She asked politely. Hello, Catherine. Mr. Schwimmer has already left his office. He must be reaching home in another half an hour. Oh, thank you so much. Have a happy weekend. Catherine placed her mobile on the bedside table and decided to pack Ashton's clothes since it was taking time for him to reach home. She did not want them to miss their flight. She jumped on her feet when she heard her mobile ringing, thinking it was Ashton, but her smile died down immediately. As she looked into the phone, she saw Laura's name popping up on the screen. Hey, Laura, what's up? Hi, sweet cakes. Anne and I were planning to have dinner at Burger Inn, and I want you to join us. Laura, I would love to join you girls, but Ashton and I have planned a weekend trip to South Padre Island. I don't think I can join you two. Wow, that sounds like honeymoon, she giggled. No problem. Enjoy your trip, and don't forget to send me the pics. Sure, babes. Bye, take care, Laura said, ending the call. Catherine was getting worried as minutes passed. It was already half past six, and there was no sign of Ashton. On top of everything, he hadn't attended any of her calls or seen her texts. He said that we had to leave at seven, she thought. It was clear to Catherine that they had missed their flight as it was way past nine. She was chewing her nails and pacing up and down her room. She wanted to call and inform her friends, but decided to wait for some more time before doing so. What if he was in an accident? She kept thinking about all odd possibilities. After an hour, she called Hudson and told him everything. Okay, don't worry. I'll be there in ten minutes, he informed before getting into his car and driving to Catherine's place. It was 10.30 and Hudson sat next to Catherine, trying to comfort her. She was panicking from inside, yet was trying to keep calm. Hudson was diverting her mind by having simple conversation with her when they heard the front door open. She knew immediately that it had to be Ashton since he had a spare key and she jumped up on her feet. She was happy that he was finally back home safely. She ran to the door with long steps and came face to face with an extremely tired-looking Ashton. Her shirt was untucked and had creases all over it. His hair was disheveled and looked messy. She walked closer to him and immediately lifted her hands to block her nostrils when she smelled strong alcohol on him. Kathy, he tried to speak. Are you drunk? She questioned Ashton, causing him to stop midway. Hudson came out and stood before Catherine. He looked at Ashton with so much confusion in his eyes. Ashton was never the one to drink out of his senses. No. Baby, listen, he tried to explain. I have been dying here for the past four hours thinking about your whereabouts and you come home drunk? Catherine's voice seemed a bit higher than usual. She was clearly pissed off at him. Guys, I'll leave you two alone. See ya, man. Hudson slapped Ashton's shoulder lightly before leaving him. I had to cancel my presentation for you, and you... you ditched me. Ashton's shoulders were slumped, and he looked down guiltily. Can't you have just attended my calls and informed me that you had other better plans to do? She wanted answers, but he simply stood there, which irritated her so much. Ashton, I'm talking to you. What the hell? Will you shut up for a moment? Catherine's jaw fell open in shock. Ashton had never used that tone with her before. Hell, he had not used that tone with anyone before. He noticed the shock on her face and felt extremely guilty for speaking to her in such a harsh manner. He strode toward her and cupped her face in between his palms. I'm sorry, baby. I'm so sorry. He kissed her forehead. I'm not drunk, I promise. She looked into his eyes. It was Callie. Her boyfriend cheated on her and she took it way too seriously. I was on my way when Judy called me. Callie was heavily drunk and she was too upset to be left alone. I had to take her home and I couldn't leave her alone there. She needed me, baby, he said, rubbing her cheeks lovingly. He wiped the tears which were now rolling down her cheeks. I'm sorry I disappointed you today. I know you had canceled all your plans for me and I had to leave you like this. But I promised to make it up to you and I didn't mean to scare you. Sorry for shouting at you. He apologized sincerely to her. She nodded and tried to free herself from his clutch, 
but he only tightened it more. Baby, please don't leave like this. I know you are mad at me. It's okay if you want to let out your anger on me, he said, placing their foreheads together. I'm not mad at you for ditching me. I was just worried that you were not attending my calls. You could have just informed, you know. She spoke in a very low voice. I'm sorry. My phone was on silent and I totally forgot about it. He had truly forgotten about the trip and about Catherine, who had been waiting for him. He was too involved in consoling his friend. It's okay. She looked up at him. How is she now? She asked him as they walked into their bedroom. She was crying and whining until she fell asleep. But I hope she will be okay in the morning. He looked at the bags which were neatly packed and kept in the bedroom. A tinge of guilt struck his heart. I'm sorry, Kathy. He promised himself slowly that he would make it up to her for breaking her fragile heart. You mean to say she messed up your weekend trip to South Padre Island? Anne asked Catherine while on their way to wine and dine. Anne sat on the driver's seat, listening to her friend. I wouldn't put it that way exactly. She needed him and I wouldn't want to blame anyone. He is after all her best friend and he would do anything for her. There was a slight amount of sadness visible in her tone. They hadn't discussed about the issue after that night except for Ashton's innumerable apologies to Catherine. She did not want to seem like the girlfriend who desperately wanted to go on a trip. She did not want to hold him responsible for the one mistake that he had done. Instead, she wanted to end the argument and move forward. She knew that Ashton could take her on many such trips if he wanted to. Seriously, Kathy, how can you be so cool and forgiving? Anne turned towards her as she stopped the car at the traffic signal. I did not even know that Callie was so serious about her relationship with James that she was left heartbroken when he cheated on her. I thought they were just goofing around with each other. She isn't at fault. Won't you or Hudson be there for me in such a situation? She raised her brow at Anne, who just nodded a yes. I don't think she did anything intentionally. She's just going through a rough patch. We should all be there for her, Catherine said, looking at the road. She actually felt bad for Callie. She was beautiful, and as much as she knew her from Ashton, she was a good human being. But due to some reasons, her relationship with men always ended too tragically. She did not deserve it, she thought. They both got into the pub and ordered their drinks before taking a table for two. They sat there talking and gossiping. Anne told her about this guy, Richard at work, who had asked her out. So, what have you decided? Catherine asked while sipping her orange juice. I said yes. I do not intend to be single anymore. She replied with an eye roll. Anne wasn't that attractive. She was short and chubby with hair reaching her neck. But anyone who was close to her would definitely like her for her charming personality. She had always wanted to date someone, but no one had actually wanted to go out with her, and that broke her heart. Catherine would always console her by saying that she was the prettiest girl she had ever seen, and she just had to wait for the right guy to sweep her off her feet. Now that someone had asked her out, she was over the moon. Wow, that's great. So when is this first date night of yours happening? This weekend. Now, enough about my love life. Tell me about you and Ashton. What about us? You know almost everything that happened till yesterday. Catherine mocked at her nosy friend, who just laughed at her comment. An hour later, they were still at the pub, when Anne's eyes suddenly widened like saucers. Is that? Catherine turned back and noticed Callie walking in with some of her colleagues. She was wearing a very short and revealing dress that clad her body like her skin. They both decided to remain silent and watch what she was up to. She walked to the counter and walked back with a huge tray of liquor in her hands. Her friends were howling and looked like hyperactive maniacs. She looked happy and laughed the whole while that she was drinking. After finishing their drinks, she walked with her friends to the dance floor and started swaying her hips seductively. She was turning her head from side to side, making her blonde hair sprawl over her face. From what Catherine heard from Ashton, she thought that Callie was still sulking over her breakup with James, but the scene taking place in front of her gave her a completely different picture about Callie. A guy walked up behind her, too close in Catherine's opinion, and started rubbing himself against her lower back, to which she paid no heed. It looked like she was enjoying the attention and intentionally ignoring him. Looks like someone is really heartbroken with their breakup, Anne mocked with a look of disgust toward Callie. Catherine did not know what to say. She was beyond shocked. A deep scowl of annoyance was forming on her face. Let's get out of here. She took Anne's hand and walked out towards the car. They remained silent throughout the drive. Anne could sense that Catherine was in deep thoughts about what they saw earlier. As she stopped the car in front of the huge apartment building of Ashton, Anne shifted on her seat so that she could face Catherine. You've been quiet for a while, a penny for your thoughts? She wanted to lighten her friend's mood. She shook her head with a forced smile on her lips. 
I'm just so confused, she admitted to Anne. I know, but don't think too much about it. Maybe she wanted to take off her bind from James. Anne knew that was not what it looked like. The girl had not even a little amount of sorrow in her eyes. I guess so. Catherine smiled at Anne before getting down her car. See you later. Bye. As she unlocked the door and entered into their apartment, she watched a half-naked Ashton standing in the kitchen with a spatula in his hand and a towel hanging on his shoulder. Hey, baby, how was your day? Good, she murmured as she walked to him and noticed the dishes that he had prepared and arranged neatly on the dining table. What's all this? She asked, pointing at the table. I thought we hadn't spent time together in a long while. Moreover, this is like an apology for quitting on the weekend trip. So I thought of surprising you with some good food, he said, wrapping his arms around her waist. She flashed a sweet smile at him. Well, you did an amazing job then. She closed the small gap between their lips, which turned into a heated makeout session. Baby, let's eat first. We can take this to our bedroom after that, he said, earning a breathless giggle from Catherine. He seriously hadn't spent enough time with Catherine after that night. Callie needed him and he had been there for her, comforting his friend. He knew she wasn't close to her parents and she did not have a sibling to share her feeling with. He wanted to be there for her in her most difficult time. They ate their meal, surrounded by a comfortable silence. Ashton did not cook often, but when he did, he would never fail to amaze Catherine with his awesome culinary skills. After dinner, they were seated on their couch, curled up against each other while watching an episode of Game of Thrones. Catherine held a bowl of hot mocha pudding in her hand and kept feeding Ashton, occasionally having some herself. How's Callie? Did you talk to her? She lifted her head to look at Ashton. Yeah, she wanted me to come meet her at her office during lunch. She is still the same. I guess she really liked that guy and she hadn't taken the breakup easily. If only I could beat the shit out of that son of a bitch, he muttered, the last few words more to himself. Catherine fell speechless at that but decided against telling him anything about what she really saw in the pub that evening. After listening to Ashton, she started doubting her own eyes. Was it really Callie that was present there? She wouldn't want to give Ashton any kind of wrong information about his own friend. She just nodded her head and placed her face back on his chest. Her forehead started throbbing with a very powerful headache, and an unfamiliar fear was clouding her heart. Why did she have to call Ashton to her office when she looked more than perfect at the pub? She unconsciously got up from the couch and started walking towards their bedroom when Ashton held her wrist. What's wrong, baby? Huh? She seemed lost in her thoughts. I have a very bad headache. I want to sleep, she said, rubbing her head. Come, let's go and get some sleep. He walked behind her before taking a place next to her on the bed. She laid on his shoulder while he kept caressing her hair until she fell asleep. The following Sunday, all their friends agreed to meet at a newly opened restaurant for dinner. Catherine's mind became chaotic after that incident. She figured out that Callie wasn't really affected by the breakup, but instead was seeking for Ashton's constant attention for some unknown reason. She started to see the once soft-spoken and kind-hearted Callie from a different perspective now. She wanted to deny it to herself, but she really started to despise Callie. Part of Catherine's heart wanted to avoid going there and stay at home since she knew Callie would be joining them, but the other half did not want to let Ashton go there without her, so she literally had to drag herself out of the house. Laura, Hudson, and Noah were already present when Catherine and Ashton reached there. Anne also joined them soon. Catherine was happy that Callie was nowhere in sight and wished she wouldn't join them, but unluckily for Catherine, Callie walked in with a gloomy look on her face Judy was walking in next to her with a similar kind of expression. Ashton immediately got up to greet Callie and led her to their group. Anne shot a questioning look at Catherine seeing Callie's mournful face, which was in contrast to the one they saw at the pub. She looked like she was in some kind of depression with no makeup, which was unusual, highlighting her dark circles and bags under her eyes. She wore a loose pony, giving her a sick look. Everyone except for Catherine and Anne, who had seen her parting wildly a few days back, felt pity for her. Callie was causing Catherine's stomach to turn uncomfortably, and she did not want to even look at her face. She realized that Callie was faking sadness, but what she did not understand was why she was doing all this. Why did she have to crave for Ashton's attention? What's wrong, honey? Laura questioned her, sensing her unusual behavior. I'm fine. Why do you ask? Catherine lied. You look extremely quiet today, she replied. Oh, it's just Sunday evening jitters. I have so much to do at work tomorrow. She managed to come up with excuses, but she really wanted to talk to Laura about this issue, which she had with Callie. She decided she would not say anything right now, but it had to be done soon. She sat there, fidgeting her fingers, not speaking to anyone other than occasional smiles and nods when she needed to. 
Ashton was busy talking to Callie the whole while, and Catherine felt left out. Ashton, shall we go home? As everyone was done with their food, Catherine asked him slowly. Ten minutes, baby. He didn't even bother to look at her while answering her. He was still occupied with his friend. Ashton, can you please drop me at home? I don't want to go with anyone else. Callie requested Ashton with that fake, innocent face on hers. Catherine's jaw fell open at Callie's unbelievably cheap behavior. Yeah, sure, Cal's. Catherine, can you go home with Anne or Laura? I'll drop Callie home and be there in an hour. As Catherine was staring at them blankly, she suddenly noticed a wicked smirk on Callie's face as if she was trying to tell Catherine that she was successful in her plans. Yeah, don't worry about me. I'll go with someone, she replied and walked out quickly, not waiting for his response. Ashton extended his arms to hug and kiss her before letting her go. She was long gone, making him stand there like a fool. He deserved it, Anne thought, before walking behind Catherine. Catherine reached home and waited for Ashton to come back. She glanced at the side table clock for the twentieth time in the last ten minutes. She did not know when she fell asleep. She groaned, turning to her side and stretched her hand, only to find the bed cold and empty. She shot open her eyes and sat up before switching on the light. She looked at the wall clock and it was 4.30 in the morning, but Ashton hadn't come home yet. She felt her anger bubble up within her chest. She took out her phone to call him when she noticed a text message from Ashton. Ashton, sorry baby, I wouldn't be coming home tonight. She needs me. She felt her tears trickling down her cheeks. What did he mean by she needs me? And why did he have to spend the night with her? She threw her mobile aside and tried to go back to sleep. She tossed and turned, but she remained wide awake until dawn. Early that morning, she got up to get ready. She wasn't going to sulk over the matter anymore. She had better things to concentrate on. She took a shower and got into her business suit when she heard the front door being opened. She knew it was Ashton, but she did not have any intention to go meet him. Less than a minute later, Ashton walked into their bedroom. He looked tired as if he hadn't slept the whole night. Hey, baby, he cooed at her. She shot him a glare before picking up her bag and brushed past him. When he noticed that she was angry at him, he strode beside her. She was grabbing the sandwich she had prepared earlier. Kathy, are you mad at me? He said they're looking at her back, but got no reply from her. I told you I wouldn't be coming home. Why do you have to be mad then? She was getting pissed at him. She couldn't believe he was justifying his actions. Seriously, Ashton? She gave him a quizzical look. You take me out for dinner with your friends and dump me there for your friend? On top of that, you just leave a text saying you wouldn't be coming home for the night? How is that even right? Catherine, what did you want me to do? Leave my friend who needs me? Asked you if you would be okay with going home with Anne or Laura. You said yes. So what now? He asked her, shoving his hands into his pockets. He seemed like an arrogant version of her sweet Ashton. How long is your friend going to need you, Ashton? She felt like crying, thinking how they were going apart because of Callie. Don't talk like she is not your friend, Catherine. I can't believe you would act like an ordinary jealous girlfriend. All the tears that she was controlling previously were flowing uncontrollably at this point. You know what? No, she isn't my friend and I'm not fucking jealous. Let me tell you something, Ashton. Callie is just pretending to be heartbroken to gain your attention, and you are stupid to believe her. With that, she left the place, banging the door on her way while Ashton banged his fist on the kitchen countertop. Ashton sat in the meeting room, staring at the projecting screen thoughtlessly. The accounting head of Schwimmer Corporation was detailing the monthly performance and profits of the company, but Ashton had his thoughts somewhere else. He kept trying Catherine's number from the moment she left home that morning, but she wouldn't bother attending his calls or answer to his texts. He knew she was pissed off at him, but what was he supposed to do when his best friend spent the whole night whining about her ex? Callie wanted Ashton to stay with her at her apartment till she fell asleep. He did not want to sound rude to his friend by refusing to stay, and hence they kept talking for a while. Then Ashton insisted on watching a movie to take her mind off that jerk ex-boyfriend of hers. It was almost early in morning, when she finally went to her bedroom to sleep while he slept on her couch. He was so tired that he had fallen asleep till seven in the morning. He then rushed home before Catherine went to work. She was standing there fuming like a bull. When he tried to explain his situation, she walked out on him. He kept on thinking about the incident the whole morning. He was swinging from side to side on his swivel chair while slowly tapping the back of his pen on his forehead involuntarily. Ashton was suddenly interrupted from his thoughts when he heard his father call his name twice or maybe more. Ashton? Hmm, um, Ashton? As he came back to his senses with a startled look, he noticed that all the members of the board had their eyes on him, causing him to raise his eyebrows with confusion. What? I asked if you have anything else to ask. 
His father, George Schwimmer, the CEO of the company, asked him, raising his spectacles above his head. No, sir. He replied, looking embarrassed. He wanted this uninteresting budget meeting to get over soon so that he could go and see Catherine straight at her office. He thought he would lose his mind if she kept on ignoring his calls any more. The second the meeting got over, he hurriedly picked up his laptop from the dark mahogany table and was about to walk out when his dad stopped him. Ashton, can I have a word with you? Ashton stopped on his tracks, pressing his lips into a thin line, and eyes shut tightly. His expression was similar to that of a kid who had been caught red-handed while stealing a candy. Yes, Dad? He turned slowly, thinking what did his father have to discuss at such a crucial moment. All the members of the board dispersed with a gentle nod, leaving the father-son duo alone. You seem like you are in a hurry to leave this room. What's wrong, son? George had never seen Ashton being so absent-minded at work. It's nothing, Dad, Ashton muttered. As a father, he could make out that it had something to do with the girl whom he called his fiancée. George and Kate were very supportive parents to Ashton, but that girl really did not look like a perfect match for their son. He was Ashton James Schwimmer, for crying out loud, the only heir to a multinational conglomerate. What he really needed was an heiress to be his bride, someone like Callie Jones and not some orphaned girl. They thought he would eventually feel bored of the girl and move forward. George had always wanted Ashton to date Callie, but the real bummer came over when he announced that he was engaged to that girl. She was literally a nobody to the business world. How are they going to introduce their daughter-in-law to the world? Kate kept on bugging her husband to put some sense into their son's head, and she wanted Ashton to get out of the relationship sooner or later. All right, I wanted to talk to you about your fiancé, he said to Ashton, leaning on the huge table. He never liked beating around the bush since he was such a busy man. Ashton was surprised that his dad had something to talk about Catherine, but now was not the right moment, he thought. Dad, can we discuss this later, please? I really need to go somewhere right now. George nodded slightly. How about dinner at home tomorrow? You can bring that girl with you. Ashton sensed a slight arrogance in his father's voice when he said that. The girl has a name, Dad. Catherine, he replied. Oh yeah, I'll have to ask her about her plans for tomorrow first. I'll let you know if we are coming. George was taken back by the way Ashton just spoke to him and stood like a rock for a few seconds before nodding his head. Ashton hugged his father and left the room. He reached the building's private parking lot, driving his car out of it. He was aware of how his parents hated Catherine for her status. Her mother had tried to persuade him out of his relationship with Kathy too many times, but she wasn't successful in convincing him. She had said to him that there were so many rich women waiting for Ashton's attention, and she would look for one such fine woman as his future wife. He snorted at his mother's words at that moment. Rich fine woman, my foot. If he wanted to marry someone, it would only be his Catherine. He did not need any dumb and spoiled heiress as his life partner. He smiled thinking about his beautiful lover, momentarily forgetting about the argument they had in the morning. No daughter of any businessman would be a match to his Catherine. She was unique, he thought. His smile faded instantly as he remembered about the argument they had earlier, and he accelerated his car towards Catherine's office. He reached the reception hall of the building where Catherine worked. He walked to the woman standing behind the desk. Good morning, sir. How may I help you? Hello, I'm looking for... He stopped when he noticed Joshua. Catherine's assistant walking towards him. Never mind. He walked away. Hey, Josh. Hello, Mr. Schwimmer. What brings you here? He was scowling at Ashton with confusion. Um, I came to meet Catherine. I couldn't reach her number, Ashton replied. Oh, but Miss Catherine has left early today. She said she wasn't keeping well, Joshua informed Ashton. All right. She must have gone home then. Thanks. See you later. Ashton walked away before patting Joshua's shoulder. He tried to call her number once again, but it still went into voicemail. He drove his car as fast as possible, reaching his house within a few minutes. He unlocked the door of his penthouse, only to find it empty. He checked their room, her old room, everywhere, but she wasn't home. He was becoming worried about Catherine. Joshua said that she was unwell and he hadn't heard from her from this morning. He paced up and down the hall, running his hand through his hair while keeping on trying her number. What did he do so wrong that she was punishing him like that? Feeling frustrated and angered, he drove back to work. As he opened the door to his office room, he came face to face with Gabriel, his cousin, sitting on Ashton's chair. Gabby, what are you doing here? Ashton looked shocked for a minute, seeing him there. Hey, bro, good to see you again. He got up to walk near Ashton and gave him a brotherly hug. I thought you weren't coming back from London anytime soon, Ashton mocked at his cousin. Well, I'm moving back to the New York branch, he flashed a grin at Ashton. 
Wow, man, that's amazing. I'm happy to have you here with me. Gabriel was managing one of the many Schwimmer group of companies at London. They both sat catching up on their lives. Ashton kept desperately checking his phone in between their conversations, and he looked twitchy. What's wrong, man? You look restless, he asked, sensing Ashton's uneasiness. Ashton was very close to Gabby and there was no point in hiding the issue from him. Moreover, he wanted someone to talk to about. It's about Catherine, man. She's upset with me for leaving her alone at the restaurant where we went yesterday with our friends, he said, rubbing his hands on his face, feeling down. Why would you do that? He asked with curiosity. Gabriel had heard a lot about the girl from Ashton, and from what he understood, she wasn't someone to overreact for small things. There had to be some reason for her to do so, according to Gabriel. I, um... He cleared his throat before continuing. I had to drop Callie at her home, but stayed there instead, he confessed. You slept with Callie? His voice was an octave louder. What? No, when did I say that? Why else would you stay at her home? Gabriel asked, looking amused. That's because she's going through a hard breakup and she wanted me to stay with her for a while. Ashton tried to justify. And you spent the whole night with her? He mocked at Ashton. Not exactly the way you sound, spent like, he replied. Man, anyone at Catherine's place would have done the same. Why did you have to be there? I can't believe, even after so many years, Callie is still so clingy to you. Gabriel? Ashton warned his cousin. Okay, okay. He brought his hands in front. I understand she's your best friend, but don't you think it was unfair for Catherine to be left alone like that? He questioned Ashton. Ashton now realized what he had done wrong and why Kathy was giving him the cold treatment. He had somehow made Catherine feel insecure by staying at Callie's place. Shit, man. He ran his hand through his messy hair. Ashton was aware how Catherine's parents had abandoned her as a child and the way she had spent a huge part of her life being left alone and uncared. It tore his heart to know that he had ignored her just like that for the past few days. He stood up, grabbing his car keys. Gabby, I'll... Don't worry, man. Go make it up to your girl. See you tomorrow, he said, waving his hand at Ashton. Thanks, man. He ran out of his office room. Catherine was sipping her coffee sitting at Laura's home. She took off from work after she couldn't bear the headache, but she did not feel like going home. Ashton had been calling her continuously, and she knew he would be home soon. Joshua had informed her about Ashton's visit to her office. She felt bad for ignoring his calls, but she wasn't ready to face him yet, since she wanted to heal her mood behind closed doors. Babe, you need to tell me what is bothering you so much, and don't say it's nothing since it's written all over your face. Laura asked her, placing her warm palm on her arm. Laura? I feel like there's something brewing in Callie's mind. She's acting very weird lately. I feel like she's intentionally keeping Ashton away from me. Last night, he did not come home. And today, morning, he comes home saying that she needed him so he had to stay at her place, she said with a shaky voice. Ashton stayed at her house? She looked at Kathy with wide eyes but then calmed down, slowly, as if thinking about something. I think Callie is using the situation of hers to keep Ashton close to her. Last week, Anne and I saw her in her pub, dancing her ass off with a stranger. She looked completely fine, drinking and laughing, but yesterday she was back to her sulking self in front of Ashton. She blurted out everything to Laura. Laura listened to her quietly. Kathy, darling, why do you think Callie would do something like that to Ashton and you? Catherine looked at her, thinking how to explain it to Laura. Laura, I may probably sound stupid right now, but I feel like Callie has feelings for Ashton. I think she has had feelings for him, right from a long time ago, but hasn't realized it herself until now. I don't think so, Kathy. I'll tell you something to clear this confusion of yours. I myself heard Callie scolding Judy once when she suggested her date to Ashton. She ended the conversation saying that they are nothing more than best friends. She patted the back of Catherine's palm comfortingly. I agree she may be a little possessive about Ashton, and now that she isn't gaining any attention from Ashton like before, she may be doing stupid things to seek his attention on her but never will she want to come in between you two. And we are talking about Ashton here. He is crazy about you, Kathy, and he loves you so much. Even if Callie has feelings for Ashton, which actually is not the case, he would never cheat on you. Don't you dare doubt his love for you. Laura chided her for her silly thoughts. A pang of regret clenched at her heart after listening to Laura. She was right. How could she ever doubt Ashton? She wanted to hit herself on her forehead for thinking so lowly of her Ashton. I think you're right, Laura. I think I have overreacted for such a silly issue instead of solving it within ourselves. I need to go home. He must be worried about me. She looked into Laura's eyes. Laura smiled at her sweetly. Yes, you should. Catherine didn't waste another minute as she booked a cab and made it home soon. She hoped he was back home from work. She was tired waiting for him.
For once, she wanted him to be at home before her. As she opened the door, she watched Ashton's back facing her. He turned immediately after hearing the sound of the door being opened, and the worried look on his face was instantly replaced by a look of relief. Catherine, baby, where were you? He strode towards her with long steps. He hugged her too tightly, not that she wanted anything less. He buried his face in her hair and inhaled her scent. He had missed her too much. I'm sorry for acting like a jerk. I'm so, so sorry for leaving you alone. No. No, Ashton, I'm sorry for overreacting. I just missed you too much for the past few days. She wrapped her hands around his waist and placed her face against his beating heart. I know, baby. Sorry for that again. He kissed her forehead. I love you so much, Kathy. He lowered his head to kiss her lips. He suddenly lifted her up by her thighs before wrapping her legs around his waist and walked into their room. One thing led to another, and soon they lay naked on their bed. When they were finished, Ashton rolled over, pulling her over his chest. The area between her thighs was still throbbing with pain from his urgency to chase his release. It was a sweet pain, though, for Catherine. She lay on his shoulder while tracing the dented lines on his chest. Catherine, let's get married. He spoke too loud and clear that made her lift her head and look at him. Ashton, no, no, I don't want to rush you into anything, Ashton. Oh my God, I feel like I've been putting pressure on you. She started pushing his hands from her body. She started having a panic attack, not because he wanted them to get married, but because she thought she had desperately made him say that. Please don't make this look like I have no trust in you. Baby, listen, it's not like what you think. I've been trying to tell you this from a very long time, but I thought you may want some more time to build your career. But now, I really think it's time for both of us to settle down and have a family together. He placed a kiss on her forehead in an attempt to calm her down. Tears slid down her cheeks before he wiped it off with his hands. He pulled her closer. Please say yes, he said in a gruff tone. She let out a clumsy laugh in between her sobs. Yes, let's get married. He placed a loud kiss on her lips before climbing over her soft body once again. Catherine kept fidgeting the hem of her skirt while seated in Ashton's car. Ashton was finally going to introduce his fiancée to his parents. It was not that they hadn't met earlier, but this was more like an official meeting with his family after they had got engaged. And moreover, this was the first time she was going to his house. After a sleepless night, Catherine was relieved to know that Ashton's grandparents had offered to come for the dinner after Ashton told them how nervous she was to meet his parents. Babe, you need to calm down. No one is going to eat you there, and besides, I will be with you, so relax. He placed his palm on her thigh. I know, but I'm scared. Will they accept me, Ashton? What if they don't like me? She looked distraught, how much ever he tried to calm her down. Kathy, let's first get over with this dinner thing, okay? I hope my parents will support my decision, and even if they don't, it isn't going to change anything for me, he said as he parked the car in the parking lot of his huge family home. He reached forward and took her lips in a gentle kiss, which lasted for just a few seconds before he pulled away. The kiss kind of helped her calm her nerves down. Come, let's get in. He helped her out of the car and intertwined their fingers before ringing the bell. While waiting outside, he looked at Catherine, bringing her hand close to his lips and kissing her knuckles. She smiled shyly and looked away. Soon the door was opened by his mother, Kate, who was clad in a dark gray pencil skirt and a plain white button-up shirt. Her short, straight hair was falling around her shoulder, and she looked elegant with her classy makeup. Ashton! She threw her arms around her son and hugged him tightly. George followed Kate to the doorstep soon. Mom? Ashton placed a chaste kiss on her temple before hugging his dad. Good to see you, son. He patted Ashton's shoulder. Mom, Dad, this is Catherine, my fiancé. Catherine, my mom and dad. He introduced them formally. Welcome home, sweetie. Mr. Schwimmer extended his arms toward Catherine and shook firmly. Ashton's mom eyed her before nodding a hello at her. Come in, Catherine. Catherine gulped loudly before walking behind them. Ashton placed his hands at the back of her small and guided her towards the living room. Kathy, darling! She was warmly greeted and squeezed into a tight embrace by his grandparents, Henry and Jenny. They all sat together, talking for a while before the dinner was served. I knew the moment he got her home that she would be more than just a friend to Ashton. Henry was laughing loudly, thinking about the first time Ashton had brought Catherine home. Ashton flashed a grin at Catherine, causing her insides to flip unimaginably. Seriously, children, I'm so happy that you could make it so far. He looked genuinely happy about their engagement. So, when are you planning to get married? Jenny asked them, cutting a small piece of meat and shoving it into her mouth. On the 7th of next month, Ashton replied. Next month? Kathy exclaimed. What are you saying, Ashton? We have to look for a place, decide on the caterers, designers? 
announce it to our business circle, and so much more. We haven't done any of those things yet, and you say you have planned to get married next month? Catherine sat quietly, shifting her gaze between Ashton and his parents. Mom, Catherine wants to have a simple wedding, so don't bother about inviting our business partners and colleagues. We just want our family and close friends to be present with us. He explained calmly to his parents. Marriage isn't a joke, Ashton, at least not yours. Kate glared at Catherine angrily. You are our only son and the future CEO of Schwimmer Group of Companies. Never in this lifetime we will agree to a simple wedding, Ashton, she said firmly as if warning the young couple. You need to calm down, darling. George placed his hands on Kate's shoulders and tried to cool her down. No, George, if she wanted a simple wedding, she should have chosen a simple man as her life partner, not our Ashton. Mom! Ashton yelled at her rude behavior. The mood inside the room became foul just in a matter of minutes. Catherine shifted uncomfortably on her seat, not having an idea how to react to his mom's insults toward her. What, Ashton? How else do you want us to react? She spoke again. Why do you want us to compromise so much for her, Ashton? Best because I love her, Mom, and I want my family to support the decisions that I make. He dropped the knife and fork from his hands with a loud clank. Jenny and Henry looked at their grandson helplessly. Ashton, please don't. Catherine held his arm softly, asking him to stop arguing with his mom. Mrs. Schwimmer, we are okay with whatever you decide, she said hesitantly, to which he got another glare from Kate. It was obvious to everyone in the room that she hated Catherine. She wanted a suitable match for her son, which Catherine was not, according to her. All right, Mom, you can decide on the venue, caterers, invites, but I don't want you to change the dates. You like it or not, I'm not ready to change the date, he said curtly. Kate, honey, we can still manage to make their wedding as grand as you want. Let us not change the date at least, Henry said in a stern voice, which she probably couldn't oppose. All right, then. Seventh of next month it is. Jenny hugged Ashton to lighten the mood in the room. Catherine wanted nothing more than the horrifying family dinner to get over soon. Her future mother-in-law literally scared the shit out of her. She understood that they weren't happy with their son's choice, and she wouldn't blame them. They were right, in fact. Nobody would want a lone girl like Catherine as their daughter-in-law, she thought. She did not leave Jenny's side the whole evening, trying to avoid all eye contacts with Kate. Ashton's father seemed polite when compared to Kate. He was at least trying to smile at her when she glanced at him. Before leaving, Ashton's grandmother kissed Catherine on her forehead. Don't worry, everything will be all right. I hope so, she breathed out loudly. Good night, Mr. and Mrs. Schwimmer. She bid them farewell and walked to Ashton's car, giving him some moments of privacy with his parents. Mom, I'm really disappointed by the way you just behaved with her. You didn't even try to get to know her. She has no family, and I wanted to give her a beautiful family that would love and support her, but now I seriously think I made a huge mistake by bringing her here. Kate realized what she had done after seeing the pained expression on his eyes. She immediately felt guilty. He took a few more minutes before getting into his car. When Catherine looked at him, she noticed that his facial features were hardened, clearly indicating his annoyance at something, but she dared not ask him anything and remained silent throughout the car drive. They reached home and Ashton strode straight into their room. She followed behind him and heard the splattering of water from the shower. She decided to wait for him. It was killing her to see him like that. Least she could do was console him. She knew the cause of his sudden change of mood. When he walked out with a towel wrapped around his waist, she walked closer to him. She wrapped her arms around his stomach and looked into his face. What's wrong, Ashton? Are you mad at something? Nothing. His monotonous answers were making her nervous. Did I do something wrong? She asked softly. His face softened instantly, looking at the tears in her eyes. Baby, of course not. I'm sorry for making you feel like that. I'm not mad at you, really. He hugged her against his bare chest. I'm just sorry for the way my mom behaved earlier. I'm sorry, honey. He kissed the top of her head and she tiptoed to kiss him back on his lips. It's okay, Ashton. I understand her concern. You are their only son and they want the best for you. I would want the same for my children. She spoke looking into his eyes while slowly stroking his slightly stubbled jaws. But you are the best thing that's ever happened to me, baby, he said, rubbing the tip of his nose against hers. He looked into her ocean blue eyes, which lacked its usual spark. He knew she was upset with the event from the evening. I'm not, Ashton, her voice crackled while she spoke. I'm no match for you. I'm so scared. Scared that we will not be able to work it out together. Tears started sliding down her cheeks. Hey, shh, shh, he shushed her. You are thinking too much, honey. You are the first girl who was able to capture my heart, and believe me when I say this, I don't give my heart to anyone so easily. He replied, wiping her tears. They will come to understand why I love you so much, baby. You are so precious. All I can do is promise to make it my life mission to keep you happy. She let out a wet laugh in between her sobs. I love you so much, Ashton. I love you more, darling.
They stood wrapped in each other's arms, surrounded by warm yellow lights filling the room. The next afternoon at work, Catherine received a call from an unknown number when she was in the middle of a meeting. Am I talking to Miss Catherine? Out came a cold voice. Yes, she couldn't recognize her voice at first. This is Kate, Ashton's mom. Oh, sorry, Mrs. Schwimmer, I didn't recognize your voice. That's all right. Are you free tomorrow? I yes. She lied, even though she had an important meeting the next day, but she could probably cancel it. She didn't want to look rude in Mrs. Schwimmer's eyes. Okay, let's meet at ten in the morning. I'll come pick you up from Ashton's place, Kate informed. Sure, Mrs. Schwimmer. Just call me Kate, she said bluntly. Okay. After she ended the call, she kept thinking why did Kate have to meet her the next day? Was she going to offer her a large sum of money to get out of her son's life? Oh no, she couldn't possibly think a life without Ashton. She would rather die. She left home early that evening and prepared dinner. She waited for Ashton and they ate together like always. How was your day, sweetheart? Ashton asked, enjoying his meal. Good, she replied, and he looked up at her face. Then why do you sound low? What's wrong, honey? He turned his attention completely at Catherine. Your mom called me today, and? His heart rate started to shoot up. She wants me to meet her at 10 in the morning tomorrow. And do you know why? He asked her. I have no idea, Ashton. She said she will come here to pick me up. She was clearly panicking. Okay, I'll call her and tell her. He was shortly interrupted by Catherine. No, 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 Ashton, don't. I will go with her and listen to whatever she has to say. Please, you don't come into this, she pleaded him. Okay, but you can call me if something goes wrong. She smiled at his words, which annoyed him. What's so funny? Ashton, what could go wrong? She's your mother, and whatever she's trying to do is out of love that she has for you. And I'm sure she wouldn't hurt me or something. She said which made him look silly, and he grinned foolishly. The next day, Kate was at Ashton's home to pick up Catherine. Ashton decided to stay home when his mom came. Catherine was ready, and Ashton kissed her forehead before letting her walk out. Mom, please don't hurt her. I love her, he said when Catherine was far from hearing him, for which he got no reply except for a hard glare from his mom. She got into her car and gestured at Catherine to get in. Miss Schwimmer, Catherine started. Kate, she interrupted. Oh, sorry, Kate, where are we going? Catherine asked her carefully. You will know, she replied. After an hour's drive, the driver stopped at a boutique. Come. Kate called Catherine and led her inside. Welcome, Mrs. Schwimmer. We have been waiting for you, and as instructed by you, we have canceled all the appointments with our other customers. A woman in her mid-thirties spoke as she walked them into the lounge area. Catherine looked around the place with no clue of what was going on. This is my future daughter-in-law. I want the best wedding dress for her. Catherine's eyes widened and her jaws were almost about to hit the ground. They spent the next five hours selecting the perfect wedding dress for Catherine. When Catherine walked out of the trial room wearing the dress which Kate had selected for her, she herself for a moment felt that Catherine was the most perfect bride for her son. She walked near her with a warm smile. You look beautiful in this dress. You should take this, she suggested. Kate kept thinking about what her son said to her the previous night. She wanted to get to know this girl, about whom he talked so highly. If she had managed to steal her son's heart, then she was truly special. I love it, Catherine said politely. I will take it. They went on to select the wedding cake, finalize the caterers, and were at a cafe to grab lunch. Catherine, I'm sorry for what happened yesterday. She apologized wholeheartedly to Catherine. Kate, you don't have to. I understand how you feel. Catherine rushed to speak. No, Catherine, you need to understand Ashton is like the center of our universe. He had never been so obsessed with anything or anyone. It just came as a shock to us that he had chosen such a simple girl like you as his life partner. We have never denied him anything, and we always want to see him happy. If you are his happiness, then we are ready to accept you as our daughter-in-law. Catherine realized that Kate was actually a very kind-hearted woman, under a facade of a stern businesswoman. She loved his son, and would go to any extent to make his son happy. They both got to know each other more. Kate asked her about her childhood and felt truly bad for her rough childhood. She realized why Ashton was so head over heels for this girl. She wasn't a gold digger for sure. Instead, Catherine was very brilliant and a self-made woman. Catherine reminded her of her younger version. Catherine felt lighthearted after their conversation and she was no more stressing out to speak to Kate. They felt comfortable with each other now. They were coming back to Ashton's place when Catherine's phone started vibrating again. Ashton kept calling Catherine every half hour. He thought his mother had something to tell Kathy, and she would be back home in an hour or so, but it had been six hours already. Catherine, you should attend his call before he loses his mind, Kate mocked. Tell him that his mom isn't going to hurt his girl. She smiled, feeling embarrassed, and accepted his call. Hello? Babe, what happened? Is everything all right? Where are you? He asked without a break. 
Ashton, we are on our way back home. I'll be home in 10 minutes, she informed him. Okay, okay, I'll wait, he said before ending the call. When the bell rang, he rushed to open the door and saw Catherine standing out alone. He looked around for his mother as Catherine made her way inside. Where's mom? he asked. She had to leave since something important came up. What took you so long? What did she tell you? he asked anxiously. She walked near him, swaying her hips way too much according to Ashton, wound her hands around his neck while Ashton stood there with a questioning look. I missed you. She took his lips in a sensual kiss, which shocked Ashton for a second. What? Catherine, he chided. What did my mum say to you? Ashton, relax. I'm perfectly all right. No, I'm actually so happy today. He stared at her like she had lost her mind. We went to select the wedding dress. Then we finalized the caterers, did some shopping together, had lunch in a cafe. She was grinning widely. Really? You aren't hiding anything from me? Right? She laughed at him. Of course not, and I think your mum is the sweetest woman on this planet, she said, walking towards the refrigerator to grab some water. Women are so unpredictable, he muttered, scratching the back of his head. Yesterday, she looked like she was about to strangle you to death, and here you are telling me that she's the sweetest person on earth. Catherine giggled at him before pulling him into their bedroom. Callie was up all night, like she had been from the day Ashton's parents had announced their wedding date. She drew the curtains aside, letting the sunlight enter into her dull room. She looked out of the window sadly. The morning sky was clear and bright, hinting the end of winter in Manhattan. She picked up her laptop and shoved it into her bag before walking out of her room. Honey, breakfast is ready. Callie's mom, Maria, announced from the dining hall while arranging the table. Callie didn't bother answering her mom and instead walked to where her car was parked. Callie, sweetie. Callie! Maria kept calling her. However, Callie paid no attention to her and got into her car. The sudden change in her behavior bewildered her parents, colleagues, and friends. The once energetic, friendly, and creative fashion designer in her was gone. She became aggressive towards everyone around her and snapped at the slightest chance she got. Callie became an ill-tempered, boring boss to her subordinates. Her mind would often stray during company meetings, and her father David became worried about his daughter. He guessed that it was all because of Ashton getting married to some girl. He knew Callie had feelings for the boy, way before she realized it herself. He had dreamt of seeing a day when he would marry off his lovely daughter to Ashton. He was, after all, the most sought-after bachelor in the whole of America. The two families' alliance would have been the greatest event of the year. But Ashton had to sabotage all his dreams by falling for such an insignificant girl. Ashton was a fool to have fallen in love with a mere nobody. Brought him no fortune, he thought. Ashton would have reached greater heights of achievements if he had chosen his daughter instead. David decided to take matters in his hands, but for that he needed to talk to his daughter first. Callie was pulled out of her deep thoughts when she heard an unexpected loud knock on her door. Come in, she yelled. It surprised her to see her father walk in without prior intimation. Dad, what brings you here? She asked, cleaning the mess on her table. Shouldn't I pay a casual visit to my daughter? He raised his brow at her. Of course you can, Dad. She faked a smile at her dad. So how's everything going, Callie? David asked her out of nowhere. She blinked at him, puzzled at what he was referring to. Dad, I don't understand. What you mean? She babbled. Honey, I'm here to talk about Ashton. He noticed how her eyes widened before she quickly straightened her face. What? What about him? She tried hard to remain cool at the mention of Ashton's name. Callie, a good father, is always capable of reading his children's heart like an open book. He paused. I am aware that you are in love with him. You just wouldn't admit it. But I can't see my daughter struggling anymore. Callie couldn't control her emotions much longer and burst into tears. David walked around her table and hugged his daughter tightly against his chest. I'm sorry, Dad, but I love him. I love him so much that it hurts me so badly. She sobbed, burying her face into his chest like she did when she was a little girl. Sweetheart, I would do anything in my power to stop the wedding if it involved your happiness. I wouldn't have let this go on for so long and would have ended it right before it even started, if you just told me how much you love him. But honey, it isn't too late. Just leave it to me. I'll handle this. David assured his daughter and wiped the tears off her face. You are my precious little girl, and I will go to any extent to make you happy. He kissed her forehead. Love you, Dad, she cried more. David had a plan concocted in his mind to ruin Ashton and Catherine's wedding, but to execute his plans, he had to wait for the right moment. He pulled out his phone and searched through the list of names on his contacts. Hello, came a gruff voice from the other side of the line. I want you to come and meet me at my office tomorrow morning, David spoke to the person. Yes, sir. David ended the call 
and looked out at the busy streets. A few days before the wedding, Catherine's friends held a bachelorette party for her. Laura and Anne were the main people behind the idea. Come on, Ashton. These are the last few days of her freedom. Then she will be stuck with you for her whole life. Let her have some fun. Laura requested Ashton, who was standing behind Catherine with his hands wrapped around her waist and chin placed on her shoulder. No way I'm letting her go with you girls. Moreover, she isn't losing her freedom just because she's marrying me, he whined at her friends. Callie stood there watching the whole scene with so much irritation. Laura, I don't need a bachelorette party. Catherine felt embarrassed to go attend the party and not to mention just a few days before her wedding night. Kathy, please don't be a party pooper. Anne began to push her towards her closet. Go get dressed. Ashton, we promise to take care of your bride, okay? Laura spoke in a mocking tone. I don't believe you two. I am sure you will be drunk by the end of the party. He replied back, frustrated. Callie, please take care of my sweetheart. He suddenly turned towards Callie, who was staring at them, sitting on the couch. She smiled sweetly at his sudden attention on her. Oh, sure, don't you worry. She smiled wickedly, thinking of what she had in store for Catherine. Take care, sweetheart. Call me if you need me to come pick you up. Ashton kissed Catherine before letting her go away. Laura and Anne had managed to invite all of Catherine's friends, which included her school, college, and office friends. Catherine was shocked to find her childhood friends from her home had traveled all the way to Manhattan to attend her wedding. They had all too much drinks. Everyone kept laughing and dancing the whole evening. They even had a stripper arrange for some fun. A stripper? Whose idea was that? Laura squealed in excitement. Don't know, but this is going to be so much fun. Anne replied, grinning from ear to ear. Come on, Catherine, have some of these. This is your night. You aren't going to get another bachelor night. Callie was uncommonly too friendly towards Catherine. Yes, I agree. Judy shoved the glass containing a dark brown liquid into Catherine's hands. Catherine smiled at them and held the glass in her hands. After a few rounds, she felt dizzy and puked a few times. She wanted to lay down somewhere. Since the party was being held in Callie's beach house, she took Catherine to a room where she could rest for a while. Catherine had never had hot drinks before, and being her first time, she couldn't handle even low levels of alcohol in her body. She closed her eyes when she felt like the whole world spinning around her. Get in! Callie and Judy pushed the man into the room where Catherine was sleeping. Catherine was so sleepy that she didn't know when someone slipped into the room. Ashton and his friends had a few drinks and were watching a football game at his penthouse while Catherine was away. Catherine had texted him, saying she missed him, but he wanted her to enjoy the evening. After an hour, he received a call from Callie saying Catherine was drunk and she wanted Ashton to come pick her up. He left his friends at home and drove to Callie's beach house. He walked through the hall and noticed most of the girls were passed out. He watched his steps and went up the stairs where Catherine was sleeping. The side of her bed dipped as the unknown person got under the sheets and hugged Catherine from behind. She groaned at first, thinking it was Ashton, but as soon as her brain sensed that it wasn't Ashton, she began to scream and struggle to get out of his hold. Come on, baby, let's have some fun. She opened her eyes and saw the male stripper pulling her closer to his naked torso. Leave me, let go of me, she thrashed at him. She wanted to throw up at the pungent smell of alcohol emitted from him. He pinned her on the bed by pressing his body into her. The door was suddenly thrown open with a loud bang. Catherine's eyes widened with fear and anxiety. Ashton! She looked between Ashton, the male stripper, and finally at herself. Anyone who witnessed the scene would have thought badly of Catherine. The male stripper's arms were splayed all over her upper body, and she was uncomfortably too close to him. Ashton gritted his teeth and clenched his hands into a fist before marching into the room angrily. He threw the man onto the floor and bent down to punch on his face. Oh my God, Ashton, stop, please! Callie rushed behind him, screaming while trying to pull him away from the man, whose face started bleeding, but that didn't stop Ashton from beating the shit out of him. What's happening here? Callie forged innocence as she eyed Catherine angrily. I don't know, Callie. I was passed out, and I did not know when this man entered the room, Catherine admitted nervously. Her eyes were filled with tears. You shouldn't have drunk so much, Callie shot at her. Catherine was too shaken up to talk back. The next time you think of laying your filthy hands on a woman, remember this. He threw a final hard punch on his nose, which produced a cracking sound of bones. Ashton grabbed Catherine's hand and walked out of the house angrily. He shoved her into his car and drove back to his home like a madman. Luckily, all his friends were gone by the time they reached home. Ashton, I swear nothing happened. Catherine walked closer to him and placed her hand on his arm. How can you be so careless, Catherine? You could have been in grave danger if I hadn't reached there on time. He shouted at her, pacing in front of her like a wounded lion. Damn, I shouldn't have left you alone, he muttered. Ashton, let me explain, she started. 
she felt breathless and nervous, thinking of all possible outcomes. How could she be so stupid and careless? She was getting married in a few days. This could ruin her relationship with Ashton. I wasn't feeling well after those couple of drinks that I had, so Callie helped me into her room, but I didn't realize when he entered behind me. Believe me. She sobbed into her palms before she murmured another apology. Ashton felt his heart being clenched tightly inside his chest. He believed her more than anyone in this world, but he was only worried about her safety. He took several calming breaths. He walked to her and enclosed her in a tight embrace. Kathy, I didn't mean to yell at you, baby, and of course I believe you. I just lost my cool when I saw what he was trying to do to you. He tightened his jaws while fuming with anger. Catherine felt ashamed, even though it wasn't her fault, but she still blamed herself. She could have been more vigilant in an unfamiliar place. You are safe now. That's all that matters. He pulled away and looked into her eyes. They were damp and her lower lips were trembling slightly. He held her and rocked her, trying to calm her down. They didn't know for how long they stayed in each other's arms before he carried her to their bed and laid beside her. It was still too early in the morning when Ashton's phone started ringing. He stretched his arm and searched for it sluggishly. Hello? Ashton? His mom's angry voice came from the other end. What in the hell is happening? What do you mean, mom? He sat up, scratching his head with confusion. Look at the pictures that I have sent you. They are all over the internet, she yelled. Ashton pulled his phone away from his ears and scrolled the screen. His eyes popped out with utter shock. What the? There were a dozen pictures of Catherine and the male stripper lying in an intimate position with the caption, Billionaire's cheating fiancé caught red-handed. Mom, this is not what you think, he tried to explain. Catherine stirred from her sleep due to the sudden rise of his voice. Ashton, what's wrong? She asked groggily. Ashton just raised his hand, asking her to hold on for a minute. Then do the explaining, Ashton. He could tell that his mom was clearly mad at his fiance. Mom, it isn't how it looks. He stopped and sighed loudly. Mom, you know what? I will explain this when I come home in an hour, okay? They knew they were both in great trouble. As soon as Ashton showed the pictures to Catherine, she broke into a fit of tears. How was she going to face his family, their friends, and the whole world with this kind of gossip flying around? She agreed to accompany him to his parents' house, since she had a lot to explain. What's all this? Ashton's dad threw the magazine which landed at Ashton's chest. You have brought disgrace to the family, he spoke, glaring at Catherine. Dad, this is all a misunderstanding. Catherine was not well during her bachelorette party and was resting in one of the rooms when this guy slipped into the room without her knowledge. I have no idea who clicked these pictures, though, but whoever did it wants to milk money from us. Ashton explained while Catherine stood there with her head hanging low. Kathy, darling, don't worry, we will deal with this. Jenny consoled Catherine when she saw how distressed she looked. She shouldn't have attended such parties in the first place. Ashton's parents were not convinced and remained angry at her foolishness. Ashton did not like the fact that Catherine was being interrogated like as accused. He was aware that whoever was behind this had planned to denigrate her name. This would become a huge scandal, but he was not going to let this taunt their future. He brought Catherine back to their penthouse and tried to comfort her as much as possible. All their friends started calling him after seeing the news on various platforms, but they were all sure that Catherine was deliberately framed by someone and they offered their support to the couple. Laura and Anne were too upset for not taking care of their friend. She was now in trouble because of them, they thought. He pulled out his phone when it rang again. Yes, Callie? Ashton, Callie, listen, we are okay. Don't worry, we just need some loan time. She's broken and needs my support. I'll call you tomorrow. He cut the call shortly after that. Callie was standing in her father's office with the magazine still in her hand. She pulled her phone out of her ear and threw it against the wall with such force that it shattered into pieces. What's wrong, sweetie? Her father asked worriedly. He was sure that his master plan would ruin their relationship. He doesn't believe in the news. That means we have failed in our plans, Dad. She looked at the wall blankly. Against all odds, Ashton managed to convince his parents that Catherine was innocent and that she had no involvement with that man. He recruited personal investigators to dig into the matter secretly, but later found out that he had absconded that very night. Mr. Schwimmer, we will keep looking for him. He should definitely come out of his hiding in a month or two, his P.I. assured him. Ashton nodded. His mind was preoccupied with the thoughts of who could probably want to pin Catherine with such a blame. The investigator left him alone in his office cabin, where he shouldn't be spending the morning since his wedding was on the following evening but this was too important of a matter to be looked into. He sighed heavily before gathering his things from the table and left home. 
Due to his grandmother's continuous insistence, he had to let Catherine stay at his grandparents' farmhouse. According to them, it was inauspicious for the bride and groom to see each other until they were at the altar. Ashton didn't take it easily and protested against it at first, since he couldn't leave Kathy alone when she was amidst such hideous and unfavorable situation. She looked terrible, hurt, and scared. She refused to meet anyone after that scandalous rumor started making rounds in various business magazines and gossip columns. He knew the rumor mill would eventually die down after a while, but Catherine was new to this kind of lifestyle, and she took it too seriously. He wanted to comfort her, but she chose to stay away from him for a couple of days until her wedding night. And Ashton, like always, respected her choices. It's just a matter of two nights, he kept telling his crazy heart. After reaching his penthouse, he loosened his tie and threw it somewhere on the floor before slumping down on the couch. He took out his phone and decided to call Catherine, who had fortunately applied for a month-long leave for the wedding and followed by their honeymoon. Hey, her voice came out as a soft whisper. Hey, baby, what are you doing? He asked her. Just taking a walk in the farm with Jenny, she replied monotonously. Hmm, I miss you so much already. He confessed to Kathy, and in return, she let out a giggle, making him smile on the other end. I miss you too, Ashton. He could feel the cravings for him in her tone. Just a night more after that and you are mine forever, and I'm never letting you go away from me even for a microsecond, he said in a husky tone which made Catherine's stomach tickle with hundreds of butterflies. For now, just a kiss would do, he suggested. Not happening, Ashton. Your grandparents are looking at me, she whispered shyly. Come on, baby. I am dying here. All I'm asking is a simple kiss, he faked a hurt tone. Catherine knew it was a waste of time saying no to him, since Ashton would never take no as an answer. She turned around so that Jenny and Henry wouldn't be able to see her actions and teased him with a loud kiss on her phone speaker, earning a frustrated groan from Ashton. He would have jumped into his car and driven to his grandparents' place if not for their meaningless, superstitious beliefs. That will do for now, he said. You let her sleep early, Ashton, unless you want her to sleep at the altar, he heard his grandma shout to him from behind. Oh yeah, she can sleep all she wants now, because after tomorrow I'm not letting her sleep. He spoke loudly, even if Jenny couldn't hear him, making Catherine blush like a tomato. They spoke until Catherine fell asleep, with the phone still near her ear. Dad, what are you going to do? You were supposed to stop their wedding, but I see you haven't done that yet, and just to remind you, the wedding is taking place tomorrow. Callie complained angrily as she dashed into her father's office. Sweetie, you are underestimating your dad. I can promise you that the wedding won't be happening tomorrow. I've planned it all well. Now we just need to sit back and watch the show, he said wickedly, leaning back on his swivel chair. What have you planned, Dad? She asked eagerly. I've hired some men to stage an accident with the car in which the girl will be going to the venue. She will be gone from his life forever. Callie's eyes grew wider as David unfolded his plans to his daughter. Dad, but that's too cruel. She became nervous as he told his plans. She had never done anything so cruel like that before. Darling, do you want her gone or not? He threw a questioning look at his daughter. She stood there thinking for a while. Of course she wants her gone from his life, but she wasn't sure if this was the only way. Yes, I do, she replied lowly. Then leave it to me, he said getting up and walking out of his room. She wanted to believe her dad. He had always given her whatever she had asked for, and she was sure he would give her a life with Ashton in it. Early the next morning, Catherine's friends reached the farmhouse and started to doll her up for the big day. She took her time in an aromatic bath. She dried and wrapped herself in a robe before walking out. Kate had brought the beautician, and she started doing miracles on Catherine, making her the most beautiful bride. Oh my gosh! Ashton is going to go bonkers tonight! Laura squealed, causing Catherine to blush wildly. She wore an ivory floor-length gown with lace bodice, which beautifully exposed her creamy white arms and enhanced all her curves. The hairdresser added a fresh sprig of Andromeda to her multi-layered updo. Her makeup was kept minimal on her request with just a nude shade of lip gloss and highlighted eyes. She slipped her cold feet into a nude pair of heels. She looked out of her window and murmured a short prayer. She wished her parents were here with her on her big day. Fresh tears started to well up against the back of her eyes. She hoped her mother would be watching her from above. Kate noticed the tear-stained look on her face and walked near her, engulfing her into a tight hug. Kate and David decided to believe in their children, Ashton and Catherine. 
In her heart, Kate knew that Catherine wouldn't be able to commit such a grave mistake. She just wanted to find out who was behind this crooked plan. After the incident, she called Laura and Callie to ask about who had invited the stripper to the party. Though it was Callie who had invited him, she said she had no idea, just like Laura. Kate decided to let the matter go until the wedding, but she would definitely look into it later, she promised herself. You look beautiful, honey. My son is very lucky to have you as his bride. Kate dropped a kiss on Catherine's forehead before she walked her out of the house to where the cars awaited for them. Catherine slid her hand into the crook of Henry's arm, who would walk her to the altar. He smiled at her gently and kissed her cheeks. Ready? he asked, raising a brow at her. She nodded shyly and got into the car. Ashton stood in front of the large mirror, very formally dressed in a white shirt, dark gray tie, and a matching striped suit. Feeling nervous? Noah asked as Mike joined them. A little. Ashton answered nervously, shoving his hands into his pants pocket. Soon his father walked in with a smile and patted his shoulders comfortingly. We shouldn't make the bride wait. Come, let's go. Ashton stood proudly in front of the aisle with his hands linked in front of him. He took a deep breath when he saw his mom walking towards him. I'm sure you wouldn't be able to take your eyes off Catherine, she joked to distract herself from crying in front of everyone. Believe me, Mom, I have never been able to do that. Ashton replied and she hugged him tightly. Ashton wound his hands around her small body when he noticed the tears in her eyes. I am so happy for you. I wish you a lifetime of happiness and love. A single tear managed to slip through her cheeks. I love you, my baby boy. She kissed his cheeks and went to sit on her seat at the front row. Where are they? Ashton was becoming impatient with each passing second. Standing in front of the aisle for almost 20 minutes now, there was no sign of Catherine and her grandparents. The guests inside the church started murmuring amongst themselves, making it difficult for Ashton to breathe properly. What could probably go wrong? He spoke to her just a few minutes before she got into the car. Then why aren't they here till now? He kept thinking. Callie grinned at her dad happily from her seat. Good riddance. Now I have to just make him forget her she thought. They were just behind us. I will call them. His mother dialed Henry's number for the 15th time within the last 10 minutes. Cool down, man. She'll be here any time, Noah reassured him. The double door of the church was pushed open, and in walked Hudson hurriedly. Sorry, everyone, the bride's car broke down on our way. We had to come here in another car. He apologized to the guests. The bride's here, he announced, panning heavily. Everyone rushed back to their seats. The next second, the band started playing, and everyone's head turned towards the doors of the church. Callie and David's face turned sour as to what they heard. He quickly walked out of the church where nobody could hear him and dialed a number on his phone. What the hell happened? How did she manage to escape? He yelled at the person on the call. I'm sorry, boss. The car never passed us. We are still on the assigned spot. His anger bubbled at the man's foolish reply. He kicked the ground angrily for failing her daughter. How was he going to face her? She would be heartbroken. Ashton tried to remain calm while his heart was hammering against his chest loudly when the wedding note was gradually heard within the church's silence. He turned back to the door and found his breath caught in his throat at her sight. She held a bunch of white lilies in her hand and the other was linked to his grandfather's arm. Ashton almost forgot to breathe at that moment and kept his gaze locked with hers. As she walked closer, he could see how her lips stretched into a breathtaking smile. Henry patted Ashton's shoulder to gain his attention. When he did, he saw a grin on his grandfather's face. She's a gem, Ashton. Take care of her, he said and took a seat nearby. He was so busy admiring Catherine's beauty that he had missed to notice his grandmother who was walking just a few feet behind Catherine and Henry. She hugged her and shook hands with Ashton. She was an emotional mess and tried to wipe off her tears that were sliding down her cheeks. I am so proud of you, my children. Best wishes on this wonderful journey as you build your lives together. She left a peck on each of their cheeks and stepped back, after which it was just the two of them, Ashton and Catherine. Their eyes were locked with each other's and they didn't mind anyone or anything around them. They stared into each other's soul until they heard the priest. Do you take Catherine Pearl Earnshaw as your lawfully wedded wife? Bringing them out of their days. I do, he whispered. His eyes never left hers, even for a split second. Do you take Ashton James Schwimmer as your lawfully wedded husband? He asked, facing Catherine. I do, she repeated brightly. Ashton didn't waste another minute as he leaned forward and kissed her mindlessly. 
They could hear their friends cheering them, but they didn't bother to pull apart until they fell breathless. I love you, Kathy, he whispered against her lips and captured her lips in yet another mind-blowing kiss. I love you, Ashton, and I will love you for the rest of my life, she managed to say in between kisses. Mrs. Ashton Schwimmer Ashton snaked his arms around Catherine, distracting her from the conversation that she was having with her friends. She was already out of her wedding gown, and her hair was let down into beautiful waves. We will be late to our honeymoon if we don't start now, darling, he cooed into her ear, sending sparks down her core. Excuse us, ladies, he said to her friends and pulled her towards the brand new car that he had presented to Catherine as a wedding gift. It was beautifully decorated with colorful flowers and ribbons. Her family and friends were gathered around the couple and wished them good luck to their new beginning. What about my bags? She asked Laura. Don't worry about your luggage. We have packed everything that you will need for a month. Laura assured her with a mischievous grin, which Kathy couldn't understand why. Ashton noticed that Callie was nowhere in sight. When he asked Judy, she informed him that she was burning up with fever. He was worried about her but decided to call her later. They bid their farewells and got in the back seat of their car. Ashton reached forward and pulled Kathy closer, kissing her on her nose. As he pulled away, Catherine noticed a spark in those eyes. With a crooked smile, Ashton leaned forward and gave her a toe-curling kiss on her lips while Kathy touched his cheek softly. After the kiss, she placed her head against his chest and she could tell he was beyond happy. In less than a few hours, they had reached Big Island, Hawaii, where Ashton's father owned a beach house. All through their flight journey, Ashton couldn't keep his hands from touch Catherine. She was his now, like how he was hers. As soon as they arrived at the villa's doorsteps, Ashton lifted Catherine off the ground, earning a loud yelp from her. The whole house, including the roofs and the pools, were impeccably decorated with rose petals and scented candles. He carried her in his arms to give her a quick home tour, where they would be spending the next two weeks. Do you like it? He asked as they stood on the deck, facing the beach. It's beyond perfect, Ashton. She wound her arms around his neck and pulled his into a gentle kiss. They both took a quick shower, and when Catherine walked out of the ensuite, she noticed Ashton had managed to arrange a table on the deck with dinner and a bottle of champagne. Wow, she breathed out. How did you get these ready so fast? She strode forward. You don't realize whom you're talking to, my dear wife. He said too smugly, which made her laugh. He pecked her lips and guided her to a chair. He popped the champagne open and poured it into two flutes. He brought his glass closer to hers that made a soft tinge. To a happy beginning. They sat staring into each other's eyes and ate in silence. The night couldn't be any more perfect for Catherine. She had everything that she had ever wanted. A blissful life, a loving husband who adored her endlessly, and a new family that she never had. They kept talking and drinking on the deck. It was already past midnight and they were still cuddled in each other's arms, leaning back onto the deck's chair. The full moon's silver rays were brilliantly sprawled across the huge villa, and the summer night's pleasant breeze was brushing against her bare arms, yet she was comfortably warm in his arms. The sound of waves crashing against the shore produced a soothing background music to their ears. Ashton turned to his side to face her and brushed his lips against the pulse on her neck, and she moaned. Ashton. Catherine breathed in his scent and hugged him more into herself. Within a few minutes, Ashton carried her in his arms to their bedroom hurriedly, while his lips were still connected with hers. Catherine's hands kept tugging at his hair roughly, with as much hunger as his. When he freed her lips, she was dropped on the mattress, causing her to bounce and giggle. He descended his body over her, and nuzzled at the soft spot in her neck, knowing very well that it would trigger a moan from her. With his arms growing tighter around her body, she lost a bit of her sense of reason and the ability to think straight. He kissed her repeatedly, thoroughly, and passionately, while she replied him with the same amount of fervor. He stared at her deeply, and she saw that his eyes were drunk with so much love and lust for her. Their hands remained busy tugging at each other's clothes until they were piled up somewhere on the floor. He stared at her body, which was glowing under the moon's bright light, with so much tenderness in his eyes that she thought she would melt like ice. As she felt his needs against her bare thighs, she moaned loudly. He was setting her body on fire with each kiss and touch of his. Ashton, she pleaded when she couldn't handle his sweet torture anymore. Soon she could feel him deep inside her, and he rode her passionately. She shattered into a million pieces with the amount of pleasure he was giving her. 
when his moment of pleasure came, he moaned her name softly. She felt his body rock inside her. After what felt like eternity, he pulled out and kissed her gently. He lay back on the bed and pulled her over his chest, drifting off to sleep shortly. The next morning, they got up almost after 11 due to exhaustion from their wedding, followed by their long flight travel. Catherine got out of the bed and put on a long t-shirt on Ashton's. Without disturbing Ashton, she walked out of the room and decided to prepare something to eat. She looked around in the kitchen and noticed that the fridge was fully stored with food products that they would need during their stay. Ashton did not want anyone intruding their privacy, so he had sent the maids on a long leave. She prepared a simple meal with whatever she could find. She placed the pancakes and berries on a tray. She entered the room and placed the tray aside on the table. She sat on the bed and ran her hands over Ashton's messed up hair. His eyes were still closed when his lips stretched into a lazy grin. He rubbed his eyes and slowly sat up, leaning against the headboard. Hey, I thought you would be hungry. She pulled a pillow and placed it over his lap, then placed the tray over it. She climbed on the bed and sat, crossing her legs. He leaned in and devoured her lips first before tasting the food that she had prepared for him. Did you eat my love? He asked her lovingly. No, she shrugged. He cut a small piece of the pancake and brought it closer to her lips. She smiled shyly at him and took a small bite. They kept feeding each other until the plate was empty. So, what's the plan for today? She asked him eagerly. I would love to be locked inside this bedroom with you. He smiled crookedly. Ashton, she whined, tell me now. We will go to the main side of the beach today where there is more crowd and watch the sunset. He informed her before pulling her on his lap. Soon they laid panting next to each other. Later that evening, Catherine was tucked under his arms with her head placed on his chest, comfortably watching the sunset. It's beautiful, she whispered. She had never imagined that her life would become so blissful. She still remembered the young high school boy who wanted to get to know her. He had saved her life in so many ways since then. He gave her a family. He provided her with so much love and affection that she had been craving from her childhood. She wouldn't be able to live a life without Ashton, she thought. He was her everything. She was looking at the children who were building a sandcastle a few feet away. Ashton was observing her face intently. He knew Catherine loved children. Do you like kids? He asked her out of nowhere. I love kids. Her voice came out more like a squeal. So, how many are you planning to give me? He asked, grinning at her. What? Are you thinking about having kids so soon? She was serious now with her eyes wide open. Of course. We are married and we are madly in love with each other. So what's wrong if we had kids sooner or later? He asked her. She stared at him for a long while, giving thought about it. How many do you want? She asked him. He grinned mischievously while placing his forefinger under his chin, thinking. Hmm, five? It wasn't a statement. He was kind of asking Catherine. She laughed. Ashton, what do you think I am, a child-making machine? I was the only child to my parents. I hated growing up alone and their constant involvement in my life. I missed having siblings. I don't want that for my kid. I want my children to grow up with lots of brothers and sisters. He explained to her. She understood that he was no different from her. She too was alone for most of her life until she met Ashton. So she wouldn't mind having lots of kids with Ashton. But don't you think five is too much? She raised a brow at him playfully. All right. How about three then? He said, chuckling. Ha ha ha. All right. Three it is then. She suddenly became excited and wanted to have Ashton's babies right away. The next few days were full of fun. They chased each other on the shore and they went for long walks in the evening holding hands. They went shopping in a nearby town and she bought souvenirs for her family and friends. Ashton couldn't resist getting his hands on his lovely wife and Catherine wouldn't stop him. The honeymoon was everything she could have dreamed of. On the fifth day of their trip, Ashton got a call from Callie. They hadn't received anyone's call after they left Manhattan since no one wanted to disturb the two lovebirds on their honeymoon. It's Callie, he told Catherine. Ashton knew that Callie wouldn't call him without a reason and immediately answered her call. Hey, doll, what's up? His smile died down immediately as he heard her loud sobs. What's wrong? Why are you crying? Ashton, it is dad. He is admitted in the ICU. She spoke on the other end. Oh my God, Callie, what happened? He asked nervously. He collapsed during one of his meetings and we took him here. It seems he had been suffering from stage three lung cancer and he hadn't noted himself. She huffed a cry. Callie, please stay strong. We will be there tomorrow morning. He comforted her. No, Ashton, she protested. 
I don't want to ruin your honeymoon, she sobbed again. No way am I leaving my best friend alone in such a situation. Catherine sat blinking not knowing what could possibly go wrong, but Ashton wanted to go back so soon. She became nervous and kept trying to read his expressions. What happened? she asked impatiently as soon as he ended the call. Callie's father is ill and he is very serious. He looked down. Oh my God, how is Callie? she asked carefully. She is a crying mess. Kathy, I think we should go back for her, he said with an apologetic look. She was upset, but she couldn't probably keep him here when Callie really needed everyone's support. She remembered when Ashton said he had no siblings and he considered Callie as one. Maybe Callie felt the same way towards him. Maybe she too considered Ashton as a sibling. That's why she needed him during her tough times. Yes, we should go back, she said, placing her palms on his hand to ease him. David's body was attached to a lot of tubes. Callie sat beside him with a long and teared face. Her mom was seated on another chair beside the bed. Maria was at a salon when she received a call from her daughter saying David was admitted to the hospital in a very critical situation. Maria, don't worry. He will be fine soon. Kate placed her hand on her friend's shoulder. You have to be strong for your daughter. I know, Kate, but this is all just so unexpected. She rose up from her seat. I can understand. You should take some rest. Come, we will drop you at your home. Callie can stay here till you come back. Kate and George offered to drop her at her house. All right. Maria picked up her bag from the table and hugged her daughter. Honey, I will be back with your clothes and food. Stay here beside your dad till then. Kate and George hugged Callie, whose face was red and puffy from all the crying. Take care, sweetie, she said before walking out of the hospital room, leaving the daughter and father alone. After a few minutes, Callie walked to the door and locked it from inside. Dad, they are gone, she whispered. She was surprised that everyone, including her mother, had fallen for their lie. It was her genius father's master plan to bring Ashton back here. David opened his eyes slowly and removed the oxygen mask off his face, pulling it to his neck. Did you call Ashton? That was the first thing he asked as he sat up. Yes, Dad. He said he would be coming here tomorrow morning. She beamed at him happily. This was the only way they could think of to bring Ashton back to Manhattan. Good, he said in a gruff tone. We shouldn't fail in our plans this time, he said confidently. Ashton and Catherine took the first flight back to Manhattan. Ashton was at tenterhooks throughout the journey. He knew that Callie loved her father very much and she would be worried sick for him. Catherine remained by his side, holding his arm and calming him down. He didn't talk much and remained quiet till they reached home. They didn't get to rest since Ashton wanted to go straight to the hospital. They freshened up and got to the hospital in the next few minutes. Ashton got to know from Callie's mother that David was undergoing an operation. He inquired at the reception and marched straight up to the room, not even bothering to wait for the lift. Catherine scurried behind him to match up to his long strides. Callie was sitting in the waiting room scrolling through her mobile and as she heard the heavy footsteps across the corridor, her eyes became watery and red instantly. Her mother had informed her about Ashton's arrival, but she wore a shocked expression on her face. Ashton! She sprinted towards them and hugged him tightly at his waist. He felt her body shake against his chest as she started crying like a baby. Callie, please stop crying. He kept rubbing her back comfortingly. Callie had her face buried into Ashton's chest, and when she was sure that no one could see her face, a smile of triumph creeped over her lips. She turned slightly to face Catherine, who was standing beside Ashton with the same amount of sympathy that everyone else around her had. The spark in her eyes vanished at a stroke and was replaced by a deathly glare. She couldn't still digest the fact that Catherine had managed to get married to Ashton, but never mind. He was hers first and will remain hers forever, she thought. It was time for Catherine to leave out of Ashton's life. Ashton, Callie looked up, wiping her tears. I told you not to come here. I ruined your honeymoon, she said, looking down at her toes. Callie, I can't leave you alone in such a situation. Nothing is more important than you, he spoke without thinking. Catherine suddenly felt her heart tighten painfully at his words. It was their honeymoon that he was talking about. It was supposed to be a special moment in their life. It irked her to know that it meant nothing to him. She knew how important his friendship was to him, but she couldn't accept what he just confessed to his friend. At least he didn't have to say it in front of Kathy. She managed to quickly conceal her thoughts and patted Callie's shoulder. Callie, don't worry. Your dad would be all right soon. Callie's heart leapt out of her chest when Ashton said that nothing meant important to him when it came to her, not even his wife and his honeymoon. 
She didn't miss the sudden sourness in Catherine's face. She wanted to laugh at that expression on her face. Catherine's eyes were fixed at Ashton with a mix of anger, pain, and disappointment. This is just the beginning, Catherine, she thought with a smirk on her face. Ashton didn't notice his parents, Noah, Laura, and Callie's mom, who were also present in the waiting room, until Noah placed his hand on his shoulder. Man, you didn't have to come here. We were all here to care for her, he told him. How could I have enjoyed my damn honeymoon when she was in such a condition? Ashton replied. Catherine was on the verge of crying now. She walked away, unable to tolerate any more of Ashton's moronic behavior. Kathy, darling, Ashton's mom took her in her arms. Why did you two come here when we are all here for Callie and Maria? His condition isn't worse after all, she whispered as she took her to the window sill, away from everyone. Ashton wanted to be here for Callie. Kate could feel her pain in Kathy's voice. It's all right, honey. You must be tired. Go home now. I'm okay, Kate. Ashton may not want to leave now. She looked around and saw Laura at the end of the room, who had a sorry look for her. I'll be there for a while, she pointed at Laura. Okay, sweetie. Kate smiled at her. She was angry at the foolishness of her son, but didn't want to display it in front of everyone. Hey! Laura hugged Kathy and patted the space next to her. They didn't talk much after that and kept waiting for the operation to be a success. After two hours, a team of doctors walked out from the ER. Callie, who was sitting beside Ashton, got up and walked to the doctor nervously. Doctor has my dad. Her mom and Ashton followed behind her. The cancer is spread to his other internal organs. He has to be kept on a ventilator, he informed and walked away. Callie let out a watery cry while her mom wound her arms around her daughter and consoled her. Ashton placed his arms on her shoulder. She immediately pulled away from her mom and threw her arms around Ashton's neck. What am I going to do now, Ashton? She cried like a baby against his chest. Shh. He shushed her and kept caressing her hair. It pained him to see Callie like that, broken and grief-stricken. He didn't have words to comfort her. Catherine's heart was torn between sympathy and jealousy. She knew it wasn't fair on her side to feel jealous on someone who was grieving over her sick father, but at the same time, she couldn't handle herself when she saw Callie being so close to Ashton physically. Later that evening, when Callie's father's condition was stable and was shifted to the VIP intensive care unit, everyone bid her goodbye. Catherine hugged Callie and spoke to her sweetly, even against her own heart. Ashton, too, wished to go home and have a good night's sleep, but their wedding and honeymoon this past week was too tiring for them. Ashton, can you please be with me? Callie asked him when he was about to tell her that he would return in the morning. Sure, he smiled at her and sat beside her again. Laura and Kathy started walking towards the lobby, waiting for Ashton and Noah, but noticed only the latter coming out. Where is Ashton? Catherine asked, looking behind him. Um, Kathy, Callie wants Ashton to stay in the hospital for the night, he told her, scratching the nape of his neck. Everyone except for Ashton could understand her pain, after all, they were married for just six days, and here he was spending time away from her. She was aware he didn't do it intentionally. All she could do was to curse her ill fate and walked out of the hospital silently. Noah dropped her off at home. She was quiet throughout the ride and got down after muttering a thanks and goodbye. She took a long and warm bath. She had no desire to eat, even though she hadn't had a proper meal from the morning. She waited for Ashton to come home, or at least give her a call, but she couldn't remain awake too long. Ashton was up all night, sleeping while sitting on the hospital chair. Callie had placed her head on Ashton's shoulder and slept comfortably. He was so busy the previous night paying the bills, talking to the doctor about David's health and consoling Callie, that it totally slipped out of his mind that he hadn't even called his wife. Damn, he didn't even inform her that he wouldn't be going home that night, and he knew how much she hated whenever he did that. He placed Callie's head in such a way that the back of her head was leaning against the wall now. Maria, I need to leave now. Can you tell Callie that I would come after a while? He informed Callie's mother as he picked up his jacket hurriedly from the armrest. Sure, Ashton, you should get some rest, she replied. It was still dark outside, maybe around four or five in the morning, and he reached home within the next 15 minutes. He quietly opened the door to his apartment and locked it behind him. His eyes landed on Kathy, who was lying on the couch. Her body was facing the LED that was mounted on the wall. He walked closer and he felt a tug at his heart as he saw her sleeping with a tired scowl marred on her face. He knew right away that she had been waiting for him. He bent down and tried to carry her in his arms, but as soon as his hand slipped under her body, she jerked awake. Ashton? She sat up, rubbing her eyes sleepily. When did you come? He didn't stop what he was going to do, swooping her in her arms and carried her to the bedroom. Just now, love, 
he replied on the way to the bed. She had her arms around his neck securely and stared at his face. He looked tired with dark circles around his eyes. She was aware that he hadn't slept much in the previous nights. They had made so much love during their honeymoon that they barely had time to sleep. And when he came to know about Callie's father, he was so worried about his friend that he couldn't sleep an ounce. He didn't want to make a big fuss about him not telling her about his decision to stay at the hospital or for saying that his honeymoon didn't mean anything to him. She believed he didn't mean what he said. He was finally home. That's what mattered to her. She leaned forward and kissed his lips. Ashton placed her carefully on the bed without breaking their kiss. He deepened the kiss hungrily. When Catherine sensed where this was all going to, she held his wrist, stopping his hands from exploring her body. He needed to sleep. She could tell from his tired face. Ashton, you need some sleep, she whispered. He knew he was a jerk to her at times, but he was happy that she understood his situation and didn't start an argument with him. Anyone else other than her would have done that. These were the things he loved about his wife, her patience and sensibility. I know, my love, but I want you more, he said as he hovered over her body, pushing her slightly on the bed. Catherine could never resist his touches and kisses. She let him do whatever he wanted. He buried himself deep into her. Her sweet scent chased away all his tiredness. He made love to her quick and intense before they both drifted off from their exhaustion. When Callie woke up again, the first thing she did was to look around for Ashton, but he was nowhere in sight. Mom, where is Ashton? He left home, honey. He looked worn out and I asked him to come back after resting well. She told Callie, which made her face turn red with anger at her mum, but she couldn't react mindlessly. Her mum was a very kind and gentle woman. She was different from her dad. She would never wish bad for anyone, especially not for Ashton. It was true that she wanted her daughter to end up with Ashton. Every girl's mom would want such a husband for her daughter, but if he fell in love with someone else, then she would be happy for him. After all, Maria had known Ashton his whole life. Moreover, she liked his wife, Catherine. Callie controlled her anger and walked back to the seat. She pulled out her phone and saw it was past seven. He must have had enough sleep, she guessed, and dialed his number. Catherine was locked in Ashton's arms, naked yet warm, and stirred awake when she heard Ashton's phone vibrating on the side table. She peeled his arms away from her body and stretched over to grab his phone, carefully not to disturb him. Though he was a light sleeper, his phone's sound didn't wake him up, meaning he was dog-tired and still needed plenty of sleep. She saw Callie's name popping up on the screen. What did she want now? Irritation filled her heart. Callie would definitely want Ashton to come to the hospital, and Catherine did not have the heart to wake him up yet. She didn't answer her call, and after ringing for a few seconds, it stopped. She looked for her clothes on the floor and decided to prepare breakfast. She grabbed both their mobiles and walked out of their room to the kitchen. Whatever emergency it was, she could talk once he wakes up, she decided. Callie kept calling until Ashton's phone, until it drained out of charge. What's with the long face, honey? David asked, seeing Callie's sullen face. Ashton isn't picking up my calls, Dad, and he left me here all alone even after I literally begged him to stay with me. She whined like a small child. Callie was day by day losing her self-control when it came to Ashton. She began to yearn for his constant attention. She couldn't bear the thought of Ashton and Catherine being together anymore. With Ashton gone, Callie lost her cool. Dad, we have to do something so that Ashton doesn't leave me at all. She spoke, pacing in front of David's bed. Hmm. He started thinking, scratching his stubble cheek. All right, call Dr. Gerald, he said after thinking for a few minutes. Ashton woke up late that morning and stretched his hand lazily over the mattress, searching for Kathy, but the space next to him was cold and empty. His muscles felt tight since he had slept sitting on the uncomfortable hospital chair, and he stretched them to loosen them slightly. He got up from the bed and walked into the kitchen, where he saw Kathy in just a long sweater. The neck of the sweater was loosely hanging off, revealing her bare shoulder. The air inside the kitchen smelt of freshly baked muffins. Catherine was planting them neatly on a tray when she felt Ashton's hands on her hip. He pulled her so that her back was against his bare chest. He nuzzled at her neck, which made her giggle. Good morning, love, he spoke near her ear. Good morning. Had a good sleep, she asked, turning within the confined space between his body and the kitchen counter. Mmm, he hummed, his face was buried into her hair and his hands ran hungrily over her naked thighs. You should eat first. You must be hungry. Catherine brought the tray in between their bodies. Yes, baby, I'm very hungry, but not for this. Hold away the tray and placed it aside before capturing her lips in a hungry kiss. 
she tasted like strawberries, and he wanted to eat her right then and there. But he was interrupted by the annoying ringing of Catherine's phone. She let out a laugh when he growled and pouted his lips in frustration. She pushed his body with great force to match his strength and went away to attend the call. She thanked whoever made that call since she was too tired for lovemaking this morning. She saw it was Noah, whose name was displayed on the screen. She panicked immediately since Noah never calls Catherine. She knew it had to do something with Callie's father. That's when she remembered that Ashton's phone had run out of charge and she had forgotten to inform him about Callie's calls from early this morning. Hello? Her voice came as a shiver. Catherine, where's Ashton? She could sense a combination of agitation and impatience in his voice. What's wrong? She stuttered. Callie's father is in a critical situation from this morning. Can you please put him on line? He asked her. Sh sh sure. She turned around and held out the phone for Ashton with shaky hands. Ashton, Callie's father is in a critical condition. Her eyes were brimmed with both tears and guilt. Ashton's brows were twisted and pinched at the corners that very instant. He hurried in front of her and grabbed her phone from her hand. Hello? He spoke urgently. Ashton, please come here as soon as possible. Callie's dad is in a very bad... Ashton didn't wait for Noah to finish as he ended the call and dropped the phone roughly on the couch. He rushed to his room to get dressed. Within the next few minutes, he was ready and grabbed the car keys. Kathy, my phone has no charge. Can you please charge it and bring it when you come there? Meanwhile, I'm taking your phone. He got hold of her phone. Sure, Ashton. I will also come with you. Can you please wait for a few minutes? Catherine asked, trailing behind him to the door. Kathy, I cannot wait for you. I need to be there soon. You can drive your car to the hospital whenever you are ready. Catherine heard his speak as he got into the elevator. She locked the door and saw the food lying cold and untouched on the countertop. Her heart squeezed painfully. He hadn't had dinner last night, and now he hadn't had his breakfast, too. Ashton reached the hospital within minutes and ran to the emergency ward where Noah was directing him over the phone. Callie? He saw her weeping against her mother's chest in one corner of the room. She snapped her head angrily at Ashton and got up on her feet. Why did you come here? She questioned him bitterly. Where were you when I needed the most? Callie. I went home, he stuttered. He looked confused. He didn't know why Callie was so angry on him. I called you so many times this morning. You were so busy with your new wife that you didn't bother to think about me. She accused him in front of their friends. She had her chin lifted up in the air, and she was fuming with anger. Callie. I didn't know that you called me. He tried to justify. Well, then why don't you ask your wife? She must have thought it wasn't necessary to inform you about my calls. She smirked internally. This wasn't meant to be a trap for Catherine, but she was getting involved because of her bad luck. Callie burst into tears. The doctor said that something went wrong with the surgery and he's paralyzed forever, she said as she threw her arms around Ashton. Ashton's chest heaved with outrage thinking about what Catherine had done. He remembered placing his phone on their bed. Knowing Callie might call him in case of emergency, but his phone was lying on the dining table this morning. Did Catherine intentionally ignore Callie's calls and didn't inform him? Callie, I'm sorry I wasn't there for you. He kept apologizing until she stopped sobbing. It's all right. You're here now. That's what matters, she said with a sad smile. After an hour, the doctor stepped out of the emergency ward. Miss Jonas, your father wants to talk to you, he said, motioning her to enter the room. Ashton? She looked at him with watery eyes as if asking him to accompany her to see her father. Sure, Callie, I will go with you. Understanding her silent plea, he sauntered behind her into the room. Dad? She muffled her cries within her palm, seeing her father attached to lots of tubes and wires. David opened his eyes weakly and held out his hand to his daughter. She dragged herself to the stool, placed to the bed, and held his hand in hers. Dad, please get well soon. I cannot see you like this. She buried her face on the bed, and her body shook vigorously as she cried loudly. Ashton hurried beside her and held her shoulders supportively. She looked like she would fall off flat on the ground if he hadn't caught her firmly. Callie, please stop crying. It looks like he wants to tell you something. Ashton said, looking at David, who was trying hard in an attempt to pull out words from his throat. What is it, Dad? She asked, looking up at him. Callie, darling, I love you so much. You have to stay stronger than ever, he stammered. I want you to take over my business. My company is my life's achievement. Promise me that? You will take care of it in my absence? I promise you, Dad. I will take care of the business. Please don't worry about it, she promised him. Ashton. He stretched his arm out in Ashton's direction, and Ashton leaned forward to hold his hand. 
He placed Callie's hand into Ashton's palms and held them together in a firm grip. You are all my daughter has, but please take care of her. She has no... He paused and swallowed loudly. She has no idea about the business world. Help her to get to know about my business, he asked in a low tone. A single tear fell down his eyes. Always be there to protect her. I've always taken care of Callie, and I promise you that I will look after her in your absence. Ashton rubbed the back of his palms assuringly. David smiled weakly as another single tear slipped off his cheek. The nurse entered the room, asking Ashton and Callie to let him rest for a while. As Ashton stepped out of the ER, his eyes landed on Kathy, who was talking to Maria. His face became red with rage while his palms were fisted tightly to control his fury. He pulled her up from the seat harshly. Catherine winced loudly with the tightness of his grip around her upper arm. Ah, Ashton, what's wrong with you? You are asking what's wrong with me. He seethed through his teeth. His grip felt like a vice around her arms, and she struggled to free herself from him. Ashton, you are hurting me, she said, looking around them. He pulled her roughly out of the hospital into the underground parking lot and shoved her against his car. She rubbed her arms, which she was sure would bruise soon. Why did you do it, huh? He asked her. Do what, Ashton? She looked into his eyes for any familiarity, but he felt like a different person to her. The Ashton she knew would never handle her so roughly. What was happening to him? Why didn't you tell me about Callie's numerous calls? She had been trying to contact me the whole morning, he asked through gritted teeth. That's because you looked tired and you were sleeping like a baby. I didn't have the heart to disturb you. She explained her genuine intentions to him. I was going to tell you. And when were you planning to tell me exactly? He snapped at her. I was going to tell you after you had your breakfast. You have been skipping your meals for the last two days. I knew if I informed you about Callie's calls, you would leave without eating. Are you kidding me, Kathy? Do you think I would die if I skipped just a few meals? He fisted his palms angrily to his sides. Because of you, I couldn't be with her when she needed me the most. He pointed his forefinger in front of her face accusingly. For a few seconds, she turned away from him, trying to compose herself, but his words were provoking her greatly. She needs you almost every day, every hour. Can't she handle a situation on her own? She blurted out without thinking and immediately regretted what she said. What did you just say? He narrowed his eyes at her. She shook her head nervously, biting her lips. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. She slumped her shoulders. Why do I have the feeling that what you did to Callie was well calculated and intentional? He said bluntly. Her eyes were looking at him, expecting an explanation about what he just said. What? Why would I even do that? Her voice was an octave high. I don't know. You tell me. His chest was moving up and down wildly. He huffed loudly before continuing. I can't believe you would be behaving like a jealous wife. You are just too hurt that I abandoned the honeymoon for Callie, he said gravely. Catherine was stunned at his accusation. Ashton saw anger flare in her eyes, and then they brimmed with tears. Jealous? She laughed at him sarcastically. How can you accuse me of something like that, Ashton? Her tears started rolling down her face. When all I did was to respect your friendship and agree to whatever stupid decisions you made in the name of friendship. Something inside Ashton felt heavy seeing her cry. He had promised to protect her and make her happy, but here she was crying within the first week of their wedding. You didn't even think how much it hurt me when you said that nothing meant important to you other than Callie. You didn't even bother informing me about your stay at the hospital when I was waiting for you like a fool. You know how much I hate that, but I still chose to leave it behind without making it a big issue, because I know that your friend is going through a rough patch in her life, but all I get in return is your accusation? She spoke in a broken voice. I understand she's your childhood friend, but I am your wife, Ashton. And for your kind information, I had no other vile intentions for not informing you about her calls. I wanted you to have a proper rest. You know what? Why do I even have to explain anything to you? Think whatever you want. She held her head high and shot him one last glance before pushing him away harshly. Ashton's heart was tightening at his chest. He didn't enjoy hurting her. Hurting her meant hurting his own heart. He fought the urge to run behind her and hug her into his embrace. He watched her walk to her car, and soon her car vroomed out of the parking lot. Jealous wife. His words kept ringing at her ears, which was beginning to cause her a severe headache. Catherine lay on her couch, staring nothing in particular. Her phone was loosely held in her hand. She was expecting Ashton's calls from the moment she left the hospital. She thought he would come running behind her, hug her, kiss her and apologize to her for whatever stupid things he said about her, but at the end it only broke her already broken heart when he didn't come home that night and didn't even think of texting her. Her mind was a chaos and she hadn't slept an ounce that night, nor did she eat after coming back home. She just wanted to stay on the couch and clear things out. 
She couldn't believe that he would go to the extent of calling her a jealous wife. He accused her of intentionally not informing about his friend's calls. Why in the hell would I do that? She kept wondering. Didn't he know better about her? Was his love for her so weak that he believed whatever he wanted to? She hated being like this. She wasn't like this before she met Ashton. She loathed women who were unnecessarily dependent on their husbands, both mentally and emotionally, but wasn't aware that she was becoming one now. She did not want to give that pleasure to Ashton. She had to learn to ignore him like he was doing to her if she wanted to avoid heartbreaks over and over again. She couldn't possibly cry her eyes out for every pain he was going to inflict upon her. Later that morning, she decided to go out to do some groceries and to divert her mind from all these that was happening to her. She parked her car and strode into the supermarket. She was briskly greeted by Martha, the elderly woman working at the store. She started strolling the cart to the extreme end of the store to buy some dairy products when she accidentally bumped into someone. Oops, I'm sorry. She apologized without actually looking at the man. Catherine? She heard him call her and lifted her gaze to look at him. James? She didn't have to try much to recognize him since he was present in almost every gathering that Callie had attended. She also hadn't forgotten how he cheated on Callie. How are you? He asked, and she frowned at him in return. She hated men who cheat on their women. It reminded her of her father's betrayal to his mum. When she didn't answer him and stood glaring at him for too long, he thought she hadn't recognized him. I'm James, Callie's ex, don't you remember me? He asked, trying to help her remember. Of course I remember you. She eyed him up and down and then continued. And also the betrayal you did to Callie. He stared at her with confusion as if he had no clue what she was referring to. Excuse me, I betrayed Callie? He was bewildered by her allegations. Yes, are you suffering from amnesia? She cocked her brow at him mockingly. He snorted, turning away from her. When did that happen? He asked, shaking his head. She stared at him with loss of words. She couldn't believe he had the audacity to deny his wrongdoings. You have no idea how much it broke Callie's heart. I don't understand how men like you can cheat on their women when all they do is to love you beyond explanation. She retorted at him. Wait, wait, wait. His hands came in front of him, trying to stop her from accusing him further. All the people around them started throwing a look of disgust at James. Did Callie say that to you? How does that matter now? She asked smugly. It does. His voice came as a loud shriek. He was done being patient with her. I wouldn't do that to anyone. He shook his head. Just in a matter of minutes, she had managed to give him a terrible headache. Catherine rolled her eyes. He looked nervous and sweaty all of a sudden, but that didn't mean he was innocent. You mean to say you didn't cheat on her? Yes, I swear, I didn't, he exclaimed. It was Callie who broke up with me. Catherine noticed a gloomy look on his face. What do you mean? Everything was going on just fine. But one day she came to me telling that she wanted to break up with me. He started narrating while Catherine paid her undivided attention to James. I didn't want to let her go. To me, we made a good match together. So I tried to make her understand and stay with me, but she had already made up her mind and she was way too stubborn. When I asked her the reason for the sudden breakup, she said that she was in love with someone else and wanted to pursue him instead of staying in a loveless relationship with me. I was the one left heartbroken for months. I couldn't date anyone for months because it all came so unexpectedly when I thought everything was right he said sadly. And why should I believe you? Catherine still couldn't believe him. You don't have to believe me at all. I don't care what you think about me, Catherine. His rage was visible in his deep brown eyes. Suddenly, she felt he was honest to her. But I don't understand why Callie would go around telling everyone that you cheated on her when she was the one to break up with you. Her voice was a mere whisper. Catherine's anger was suddenly overshadowed by confusion and guilt. Confusion about her recent discovery guilt for accusing James without clearly knowing what had actually happened. As she looked around her, she realized all the people walking around were now throwing looks of annoyance at her. I didn't even know that she was accusing me of cheating on her until a few minutes ago. He was as baffled as Catherine. I can't believe she would do that. But why didn't you tell us all? We never saw you after that, she asked curiously. That's because I didn't want to face you all after she broke up with me. You were all her friends. There was no point meeting you guys after dumped me. And moreover, I did not want to look like a desperate boyfriend wanting to get back with her, he explained. Catherine's eyes were fixed on something on the nearby shelf as if she was in deep thought about all this. James, can I have your number? She asked, pulling out her phone from her jeans pocket. Sure. He quickly gave her his contact number. Can I call you tomorrow? She asked him hesitantly. Any time, he assured her, and she nodded. See you, and I'm sorry. She became edgy after her encounter with this new piece of information. 
All this while, everyone had pitied Callie for what James had done to her. He nodded at her understandingly. She wanted to make things clear. She wanted to confront Callie as soon as possible. While on her way to the hospital, her mind was constantly trying to think of a rational explaining for Callie to do that. She remembered James telling her that Callie broke up with him since she was in love with someone else. Who could that someone be? She muttered under her breath while stopping at the traffic signal. Her fingers were stressfully tapping on the steering while her brain was constantly trying to figure out the missing parts of the puzzle. She didn't remember Callie dating anyone after her breakup with James. Ashton was there beside her for a whole month, trying his best to comfort her. Did she do it just to earn his attention on her? Was it Ashton that she was referring to? Was she in love with Ashton all these years? The sympathy she had for Callie was immediately gone, and all she felt towards her was betrayal. Now that she gave it a serious thought, everything about Callie felt wrong to Catherine. Callie's deathly stares never went unnoticed by Catherine, but she had always ignored them, thinking they were nothing but just her imagination. Catherine began to join the dots correctly. Callie had always wanted to keep Ashton close to her. When Ashton had fallen in love with Catherine, everything started to change, and she possibly couldn't accept it that her best friend was going away from her. Now she understood why Callie always came up to Ashton with problems and excuses. She had to inform Ashton about this. She believed he would take her side this time. She hit the accelerator and her car flew in the top gear, reaching the hospital 20 minutes earlier than usual. She literally ran through the corridors, not minding the receptionist, who was calling her to fill in the visitor's entry book. As she reached the floor where Callie's father was admitted, she stopped dead on her tracks and her blood boiled at the sight in front of her. Callie had placed her head on Ashton's shoulder and she was holding Ashton's arm. She fumed with rage and walked with a murderous look on her face. Kathy? Ashton was puzzled to see Catherine so late in the evening. He loosened Callie's grip from his arm and got up slowly. He noticed the dangerous look on her face. What are you doing here? Callie asked, getting up on her feet. Catherine looked down at her hand, which snaked up to Ashton's arm to hold them again. I met James at a grocery store. She watched how the blood on Callie's face drained away with the mention of her ex's name. He told me everything. Why, Callie? Why would you do that? She felt disgusted, thinking how far she could go for Ashton. I don't understand. What are you saying? Callie mumbled. Catherine, what are you doing? Why are you reminding her about that bastard? Ashton was a fool to think that Callie was still hurting over her ex-boyfriend, when in reality, she was the one to dump him. Catherine gave him a hard look as if she was saying, don't you dare call him that when you don't know a shit about what the actuality is. Ashton became silent for a few seconds. He had never seen Catherine so pissed off at something. Ashton, you are an idiot to believe in her lies, Catherine told him. What are you saying? I don't understand anything. He was becoming irritated with Catherine for creating an awkward scene outside the emergency ward. Why don't you ask your friend? She knows what I'm referring to. Catherine taunted with a smirk. She was certain that what James said to her earlier was 100% true by the petrified expression on Callie's face. Come on, Callie. Why don't you enlighten him about what had actually happened between you and James? Callie, what is she talking about? Can you please explain it to me? I don't know, Ashton. She spoke in a broken, innocent voice. Ashton, I met James today. He isn't how we all actually think about him. She paused and eyed at Callie. It was Callie who broke up with him, saying that she was in love. She stopped again, with someone else, and he never cheated on her. She blurted it out too fast. Ashton raised his brow at her as if she has lost her mind for saying that. He believed Callie more than anyone in his life, and he was certain that she would never lie to him about anything. He took in a sharp breath and stiffened in place. Have you lost your mind for saying that, Catherine? He asked immediately, without any hesitation. Catherine swallowed hard against her suddenly dried throat. No, Ashton, that's the truth. I've got his number for you. You can ask him what actually happened between them. It was Callie who dumped the poor guy. And you believe that cheap piece of shit? He growled. Yes, of course I believe him. Your brain is too clouded with this friendship of yours that you are unable to differentiate between... Enough of this nonsense, Catherine. Now go home. His nostrils flared as he fumed with anger. Don't you believe me, Ashton? She muttered with pleading eyes. No, I don't, he said candidly. I don't understand why you would want to pin her with something like that, when you know how much of a heartbreak she went through when he cheated on her. Her eyes shifted to Callie, who sneered at her arrogantly. Callie was sure that Ashton would never believe James and Catherine when it came to her. She stood there happily enjoying the show taking place in front of her. Try all you can, Catherine, but at the end he will be mine, and only mine, 
she said mentally. Catherine was too shocked to observe the sly smirk forming at Callie's lips. Why are you being so naive, Ashton? She shot back at him. It is not me who is being naive, he countered at her. I trust Callie, and I am sure that son of a, he paused, is lying to you. I don't believe you can fall for his words, Catherine. Are you that dumb? He inquired. Catherine winced, and her brows furrowed as she felt the insult deep into her heart. She began to feel the bitter tears flow down her cheek. She glared at the bitch standing in front of her. There was nothing Catherine could do. She had informed Ashton about what she knew. That was all she had in her hands. Now it was left for Ashton to choose whom to believe, and to her prediction, he chose to believe his friend. She didn't wait a minute more and turned on her heels before walking out of the hospital. Ashton was back home after staying at the hospital for three nights. He trod to their bedroom, calling out Catherine's name softly when he didn't find her in the living room or the kitchen. He opened the door to their bedroom and saw she was sleeping with the lights on. Her face was marred with tear stains. The tip of her nose was pink. Her eyes were puffy even while they were closed. A pang of guilt stabbed at his heart. He knew he was the reason for all her pains and grieves, but what was he supposed to do when his best friend was in need of moral support? Catherine knew what Callie meant to him. She was his best friend. She was always there for him when he needed her. Now she was at the point in her life where she needed him, and he wanted to be there to lend his shoulders for her to lean on and cry. Why couldn't Catherine understand his intentions? On the other hand, Catherine was his wife, and obviously she meant the world to him. He just didn't say it out often but she was the very reason for his existence. He knew it in his heart. Callie's father had begged him to look after his business until he was recovered completely. The last two days were in fact very hectic for Ashton, managing the meetings and making major corporate decisions, that he didn't even get time to come home to get his clothes. Ashton hadn't talked to Catherine after she walked out at him from the hospital. He hadn't called her because he was mad at his wife for behaving like a silly woman who was striking out at Callie out of impulse. Her actions only made Callie more grief-stricken, and Ashton had a hard time consoling her that night. He didn't understand why Catherine would go around accusing Callie when she knew what actually happened to her. How could Catherine be so dumb to believe that rascal? He knew Callie more than anyone, and he was certain she wouldn't lie to him about something like that. Moreover, if Callie loved someone, Ashton would be the first person she would think of informing. He didn't remember Callie confessing him about loving someone else after James. He had given a lot of thought about the matter the following nights and realized there was no reason for Callie to lie about her breakup with her ex. Catherine was clearly mistaken and was judging Callie wrongly. He decided he would talk to her when the time is right and try to clear the misunderstanding. He turned off the lights and silently made his way into the covers, cocooning Catherine comfortably between his body and arm. She let out a soft moan and snuggled closer to him senselessly before drifting into a slumber soon after. The next morning, as Catherine opened her eyes, everything was dark around her. She remembered leaving the lights on. The soft morning rays were beginning to peep through the curtains. Surprisingly, she didn't feel cold as she had been feeling for the last three nights without Ashton. As she began to move on the bed, she felt an arm encircling her waist gently. She opened her eyes as her heart pounded wildly against her chest. Was he here, finally? Her mind was still mad at him, but her crazy heart wanted to just forget everything and hug him as close as possible. She had to admit, she hadn't slept so well in days. She had missed him so much. She had missed being so close to him. She had missed his strong arms around her body. She had missed his sweet kisses. And she had missed making love to him. Unknowingly, her eyes swelled with fresh tears when the negative thoughts started to cloud her brain yet again. She whimpered as she tried to contain her grief within, but failed miserably. She pulled away from him and turned her back on him, causing Ashton to stir awake from sleep. She didn't have the courage to look at his face, fearing she would give in to him and forgive his mistakes. Kathy, he mumbled. He reached forward, placing his chin on her bare arms and caressing it with the tip of his fingers, sending shivers all over her body. She chose to remain quiet. She didn't want to give up her anger so soon. He couldn't come and leave whenever he wanted. She was his wife, and she had every right to know about his whereabouts. She heard him sigh loudly and then felt him take her in his arms again, burying his face in her hair. He inhaled her scent that he had been craving for days. Why did she have to make it so difficult for him? Wasn't it enough for her that he loved her beyond his own life, he thought? She shoved him roughly and got up from the bed. She walked into the bathroom and had a refreshing shower. When she walked out, wrapped in a knee-length robe around her body, she could feel Ashton's desires for her reeling in his eyes. 
She quickly went into the walk-in closet and shut the door behind. Ashton was propped onto his elbows, watching her until she shut the door softly. He hadn't gone along without touching her for so long since they made love for the first time. They did it almost every night, sometimes more than once. He was literally dying without her, but he knew she wasn't going to give him any. He groaned and fell back on the bed vexatiously. As she came out, he noticed that she was dressed in her formal attire. Wasn't she in a month-long leave, he wondered? Baby, where are you going, he asked, getting out of the bed. To work, she said in a duh tone. But it isn't a month yet. She gave him a hard look before pushing him out of her way into the kitchen. Kathy, I am talking to you. Ashton was becoming annoyed at her arrogance. That was so not her. Why are you going to work so soon? What else do you want me to do, Ashton? Sit here alone and wait for your arrival? She asked, pulling out a packet of bread from the refrigerator. She stood in front of him and looked into his eyes. I took leave so that we could spend quality time with each other, remember? And since it isn't happening, it is time for me to join back. That way I wouldn't lose my sanity. She didn't want to argue with him. They were seeing each other after three torturous days. Ashton stood there silently watching her move around the kitchen. She prepared a simple breakfast and placed it on a plate. She pushed the plate across the table towards Ashton. She grabbed a slice of sandwich. At least eat with me, she heard him say when she was about to leave the kitchen. She wanted to take a seat next to him as he wished, but he had hurt her ego way too badly. She wanted him to suffer just the way she did these last three days. I'm late for work. See you later. She mumbled without turning back fully and left without another word. Miss Catherine? Joshua was surprised to see Catherine at work a week earlier than he had expected. You are back already? Surprise, she said sarcastically, entering into her office room. She tried to ignore everyone who were asking her about how awesome her honeymoon had been. She wanted to laugh out loud when she thought of the old assistant who placed her palm of Catherine's tummy and said, I can say something is baking in the oven with the glow on your face. Catherine masked her sadness with a shy smile and walked away without answering her. That woman is crazy for thinking that, she thought, while working. The entire day, she immersed herself in work to take her mind off anything related to Ashton. She had so much to catch up since her absence, but even with lots of work, she couldn't completely abandon her thoughts about Ashton. She felt frustrated as she couldn't concentrate on her work fully. Tears rolled down her cheeks, and she tried to quickly wipe them away before anyone noticed her. A new bride isn't supposed to cry. She dialed Laura's number and waited for her to pick up. Hey, Kathy, what's up? Hi, where are you? At work, what's wrong? She asked worriedly. Everyone, including Ashton's parents, were aware of the heated situation between Ashton and Catherine. They felt sorry for Catherine, but they also knew that Ashton wouldn't leave Callie alone in such a tough situation. Laura had helped him to fetch his clothes from home, and she tried to make Catherine understand. Catherine hadn't said anything to anyone about meeting James. Laura was certain that with time, things would go back to normal between the couple. Can we meet? Catherine asked. Sure. How about lunch at Joanna's kitchen? All right. I'll be there in half an hour. Catherine ended the call and drove to the place. Laura was already waiting for Catherine and waved at her. How are you? Laura asked. Good, she replied. Laura could see those huge, ugly bags under her eyes. Did he talk to you? He came back home yesterday night. She kept her updated every night, and it irritated Laura that Ashton hadn't come home from the hospital even after Callie's father was shifted out of the emergency room. Finally, she muttered under her breath. Give him some time, okay? He's just kind of stressed out because of all this, Laura said. Hmm, Catherine nodded. I saw James at a grocery store. Which James? She asked, lost. Catherine rolled her eyes at her. Callie's ex-boyfriend. Oh, that jerk. Laura, listen to me before you judge him. She said firmly, which made Laura wonder what was with her all of a sudden. All right, Laura asked her to continue. She inhaled deeply. He did not cheat on Callie. Huh? What do you mean he didn't cheat on her? Yes, believe me, he did not cheat on her. It was Callie who broke up with him, she explained. What? She narrowed her eyes at Catherine. How can that be possible? Callie was devastated for months after what he did to her. No, that's not what happened, Catherine said, shaking her head slowly. Why would she do that, Catherine? James told me that when he asked her the reason for the breakup, she said she was in love with someone else. Bullshit, that's impossible, she cried out. Do you believe him? Callie wasn't. No, Callie isn't in love with anyone. I'm sure of that. Laura, just calm down. Let me finish, okay? Catherine waited and got a nod from Laura after throwing an annoying look at Catherine. I think the person she is in love with is Ashton. Laura threw a hard look at Catherine. Has she lost her marbles? Why does she keep on bringing this topic? 
She was confident that there was nothing going on between Ashton and Callie, as Catherine was claiming. Catherine, not again. We have had this conversation before, and I told you she isn't in love with your husband. You are just being too jealous of their relationship. Why are you always being so insecure, Catherine? Just because they both are close doesn't mean she loves Ashton. Laura screamed at Catherine, making all the heads around turn at them. Laura looked around and apologized to everyone politely for being a public nuisance. Catherine's mouth was wide open with shock, while her eyes were filled with images' tears. Laura looked deep breaths to calm down herself. Look, Catherine, James is an asshole who cheated on Callie. I don't understand why you'd want to believe him. You don't believe me, right? What if I prove it to you, she said, dialing James' number on her phone. Yeah, sure, go ahead and prove it. Laura threw her arms up in air, frustrated with Catherine's drama. She waited for him to attend the call, but the call went unattended. Once. Twice. Thrice. What now? Laura asked her with an angry tone. He isn't answering my calls, she said in a defeated tone. Did you really meet James? Laura sneered at Catherine. She was too pissed off at Catherine. I don't believe you would go on cooking up stories against Callie. I understand that your honeymoon was ruined and Ashton had been spending days of his honeymoon phase consoling Callie, but you don't have to go around speaking ill about her. All she did was to be a good friend to you. If you can't reciprocate that, at least leave her alone instead of spreading rumors about her. She warned Catherine before throwing a dollar bill on the table. Laura, wait. Believe me, why would I do? Catherine held Laura's arm to stop her, but she shoved her away before walking out of the restaurant. Oh, God, why is this happening to me? How am I going to prove this to everyone? She slumped down in the chair and started sobbing into her palms. Catherine was sitting on the balcony facing the setting sun that streaked the evening sky with a light shade of pink. She had been trying James's number the whole week, but it remained always switched off. Did something bad happen to him after their meeting, or did he simply lie to her about it all? She felt like a fool for confronting Callie without any proof. She hadn't had a proper night's sleep in a long time. She hadn't eaten properly. She was pressuring herself too much, and that reflected in her performance at work. Laura visited her after that evening they met at Joanne's kitchen and apologized to her about her rude behavior, but that obviously didn't mean she believed in her accusations, nor did Catherine want to mention it about it again to Laura. Anne and Hudson, too, visited her frequently and checked she wasn't losing her mind anymore. Of course, they believed when she said she met James and whatever he mentioned to her at the grocery store. When she told them how she had been avoiding Ashton, they were truly worried about the couple. Kathy, we do not have any proof against Callie, so it would be better for us to remain calm and wait. If you keep on accusing her, Ashton may get fed up with you, Hudson suggested. Yes, I agree with Hudson. Don't focus too much on her, Anne said, squeezing Kathy's hand softly. Look at you. You are a mess, Catherine. Catherine knew she was a mess. She was angry, hurt, and insulted by all this charade. It took her days to clear her mind. After a lot of struggle, she gave up and decided that she wouldn't ever involve in anything that concerned Callie. All she wanted was to stay as far away as possible from her. What Callie did or want was none of her business. All these days, she had been ignoring Ashton, who was trying to talk and make up with her. He was so persistent and sincere in his attempts to make everything all right between them, but she just wasn't ready to forgive him yet. He was busy with managing both his and David's companies, but he still tried to come home early to spend his evenings with Catherine, but she didn't even want to look at him. He knew she was hurt and was ready to wait until she forgave him. Kathy, baby, how long are you going to stay mad at me? Ashton asked when he saw Catherine placing her pillow on the couch in their living area. She had been sleeping on it and ignoring him for almost a week now. Like always, she chose to remain silent and patted the couch before laying on it. She heard him sigh as he gave up and finally went back to bed. She bit her lower lips from crying. She couldn't believe their relationship had become sour so soon after their wedding. They hadn't sat together and talked normally in a long time like they used to do before they got married. She missed being Ashton's girlfriend. She bawled her eyes out that night as if washing away all the pain with it. She wanted to leave all the hurt and sufferings behind and move forward with her Ashton. The Ashton who promised to make her happy for the rest of her life. The one who made her believe in love and marriage. The one whom she loved more than anyone in this world. Next morning, she woke up to the clamoring noises of utensils. She pushed her body up against her elbows and saw Ashton standing in the kitchen. She threw her legs off the couch and stretched her body before making her way into the kitchen. He had his back facing her and was busy preparing breakfast. He turned with a satisfactory smile on his face, holding a tray in his hand, 
but froze when he saw her standing at the doorframe with a shocked look. I thought of surprising you with breakfast on bed. He brought the tray in front of him to show her what he had prepared. But I guess I woke you up by making too much noise, he said, pressing his lips together into a thin line. He looked down with an apologetic look, which made her want to pounce on him and kiss the light pout on his lips. She was delighted with the thought that he wanted to impress her with the idea of surprising her with breakfast. Her lips curled up into a crooked smile, and she strode towards him. Smells good, she complimented, inhaling the aroma of freshly made pancakes and coffee. This was the first time she was willing to talk to him after their fight. That made him grin at her like a fool. His heart was full of anticipation and excitement. Thanks, he muttered. Come, let's eat together? It was more like a question. He didn't know if she would agree to that. Catherine nodded and he walked to the breakfast table. Give me two minutes. She excused herself to freshen up first. Her heart was fluttering after a long time. She was done being cold and mad at him. When she came back, she saw he was waiting for her and she took a seat opposite to him. He plated the food and waited for her to taste it. It had been a while that he prepared a meal for her. She loved his cooking and she had missed it a lot. You like it? He asked her eagerly. It tastes amazing, she said, shoving another small piece in her mouth. Glad you like it. He started eating as he said that. They both ate in silence, often throwing smiles at each other. Are you free today, Kathy? He asked her. Hmm, I have to work today, she replied. Can you take off from work for a couple of days? I thought of taking you somewhere. She looked at him unsurely. She didn't want to get too excited. He had many at times planned for trips before, and most of them had been canceled at the last minute because of Callie. She was sure that he would run back to her if she made a call to him. She wasn't ready for another heartbreak. As if reading the guarded look on her face, he placed a hand on the back of her palms. I promised to make it a memorable one this time. He promised her, and she nodded at him. Where are we going? Her eyes were shining eagerly. That's a surprise, he told her with a naughty grin forming at his lips. She smiled shyly at him. All right, I'll inform my boss. Great. He picked up the plates from the table cheerfully and Catherine helped him clean the kitchen. Within an hour, they stood ready in the living area. Ashton had asked Kathy to dress up casually and she was dressed in a pair of dark blue jeans and a chiffon yellow off-shoulder top. He had managed to pack some clothes that they would be needing during their stay when she was taking a shower and placed the bags in the trunk of his car before she got ready. She knew it was a waste asking him anything about this trip since he wouldn't spill a bean. They rode towards the beach for three hours straight without a stop. As they reached Catherine, realized she hadn't been to this part of the city before. It was outskirts of Manhattan, and the summer rays were pecking on her skin gently. Oh my God! She squealed loudly when her eyes fell on the beach. Ashton stopped the car in the parking area of a resort, smiling at her childish behavior. She looked genuinely happy, and he realized that he had missed seeing her smile like this. He got out and helped her out of the car. Ashton, how long are we staying there? She asked, looking at the bags that she didn't know he had packed. She thought it was a one-day trip. For a couple of nights. He closed the trunk and carried their bags toward the reception desk. They were greeted by a young man and asked to wait while he checked his computer for their reservation. How long have you been planning on this trip? She asked, leaning on the desk, facing Ashton. We have our bags. Can someone bring it to our suite? He requested the receptionist. Yes, sir. Thanks. Ashton thanked the guy when he handed the keycard to their room. He held Kathy's hand and pulled her inside the elevator. I wanted to bring you here last week, but you were too mad to even glance at me, he said, looking into her eyes. And what would have you done if I hadn't agreed to it when you asked me? She raised her perfectly shaped eyebrows at him. I would have canceled the room with a heavy heart like I did last time, he mumbled, which made her gasp. Did you book a room last week? Yes, and then I canceled it when you didn't want to talk to me. That's when she remembered that he had wanted to talk to her last week and about something, and she slammed the door on his face. I'm sorry, Ashton. All of a sudden, she felt guilty for being a bitch to him. He leaned forward to peck her lips as if saying it was all okay and he deserved her cold treatment. The kiss was over even before she could feel it. No, I'm the one who should be asking for your apology. He pulled her closely and placed his forehead against hers. I shouldn't have reacted like that in front of everyone, no matter what. As much as she hated to admit it, he made her feel guilty. All this while he had been trying his best to mend things between them, and all she did was to throw angry looks at him. Let's not talk about it, okay? She breathed out. She didn't want to spoil the amazing time they were having together by bringing it in. Yes, darling. Blamed her lips once again before they heard a ding sound of the elevator. He took her hand and pulled her out of the elevator towards their room. The suite was huge, twice the size of their bedroom. 
It was facing the beach. The screeching sounds of seagulls were being heard loudly and the salty breeze could be felt from their large wall-sized window. He pulled her closer and wrapped his arms around her. Go get ready. We are going to the beach. She slipped into a light pink floral dress and tied her hair in a loose ponytail with some strands brushing her neck. She applied some lip gloss, and when she came out to the hall, Ashton took a whole minute to study her from head to toes, which made her blush wildly. You look beautiful, he whispered her ear, placed a wet kiss at her sweet spot behind her ear, making her shiver. When he pulled away, he could see the desire for him burning in her eyes, but he had other plans for the evening and he didn't want to ruin it by taking her to bed. They had a late lunch at the restaurant in the resort. After lunch, they walked to the beach holding hands. For once, they felt like a newlywed pair. They spent the whole afternoon at the beaching. It reminded her of the times they spent at the beach house during their honeymoon. Catherine placed her head on his shoulder and their hands were intertwined as they were watching the sunset. Thanks, Ashton, she mumbled and placed a kiss on his arm. For this. She had come to know from Laura that Ashton had been looking into David's business for the time being. She knew how busy he usually was and now with the added responsibility, he had managed to make some time for her. He stared at her apologetically. His face descended down towards her lips and he gave her a thorough kiss, which she answered with the same intensity. They sat on the shore and talked till it was a little dark outside. He told her everything that had happened at work in the last two weeks and she leaned her head on him, listening to him quietly. He kept stealing kisses from her and that only made her heart beat faster. She was thankful that he didn't bring Callie's topic at all, but that didn't last for long as Ashton's phone started ringing in his pocket. When he pulled it out, they saw Callie's name on the screen. Catherine became instantly angry looking at the display screen and a scowl began to appear on her face. She was sure it was the end of this trip. How did she manage to spoil all their good times with just a simple call? Catherine thought and looked away, thinking Ashton would obviously attend her call. After a couple of seconds, when she didn't hear the ring of the phone anymore, nor did she hear him talk on the phone, she turned to look at him and to her surprise, he was placing his phone back into his pocket. No distractions. He grinned at her naughtily, grabbing her hand and placing a kiss on her knuckles. She couldn't hide the trace of joy in her expression. She turned away blushing when he stared her deeply. He was making her insides flip dangerously. He took out his DSLR and clicked some random pictures of them, placing it on a tripod. She grabbed the camera from him and started looking at those photos. Ashton pulled her so that she was sitting between his legs. He placed his chin on her neck and nuzzled at her neck. We should frame this, she said, looking at a picture in which Ashton was hugging her from behind and placing a kiss on her cheeks. She had a huge grin plastered on her lips. They seemed happy together and so in love with each other. He brushed his lips on her shoulders. As you wish, my love. He inhaled her strawberry scent. He snaked his hands around her waist, and when she looked up, she saw his eyes were filled with desire. She knew that look too well. She knew that he wanted her just the way she wanted him. He kissed her passionately, and after that, they couldn't keep their hands off each other. They knew they had to stop since they were surrounded with people and small kids. Ashton hurriedly grabbed her hands and they started walking towards their suite. They were kissing all the way inside the elevator. He couldn't wait to get inside the room and throw her on the bed. He hadn't stopped kissing her, even while he tried to open the lock of the door. They hadn't touched each other for more than a week, and they were dying to fulfill each other's hunger. As he slammed the door behind, he stared at her, which made her go weak on the knees. She thought she would fall flat on her butt if he hadn't held her firmly at her waist. She leaned forward to kiss him passionately. He pulled away and lifted her like a sack of potato on his strong shoulders before throwing her on the bed like he was imagining a few minutes ago. She landed on her back and bounced on the bed lightly, which made her giggle. Her smile faded as his hard stares caused her desires to seep through her veins. He didn't take his eyes off her while he hovered over her. He kissed her and she could feel his hands all over her, setting her body on an untamable fire of desire. His hands cupped her face and stared into her eyes. His eyes were darkened with love and lust. I love you more than you give credit to, Kathy. He spoke with a look of pain. She wanted to cry at his words. I love you, Ashton, and sorry for being a bitch to you. Her voice came out rough and broken. He kissed her and flipped her so that she mounted him. Her hair created an illusion of brown falls around their faces. He held the nape of her neck and brought her lips closer to his, showing her how much he loved her. He took her into a roller coaster ride before they fell off the ridge together, screaming each other's name. Ashton and Catherine returned home after spending four nights at the resort. 
Quite surprising to Catherine, Ashton hadn't received any calls from Callie after their first one, and they stayed there without anyone's interruption. Ashton even extended their stay for two more nights when he didn't want their trip to get over. The whole month went in a blur after that with lots of work for Ashton, but he still took out some of his time for Catherine. She laughed more often and looked happy again. He started noticing this unusual glow in her face lately. He didn't know why, but she looked much prettier to him than before. The next Monday, Callie's father had asked Ashton to visit him sometime when he was free. Ashton drove to the hospital to meet him straight from work that same evening. How are you feeling now? Ashton asked David. I'm alive, he said in a heavy tone. From the outside, David looked just fine to Ashton, but then he wasn't a doctor to guess what was wrong in a person's body. He couldn't find Callie anywhere nearby. He had spoken to her a day before, and she sounded a little down. What did you want to discuss, Mr. Jones? Ashton asked him politely. Ashton, you know how much my company means to me. It is my whole life's hard work. He paused and looked at Ashton, who nodded at him understandingly. I have always wanted my company to grow big and perform well, not only within the country, but also outside. Before I fell ill, I wanted to sign a contract with J. Van Richard. He is a longtime friend of mine and also the founder Van Richard's personal care company headquartered in Paris, but that couldn't happen because of all of this. He pointed around the tubes and wires around him, indicating his illness. I want it to happen now, David told Ashton. Mr. Jones, how can you travel in such a condition? It is totally not safe, suggested Ashton. David nodded. I know. I will not be able to travel even if I want to, Ashton. But Callie can. She is my legal heir, and she has the full rights to sign a contract in my place. But David, Callie is... David stopped Ashton midway. I know, Ashton, my daughter is new to the business world, and she does not know much about contracts and agreements to sign one, and that's why I request you to accompany her to Paris. Ashton stared at him. He didn't know what to say. He had been avoiding almost all of his own business travels because he hated to leave his wife behind. That was the reason most his overseas business dealings were done either by his assistant or by his cousin Gabriel. When David saw the unsure look on Ashton's face, he took Ashton's hand in his. Ashton, I am aware that you are newly married, and I have been burdening you with all of my work lately, but please think of this as my last request to you. The man had a sorry look on his face. Mr. Jones, don't worry about it. I would go with Callie to Paris and help her with the signing process. He patted the back of David's palm with an assuring look in his eyes. Thank you so much, Ashton. It means a lot to me. He smiled at Ashton sadly. After staying a few more minutes, Ashton took leave. David pulled off the tube that had been simply taped to the back of his palm and got out of his bed normally. He stretched his body that popped a few joints in his body as a result of laying still for too long. He couldn't believe he had been staying inside these four walls for more than a month now, leaving all his work behind, but he consoled himself, saying that he was doing it for the sake of his daughter. Callie was the only one who deserved to be Ashton's life partner, not some cheap orphan girl who had no wealth and power. Thinking that, he dialed his daughter's number. Sweetie, come meet me soon, he said over the phone, and a few seconds later he ended the call. Within an hour, he heard a soft knock on the door. He knew it was Callie and asked her to get in quickly. What is it, Dad? She asked as soon as she entered the room. Callie, as we planned earlier, I was able to convince Ashton to go with you to Paris, he said, grinning wickedly at his daughter, whose lips curved up into a full-blown smile. Oh my God, I can't believe this. Thank you so much, Dad. She hugged her father. You know what you have to do, right? He asked, pulling her face up. Of course I know, Dad. Leave it to me. She said way too confidently, and David nodded in response. Ashton drove back to his apartment and saw Catherine curled up on the couch. Kathy, he shook her gently. It was just half past seven, yet she was in a deep sleep. Babe, are you okay? He asked concertedly as she began to slowly open her eyes. E yeah? She mumbled and began to sit up. Ashton placed his fingers on her forehead and then on her cheeks to check if she was sick. It wasn't usual to see her sleeping so early in the evening. Her body temperature seemed normal, but she looked pale and weak. What's wrong, honey? He sat next to her and took her under his arm. I don't know. I felt very tired at work, so I came home early and slept, she told him, placing her head over his shoulder. Did you eat something? Do you want to see a doctor? Catherine could feel the panic in his voice. No, Ashton, I'm all right. I am just a little exhausted from work. I guess I will be fine if I sleep a little more. Okay, let me go prepare something for you to eat. You can sleep after that. He stood up and walked into the bedroom. He freshened up and walked back wearing his gray sweatpants. He made a flu buster chicken noodle soup for her and transferred it into two bowls. Baby, get up and eat this. You will feel better, 
He placed the tray on her lap and brought the spoon close to her mouth. As soon as the smell of the soup hit her nostrils, her stomach began to twist in knots and a strong urge to puke overtook her tiredness. She pushed his hands away, which caused the soup to spill all over the couch as she dashed to the bathroom. Ashton didn't know for a moment what was going on. He threw the spoon aside when his senses were back and ran behind Catherine, who was emptying her stomach out. Catherine! He rushed beside her and gathered her hair gently in his palm to keep it from falling on her face. He kept rubbing her back comfortingly until he stopped hearing the retching sound. When she was done, he helped her on her feet and wiped her face with a wet towel. He carried her to the bed. Are you okay? His voice was thick with worry. Yeah, I am all right. I guess it's because of the steak that I had for lunch. She had her head against his chest. Let me call the doctor then, he said as he placed her on the bed as tenderly as possible. Ashton, please no, I am fine. Please don't call the doctor. It annoyed him that she was behaving like a child, but he huffed loudly and sat next to her, taking her hand in his. All right, but the next time you puke, I'm going to call the doctor, he warned. Okay. She laid on the bed and pulled him beside her. The next morning, she seemed fine, and Ashton prepared a light breakfast for her. Kathy, I met David yesterday. He wants me to accompany Callie to Paris for signing a contract. I will be leaving tonight. I'm sorry I couldn't tell you yesterday. He spoke as he sat with his newspaper between his hands. Paris? An unknown fear crept in her heart. With Callie? How long will you be gone? I will be back on Friday. He threw the paper on the nearby chair when he sensed her sad voice. She was certain that there was no way she could stop him from going on the business trip with Callie. Her heart began to hammer in her chest. Her mind kept on screaming that something terrible was in store for her. Baby, come here. Ashton held out his hand to her and motioned her to come near him. He held her wrist and pulled her on his lap. Believe me, I don't want to leave you alone when you're sick, but I need to go, baby. I hope you understand my situation. He cooed at her ear. She nodded blankly. Her eyes were already pooling with tears, and she swallowed hard to hide it from Ashton. Catherine decided to take a day off since she still felt lightheaded. Ashton promised to come back home early after assigning the work to his assistant that needed to be done in his absence. Catherine spoke to Anne and poured her insecurities out to her. She was the only one who would believe her and understand her feelings without judging Catherine. Why don't you simply ask Ashton not to go? Anne asked her. And do you think that will stop him from traveling with her? She snorted back. I know, Anne sighed. He becomes very stubbornly dumb when it comes to that bitch, she added. Catherine remained quiet on the line. She couldn't completely disagree with Anne since she was absolutely right. What she could never understand was how the usually brilliant and sharp Ashton became tongue-tied and dense in front of Callie. Even though Catherine had been trying to ignore Callie completely, she had her own ways to mess up Catherine's mind. So what are you going to do now? Anne asked, pulling Kathy out of her thoughts. Don't know, she shrugged. There is no point in discussing this with Ashton. She knew it would only lead to unnecessary argument between them, and she didn't want to fight with him. At least, not now, when he was leaving her behind for almost a week. As promised, Ashton came home early for lunch. Catherine had somehow managed to prepare lunch for them, even when she had the strong urge to throw up the contents of her gut. Hey, love, how are you feeling now? He asked as soon as he entered the house. Hi. She wound her arms around his neck. I'm better now. She lied to him. She didn't want to bother him by telling that she had a stomach bug. He would be worried all through his journey to Paris. Good, he kissed her lips. I've prepared lunch for you. She pulled him towards the lunch table and served the meal on a plate. She again lied to him that she had already had lunch, since she was very hungry. She knew she would definitely throw up if she even had a small piece of what she cooked. It smelled so awful to her. After lunch, they lay on their bed, cuddling in each other's arms. I will miss you, Ashton. She confessed to him as she panted heavily as a result of their intense lovemaking. She knew he would leave soon and that made her want to cry. I will miss you too, baby. He pecked her on her lips. What time is your flight? Tonight at 10. I need to leave by 7. He pushed her back on the bed and pinned her hands over her head. She stared at him. Promise to come back as soon as your work there gets... She blinked her eyes to avoid the tears that were threatening to spill out. He smiled at her sadly. I promise to come home to you as soon as my work is done. She hugged him, and he could feel her warm tears against her cheeks. He felt like calling Callie and canceling the trip, but he knew he couldn't do that to his friend. I love you, Kathy, and remember, I will always love you. He didn't know why, but he wanted her to know how much he loved her. I love you too, Ashton. She placed her head on his chest, and she began to think. Her eyes fell on the calendar that was placed on the table beside their bed, and that's when she remembered something. She hadn't had her periods after their wedding. She had stopped taking her pills right the night after they talked about having children and stuff. 
Her eyes widened in realization. She sat up quickly on the bed. Are you okay? He asked, seeing her worried face. Yeah, yeah. She smiled back at him. She would check first before giving him any false hopes. She decided she would take a pregnancy test the first thing in the morning, but she was already sure about it. She was late, and they hadn't been using protection. She reached up and gave him a kiss. Now that she had doubt about her pregnancy, she started missing him already. He smiled at her in return and gave her a quick kiss. He pulled her into a hug, and they stayed like that for another hour before she helped him with packing his clothes. Call me once you reach, okay? Catherine's eyes were puffy even though she didn't want to cry in front of him. Okay, sweetheart, and remember, I'll be back soon. He kissed the top of her head and she nodded, making her lips into a thin line. She hugged him closely and inhaled his scent before letting him walk out of the door. I love you, he said one last time and turned on his feet without looking at her again. He slammed the door behind him and strode straight into the elevator. He was scared he wouldn't be able to leave her behind if he looked at her one more time. Catherine leaned her back against the door and slid down, crying into her palms. When Ashton and Callie reached Paris, it was already late in the evening. They had the contract signing meeting the next afternoon. Good morning, sir. Do you have a booking with us? The lady at the reception desk queried Ashton. Yeah, under the name. He looked at Callie for the answer. Ashton James Schwimmer, she completed. The woman stared at her laptop for a minute. Here is your room key. Have a great stay, Mr. and Mrs. Schwimmer, she said, handing over their room key. Ashton immediately opened his mouth to clear the woman's misunderstanding, but Callie was quick enough to drag him along. Ashton, I'm really tired. Let's go and get some sleep, she spoke sweetly. Ashton smiled at her and carried their bags to their rooms. Callie strode out of the elevator and opened the door to their room. Ashton walked behind her and placed her bags on the floor. Good night, Cals. I'll see you in the morning. Where are you going? She asked, placing her hands on either side of her hips. Oh, sorry, I forgot about my room key. Where is it? It totally slipped out of his mind to get his keys from Callie. No, we are sharing the room tonight, she replied, annoyed at him. What? Why? That's when he noticed there was only one key in her hand. That's because there are no vacancies in any of the hotels around this time of the year. It is the peak time for tourists to visit Paris, remember? She raised her brow at him. Uh, oh, that's a bummer. He muttered under his breath. Never mind, I'll take the couch. You can take the bed. It's not like they haven't shared a room before. He would manage, he thought. Okay, you can use the bathroom first, Ashton suggested. Thanks, Ash. She beamed at him way too brightly before walking into the bathroom. Her heart was beating crazily under her chest. She finally was getting some lone time with her Ashton. This was what she was looking for from a very long time. All she had to do was to make him his, and she was positive that moment was not very far away. She took a really long and relaxed shower. She walked out wearing a bathrobe that revealed her never-ending long legs and expected Ashton to see how beautiful she looked in it, but to her heartbreak, he wasn't in the room. Ashton? She looked around. Ashton? She opened the door slightly to check if he was outside their room, but the corridor looked empty. Damn it! She balled her fist tightly and poured all her anger at the door by slamming it shut piercingly. Catherine woke up with a terrible headache. She had to work, but she had no energy in her body to get up from her bed. Her legs felt weak and her head dizzy. After sending off to Ashton, Catherine managed to get five packs of pregnancy test kits that she had planned to use this morning. She threw her sheets away and got out of the bed carefully. She picked up a brown paper bag from her closet and walked into the bathroom. She took a minute to read the instructions carefully. She followed the steps before placing all the five sticks on the counter. She placed her intertwined hands near her mouth and placed in the bathroom, waiting impatiently for those three minutes to get over, which felt like infinity to her. A joyous whimper escaped her lips as soon as she noticed the two red lines on all the five sticks. Very much pregnant, she squealed. She controlled the urge to jump up and down mindlessly. Oh my God, I'm going to be a mother soon. I cannot believe this. She almost cried in contentment. She stood a whole ten minutes in the bathroom, thinking how she was going to shower the baby with lots and lots of love that she had missed her whole life. She wanted to give the good news to Ashton right away, but she wished to see his reactions. She was certain he would be over the moon with happiness, so she decided to wait till he came back home. She was interrupted by the ringing of the landline. She hurried out of the bathroom. Hello? Her voice was still groggy. Hey, love, she heard Ashton's gentle voice on the other side of the line. Ashton! She didn't know if her hormones were already playing their role, but she wanted to cry listening to his voice. I miss you. I am miserable without you, baby, he huffed loudly. 
You have no idea how much I desire to be beside you, over you, and inside you. He said huskily, which made her laugh loudly. My hormones were definitely responsible for my crazy mood swings, she thought. How are you feeling now, sweetie? He asked concernedly. Mm, better, she said more to herself. Mm, what time is it in Paris? She diverted him from that question. Half past nine and it's snowing here. I wish you were here with me, Ashton mumbled. I can't travel for at least another... She uttered without thinking before she covered her mouth using her palms. What? Mm, nothing. Ashton, you must be tired. You should sleep now, she told him. All right, honey, call me when you're back from work, okay? I will do that. Love you, Ashton. Love you, darling. Mwah. He kissed loudly on the speaker, which almost shook her core with luscious sparks. She ended the call with a huge smile on her lips. She kept running the scene mentally how Ashton would react when she tells him that he was going to be a dad soon. She came up with an idea to surprise him when he is back from the trip. Ashton walked back to Callie's room and knocked on the door softly. Where were you? She asked him, trying to keep a check on her annoyance. Hey, guess what? Just managed to get another room for me. Luckily, this guy on the second floor was checking out earlier than he had planned, and I was quick to grab the opportunity. Ashton announced proudly. Great, she mumbled. She wanted to go find that guy and land a tight slap on his face for ruining her plans. You should rest. We have a meeting early tomorrow morning. Ashton picked his bags from the floor and wished her a good night's sleep before closing the door behind him. Callie trashed the vase that was placed on a table next to where she was standing. She couldn't digest the fact that Ashton had refused to spend the night in her room. What was she supposed to do now? She began to chew her nails aggressively until it bled. You leave me with no choice, Ashton. I guess I need to go with plan B. She thought of the only way that she was left with before she drifted off to sleep. The next day, Ashton sat in the conference hall negotiating the contract with Mr. J. Van Richard and his attorney. Callie was looking at Ashton dreamily, not really paying any attention to what they were demanding from each other. She knew she could believe Ashton with the company's legal procedures. After all, the company would belong to him after they got married, but before that, she needs to eliminate Catherine entirely from Ashton's life and from his mind as well. Just the thought of Catherine caused a deep scowl on Callie's face. What do you think, Callie? Callie blinked at Ashton, completely lost. Huh? She had no idea what Ashton was asking her about. We will get a share of 45% of the total profit, is that okay? Ashton asked her in a very professional tone. Yeah, yeah, whatever you feel is right, Ashton. She nodded positively. Okay, then we have a deal. Ashton got up from his seat and shook his hand with Mr. Van Richard. Mr. Schwimmer, I have arranged a welcome party for you two in the evening at one of my pubs, Van Richard told him as they walked out of the conference hall. Ashton wanted to go back to his room and sleep. He was still tired from the jet lag, but being a businessman, he knew it would be rude to turn down another businessman's invitation. Sure, Mr. Richard, we will be there in the evening. Callie got to answer it when she noticed Ashton was giving too much thought to go there. This was her only chance and she wouldn't want to miss it for the whole world. Ashton called Catherine before getting ready to the party. Baby, the work is done. We are starting tomorrow morning from Paris. Wow, I can't wait for you to get here. I have good news to share with you, darling. Good news? No, it is actually beyond that and you are going to love it. He could feel her excitement in her voice. Oh dear, now I just want to hop into a flight and get there as soon as possible, he said as she laughed. You better be here soon, Ashton. Yes, madam, he replied mockingly. Love you. Love you so much, Ashton. She ended the call after that. At around six in the evening, Callie stood dressed up in a blood-red dress that hardly covered her thighs and hugged all her curves like another skin on her body. She smeared a matching shade of red lipstick on her lips and smirked at her reflection. She was certain that Ashton would be seduced by her charm. When she heard the tap on the door, she grabbed her clutch before opening the door. She thought her heart missed a couple of beats as her eyes fell on Ashton, who was looking devilishly handsome in his dark gray suit dress. His hair was gelled back perfectly, and his manly scent invaded her senses dangerously. Hey, you ready? He asked, and she nodded as her voice got stuck at her throat. Let's go, then. He guided her toward his limousine. Kelly couldn't keep her eyes off him all throughout their ride to the pub. They reached there in 30 minutes or so, and the environment was already lively and lit. Wow! Callie squealed loudly, dragging Ashton towards the bar stool. Vodka, please. She ordered the bartender and sat on one of the raised stools. I don't want to drink tonight, Callie. He refused, pushing the glass aside. When did you become this boring, Ashton? You have changed a lot lately. I miss the old Ashton, my best buddy and the fun-loving guy. What has Catherine done to him? She asked, looking dejected. Ha <laughs> ha, very funny. I'm still the same guy and no one has done anything to me, he said as a matter of fact. Then come on. Drink with me like old days. I miss those days, Ashton. He pushed the glass toward him. All right, all right. 
He lifted his hands up in the air in submission. Good. She smiled at him triumphantly. Ashton didn't notice the questioning look that she threw at the bartender or the brief nod he returned at Callie. She smirked inwardly before bringing the glass in front of her lips. She watched Ashton, swallowing the liquid from the corner of her eyes. As he gulped the liquid in one go, he felt a weird taste in addition to the usual burning sensation at the back of his throat. Do you remember once when I got so drunk in Laura's poolside party that you had to carry me back to my house? You were always my savior, Ashton. She giggled, thinking back at the memory. Yeah, you have such a low tolerance to alcohol, and yet every time you want to drink mindlessly, he teased her. No, that's not true, she whined playfully, jabbing him at his arm. It is. Okay, then. Let's see who gets drunk first. She raised her chin challengingly, placing her glass noisily on the table. Aha, uh -huh. don't take more than you can chew, Cowles. He taunted back at her. Oh, come on, stop whining like a girl, Ash. Pick up your glass. He raised her, refilled glass at him. Challenge accepted. He raised his glass at her before gulping its contents. They didn't know how many more glasses they had after the first one. Why do I see two Ashtons? She rubbed her eyes. Ashton burst out laughing like a maniac. And I see four Callies. They remained there for a good knows how long, before his head began to spin. I, I think we should get back to our rooms, Callie. He stumbled when getting up from his stool. He had never felt so dizzy in his life after having just a few glasses of vodka. Careful, Ashton. She helped him on his feet and guided him back to her room. By the time they reached Callie's room, he was completely passed out. Outside her room, she fidgeted with her card key. It was becoming so difficult for Callie to unlock the door single-handedly since he had put all his weight on her right shoulder. She wasn't complaining, though. Her heart was fluttering with anticipation, similar to that of the colorful wings of a butterfly. She knew it was finally time for them to become one. She opened the door and walked to their bed before laying him on the bed clumsily. She rubbed her shoulder, which was sore from balancing his weight on it for too long. The drug had done its job perfectly, she thought, thanks to the bartender. She was sure there was no way to get him drunk just with a few shots of alcohol, since she was aware of his high tolerance level to alcohol. He was always the one to drive everyone back home after partying. She unbuttoned his suit jacket and got rid of it before doing the same with his dress shirt. Her long and thin finger outlined the contours of his chiseled chest. Her core throbbed painfully with the sight in front of her. No other man had ever managed to arouse her as Ashton was able to, even without his consciousness. She leaned forward and brushed her lips carefully over his. She tasted his lips, and he tasted like mint, fresh and cool. He groaned and she yelped with surprise when he held her hips firmly. Kathy, I love baby, he murmured near her ear. She pulled away slightly and looked at his face. His eyes were closed. She wanted to tell him that she wasn't his Catherine, but she knew by doing so, she would only stupidly raise her plans to the ground. Let him think whatever he wants, she nuzzled at the crook of his neck. He raked his hands up her spine and stiffened with realization. You're, you're not my Kathy. Go away, woman. He shoved her harshly, causing her to fall on the ground. He couldn't think clearly, yet he felt this woman was nothing like his wife. His Catherine was much more soft and slender, he thought. Damn it, Ashton. She seethed through her gritted teeth. There was no way Ashton would allow her to touch a hair on his body, but she needs to do something, anything. Why, Ashton? Why? Why don't you see how much I love you? I would do anything to make you happy, Ashton, she cried, standing at the foot of the bed. She stood there thinking of something that she could use against him before an idea popped in her head. She slipped out of her dress and crawled on the bed beside Ashton after turning the lights off. For now, this is enough for me, Ashton. She placed her head on his bare chest and wound her hands around his waist. The next day, it was almost 11 in the night, and there was no sign of Ashton yet. He hadn't called her after the previous night when he informed her that his work was done. She had tried his number early the next morning, but it was switched off. She thought he had boarded his flight and waited for more than nine hours. He should be here by now. Why isn't he here yet? She looked at the clock for the hundredth time in the last half hour. The meal that she had prepared for him had turned cold. The candles that she had set on the table were fully melted into liquid wax. Maybe his flight got delayed at the last moment and he couldn't inform me. Her heart came up with pathetic little excuses to calm down her irregularly beating heart. Half an hour later, she thought, what if his plane crashed midair? Her eyes started pooling with tears. No, no, that's impossible, she mumbled, shaking her head with negation. She was aware she shouldn't be worrying too much in this situation. It would only do harm to her baby. She kept turning and tossing on her bed, trying to sleep for a while. She was sure he would be back when she woke up. That way she could stop overthinking and keep her mind at ease. 
She didn't know when she fell asleep, but when she woke up, it was very late. She looked up at the digital clock, which read 9.30. Ashton, are you home, honey? She called out loudly, walking out of their bedroom, thinking he must be in the kitchen or the living room. Ashton? She went to the kitchen, then to the living area, and again to their bedroom to check if he was in the shower. She felt like her heart just shattered into a million pieces. How come he is not here yet? She could feel her pulse rate shooting up. She grabbed her phone and dialed Gabriel's number. Hey, Catherine, good morning, he said, chirpily. He was almost near Schwimmer's group's office building when he received her call. When he heard nothing but silence on the other end, he knew something was definitely wrong. Catherine was not someone who would call him without a valid reason. What is it, Catherine? Gabby, it's Ashton. He's not home yet. He was supposed to come yesterday night. Warm tears trickled down her cheeks and she didn't bother wiping. Hey, calm down. Let me call him, okay? I tried calling him, but his phone is turned off from yesterday afternoon. I'm scared, Gabby. Catherine, please calm down. He'll be there any minute, he assured her. Can you please try calling Callie and ask where they are, please? All right, give me two minutes and I'll get back to you. He was aware of the Cold War between the two women. He hurriedly went through his contact list and tried calling her. Her phone rang, but there was no answer from her side. If her phone was turned on, then it meant either they were still in Paris or in Manhattan, but definitely not in the plane. He tried calling her again and again, but she didn't answer any of his calls. Then he called Ashton, but indeed it was turned off. He knew something was definitely wrong. He strode into the office building and got into the elevator. As he got down, he first called Catherine. Hey, Catherine, listen, Callie's phone is on, but she didn't answer it. The good news is that they're not on the flight, okay? There's a possibility that Ashton got caught up with work at the last minute, or maybe he lost his phone. So please do not come to random conclusions. We will have to wait patiently, Catherine. Meanwhile, I promise to find out where that asshole is, okay? He tried to lighten her mood. Okay, was all she could muster to say. Gabriel was about to enter his office room when he noticed that Ashton's room was lightly ajar. He frowned and walked towards it, pushed the door open further, and that's when his anger skyrocketed. What the fuck, man? He launched himself into Ashton's office when he saw him standing near the wall-sized window facing the city. Ashton was startled initially, but turned away when he saw Gabriel. What are you doing here? Catherine is so worried about you. She was almost breaking down into tears, and here you are, enjoying the view in front of you? Go away, Gabriel. I'm not in a mood for this. Ashton muttered, irritated at his cousin's sudden outburst. What is wrong with you, man? He held Ashton's shoulder and turned him harshly so that he was facing him. I said, leave me alone. Ashton shoved him away angrily before running his palms over his face. He pinched the bridge of his nose before he huffed loudly. I am sorry, man. Gabriel was too shocked to react. This was so not like Ashton. He stood there trying to decipher his thoughts. He looked like a different man to him. I fucked up, Gabriel. He heard him mumble. Really bad this time. Ashton stared, pacing up and down his room, not having an idea about how he was going to explain him what had happened in Paris. He felt ashamed of himself that he wanted to bang his head against the wall till he died painfully. I slept with Callie. His voice was a mere whisper that Gabriel thought he had heard it wrongly. What did you say? I slept with Callie, he said a bit louder this time. Ashton looked down since he couldn't meet his cousin's deathly glares. If looks could kill, he was sure he would be dead by now. You are kidding, right? Tell me you're kidding, Ashton. Gabriel almost begged him. He didn't know what he hated more, the fact that his cousin cheated on his wife, or he cheated on her with that bitch Callie whom he hated the most. Ashton's silence was enough of an answer that he indeed had done what he claimed. How could you do that to Catherine, Ashton? He was ashamed of Ashton for the first time in his life. This is going to kill her, man. He said with a heavy heart and walked out of the room. Ashton knew Catherine would be dead worried about him. He picked up his jacket and walked out of his office. It was time to face her. After all, he couldn't hide from reality forever, he thought. Sitting on the back seat, he looked out of the window. His mind drifted back to the previous morning when he woke up next to a naked woman. His heart almost stopped beating for a few seconds. He looked under the sheets and observed the lack of clothes on his body. His chest tightened with panic. No, no, no. What have I done? He slammed his palm on his head. As if hearing the rustling of the sheet, the woman on his side began to stir awake. Ashton! He froze at her familiar voice. She sat up against the headboard and smiled at him shyly. What the heck, Callie? How did you end up on my bed? He still had a scarce amount of optimism left in his mind that he hadn't slept with her. Maybe they two were just too drunk and ended up on the same bed, but nothing more than that because he didn't feel like having sex like he usually felt every morning after having one. Callie widened her eyes as big as a saucer. What do you mean, Ashton? Don't tell me you don't remember anything. Her words were causing him a mild chest pain. Well, I don't remember anything, he said rudely. 
Okay, then let me remind you then, Ashton, she said in an equally rude tone. We made love yesterday night. He didn't know why, but the very thought of it made him want to throw up. He felt disgusted. Made love? No way could he make love to any woman other than Catherine, he thought. And this is my bed for your information, Ashton. You're the one to force yourself on me, she said, wrapping the sheets around her nakedness before getting up from the bed. Ashton was too shocked to even react. How did this happen? How did I get so stupidly drunk to sleep with Callie? He screamed mentally. Why didn't you stop me, Callie? You knew it very well that I was beyond wasted yesterday. His voice was an octave higher. I did, Ashton, but you were too drunk to think straight. You were all over me before I could do anything. One thing led to the other, and before I knew we were too far into it. He wanted to whack himself for doing that to Callie. He looked up when he heard her soft sobs. You want to blame it all on me now, isn't it? Okay, so be it, Ashton. It tugged at his heart to see Callie crying, but he didn't dare to go near her. She was equally responsible for all this. She was aware how drunk he was. Why the hell did she allow him to touch her when she knew he was already married? His nostrils flared with anger, and for the first time in his whole life, he felt like she was stupid for letting him touch her. He didn't know what to do. He got dressed and stormed out of the room, leaving Callie crying and swearing. They didn't talk the whole way back to Manhattan. He noticed how Callie was throwing murderous glares on him. Her eyes were puffy and red for too much crying. All he could think about was how he was supposed to face his wife after committing such a blunder. When they landed in Manhattan, it was seven in the evening. He got into his car and drove straight to his office without throwing another glance at Callie. He didn't actually blame her completely, but he was ashamed of his actions and he needed time to think. You were not supposed to screw your best friend, not to mention when you were already married. He knew Catherine must be dying to see him. He too was, till yesterday night, but not anymore. He prayed for the ground beneath him to open up and swallow him. He was very scared for the first time in his life. How was he going to explain it to Catherine? What would be her reaction? Oh, she would be devastated. Oh, God, please, let this be a bad dream. Please, please, please. He prayed mentally while he was on the elevator, but he knew it wasn't. He decided to spend the whole night in his office. He wasn't quite ready to face his wife yet. He stayed there until Gabriel showed up, saying Catherine was so worried about his whereabouts. Sir? He was pulled out of those gloomy memories when he heard his driver's voice. He looked around. He was outside his apartment building. Thanks. He muttered and dragged himself towards the elevator. He knocked on the door and heard the rushed footsteps of Catherine. Oh, my Ashton, where were you? She pounced at him and hugged him tightly. You scared me. She was on the verge of crying. He made out from her voice. Shh, I am here. Sorry to bother you, love. He caressed her hair and she pulled away from him. Why do you smell of alcohol so early in the morning? She questioned him, scrunching and covering her nose with her palms. The smell alone was enough to trigger the vomiting sensations. I had a few glasses at the office. He replied with a scowl. His guilt was killing him that he couldn't even look at her normally. When did you reach Manhattan? And why didn't you come home yesterday night when you knew I would be waiting for you? She was annoyed at him for making her worry so much. Catherine, would you let me breathe at least before throwing so many questions all at once? He shouted at her. He wasn't particularly angry on her, but he wanted to take his anger out on someone. Catherine's eyes stung with fresh tears and she tried to blink them back. I I'm sorry, I didn't mean to nag you. I guess you need to rest. She walked into her bedroom. That night they went to bed without talking to each other, much to Catherine's disappointment. She would have to wait to give him the good news until he was back to his normal self, she thought. The next morning when she woke up, Ashton wasn't on the bed. Her eyes landed on a small piece of paper. Ashton had left her a note. Sorry for shouting at you. I didn't mean to. I have to be at the office early today. See ya, Ashton. It was his handwriting, but he didn't sound like her Ashton. There were no XOs, no I love you, no endearments, nothing. If not before, now she was sure something was bothering him. Maybe it was work pressure. She brushed the thought aside. She knew a way to make him cheery and happy again. She had saved one of her pregnancy test kits. She wrapped it with a ribbon and got out the small onesies that she had bought earlier to surprise him. She put them in a box and gift wrapped them. She was certain that this would make him happy to the moon and back. She kept it carefully in her closet. Catherine waited for him the whole evening and when he wasn't home even after nine o'clock, she decided to call him. It went straight to voicemail. After an hour, she heard the front door being opened and he walked in stumbling on his feet. Ashton! She hurried near him but walked a step back as he reeked of alcohol. He was drunk again. What was wrong with him? She dragged him to their bedroom when he fell on the bed and slept instantly. What is it that is bothering him so much? He was never the one to drink so brainlessly. She removed his shoes and wiped his face with a wet towel before covering him with a sheet. 
She stood beside the bed for a whole minute looking at his sleeping form. He didn't look peaceful to her. There was a permanent scowl marred on his forehead and he kept on murmuring incoherent words. When she was about to walk away, he held her wrist and stopped her. Kathy, I love you. Please forgive me. His eyes were still closed, but she noticed a single tear slip from his closed lids. Why is he asking me for forgiveness? What did he do? Her heart kept repeating that something was terribly wrong. She had a weird feeling that their relationship was going to go downhill. Her heart ached to see Ashton like this. Please, God, whatever if bothering him, let it pass soon, ease his trouble, she prayed. She leaned forward and pushed his bangs off his forehead before planting a lovely kiss on it. Ashton opened his eyes before they fell on the sleeping figure of his beautiful wife. She had made his life a wonderful dream that came true, but he was a fool to ruin this blissful life, he thought. She looked as fragile as glass, and it pained to think that he was about to shatter her into a million pieces by dropping the bomb of sleeping with another woman. How would she forgive him when he was unable to forgive himself? They hadn't talked to each other properly. No, that was not entirely true. She had been trying to talk to him and ask what was wrong with him, but whenever she tried to talk to him, he was either drunk or angry. Just when Catherine thought that everything was going on fine between them for a while, Ashton had to ruin everything by behaving like a moron to her, and she had no clue what was the reason for this jerk mode. Catherine suspected that somehow Callie was responsible for Ashton's sudden insolence. He was just fine before traveling to Paris. Ashton tried to get up from the bed when Catherine tightened her hold around his waist. Ashton, don't go. Five more minutes, please. She mumbled, and he shut his eyes tightly for a minute. He would have wanted to stay in her warm embrace if Nadia cheated on her with another woman. He took a deep breath before he gently unwound her arms and walked into the shower. He was ready with the next 15 minutes. Catherine was still in a deep slumber and he took the chance to quickly walk out of the apartment. He had been successfully doing this for the past few days, escaping from her. He would leave the house before she woke up and return back only when he was sure that she would be asleep. Catherine thought that he needed time to open up to her about whatever nonsense was running in his mind and she was ready to give him that. Ashton reached the building and met Gabriel on the way to his room. Gabriel threw a hard stare at Ashton, even thought of punching him hard in his face for cheating on Kathy. Ashton walked past him silently into his room. Gabriel's accusing looks were burning holes into his skin. His secretary informed him that Mr. Ferguson, his lawyer, was waiting for him in his room and a chill spread throughout his body. Good morning, Mr. Schwimmer. Ferguson chirped, jumping on to his feet. Morning. Ashton muttered as he took his seat opposite to him. What can I do for you, Mr. Schwimmer? The old man was the legal advisor for a Schwimmer group of companies for more than two decades. He wondered why this young man had called him to meet so early in the morning. Mr. Ferguson, I want you to process my divorce papers. Ashton said numbly his eyes lacked emotions. His lawyer stared at him, too shocked. He had attended his grand wedding ceremony just a couple of months back, and here he was, asking to file his divorce papers? Oh, these young people take marriage to be a joke. The old man thought angrily. He was all calm and collected from the outside and asked, And what must I mention the reason for the divorce, Mr. Schwimmer? He asked in a professional tone. I don't know, mention whatever comes to your mind, but I want it to be done soon, really soon. He emphasized on the last two words. Yes, Mr. Schwimmer, it will be ready sooner than you would expect, he assured, and Ashton nodded in response. As much as it hurt his heart, he knew this was to be done no matter what. His guilt was already killing him from inside, and he was sure Catherine wouldn't be happy with him once she came to know about his infidelity. It was only correct to let her go and stay away from her. He was aware of Mr. Ferguson's efficiency, and he believed that the divorce papers would be ready really soon. But till then, he had to stay away from Catherine. He would only hurt her more by being close to her. He grabbed his phone and sent a curt text to Catherine, saying that he was traveling to China for a few days. Catherine was waiting alone outside her gynecologist's clinic. She wanted to go for her first checkup with Ashton, but she didn't know how long it would take him to come back to normal. She couldn't wait that long and decided to meet up with her doctor. Doesn't matter. He would be here with me for the next checkup, she consoled herself, hopefully, when her phone beeped with a text message. She swiped the screen open and her eyes were immediately pooled with tears. Ashton, I'm traveling to China for a couple of days. The plainness in the text was what was hurting her more than the fact that he was leaving her again. It had been a week since she found out about her pregnancy and yet she was unable to inform him about it due to some or the other reason. She wiped her tears with the back of her palms hurriedly as she heard the nurse calling her name. She was helped onto a raised bed before the doctor applied a cold gel on her abdomen, making her wince with a sudden chillness. 
Sorry, the doctor apologized with a smile running the wand over her flat belly. She kept staring at the screen for a good few minutes before she turned to look at Catherine. Congrats, Mrs. Schrimmer. You are six weeks pregnant, and this here is your baby. She turned the screen so that Catherine could have a look into it. Wow. Her voice was a mere whisper looking at the tiny spot on the screen. Their little angel, who was the result of their love. Her eyes brimmed with tears, but they weren't sad tears this time. After spending half an hour at the clinic, she reached home with a copy of the scan. She had a huge smile on her face after seeing their baby's first picture, temporarily forgetting about her issues with her husband. She placed them under the gift wrap box and closed the closet. She picked up her phone and called Ashton. Suddenly, she felt like she wanted to hear his voice. She missed him a lot, but to her dismay, Ashton did not attend her call. She pretended that it didn't happen and diverted her mind on the house chores. The next afternoon, when she didn't get any calls or texts from Ashton, she decided to call him. She was upset with the fact that he hadn't bothered to call back, or at least send a text message if he was busy. Again, her calls went unanswered, but this time she received a text message within a few minutes. I'm busy, I will call you later. Catherine was really pissed off at him for being an asshole to her. What did she do to receive his cold treatment, she wondered. After three days, Catherine received an unexpected text message from Ashton which read he was back to Manhattan and would be home in the evening. She felt that his message sounded a bit cheery. Her face lit up with contentment. She decided she shouldn't be delaying it anymore and had to inform Ashton about her pregnancy, whatsoever may come. She placed the little box of surprise that she had for Ashton on the bed. She sat on the couch with a small smile on her face, sipping a cup of coffee while lost in her own thoughts. She was certain that Ashton would be on top of the world after knowing that they were going to become parents soon. She knew how much he desired to have lots and lots of babies with her and be blessed with a large family. Soon, she heard the bell ring. She looked up at the wall clock. It was half past four in the evening. He got home earlier than she expected him. She got up from the couch to invite him in with a sweet smile plastered on her face. The moment he entered, she smiled at him with all the love she had for him before launching herself at him. She wound her hands around his neck pulling him closer towards her lips, she had missed kissing him so much. Ashton stiffened to her touches, his hands itched to snake on her hips and kiss her mindlessly. It was not easy for him to stay away from her for this long, but he thought he had to learn doing it for he was about to live a life without her. He was home earlier with a purpose, and it was definitely not to hug and kiss her. He had promised himself that he would come clean about the incident that had been burying him alive. He put his palms between them and pushed her a few feet away from him. Catherine blinked at him with a worried face. His simple act made Catherine's eyes pool with tears. She knew things were not okay between them lately, but they always reconciled after every argument. They were the couple who would easily forget that they ever had an argument, and they would be cuddling in each other's arms the next moment. Moreover, she knew however dejected her was. He would feel to be the happiest man on earth after listening to the happy news that she was planning to share with him. Catherine was about to open her mouth to say something, but he was quick enough to interrupt her. Kathy, let us divorce. Catherine stared at him with a bewildering look on her face as if he had grown two horns. To say she was dumbfounded would be an understatement. What? what Catherine was beyond shocked to even speak, but she managed to bring out her voice as a breathy whisper. You heard me, Catherine. I want to divorce you. Here are the papers. Catherine, for the first time, noticed the bundle of papers that he was holding within his palm. She choked a few times before trying to speak again. What kind of sick joke is this, Ashton? She wanted to whack him on his head for playing such a cheap prank on her. I'm serious, Catherine. She tried to read his expression, expecting any slight amount of amusement in his face, but he was indeed dead serious. Catherine never would have thought, even in her wildest dreams, that she would hear Ashton say this to her. She stared at him for God knew how long. Why, Ashton? Catherine asked him that one question that he had been expecting, yet would never be ready to answer. Tears kept rolling down her cheeks. He wanted to run to her to wipe those tears. He remembered promising to make her happy for the rest of his life, but he had failed to keep up that promise. He had become the sole reason for her tears and he wanted to kill himself for that. I slept with Callie. He spoke in a muted tone that she thought she almost misheard him. Of course I heard it wrong. There was no way he would do that to me, at least not with Callie. She said that mentally, not ready to believe his claims. No, I don't believe you. Tell me it's not true, Ashton. She walked closer to him and clasped the pels of his jacket. Ashton, please, I beg you, tell me it is not true. Her sobs had turned into full-blown cries, now that reverberated within the four walls of the hall. Ashton lowered his head, looking down in guilt. He never thought that he was capable of cheating someone. He hated himself for hurting Catherine, for breaking her heart. 
He loved her with her whole heart. He hated the fact their fate was playing such a cruel role in their life. But he knew he had to let her go. He knew she would never forgive him for what he did. How could you do that to me, Ashton? How? She shook him with all the energy within her, and he stood slumping his shoulders, letting her do whatever she wanted to. He wouldn't stop her even if she wanted to kill him. He would die happily at her hands than to live a life without her. He didn't deserve her. She was so pure and innocent for him. She could never be happy with him. And it was only fair to leave her, he thought. I'm sorry, was all he could think of. Anger surged through her when she heard him say that. You can have this house and can demand for anything that you want from me. I would. He didn't get to finish his sentence, since the next second he felt her hard slap on his left cheek. He was startled a bit at first, but he knew he deserved more. That's all you got to say after all you have done? She snapped at him. I will not take anything from you, but I will never forgive you for this, Ashton. You prove to me that you are no different from my father. I hate you. I hate you! She screamed at the top of her lungs. You want a divorce, right? Give me that. She snatched the papers from his hand and pulled out a pen from a nearby drawer before scribbling her signature on all the papers without even bothering to give it a read. I hope you'll be happy with her. She threw the papers on his face, which scattered everywhere on the floor, and walked into her bedroom, locking the door behind her. Her eyes landed on the box that was placed on the center of their bed. Fury seeped through her veins. How could he do this to me? She felt disgusted, thinking how low he can fall. She was a fool to believe him. She should have expected this from him. After all, all men are the same. They would sleep with anything that wears a skirt. She placed a palm on her stomach. He doesn't deserve us, she mumbled venomously before she grabbed the box and shoved it roughly into her closet, which made her clothes fall in it, bearing it deep beneath them. Ashton marched into his study and smashed everything that was on his table. He couldn't help all the tears even when he tried to control them hard. He was devastated by looking into her sorrowful eyes that he wanted to kill himself for inflicting those enormous amount of pain to her. He sat on his chair and leaned back, closing his eyes. There was no point in apologizing. Cheating is not a mistake. It is a choice, and he had made the choice. Now he was supposed to suffer a life without her. He knew that. Catherine didn't know how long she cried after that, but when she was done, she noticed it was dark and raining outside. She got up of her feet and opened the door slowly. The whole house was filled in an unusual darkness, and she took the chance to walk through the main door, silently leaving Ashton forever. She walked out of the building into the empty and wet roads. She was hurt, alone, scared and heartbroken. She didn't know what she was supposed to do, but she was sure she wouldn't be in his life a day more. It was still raining, but she started walking mindlessly wherever her legs were taking her. She kept walking and walking on the deserted road unaware of the car that was following her. She kept going on until her weakness took over her, and she fell on the ground unconscious. Stop the car! Stop the car! The young man in the back seat rushed out of the car and ran near her. Catherine! Catherine! He tried to wake her up before carrying her back into the car. He pulled out his phone and dialed his secretary's number. Arrange a private jet to take me back to London, tonight. He spoke in his heavy British accent. To the airport now. He ordered his driver impatiently before looking down at Catherine who had placed her head on his lap. He looked at her and she was pale. I never imagined that the first time I met you, you would be in such a condition, Catherine. He mumbled, pushing her wet strands of hair away from her face. Ashton was startled from his nap by the ear-shattering sound of the thunder. He didn't know when he fell asleep, leaning against the back of his chair, but when he woke up, he saw that the whole house was illuminated by a weird kind of darkness that he had never witnessed before. It seemed like the last rays of sunshine had gone missing from his life. Kathy. He knew she would be angry at him and wouldn't want to see him at all. That was why he had left her alone, giving her some time to calm down. When he approached their bedroom, there was calm the calm that is felt before the storm. A chill ran through his spine. Catherine, honey? He kicked open the door to their room. It was dark and quiet inside. He turned on the switch and his eyes met with the empty room. He looked inside the bathroom before coming up with wild conclusions, but to his disappointment, Catherine wasn't there too. He searched for her in the whole house, and when she was nowhere to be found, his heart began to pound loudly, if it wasn't already. He pulled out his phone and called her several times. He cursed loudly when he heard that her phone was turned off. Where did she go? It was way past midnight, yet that did not bother him from calling everyone that came to his mind. He started with Anne's number. Hello, Anne. Did Kathy come there? Hmm? No. She sounded slightly disoriented from her sleep. Ashton, what's wrong? No, nothing. 
He ended the call and tried calling Laura. Hello, Laura. Is Catherine at your place? No, Ashton. He received the same answer from everyone he called. Why? What happened? Nothing. I will call you back. He grabbed his car keys and rushed out of the door. He raced his car rashly through the empty roads of the city, hoping that he would see Catherine sitting somewhere and crying her eyes out. After three hours of search, Ashton came back home. Kathy, baby, are you home? He prayed she was back home, but to his dismay, the house was still empty. Ashton made a final call to Gabriel, asking him to come home as soon as possible, before slumping down on the sofa lifelessly. After talking to each other and sensing something wrong between the couple, their friends reached Ashton and Catherine's home. As they walked into the living room, they noticed Gabriel standing near the window looking distraught. He had his phone pressed against his ear, and he was talking to someone impatiently. Callie was standing near Laura, watching everything silently. She was ecstatic when she received a call from Laura early in the morning saying Ashton had been calling everyone asking for Catherine. Her heart was jumping out of anticipation and immense joy. She wanted to be there to confirm it with her own eyes that Catherine had finally left him forever. She just wished she would never show up again, and she believed she would gradually make Ashton forget about her with time and patience. Ashton, where is Catherine? Anne was the first one to ask him. Ashton sat on the sofa staring into the wall thoughtlessly. He was still in shock. His shoulders were slumped and his back was leaning on the sofa. He never thought Catherine would leave him just like that. It hurt him to think about it. But he wanted to apologize to her for betraying her when she had calmed down, and he hadn't planned of moving out of the apartment, leaving it behind to Catherine. A few minutes later, Ashton's parents and grandparents also rushed into his apartment looking worried. By the time Gabriel had called him, it had dawned already, and yet there was no news about Catherine's whereabouts. Ashton, what's going on? You're scaring us. Please tell us where is Kathy. Laura shook his shoulder to grab his attention at her. Why don't you tell them what you've done, Ashton? Gabriel taunted him, shoving his phone back into his pocket roughly. Gabriel, honey, please tell us what is wrong. Where is our Kathy? Ashton's grandma asked her other grandson when she thought Ashton was never going to open his mouth. She could feel her heart at her throat. Gabriel threw a disgusted look at Callie, then his eyes slowly shifted to Ashton. He cheated on Catherine with his so-called best friend. All he could hear in return was loud gasps from everyone. They all looked as if they were struck by a deadly lightning, frozen to the ground. What the fuck is he talking about, Ashton? Before Gabriel could turn around to the source of that loud growl, Hudson had pulled Ashton onto his feet by grabbing a shirt collar. Tell me you didn't do it, he roared at him. Ashton lowered his head to the floor, confirming Gabriel's accusations. How badly Ashton wished to say it wasn't true but that would be a lie. Hudson released his shirt only to throw a hard punch on his face a second later. Ashton wasn't shocked. This is what he had expected from Hudson, and he embraced it without trying to stop him. After all, he deserved more than a few punches for what he did. Callie, how could you do that to Catherine? Laura turned her irritated and hurt gaze from Ashton to Callie, who was standing beside her. Ashton was too drunk to think straight. She tried to justify her innocence in the matter with a sorry face but in actuality, she was bursting with happiness. And you took advantage of the situation? Anne screamed at the top of her lungs. She was the only one, other than Catherine, who clearly knew what kind of a cunning fox Callie was. It just hurt her to know that her friend's insecurities had turned out to be true. What? Of course not. I tried to stop him, she retorted angrily. Oh, really? Because I doubt that, Anne stared at her, rolling her eyes. Ashton's father strode near his son with a murderous glare. He was sent to the best schools in the country to be a gentleman and definitely not to involve in adultery. He didn't think twice before landing his palm on Ashton's cheek. You have brought disgrace to this family, he spat at him. Stop it, all of you. Henry, Ashton's grandfather, walked in between his son and grandson. I am disappointed, Ashton, he said, shaking his head slowly. Ashton's mom and grandmother were almost in tears. Kate had started to like her daughter-in-law so much. Catherine was the daughter Kate could never give birth to. Her heart ached to think that her son had committed such a great blunder. It was definitely going to break him apart. She knew it very well. She liked Callie, but Kate believed she could never replace Catherine in Ashton's heart. All that we have to do now is make sure Catherine is safe. Henry spoke in an authoritative tone. For the next few minutes, they made several calls to find out Catherine's whereabouts. Ashton called his personal investigator to look into the issue. After hours of trying, his PI managed to pull out a CCTV camera footage a few blocks away from their apartment. Mrs. Schwimmer is seen walking alone in the streets at around 10 in the night, he informed, pointing at his laptop screen. 
They all surrounded him and watched as the image of Catherine walking in the lone street. Ashton's already broken heart shattered further into countless pieces, seeing Catherine walking in the street like that, hurt and alone. And in another video, we see this. The P.I. fell out of words to explain it. They all gasped loudly as everyone saw Catherine suddenly collapse on the road. A loud whimper left Kate's lips as she failed to control it within her palms. If Ashton felt hurt earlier, now there were no words to explain his anguish. He could feel a physical pain at his chest that felt like his heart was ripped open and left to bleed. A few seconds later, a man in a black suit jacket rushed to lift her from the ground and carried her into his car. He must be trying to help her. A trace, a relief, flashed on everyone's face except for Callie, who was chewing her nails restlessly with fear in her eyes, fearing that Catherine would be back soon. Zoom in to the number plate. It was the first time that Ashton spoke. We have done that, Mr. Schwimmer, but we were unable to find the owner of the car. What do you mean by that? Use everything in our power to find out, Henry ordered. We did, sir, but there are a small problem in it. The poor investigator stuttered. The car belongs to an influential person, and for security reasons, his identity couldn't be revealed just with his car number. Damn it! The sudden loud shattering of the glass on the table made everyone jump with horror. Ashton drove his fist into the glass tabletop, making it bleed profusely. Oh my God, Ashton! Kate rushed to her son, taking his wounded palm in her hands. He pulled away from her harshly. The pain was nothing compared to the one at his heart. It would injure his whole body if it would bring back his Catherine to him. How stupid was Ashton to sleep when Catherine was in such a mindset? He should have known that she was too sensitive and this was how things would end up. He ran his injured hand into his hair for the tenth time in the last minute. Where was she? How was she? Please, God, bring her back to me and I promise to never break her heart again. He prayed silently. His eyes were brimming with tears. Well, do something, anything to find out where she is, he roared at his investigator. We are doing our best, Mr. Schwimmer. We will get back to you soon he said before collecting his laptop from the damaged table and walking out. He knew he was going to have a tiring week, or maybe even a month ahead with this case. No one stayed back after the investigator left. They were still pissed off at Ashton and Callie. Well, he deserved to suffer for what he did, Laura mumbled to Hudson and Ann before throwing a shameful look at Callie. Callie rolled her eyes, letting out a huge breath. All this drama was suffocating her. She was happy that everyone had finally left him alone. For the past few days, she had been trying to contact Ashton to discuss about what he was planning to do now that she had made him believe that they had slept together, but he had been dodging all her calls and appointments. This was the right moment to talk to him, she thought, as she went to lock the door. Ashton, we need to talk, she announced, crossing her arms over her chest and taking a place in between his legs. He stood up, shoving her roughly and making his way into his study. He couldn't handle this right now. All he could think about was his missing wife and nothing else bothered him as much as to think there was a chance that he would never see her again. Ashton, don't you walk out on me. Callie caught his arm firmly. Callie, he pulled his arm from her hold. Go away. What? You think you can sleep with me and ignore me for the rest of your life? Pretend nothing happened? She stood in front of him, blocking his way. I can't do this right now, Callie. Please understand, he spoke in a broken tone. No, Ashton, I'm done waiting for you. I want an answer from you now. What answer do you want, huh? He began to pace forward with a murderous glare that Callie had never seen one before. Tell me, what do you want to hear from me, Callie? I, I, Ashton, she suddenly felt like she lost her ability to speak. She wanted to tell him to forget his wife. She wanted to tell him to start seeing her in a different way. She wanted to tell him to love her back just the way she loved him. She wanted to tell him to give them a chance. She wanted to tell so much more, but she stood blinking at him. I know I made a mistake, but that doesn't mean you are completely out of fault. You are equally blameworthy, Callie. You could have stopped all this from happening, you know, but you decided otherwise. Now what do you want me to do? He whispered, yelled at her. Ashton, I shouldn't say this right now, but I think Catherine is gone and she is never coming back if I know her correctly. I think you should stop thinking about her if you don't want to feel the pain. You should give us a chance, and I'm sure you will start to love me more than you ever loved Catherine. Her words somehow managed to snap something within him. Callie noticed the muscles at his jaw tick and his eyes turning cold and menacing. Callie, don't make me regret that I ever considered you my best friend. Get out of here before I lose control of my rage. He spoke in an unfamiliar cold tone. His chest was moving up and down as his nostrils flared anger at Callie for speaking such nonsense. How could she even think for a second that he would forget Catherine and be happy with her? 
If thinking about Catherine would give him pain, then so be it. He would happily endure the bittersweet pain till the last moment of his life, but he would never think of spending it with someone else. Callie was dumbstruck by hearing his words. She thought she was finally going to get what she had wanted her whole life, but she had clearly underestimated Ashton's love for Catherine. There was no way she could replace Catherine for him. Leave, Callie, if you still have an ounce of respect for the friendship we shared. She heard him say loudly before he slammed the door to his study. A few months earlier. England. Mr. Mackenzie, your father is diagnosed with liver cancer, the chief doctor informed Harris. Harris stared at the doctor, trying to process his words for a couple of minutes. How bad is it? Harris asked blankly. I'm sorry, but he is at the final stage of his illness. Harris pressed his lips into a thin line to control his raging emotions. Can I see him? Yeah, sure. The doctor led him to the VIP ward where Harold Mackenzie was admitted. Harris took a deep breath before tapping on the door gently. He peeped into the room and watched his father, motioning weakly at him to enter. Dad, you are going to be okay. I just talked to the doctor and he said you are completely fine. He lied in order to comfort his sick father who looked weak, pale, and nothing like the man who was his superhero. Warm tears prickled at the back of his eyes when his old man snorted at his words. Whom are you trying to fool, Harris? I know I am dying a slow death. I've known this for a while now. He smiled at his son, a smile that didn't reach his eyes. I'm not afraid to die, son, but I would regret dying without getting a chance to meet my daughter again. Harris watched tears slipping from his old man's eyes. He blinked to stop his own tears from falling. It pained him to see the once strong and powerful man lying on a hospital bed with numerous cords attached to his body. He swallowed the lump that was forming in his throat. No, Dad, I wouldn't let that happen. Harris shook his head while holding his father's palm softly. I promise to bring her back to you, Dad. Wherever she is on this planet, I would find her out. That's a promise. He got up and left the room hurriedly. Harris walked into his car, and now that there was no one around him, he let his tears fall from his eyes, which did nothing to lighten his heavy heart. He wiped his tears before dialing the personal investigator's number, whom he had hired six months back, to find out about his stepsister's whereabouts. Harris was six when his grandparents informed him that he had a stepsister on the other side of the world. Being an only child, his life was too dull and monotonous. He always had wanted a sibling, and when he came to know of her existence, he couldn't wait to meet her right from that day onward. Harris had known his father's bad choices in his past, but he had also witnessed him suffer for most of his life. Harold Mackenzie was a young billionaire from England, wanting to spread his empire in the States, where he met Agnes Earnshaw, an employee. She was young, pretty, and smart. No man could resist her charm, and he was no different from any other man with young blood. Within few months of being in a dating relationship, Agnes announced her pregnancy. She pressured him to marry her, which he did to stop it from becoming a scandal. She wasn't behind his money. He was sure of it, but she needed his undivided attention on her, which he couldn't give due to his busy lifestyle. Months passed into years, and when he couldn't handle the pressure anymore, he started having affairs and finally decided to walk out of the marriage, which wasn't working out for him. It was in a business party, his old friend informed him of his ex-wife's death. Harold had been begging Agnes to let him see his daughter, but she couldn't take their separation easily. She changed into this crazy, possessive mother who was scared that Harold would take her daughter away from her. Harold knew she was a dedicated mother to their daughter, and he wanted to assure her that he would never take their daughter away from her, but not even in his wildest dreams did he imagine that she would take her own life, making sure he would never get to his daughter. That was her way of revenge against Harold for leaving her for another woman. What had he not done to meet his firstborn and bring her back to England? She was an heiress meant to rule the Mackenzie group of companies and definitely did not belong to an orphanage. It had been almost 20 years, but he had no clue where his daughter was. Hell, he didn't know if she was still alive. Hello, Mr. Mackenzie. Harris was pulled out of his thoughts when he heard his investigator's voice on the line. Did you find out anything about her yet? Harris asked his investigator a little annoyed. He was given the project four months back, yet he hadn't found out any clue about his sister. There is no Catherine Mackenzie in Staten Islands that matches the details you've provided. The investigator paused. But we may have gotten closer to her. What? This was the first time the investigator gave a positive news about his stepsister. 
Yes, Mr. Mackenzie. Her mother might have possibly changed her surname to Earnshaw before her death. How can you be so sure? I managed to contact the warden of the home in Staten Island. And? And there grew up a Catherine Earnshaw who matches with your details. Then what are we waiting for? Harris was becoming impatient. I'm afraid that she isn't in Staten Islands anymore, Mr. Mackenzie. Harris cursed under his breath. This was becoming difficult than he thought. He ran his palm down his face. I will get back to you when I get more details about her. All right, thanks. He muttered before ending the call. Harris sat in his car and gave a thought about it all. Now that his father was left with only a few more years, he shouldn't rely on this investigator completely, he decided. I need to go find her myself. He mumbled before bringing his car to a start. It took approximately three weeks for Harris to find out that Catherine had moved to Manhattan, and a week after that, to find out her office address. The first time he saw her in person, he knew without a doubt in his mind that she was his sister. She had the same deep shade of blue eyes like him, and her face was in a close resemblance to their father. He was happy to see her as a successful woman, married into an affluent family. He watched her walk out of a gynecologist clinic after she left. He used his influence to find out that she was six weeks pregnant. He couldn't put his contentment in words. He came to Manhattan in search of his sister. Now he was going to meet her whole family. His lips slid into a grin when he thought he was going to have a niece or nephew soon. He wanted to call his father right away to give the good news, but instead decided to give him a surprise by waiting a little more. He was so excited to finally meet her the next day. He kept thinking what her reaction would be. Will she accept me right away as her brother? Will she believe me? Will she be angry about the fact that somehow my mother was responsible for her mother's death? He couldn't sleep even for a bit that night and foolishly decided to ask his driver to drive him near her apartment building. The car was parked under a tree while he leaned back on his seat. The soft sound of the drizzling rain lulled him pleasantly, and there was a permanent smile plastered on his lips that he couldn't help wiping off his face. After spending about two hours simply staring up at her apartment window, he instructed his poor driver to take him back to his hotel room. Wait, wait, wait. He stopped his driver as he saw Catherine suddenly walking out of the building with a bag in her hands. What the heck? His smile was replaced with a deep scowl when he saw her wiping her stream of tears. She looked sad and hurt. Where does she think she is going? He muttered, looking out as the rain started pouring heavily. Follow her. He slid to the other side of the seat to have a clearer look at her. His car followed slowly behind her until she reached three blocks away from her apartment. Shit. He grumbled when she collapsed right in front of his eyes. Stop the car. Stop the car. He didn't even wait for the car to come to a halt before he jumped out of it and ran to her. Catherine. Catherine. He patted on her cheek softly. His eyes landed on her bag. Why is she carrying a bag? Was she planning to leave her husband? Did he break her heart? He balled his fist, thinking of punching the bastard who broke her heart. He tapped on her cheek once again, but when she wasn't opening her eyes, he rushed her back into his car. He didn't think again before he pulled out his phone and dialed his secretary's number. Arrange a private jet to take me back to London tonight. To the airport now. He ordered his driver impatiently before looking down at Catherine, who had placed her head on his lap. He looked at her, and she was pale. I never imagined that the first time we meet, you will be in such a condition, Catherine. He mumbled, pushing her wet strands of hair away from her face. Within minutes, they were inside his private jet. His secretary helped in changing Catherine's wet clothes. He tucked her under the warm blankets before closing the door of the small cabin. Catherine's head was pounding when she opened her eyes the next morning. The events of the previous night rushed back to her mind and she couldn't hold back the low whimper that escaped her lips. Then she remembered walking out of the house in the middle of the night before she blacked out completely. She sat up slowly looking around and that's when she noticed three pairs of eyes staring at her. Oh, my baby. An old woman with lots of wrinkles on her face squeezed her into a tight hug. She stiffened under the woman's warm embrace while she shifted her eyes to the other two people present in the room. An old man, probably the woman's husband, and a young man whose features she thought were too familiar. Where am I? She could finally put some words together into that question. The woman pulled away from her, pushing Catherine's hair from her face. You are back home, Catherine. Catherine blinked around, clueless to what this woman was saying. This place was definitely not her home. She was sure of it. Seeing her confused look, Harris held her hand softly. She was quick enough to jerk away the stranger's hand away from hers. Catherine? Harris swallowed hard against the dryness of his throat. I'm your brother, Harris. And they are our grandparents, Hugh and Esther. What? 
She looked at him like he has lost his mind or probably hit his head hard against a pole. Yes, my child, we were dying to meet you. We thought we would never meet you in this lifetime. The old man was the one to speak now. Surprisingly, his voice managed to calm her a bit. But God was kind enough to send you back to us. He took a place on the bed beside her leg. She noticed the guy who claimed to be her brother was studying her intently, standing at the edge of the bed. She could tell he was related to her by blood because of his close resemblance to her own. Where am I? She asked again, a little sternly this time. You are in London, Catherine, Harris told her as a matter of fact. Catherine, you must not put yourself under too much pressure when you are pregnant, Esther said, gesturing to her husband to move out, giving the sibling some alone time. How the hell did you know about my pregnancy? She wondered before shifting her eyes to the young man. He looked a couple of years younger than her. You know, Dad would be so happy to finally meet you after so many years. He grinned at her, but his grin faded as he saw the fury burning in her eyes. Dad? I don't have a dad. She spat at him and turned away from him. Harris lost his mother when he was 13, and he missed her a lot even now. He could understand the difficulties that Catherine must have faced as a child in an orphanage with no one to look after her. He was lucky to be brought up in a loving family, unlike her. She must have hated her parents for not being a part of her life, but little did she know how hard her father tried to get her back. He decided he wouldn't say anything right now and slipped out of the room quietly, giving her some privacy. For the next few days, Catherine would simply stare at the four walls for hours. She would often cry thinking about Ashton. She couldn't deny the fact that she missed him so much, but there was also another emotion that was filling at her heart. Hate. Now that she thought about everything, the only feeling she had for Ashton was hate. Her meals were brought in by Esther while it became a routine for Hugh and Harris to visit her every day. They would keep initiating conversations with the hope that she would answer them back. They would stay by her side until she fell asleep. Even with his poor health condition, Harold wanted to visit Catherine right the moment Harris informed about his arrival. Harris explained to Harold about her emotional instability at the moment and asked his father to wait for the right moment to meet her. Harris knew how much she hated her father and she wasn't to be blamed. Fate had played a cruel role in their lives. When his father grew impatient to see her, he finally took him to meet her when he knew she would be asleep. It broke his heart to see his father break down into tears seeing Catherine after so many years. She looks so fragile, he mumbled to his son, wiping his wet cheeks. How could someone break her heart? He now understood the sufferings that Agnes must have undergone after he left her, and it pained him beyond explanation. A week later, Catherine decided she was done brooding over Ashton. She had a baby growing within her, and she couldn't let history repeat itself. If he could be happy without her, then so be it. She could also be happy without him. She tried to console her hopeless heart. She remembered promising herself to love the baby with all that she had, and she didn't need a man for that. She didn't want to be weak like her mother, and she wouldn't let her daughter suffer for what her father had done. She rolled up her sleeves and swooped up her hair into a tight bun. She decided to rise up once again for the sake of her baby. I want to work. I cannot sit her idly the whole day, she announced to her brother when he came to visit her after work. It startled him initially to hear her speak to him for the first time willingly, but he was happy that she had finally decided to move on and he wanted to offer his full support to her. Well, then you should start working from tomorrow. After all, you are a major shareholder in McKinsey Group of Companies, and the CEO position had been remaining unoccupied for a while now. He grinned at her boyishly. Ah, uh, but Harris, she stuttered. It was a huge responsibility to take up, and she wasn't very confident about it. Sister, don't worry, I'll be with you in every step. Moreover, I believe you are smart enough to learn things faster than you give credits to. He squeezed her hand gently, providing the warmth and comfort which she needed at that moment. That day, a new ray of hope and determination sparked within her. Ashton kicked open the door to his apartment, which was engulfed in a tragic darkness. His house was never so dark before. Catherine always made sure to keep it well lit and ventilated. Now that she was gone, both his house as well as his life felt awfully dark. Ashton's hands stumbled against the wall in search of the switches to turn on the lights. But with the amount of alcohol in his body, even standing still on the ground was becoming too difficult for Ashton. Kathy, baby, are you home? He called out to her like he had been doing for the past six months with a slight trace of hope still lingering at his heart that someday his wife would say, yes, honey, I'm here. When he didn't hear anything in return except for the grave silence, he silently walked into his bedroom and opened Catherine's closet. He pulled out her yellow sundress 
that still held a tinge of her sweet scent. While pulling it out, something shiny fell on the ground making a thud sound in the otherwise silent room. Ashton was so drunk that his eyes were droopy and almost blinded. He bent down carelessly, grabbing the thing between his palms and shoved it roughly back into the closet. He didn't bother changing his clothes as he slumped on the bed heavily, burying his face in the soft piece of clothing that managed to bring a smile on his lips. As his lids closed, sleep took over him. Ashton. His eyes automatically shot open when he heard Catherine's faint voice. He noticed the room was now illuminated with warm fairy lights and smelled of rose-scented candles. Catherine stood at the doorframe wearing a light pink gown, giving her an angelic appearance. Baby, where are you? He jerked up on the bed. I missed you so much, he mumbled, stretching his hand out for her. Glad you missed me. Her juicy lips curved into a naughty grin as she walked near his bed. He watched her climb over and straddled him. Because I want you to miss me just the way I miss you. She whispered seductively against his lips so that he could feel her breath against his lips. He grabbed the nape of her neck and pulled her closer. He showed her how much he was missing her with the intensity of his kisses. He snaked his hands up under the thin material of her gown and felt her soft skin under his rough hands. He ran his lips and hands all over her sweet body before gently slipping the gown off her shoulders, all the while his eyes fixed on her stunningly beautiful face. He buried his hands into her brown locks and kissed her with a fervid passion. I missed you so badly, baby. Never leave me again, please. He hugged her closely, fearing she would leave him again. He caught her waist and steadied her on him so that her face was a few inches above his. He felt himself reach the heights of bliss as he buried himself within her, stretching her tight walls and filling her completely. He groaned at the physical pleasure that felt like spark all over his body. When Ashton noticed that she was completely motionless on him, not even blinking her eyes, he slowly guided her arms around his shoulders. He hugged her tightly at her waist and buried his face into the valley between her peaks. He gave in and thrust it into her with gentle yet desperate strokes. When he was about to reach his moment of euphoria, he for once, just for a microsecond, closed his eyes, which was a grave mistake, because the next moment he opened his eyes, he saw the fire on the candles flicker before they were blown off one by one, turning the room pitch black once again. No, no, no! He shook his head nervously and tightened his hold on Catherine as her image in front of him began to crumble down like pieces of blocks. Kathy, please don't leave me. I swear I'll never hurt you. Baby, please, please. His cries died down and turned to sobs when she completely vanished from his lap. Ashton? Ashton, wake up. He opened his eyes when he felt a few gentle taps on his shoulders. Oh my God, look at you, he heard someone mutter. Ashton brought his hand up against his face to cover the harsh sun rays that were hurting his eyes. Another dream about Catherine being in his arms. It had become regular, he would say, and it only increased his pain to wake up beside the cold and empty space on the bed where once Catherine used to sleep. He groaned holding his head that was pounding with a bad headache, and that's when he noticed Laura standing beside his bed. She had a sorry look on her face. Laura watched her friend sit up on the bed slowly. He was a mess, while he stank of alcohol, and why wouldn't he? He had been drinking mindlessly since the night Catherine left. His previously stubbled jaw was savagely covered with rough and long beard. She had never seen him like this in his entire life. What have you done to yourself, Ashton? Of course she was beyond mad at him for cheating on his wife, that she didn't talk to him for two months straight, but she couldn't be angry on him anymore when Noah informed her that Ashton was literally surviving on alcohol. As his friend from childhood, she knew that he needed someone by his side to pull him out of the grave that he was digging for himself. Leave me alone. She heard him grumble and turn on his other side. He wasn't in a mood for her lecture so early in the morning about his recent addiction to alcohol that she had been nagging him with lately. I would gladly leave you alone, but before that you may want to come out. Your poor investigator is waiting for you outside your apartment for a long while. He says it is something urgent. Ashton remembered that his P.I. wanted to tell him something that the previous night, but he was too wasted to listen to him. He threw his legs down on the floor before making his way into the bedroom. Laura shook her head and huffed before deciding to give him some privacy. How could you still not find her? Ashton shrieked on top of his lungs at his investigator. It has been six months since she left, and I've got no information from you yet. Do you want me to replace you with a better one? Ashton, please calm down. Laura held his arm to pacify him. He jerked away her hands off his arm. Mr. Schwimmer, I may not have information about your wife yet, but I have something much more of importance. The investigator spoke to Ashton in a calm and measured approach. 
He was used to such situations, and he knew how impatient his clients became when they wanted him to find out something of great importance to them. After all, he wouldn't have survived for so long as a successful investigator, if not for his patience. What can possibly be more important than my wife? Ashton snapped back at him. I do not care about anything else right now. Just focus on finding her. Ashton turned on his heels to leave the room. Mr. Ashton, we tracked down the stripper from Miss Catherine's bachelorette party. The investigator spoke in a hurried tone which managed to grab Ashton's attention as he ceased walking further. Where is that bastard? He balled his fist to his side to control the anger bubbling inside him as the images of the stripper with Catherine flashed in his mind. Why don't you come with us, Mr. Ashton? He asked Ashton, ignoring his previous question. He has some serious confessions to make to you. I will come with you, Laura announced, picking up her purse from the coffee table before rushing beside the two men. After a 30 minutes ride, they reached the investigator's room that looked nothing like a normal office. The files were scattered all over the place. The walls were covered with papers and photos pinned to it like the webs of a spider. Laura gasped loudly when her eyes fell on the person inside a cell whose hands were tied to the back of a chair. Sorry for the mess, the handsome investigator apologized, noticing her terrorized look. He cleared the files from the chairs and dragged them too loudly into the cell before asking them to settle in front of the man who looked like a deer caught under the headlights. Ashton's eyes filled with rage the moment he saw the man's face who was hugging and caressing his Catherine in those pictures that floated all over New York City for over a month. Before anyone could realize what was happening, Ashton strode forward and landed a hard punch on his face, causing his nostrils to bleed profusely. You bastard! How dare you touch my Kathy! He raised his fisted arm to throw another punch at him before the investigator pulled him away. Mr. Ashton, calm down. Please, I wouldn't let you harm him when he is under my custody. He pleaded, Ashton, before shoving him slightly away from the stripper so that he wouldn't be able to harm him anymore. He paused and gestured at someone to come in. Before I proceed, I want you to meet James, who helped me solve the case. I guess you know him already. Laura and Ashton turned their gazes together at James, Callie's ex-boyfriend. What is he doing here? Laura asked, annoyed. She didn't know where this was all taking to. I have known James my entire life. A few months ago, he was threatened to death by someone you know, and he left Manhattan immediately. But fortunately, we were still in touch, the investigator narrated. Now, tell him what you said to me earlier. He turned to the stripper. The gentleness with which he spoke to Ashton was now replaced by a deathly warning tone, to which the stripper swallowed loudly. I, I, I swear I didn't do it purposefully. He swallowed again. I was asked to do it, and I, I did it for money. Laura noticed that the man was trembling visibly. Who was it who gave you this dirty job? Ashton stared at him as his nostrils flared, and the muscles at his jaw ticked. There. The man pointed his finger at something on the table which made Ashton and Laura turn back to it. The investigator walked to the table and brought a couple of photographs that were laid on it. He handed it to Ashton and waited a few seconds for his reactions. What the fuck? He threw the photographs on the stripper's face. This is impossible. He is definitely lying. And you, you are with him in this, aren't you? He turned to James before he leaned toward to punch the stripper even more than he deserved. He was stopped by the investigator who pushed him on the chair. Now listen to James before you kill him. Ashton, I wanted to tell you everything when Catherine asked me to, but I was too scared. They threatened to kill my family. However, I felt very sorry for Catherine. I knew she was in trouble because of that snake you think is your friend. I wanted to help Catherine, and when I spoke to John about it, we found out this was all somehow connected to one another. We checked everything from your friend's bank accounts to her phone number, and that's when we found him. James tried to make him understand. Laura had no clue what was going on until her eyes landed on the photographs lying on the floor. Callie? She mumbled. Something triggered her mind to drift back to a distant memory of a night. The night of Catherine's bachelorette party when she was totally wasted. She couldn't find Catherine anywhere. She was clumsily searching for the restroom when she passed a long corridor and stopped upon hearing Callie's voice. You just need to lay next to her and hug her as tightly as possible. We will click your intimate pictures. Laura peeped into the room and adjusted her eyes when she saw Callie speaking to the stripper. But what if I get caught? The stripper asked nervously. That wouldn't happen since you wouldn't be staying a minute longer in Manhattan. My father had made all the necessary arrangements for your stay at Las Vegas, Callie said proudly before shoving the bundle of cash into his hands. Now get inside before someone sees us here, 
Judy pushed his bulky frame into a dark room, after which both the girls laughed wickedly and got out from the other entrance of the corridor. Laura's mind was hazy to think straight, and she couldn't process her words then. But now, when she gave it all a proper thought, it made sense to her. Everything began to fall in its place. When she snapped out of her trance, Ashton had laid the stripper flat on the floor and was punching the life out of him. She watched the investigator trying to peel Ashton away from the stripper, but Ashton wanted to kill him for trying to frame his friend. Ashton, stop, stop it! She tugged at his arm, but when he didn't budge, her voice rose an octave higher than usual. Ashton, yes, it was Callie who hired him that night. Her voice echoed within the four walls of the rooms, causing Ashton and the investigator to snap at her. What? Ashton noticed the tears that were flowing from her eyes. She was standing without moving a muscle, still shocked from the memory that suddenly popped in her brain. Laura, what did you just say? He narrowed his eyes at her, shaking her a few times to bring her back from her reverie. Ashton, her lower lips trembled as she tried to put her thoughts into words. That night I saw Callie and Judy talking to him, asking him to get into the room where Catherine was resting. Her tears were flowing freely down her cheek. I was drunk that night like everybody else, and I didn't remember any of it until now. She sobbed into her hands. No, I don't believe you. You are confusing it all with something else. He shook his head from side to side. Callie can never do something like that, he said, pushing her away before turning his gaze on the stripper. This bastard is just trying to frame Callie. He will tell you the truth with a few more punches. Laura held his wrist, stopping him from taking another step. Ashton saw her pulling out her phone from her purse and dial someone's number. Can you meet me at the park near your house? She spoke calmly into the cell before throwing the phone back into her purse. Come with me, Laura said, grabbing his wrists. I'm not going anywhere with you, Laura. I know Callie would never try to harm me by pulling such a cheap stunt like this asshole claims. He pulled away his hand from Laura and left the room angrily. Okay, I'm going alone. Keep denying it until you reach a point in your life where it would be too late to rectify things, she shouted at him. Callie saw Laura sitting alone on a bench in the park. She was being pampered at the salon when she got a call from Laura. Hey! Callie immediately removed the poker look from her face the moment Laura turned towards her. Why did you want to meet up here? She asked, looking around. Sit. Laura patted the space beside her while Callie silently obeyed her. Callie watched as Laura pulled out a photograph that she had managed to get from the investigator. Do you know him? She brought it closer to Callie and noticed the sudden stiffness on Callie's face, confirming her doubts. I... I don't know. She shook her head in denial. Liar. Laura seethed through her gritted teeth. I may have forgotten who he is. She corrected her previous sentence when she noticed Laura's fury in her eyes. I have proof that you know him too well to forget. Laura pulled out the bank transaction details from her bag. The investigator was brilliant enough to collect all the evidence against Callie even before he got the stripper under his custody. He had been following him closely for a month before accusing him of anything. His phone and bank details were checked thoroughly. The frequent money transfer from Callie's bank account to the strippers confirmed all his suspicions before he caught him in a lavish pub in Las Vegas. What is this? Callie asked dumbly, looking at the sheet. You have transferred huge amounts of money not once, but twelve times in the last nine months to someone whom you may have forgotten. May I know why? Laura smirked at her. I, I don't... N Callie stuttered. Come on, Callie, I know everything. Laura said in a defeated tone. After all she had known Callie her whole life, and she never thought she would do something so cheap. Yes, it was me who hired the stripper to make Catherine fall low in Ashton's eyes. Callie crossed her arms and narrowed her eyes at Laura when she knew that it was of no use to deny it anymore. I wanted Ashton to throw her out of his life, but that bitch somehow managed to stay in his life. She grinded her teeth together, thinking about Catherine. Never mind, he's all mine now, she smirked at Laura. How could you do this to Ashton, Callie? Do you see how much he is hurting from inside? Laura asked her in a painful tone. Oh, I will heal him with time. Don't worry. She answered her confidently. Laura shook her head negatively. You will never be able to heal him, Callie. Ashton will never be happy with you. All he needs is Catherine back in his life. Shut up. Shut the fuck up. Callie jumped forward, strangling Laura's neck with all the force that she had got in her. It is all because of you. You were the one who brought them closer. If not for you, Ashton would have been mine right from the beginning. To Laura, Callie looked like this crazy woman she knew nothing about. She wondered how Callie could successfully conceal this monster within her from all of them for so many years. This will all end if I kill you. Ah! Before she knew, Callie was roughly pushed to the ground. Her eyes widened as big as saucers as soon as her eyes traveled to the tall frame of the man standing there. 
Ashton? His chest was heaving up and down while his eyes were blood red with fury. After the night Callie begged to give them a chance together, she had come to see Ashton several times, trying to convince him again and again, which pissed him off. He almost screamed at her the last time they met, asking her to stay away from him. He ignored it all as her usual childish behavior and never thought she would have played such a cruel role in his separation from his wife. He wanted to smack himself when he thought of those times when Catherine was trying to tell him about Callie's wrongdoings. He had simply chosen to not believe her. He felt ashamed for not believing in his wife's words. Why, Callie? Why? He strode towards her. What did I ever do to you? Why would you do such a cruel thing to me? Ashton, that's because I love you. He snorted at her words. Love? He shook his head mockingly. His eyes had so much pain in them when he looked at her. You don't do such things to the one whom you love, Callie. If it were me in your place, I would have wished you all the happiness in the world instead of plotting against me. His tears rolled down his cheeks. Laura noticed James and Ashton's investigator standing behind them. You know, I didn't believe them even when I drove here. I thought I would be able to prove your innocence to them, but I guess I have been a fool for a long while to blindly believe you. Ashton, please, I love you, Ashton. I couldn't see you with her. You were mine and you always belong to me. She tried to hug him, but Ashton was fast enough to push her away from him before placing a hard slap on her cheek, causing her to fall with her ass on the floor. Don't you ever dare come near me, he clenched his jaw together. You are dead to me right from this moment onwards. I feel ashamed for even calling you my best friend. Never show your face to me again, if you even have an ounce of respect left for the friendship we once had. It started to rain heavily as they all left her alone in the park and walked to their cars. Ashton, please slow down. Laura was trying to calm Ashton during the entire ride back to his apartment. He felt like his whole life was a lie. How could he so blindly have believed Callie his whole life? How could he not see what a viper Callie was? Poor Kathy, she tried to tell me about Callie's viciousness several times, but I was a bitch to her. Laura couldn't control her whimpers. Ashton clutched his jaws and tightened his hold around the steering, turning his knuckles pale. He wanted to throw a hard punch on his balls for choosing to believe Callie instead of her. He remembered the words he used against Kathy when she accused Callie. He had called her a jealous wife and accused her of being so insecure about his friendship. He even went to the extent of returning from his honeymoon to stay beside Callie, foolishly believing that she needed him genuinely. Callie had somehow managed to ruin all of his precious moments with Kathy. When he gave a deep thought about all those incidents, they all seemed well planned. Where are we going? Laura asked, panicking when she observed Ashton taking a different route. To Judy's place. He spoke coldly, keeping his eyes fixed on the road. But why? I want answers, Laura. If anyone could clear my doubts, it is Judy. I don't understand. What other answers do you want? Do you still not believe us at all? He glanced at Laura and his eyes immediate softened, looking at her tear-stained eyes. Laura had always been there for him, but he had always ignored her like he ignored everyone else for his so-called best friend. He had the rights to explain everything to her. He huffed loudly and began to explain. I have a feeling like there is more to this, Laura. After all this... I highly doubt I ever slept with her because all this while my consciousness had been screaming at me that I haven't touched a hair on her body. Laura's eyes widened at his words. Her heartbeat began to race wildly. Oh my God, Ashton, did she trick us into all believing that you slept with her, knowing well enough that Catherine would be devastated and leave you? She covered her mouth with her palms. Ashton didn't bother answering her. Instead, stroke his foot on the accelerator harshly. Laura turned away to look out praying that he doesn't hurt Judy for playing such nasty parts in his life. Judy could have stopped Callie if she wanted to, but instead she had only fueled the fire within Callie. Laura had called Hudson, Anne, and Noah to Judy's house. She decided that everyone had the right to know the truth, and by the time they reached there, they were all waiting for them. Ashton pulled his car aside and marched near the door, knocking on it as loud as possible, continuously until it was thrown open. Who the hell? Judy's voice died down her throat. Ashton, what are you doing here? Her eyes shifted on the others who had to literally run behind Ashton to catch up with his pace. Ashton pushed the door wide open and strode in. Judy noticed the murderous glare that he was throwing at her and she couldn't resist the urge to swallow against the dryness of her throat. Hey, everyone. She tried to act normal, but in reality her heart was drumming against her chest wildly, thinking of all possible reasons for their unannounced arrival. Sit. Laura ordered her in a cold tone which made Judy obey her without removing her eyes from Laura. Spill. That one word from Ashton was enough to form sweat beads on her forehead. 
Everyone blinked at the three with not even a slightest clue of the situation. What? 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 Judy stuttered. Just then, they all heard her phone ringing loudly. Ashton was quick enough to grab it from the table. He smirked at the name being displayed on the screen before turning it towards everyone. He was glad he had reached to her before Callie did. Pretend we are not here. He growled at her before turning on the speaker. Judy, what took you so long? Callie's distressed voice was heard, causing everyone to perk their ears up. I'm, I'm sorry, I was taking a shower. All right, look, Ashton somehow found out about the stripper that we had arranged for Catherine's bachelorette party. They all gasped softly at Callie's revelation. Oh, Judy's eyes widened. Now she understood why Ashton was looking like he wanted to kill someone. She slowly turned her gaze at Ashton, who still had those homicidal look in his eyes. He might call you or he may even come to your house, but do not panic and do not answer his calls at any cost, okay? Uh, okay. She looked at Ashton, who motioned her to keep talking. She swallowed hard, trying to think of something to continue with. Mm -hmm. do, do you think he's mad at you for what you did? He is beyond mad, Judy. She was irritated at Judy's silly question. I can't believe he slapped me. Judy began to panic, thinking she was going to be the next to witness his fury that was clearly visible in his blood-red eyes. But don't worry. I've always had my own ways to bring him back to me. Callie continued, oblivious to everyone's presence. Ashton ran his palm over his face like he had lost a battle. The pain was deep and unexplainable. How would he ever believe anyone in this world after this? D does he know anything else? Judy read the question from the piece of paper that Ashton scribbled on hurriedly. Luckily, no. I don't even want to imagine about how he will react if he comes to know that I lied to him about that night in Paris. I have to make sure he never finds out. He will run back to that bitch if he knows that he didn't touch me at all that night. She kept on blathering. Ashton breathed out a huge sigh of relief, as did his friends. To tell that they were dumbfounded would be an understatement. When they were asked to come to Judy's house, all they thought was they were planning some kind of surprise for Judy, but this never expected any of this. Ashton didn't know if he wanted to cry or laugh at that moment because he was torn between the two options. One side of his heart wanted him to jump up and down triumphantly knowing he hadn't actually cheated on his wife, and the other side wanted to weep for the sweet childhood friendship that had gone bitter. You bitch. You're even more wicked than we thought, Hudson spat out loudly. J Judy, who is that near you? Callie's voice began to tremble at the sudden outburst. Ashton didn't bother listening to the remaining conversation as he walked out. He felt suffocated and was in desperate need of fresh air. He had heard enough, and what mattered the most was he didn't cheat on Catherine like he thought he did. All he had to do now was to find out Catherine and explain everything to her. He knew she would be angry at him since she had tried to warn him so many times about Callie, but he had blindly refused to believe her, but he also believed that she would forgive him soon if he worked hard for her forgiveness. He reached home and took out the divorce papers from his drawer. He looked at the empty space beside Catherine's signature where he was supposed to sign. He never gathered the courage to fill it. He shredded the papers into pieces before throwing them into the bin under the table. He would never be able to divorce her. She would always belong to him wherever she was, he thought. I will find her no matter what, he mumbled. Catherine stood near the wall-sized window of her office room on the 18th floor of the building. She could almost see the whole city from there, and the view of the setting sun was breathtaking. She had been coming to work every day, and that did a great job to keep her distracted from Ashton. She looked down when she felt a hard kick against her tummy. She smiled, rubbing her baby bump lovingly. Her baby girl had grown big, and she was ready to come out any time now. Although Catherine tried hard to be brave for her little girl, but there were times when she missed Ashton gravely. She would silently recall all the happy memories they had once shared. Her eyes would automatically swell up with tears, seeing the husbands of other pregnant women when she went for her monthly checkups. She wished Ashton was there beside her to love and care for her, just like the others. Why does her fate have to be always so cruel to her? What did she ever do to anyone to deserve this ill fate? She would often question herself. In the last few months, Catherine had grown closer to her grandparents and her brother Harris. They showered her all the love in the world, more than she could ever wish for. They went with her to all her checkups and made sure both mummy and baby were healthy. They were always careful not to bring up about her husband or the heartbreak that she went through, for which she was very grateful to them. However, the mere sight of her father's face made her skin crawl over her bones. He had begged her a hundred times for her forgiveness, but all she would do was to shut him out. She knew he was ill, but that fact was not enough to melt her heart 
and forget everything. Kathy? She heard a soft knock on her door. Yes. She turned around and her lips split into a grin when she saw Harris peeking at the door. Hey, sister. He grinned back at her. Every time she saw him, she wondered why she hadn't met him earlier in her life. He was such a sweet person and a loving brother. He was very understanding and way too mature for his age. He had wholeheartedly sacrificed the CEO position for her, which she knew belonged only to him, being the only male heir to their father. Ready to go home, he asked her, like he did every day. He never felt ashamed to travel with his pregnant sister. Yep, just give me a sec. Ah! Uh! Catherine yelled, holding her lower abdomen. Kathy, what is it? He rushed to her side worriedly. Harry, I guess I'm going into labor, she huffed painfully. Within half an hour, Harris managed to bring her to the hospital. He informed their family as soon as she was taken to the labor ward, and in an hour, her father and grandparents reached the hospital. After what felt like the longest 17 hours of their lives, they heard the cries of the baby. It's a healthy baby girl, the good doctor announced as soon as she walked out of the ward. How's my sister? Harry queried her. She is absolutely fine. You can see her in a few minutes when we shift her to a room. Thank you, doctor. Harris's eyes fell on the tiny baby wrapped in a pink blanket in his grandmother's arms. Oh my God, she is so cute, he whispered tenderly, touching her fingers. She looks just like her mother, his grandmother said, sniffling with happy tears. No, she is much more prettier than her mother, he mocked for which he got a smack on his head from his father. Harold walked closer and stretched his arms. Can I hold her? His mother saw a mix of joy and yearning in his crystal-like eyes. Careful. She placed the baby on his arms while he gently kissed the top of her head. I'm going to do everything that I miss doing with my daughter. His tears ran down his cheeks freely. Harris held his arms from behind. His own eyes were pooling with unshed tears. He was happy that his father was stable enough to hold his granddaughter. They were called in soon after Catherine was shifted to her room. Catherine, sweetie. Grandma cooted her. How are you feeling now? I'm good, Grandma, she smiled at them all. She held her baby in her arms, and Harris jogged beside her to watch his sleeping niece. She is so beautiful, Kathy, Harris said, kissing the baby's feet. What are you going to name her? Crystal Mackenzie, Catherine answered, looking at her baby's crystal blue eyes, which were just like Ashton's. How happy he would have been to carry her in his arms, she thought, but she knew she could only imagine it because it was never going to happen. He would never be part of her daughter's life. Their story had come to an abrupt end the moment he cheated on her. Five years later. Mommy, look, Uncle Harry is here. Little Crystal pulled her hand from Catherine's hold as she ran towards her uncle. Uncle Harry! She threw her small body in his arms. Hey, princess! Harris caught her and tossed her up in the air, causing her to giggle loudly. I missed you so much, baby girl! He placed a chaste kiss on her cheek. I missed you too, Uncle. Her pouted lower lip was the cutest thing Harris had ever seen. What took you so long? You told you would be back from Hong Kong in two days. She crossed her small arms, feigning anger at him. She looked so much like her mom when she was angry, Harris thought. I'm sorry, Angel. Something came up at the last moment and I couldn't avoid it. He apologized, holding his ear. How about we make up for it with some ice cream? He asked her in a hushed tone, seeing his sister walking near them. Yay! Crystal wrapped her chubby hands tightly around his neck. Shh, don't tell your mommy, okay? Whispered in her ears, looking at Catherine, who already had a look of suspicion on her face. What are you two planning? Catherine narrowed her eyes at the partners in crime. Nothing. They answered in unison, faking innocence, but Catherine knew they were up to something. Sister, Harris hugged Catherine. How are you? Great, just missed you so much. Good to have you back, brother. She patted his back. I missed you too, sis. Come, let's go home. I haven't eaten properly in days, and I'm starving right now. Grandma's prepared a whole banquet for you. She rolled her eyes at him. Ha ha, then we should hurry up. He laughed while walked out to where their car was parked. How was the auditing? Catherine asked while driving the car. Hmm, everything went smoothly. Harris averted his eyes from Catherine, since he couldn't lie at her face boldly. What was he supposed to do? He was in desperate need for answers, and Catherine had been as stubborn as a mule. He wanted to see the man for himself who had shattered his sister's heart into a million pieces. Initially, he had tried to hook up Catherine with so many eligible bachelors in London, but she refused to date anyone. Her whole life revolved around her daughter. She kept herself busy, juggling between taking care of her daughter and work. She was young and what people would call stunningly beautiful. 
She had a whole life ahead of her, and Harris did not want her to waste it by living like a saint. He wasn't in Hong Kong like he claimed. Instead, he was in Manhattan for a week looking for answers. He knew Catherine's ex-husband was one of the richest men in the continent. For anyone else in his place, it wouldn't have been easy to meet Ashton Schwimmer. But he wasn't anyone else. He was Harris McKenzie, belonging to an equally wealthy and powerful family. He came up with a merger plan between both the conglomerates to meet up with them. Seeing him for the first time in person, Harris understood why Catherine refused to date anyone else after divorcing Ashton. He was handsome and radiated so much dominance. He looked like he popped straight out of a modeling magazine, dressed impeccably in a gray button-up shirt and dark pants. His jaw was set hard and his dark brown hair was gelled back neatly. However, Harris noticed the blankness in his expression like he too was grieving over something like Catherine did. He wanted to get to know Ashton more. He wanted to see the woman with whom he had cheated on his sister. After following Ashton for three days, Harris got to know that he was still living in the same apartment where Catherine used to live once, but his investigator informed him that there was no sign of any other woman in his life, and Ashton had become this cold and ruthless businessman after his wife left him, who was hungrily acquiring all the companies that he could lay eyes upon. Later that week, Harris also found out about the woman, Callie Jones, sole heir to her father's beauty product company, which was once popular in the States. As such, they weren't doing great in their business, with lots of debts on their shoulders. It surprised him to know that Ashton was the reason behind their never-ending debts. He had played a wicked role in burning down their business into ash. Harris was certain that there was some kind of misunderstanding between Ashton and his sister, or even if Ashton had really cheated on Catherine, he was definitely regretting now. He came to Manhattan to throw several punches at Ashton's face for ruining his sister's life, but seeing Ashton, he had a change of heart. He understood why people said that there's always two sides to a story. Harris wanted them to meet again, or even if they weren't going to get back together, Ashton had the rights to know about his daughter, whose whole existence was unknown to him. He met with Ashton the day before he started to London and blindly signed up a merger contract with Schrimmer Group of Companies. Moreover, it was the right time to fulfill his father's dream to expand his business in the States. Hey! Catherine waved her hand in front of Harris to distract him from his daydreaming. Where are you lost? she asked. Sorry, I guess I'm tired from the jet lag. He shrugged and peeked behind to have a look at his cute niece who was quietly playing with her kitten plush toy. Now that he had met Ashton for the first time, he thought Crystal looked nothing like her mother, because most of her features were eerily similar to Ashton's, including her sharp nose and pitch black hair color. Her blue eyes were the only gene that Catherine could pass on to her daughter. As soon as she noticed her uncle looking at her, she stopped playing with her toy and paid her whole attention on him. Harris's face split into a wide grin when he saw her making funny faces at him. When they reached home, Crystal ran into her grandfather's fragile embrace, causing a grimace to form on their mother's face. Catherine hated the fact that her daughter loved this old and feeble man whom she had hated her whole life. He didn't put much effort to impress his granddaughter, yet Crystal was so fond of him. He almost spent his whole day on his wheelchair admiring his sweet granddaughter who was a spitting image of Catherine, according to him. Grandpa, she kissed his cheeks. Uncle Harry is here. That's great, sweetie, he ruffled her silky hair. Harry, how was your trip? Harold asked his son. Great, Dad. I'll tell you everything after I've had my lunch. I'm famished right now. Harris knew he had to inform his father about the merging of the two companies, but not right now, when Catherine was just a few steps away. In the evening, when Harold was alone in his study, Harris knocked on his door and entered in. Harry, come in, come in, he gestured him to take a seat opposite to him. Dad, I have to tell you something very important. What is it, son? I didn't go to Hong Kong as you all think, he mumbled, rubbing the back of his head. What do you mean? I was in Manhattan for a week. And may I ask what you were doing there for a week? Harold asked politely. He believed his son had a valid reason for going there. I, I wanted to meet Ashton James Schwimmer. The very name made Harold's palms to curl into tight balls. What possible reasons did you have for meeting that jerk? He questioned his son angrily. Dad, please, listen to me first. Harris leaned forward on the huge table while Harold motioned with his fingers to continue. Dad, I personally spied on him for several days, and what I learned, Ashton doesn't have any other woman in his life. At least, that's what I believe. His life is as empty and meaningless as our Catherine's. Harris explained. Why are you telling me all these things, son? He's a least of my concerns. Harold made a poker face. I want them to get together once again, Dad. What? 
Have you lost your marbles, Harry? How can you even suggest it in your right mind? He's the one who broke her heart at the first place. Harold chided him for his silly suggestions. He might have broken her heart in some way, but I strongly believe Ashton is the only one who holds the key for Catherine's happiness. He spoke in a soft tone. Why do you think she is still not ready to date anyone else, Dad? I think she isn't entirely over him yet. He shook his head while Harold stared at him. What are you suggesting, Harry? Harold asked after giving him a quick thought about it. Dad, I want us all to shift from London to Manhattan in a month's time. Harold stared at him as if his son had lost his mind. I don't understand any of this, Harry. I am planning for a merger with Schwimmer Group of Companies, Dad. That way we would establish our business in America. If everything works out, Catherine can stay there with Ashton and take care of that branch. What if she doesn't want to forgive him, Harry? Then I would respect her choices, Dad. But I want her to first give him a second chance before deciding on anything. Harold nodded his head. Harris was right. It was up to Catherine to decide whether she wanted to forgive him or forget him. His only wish would be to watch her live a happy and love-filled life that she deserved. The biggest hurdle for Harris was to tell his sister about his plans. He wasn't planning to tell her about the merger with Ashton's company. He had a slight idea of how she might react when he informed her of moving to Manhattan, and that's exactly what happened. Manhattan? Her voice echoed inside the four walls of her room. Isn't there any other place left on this whole planet to open a branch? Gosh, she would kill me if I told the remaining part of my plans, he mumbled to himself. What? She tried to understand what he was mumbling about. Nothing. He shook his head and walked near her. Kathy, Manhattan is such a big city. There's no way you would meet him again, and there are chances that he left Manhattan after all. It's been so long. He tried to read her expression. It doesn't matter, Harry. There are so many memories I left behind, and I don't think I would survive a day in that place. Harris noticed the tears in her eyes that were threatening to fall down. As much as he hated to do this, he knew it was the only right thing to do for her sake. She might thank him one day. How about you go there and I stay here? She suddenly came up with an idea. Oh no, I forgot how clever she is, he said internally. Kathy, please, I can't leave you guys behind for so long. You know how much I miss you all, and moreover, it's just a matter of six months. We will come back once the branch starts working smoothly. Please do this for me, sister. He used all his tactics to lure her into believing him. Please. He pleaded her, holding her hands tenderly, to which she couldn't say a no. All right, all right. She pinched the bridge of her nose, but don't ask me to attend business parties and functions when we are in Manhattan. I would just go to work, nowhere else. I'm warning you, she threatened him in a firm tone. I promise, Harry assured her, grinning mentally. Within the next few weeks, Catherine and her family were back in Manhattan. As soon as she landed at the Manhattan airport, old memories came rushing back into her mind that she thought she had successfully buried deep in her heart. She prayed to Almighty that she should never see Ashton again in these six months that she was going to spend in this city for the fact she would never be able to tame her heart, which she knew still beat for him. Crystal was initially sad to leave behind her friends at school, but when her grandfather consoled her that she would get more friends in Manhattan, she instantly agreed to travel. She fell in love with the huge skyscrapers and busy roads. She was clapping and squealing happily at everything her eyes landed on. Catherine watched her daughter with a pain-filled smile. This was the place Chris was supposed to be born, brought up in, but her fate had other plans. Where are we going now, Uncle Harry? To our new house, sweetie. The first person they met at the huge entrance of their mansion was Roderick McKenzie, Harry and Catherine's cousin, who was managing a small business in New York. Hey, man. He gave a brotherly hug to Harry before turning to Catherine. Hey, cuz. Roderick hugged Catherine warmly. He was a son of Harold's late brother. He was just a few months older than Catherine, and they got along well whenever he visited London. Hi, Rodri. Good to see you, she greeted back. He welcomed his uncle and grandparents with the same warm hug. Hey, little one, remember me? He asked, crouching down to Crystal's eye level. Of course, Uncle Rodri. She shook his hands, causing everyone to laugh. I made sure to personally check everything for your comfortable stay here. He spoke, leading them inside the mansion. I hope you like it. We love it, Uncle Rodri. Crystal answered, jumping up and down her feet. In the evening, when everyone settled in their room after the tiring journey, Harry met Roderick in the living hall. Thanks for everything, man. Harry handed a cup of coffee into his hand. Come on, man. I'm happy that I could help you. After all, it is for our Catherine. Harris nodded to him with a smile. So, what's the next plan? Roderick asked him. Harris leaned near his ear and put in a picture of his plans to Roderick, causing him to smirk. 
She is going to kill you for this, man, he laughed, shaking his head from side to side. Are all the papers ready? Ashton queried his secretary while sipping his cup of coffee. Yes, Mr. Schwimmer. The young secretary placed the files carefully on the table. You may go now. He dismissed her and glanced through the agreement papers. He ran his eyes carelessly on it until they got stuck on the name Catherine McKenzie. The name alone was enough to shake his whole body with an unknown surge of electricity, but he knew this Catherine could not be his Catherine. These past five years were the most blank and dull years of his life. He was delighted to know that he hadn't cheated on Kathy. He hoped she would forgive him and they would resume living happily, but he didn't see it coming, though. He had searched for her everywhere, but there was not even a single trace of her, as if she had just disappeared into thin air. What would he not do to get back those brief moments of happiness he had with Catherine, but things seemed so out of reach for Ashton? Situations seemed to favor the impossible, and there was nothing he could do about it. He shut everyone out of his life, which made his family and friends to worry about his mental health. There was not even a single night when he hadn't wondered how he could have so blindly believed Callie. On several nights, he imagined how his life would have been if he had believed Catherine instead. It took him approximately a year to get back to his normal self. At least, that's what he made people believe. But deep within, he could still feel the wounds as fresh as on the first day, and he was certain they would never heal. In the mornings, he kept himself busy in the gym, and he would stay in his office till late night, working until his body became worn out and sore. He hated going back to that house, which was now empty and lifeless. He closed the file and huffed before walking out of his office room. The Mackenzies were popular in Europe. He could have just acquired their company just like that, but Harris Mackenzie had managed to impress him with his unique ideas. Ashton had read so many articles about his achievements at this young age, and he was elated to sign a merger contract with them. Ashton directed his driver to take him to the venue where Harris had arranged an evening party for signing the deal while he leaned his head against the back of the seat. Catherine was almost about to leave her office after a tiring day at work, when she received a call from Harris. He had traveled back due to an unavoidable situation at their London branch. Hey, Harris, are you back to Manhattan? She chirped over the line. N no, Kathy, it's snowing here badly. I don't think I can travel back today, he said, shivering. Oh, that's bad. Chrissy would be upset, she mumbled with a pout, since she would be the one who will have to deal with her daughter's tantrums. Yeah, I know. This crazy weather, he cursed under his breath. Kathy, I need your help. He began to request her carefully. What is it? She asked coolly, unaware of the grave trap that he had set for her. Never mind. You will not do it, I know, he groaned. Catherine rolled her eyes at his childish ways to make her do things. Come on, tell me what it is. I will see if I can help you with it. Really? He asked her with a trace of excitement. I wouldn't promise, though. Tell me what I have to do first, then I will decide if I can do it or not. She remarked playfully. I'm sure you can do it, he countered back. Harry, she charted. He was losing her patience now. Will you tell me already? Okay, okay, but promise you wouldn't freak out. Okay, I promise. Kathy, the merger meet I was talking about earlier is tonight. I thought I would be able to come before it, but I guess I was wrong. He explained her in a sorry tone. What merger meet are you talking about? How come I have no idea about it? She responded back angrily. What are you talking about? Don't you remember we were talking about it when Roderick came home last weekend? Harry? Her voice was dangerously high that he had to slightly remove the phone from his ear. I am sure we never talked about any merger. God, Kathy, were you lost when we were discussing about it? Why don't you ask Rodri if you don't believe me? Never mind, because I'm not going there anyway, she declared furiously, picking up her bag from the table. Sister, please, this meet is really important. In fact, it will be the big break that I've been waiting for, he pleaded. Well, then you should have planned it more carefully, she snapped at him. I warned you before, I wouldn't be attending any business meets while we're in Manhattan. I know. I know, but please, Kathy, help me this once. I will never do this again. His voice was low, and Kathy knew she wouldn't be able to resist his beseech. Damn it, I hate you, Harry, she muttered, making him grin victoriously on the other side. She kept quiet for a while, thinking the possibilities of meeting Ashton in such a big city was nil to low. Moreover, his brother would never desire to merge their company with the Schwimmers. He was well aware of her history with Ashton. She sighed with a decision. Where do I have to go? Does that mean you're going? Do I have a choice? She retorted back. Sorry, sorry, he chuckled. Roderick will take you to the venue. Don't worry, and he has all the contract papers ready for you. You just have to sign on it and come back home, he assured her. All right, she mumbled. Kathy, he paused, his voice turning serious all of a sudden. Remember, whatever I do. 
It's in your best interest. I wish you good luck. Catherine blinked, trying to decipher his words. Why was he telling her this all of a sudden? When she was about to ask him, the line suddenly went blank on his side. Catherine went home to quickly get ready. She was already running a little late by this time, but what was she supposed to do? Harris had informed her at the very last moment. Roderick waited in the living room to escort her to the evening party. She glanced at her daughter through the mirror who was sitting on the edge of her bed with a long face. She was still mad at her uncle for not keeping his promise of returning back soon. Catherine felt a tug at her heart when she thought about having to leave her here. Baby, do you want to come with mommy? You won't be bored at the party. We can have some fun there. Catherine suggested and immediately saw a toothy smile appear on her lips. Okay, mommy. She jumped down from the bed. Catherine scooped her in her arms and took Crystal to her room to get ready. We are ready, Uncle Rodney, she announced while swaying her frock from side to side. Wow, who is this pretty lady? Roderick bent down to carry her in her arms. Now this is going to be so much fun, he mocked to himself. Ready? He raised his brows at Catherine, winding his arms around her shoulder, which made her look at him weirdly. He secured Crystal at the back seat and opened the passenger door for Catherine. We are late he murmured, looking at his watch before turning on the engine. Ashton was waiting for more than 20 minutes now. The meeting was supposed to begin at 7.30, and yet there was no sign of Harris McKenzie giving a very bad first impression on him. I'm done waiting. Cancel the meeting. He stood up to walk down from the stage. Trust me, Mr. Schwimmer, they will be here soon. The broker tried to cool him down. Please, I just talked to them. They're almost nearing. Ashton sat down crossing his ankle over his other knee and started rubbing his stubble impatiently. The media and press were already present and he didn't want to create a nasty scene. Hence, decided to wait a little more. I will wait for another ten minutes. If he isn't here by then, I'm canceling this deal. I have other ways to acquire his company. He informed the broker through whom Harris had contacted him a few months before. Yes, sir. He took out his phone to call Roderick. Mr. McKenzie, where are you? I'm here. Roderick said over the line and the broker's gaze immediately went to the entrance before he sighed in relief. Mr. Schwimmer, they are here. He made a loud squeal, pointing his finger at the entrance. As soon as Ashton heard that he stood up and straightened his suit jacket. Without bothering to look at his future business partners, he tried to look calm and collected, but only until his eyes slowly fell upon to the woman walking into the hall, because the next moment he knew he stood rooted in his place, completely stunned. He thought he was no more breathing since his throat began to clog up with overwhelming emotions. The world around him began to spin, and he thought he would collapse any minute now. Catherine! When they reached the venue, it was almost crowded with business delegate from both the companies. Catherine's eyes were blinded by the bright flashlights from the camera that she was unable to see anything around her. She held her daughter's palm tightly and made her way onto the stage behind Roderick. As they neared the stage, Roderick suddenly stopped on his feet and took Crystal from her arms while wrapping his free arm over her shoulder. She wanted to smack him at the back of his head. What does he think he's doing? But her eyes were caught on something or perhaps someone on the stage. She began to hyperventilate, seeing the man to whom she had once lost her heart. Her breath was heaving as she looked at him. His eyes were unmoving. His jaw was set sharply while his palms were clenched to his sides. What was he angry at? If someone had to be furious, it was me. She spoke in her mind, and that's when she noticed his eyes were fixed on Roderick's hand, which was over her shoulder. She quickly shrugged his arm away from her shoulder. Ashton didn't react. His expression was almost blank after that, and she couldn't evaluate what he was thinking. All he did was to stare at her endlessly. He wanted to scream out loud and wanted to break things that were around him. His eyes shifted to the little girl in Roderick's arms, and Catherine didn't miss, noticing the tick in his jaw muscles. How could she move on so easily, he thought. The pain that he was experiencing in his heart couldn't be put in words. She followed his eyes on her daughter, their daughter, then at Roderick, and that's when her eyes widened with realization. No, 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 this is not what you think. She wanted to scream at Ashton for the misunderstanding that was currently brewing inside his head, but then her consciousness stopped her from doing so. What was the use of explaining all this to him, Kathy? She heard her own voice within her head. Let him think whatever he wants. After all, you should be happy to see him suffer. The same voice spoke again. She raised her chin high, squared her shoulders, and began to walk over the flight of stairs confidently. Hello, Mr. Schwimmer. Roderick stretched his hand out to Ashton, who took his hand and shook harshly. I'm Roderick McKenzie, and I'm here on behalf of my cousin Harris. This is Catherine McKenzie. He spoke, placing his palm on the small of her back. Rage and fury boiled in his bloodstream that he wanted to punch this bastard to death, 
A wave of jealousy hit at his chest like a storm. He would have killed him by now for touching her if he wasn't her husband, he thought. Kathy, this is Mr. Ashton Schwimmer, he said way too sweetly. Kathy rolled her eyes mentally before stretching her hand towards Ashton. Ashton ran his eyes over her body without an ounce of shame in it. He had to admit, she had grown too beautiful, and everything about her looked different. She looked more confident and calculative. As his palm came in contact with her soft ones, a powerful gush of electricity passed through their bodies. His masculine scent that she remembered by heart invaded her senses, causing her sense of logic to fly out of the window. She felt Roderick's hands on either side of her arms trying to steady her on the ground. Only then did she snap out of her trance before quickly pulling her hand from his hold. She walked to her assigned seat while Crystal jumped on her mother's lap. Catherine was fuming from inside. She was sure that this was all Harry and Roderick's well-orchestrated plan. How could they do this to me? Her nostrils flared. Ashton pretended to talk to Roderick to maintain a public decency in front of his guests. After a while, Roderick led him next to where Catherine was seated, before taking the seat on her other side. Catherine felt so uneasy at this awkward situation. Never did she imagine of such an embarrassing circumstance where they would have to act like strangers. Ashton had wanted to cancel the contract with the Mackenzie for coming late at the first place, but after seeing Catherine, he changed his mind. For some unknown reason, he wanted the contract signing process to happen smoothly. The meeting went in a blur and came to an end with the MC requesting to the guests to have their dinner before leaving. Ashton felt a soft tug at his heart. Hi, I'm Crystal. What's your name? The little girl who was comfortably seated on Catherine's lap waved at him without her mother's knowledge. He shortly glanced at Catherine, who was busy talking to Roderick. Uh, hello, I'm Ashton. It was the first time he had a closer look at Catherine's daughter. She had her mother's mesmerizing blue eyes, he remarked to himself. She reminded him of his young Catherine when they were at school. He shifted his eyes between the little girl and her father, Roderick, and he could find no resemblance between the two. He was a lucky bastard to have such a beautiful family, Ashton thought, clenching his fist. Are you also bored like me, Ashton? Crystal asked him innocently, causing his lips to curve up into a smile. Yes, he nodded at her. How long do you think we'll have to sit here? She whispered again. Hmm. Maybe another five minutes, he told her, looking down at his wristwatch. He would have ignored any other child asking those questions, but to his own surprise, he kept answering all their questions until her mother glared at him. Crystal, come, let's go home, Catherine said, carrying her daughter in her arms. Kathy, we cannot go home yet. There's still so much left for the night, Roderick said, smirking. Ashton, can you please keep an eye on Crystal, he asked Ashton, adding salt to his wounds. Roderick didn't wait for his answer as he pulled Kathy towards the center of the dance floor. He snaked his hands on her hips and pulled her closer to him. Roderick, what the hell are you up to now? Catherine asked, trying to pull away from him, but his hold was too strong for her. Trust me, Kathy. Let us go with the flow. He whispered at her ear, watching Ashton from the corner of his eyes. If not for the little girl beside him, by now Ashton would have jumped down from the stage and thrown several punches on that asshole's face. He leaned back on his seat and ran a palm over his face. This was so frustrating to him. He was helpless, and he couldn't do anything to stop all this from happening. But who was to be blamed for all this? She would have still been my wife, if not for my blind faith in Callie. He felt like shooting himself or putting himself through this situation. Catherine trailed her eyes secretly towards Ashton. It was fair to say that over these five years, his soft and boyish looks had been replaced by much more manly features. She was certain he had been working out by looking at his broader chest and toned muscles at his arms, that were visible even after being covered by his suit. He looks so hot. The annoying voice in her head taunted her. She unknowingly let out a long sigh of longing. Catherine watched Crystal, who was in a deep conversation with Ashton. Her daughter was always shy with strangers, but here she was, talking to Ashton as if she had known him for ages. Was it because she felt the fatherly bond with Ashton? If so, did he not feel the same bond with his daughter? She wondered, but suddenly began to panic when a disturbing thought crossed her mind. What if he finds out that Crystal is his flesh and blood? Would he take her away from me? Her eyes widened with fear. What's wrong? Roderick asked, observing the fear in her eyes. Take me home, right now. She walked toward Ashton before snatching Crystal away from him. Ashton stared at her back as she left the party hall furiously. The sound of a slap resonated within the walls of the living room followed by Catherine's shrieking voice. How could you do this to me, huh? I trusted you so much. She spoke between her sobs. Roderick had detailed everything from the night to Harris before he even reached Manhattan. He was preparing for this and embraced it willingly. I'm not sorry for what I did, he murmured, escalating Catherine's fury more than tenfold. What did you just say? 
Catherine pounced toward. Catherine, sweetie, please. What he did was for your own good. She was stopped by her father's pleading voice. Oh, she snorted at him. So after all, it was your idea. Why? Do you have a problem with me staying here that you are planning to pack me up from here? Kathy. Harris snapped at her for the first time. Stop it, please. Ignoring Harry's warnings, she walked in front of her father's wheelchair, crossing her arms at her chest. I hate men who cheat on their wives, she spat at him. Unfortunately, both my father and husband fall under that category. Catherine, you don't know anything about what Dad went through, so stop talking nonsense. Harris pulled at her arm and turned her forcefully. Harris, leave her. This is between me and my daughter. Harold raised his forefinger to stop him from reacting further. For the very first time, Catherine didn't see a weak and dying man in her father. Instead, she saw the fearsome pair of blue eyes. His ice-cold eyes softened as soon as he turned his gaze on his daughter. Catherine, I know how much you hate me for what I did to you and your mother. There is no point in justifying my action because I know I made mistakes which I will never be able to rectify. But isn't it a man's basic quality to commit mistakes? He paused to cough before continuing. You have no idea how much my hands itch to punch on that jerk's face for cheating on you? Seeing you suffer in pain makes me realize what a monster I was to Agnes. Painful tears pooled in his eyes. When I realized my mistake, it was too late, honey. Agnes was gone and you were nowhere to be found. Fate never provided me a second chance. She simply stared at him as her throat began to constrict with an unknown surge of emotion. You might hate him for breaking your heart, but he has the right to explain himself to you and also deserves to be part of Crystal's life. She's growing faster than you think, Catherine, and in a few years, she might ask about her father. He sniffed, crooking his brow at her. Catherine lowered her gaze to the polished floor, unable to answer her father's question, which had never crossed her mind before. I grew up without a father, and not even once did I regret about it, she argued when she gathered herself. Harold nodded his head with a painful expression. But your father did. Not once, but every single day of his life, and I'm sure Crystal's father would experience the same pain when he realizes that he couldn't be part of her life. Catherine started fidgeting her fingers, giving a thought about all this. Catherine's grandmother was already weeping her heart out, listening to her son's heartfelt words to his daughter. They had been very upset with Harold their whole life for losing their precious granddaughter, but this time they were upset with Catherine for not understanding his pain and refusing to relieve him from his sufferings. What if he takes my daughter away from me? She asked that very same question that had managed to drive her mother crazy a long time ago. No man in his right sense would want to separate his child from its mother, Catherine. Harold sounded a bit annoyed. No matter how much ever Catherine claimed that she wanted to be stronger than her mother, Harold knew her brain worked just like her mother's, or maybe this was every single mother's nightmare. And do you think we would let him do that, Kathy? Harris interrupted his father to assure his sister, Don't forget, we are equally influential to win Crystal's custody battle against him. Catherine couldn't stand this emotional turmoil anymore as she grunted frustrated, and she left the living room without another word. She didn't want Crystal to experience any of this. That was the sole reason why she had been maintaining a low-profiled life in London. She wanted a happy and love-filled childhood for her daughter, unlike hers, but her own family had managed to drag her into this web of problems. She silently laid next to her daughter, who was sleeping soundly. Looking at her innocent face, the tears that were brimming her eyes for so long began to fall down her cheeks freely. Her agonizing past came rushing back to her mind, and she had to bury her face into the pillow to muffle her cries. Callie must still be in Ashton's life. Maybe as his wife, whom I was trying to compete with? Callie was his childhood friend, and he must have loved her so much for cheating over me. Catherine began torturing herself thinking about Ashton and Callie being together as a couple. There was no way she could think of sharing Crystal with Ashton and Callie. Catherine never wanted them to be part of her life. Crystal belonged to her and only to her. She hugged Crystal's sleeping form tightly before placing several kisses all over her face, causing her to groan lightly. After a week, Catherine was at her office when she heard the rumbling of furniture in the room adjacent to hers. Within minutes, her room became frustratingly noisy that she couldn't tolerate it anymore. What's going on here? She asked one of the men working over there. The room is being renovated, ma'am. Why? We don't know, ma'am. We were asked to do it, he answered uncertainly. Can't you do it after the working hours? She was annoyed at them for spoiling her peace of mind. Sorry, ma'am, the room has to be ready by tonight. He told her and turned back to work. 
God, this is so annoying. She muttered under her breath and left the room. The next morning, when she came to the office, she noticed the room was ready to be occupied. She wondered why this room was getting renovated in such a hurry. Moreover, it looked posh and way too big. Harry had his own room two floors above hers. There were separate rooms for Roderick and her father as well. Then who was going to use this room? She began to ponder as she settled in her chair. A little while later, she heard the sound of the room being unlocked. Before she could have a look inside, the door slowly closed behind. She huffed and walked back into her room. She shook her head to ward off the distraction so that she could concentrate on her work. In a few minutes, her landline began ringing loudly. Hello? Kathy, we have arranged a lunch party for everyone. Why don't you join us in the cafeteria? She heard Roderick's voice. She could also sense Harry standing beside him. Catherine hadn't talked to Harris after that evening. He understood his sister was enraged at him, but it hurt him whenever she avoided him directly. So he used Roderick to invite her for lunch. They had arranged on this special occasion. Not that she wasn't angry on Roderick, but he wasn't her brother to be angry at him for too long. All right, I'll be there in a few minutes. She picked up her mobile phone and walked to the cafeteria. She ignored Harry and went straight to Roderick. What are we celebrating? She asked him. Is it a welcome party? She was about to open her mouth when Roderick and Harry stood up from their seat and rushed towards the entrance of the hall. Her big eyes widened further when she saw Ashton walking in next to them. What the hell? She mumbled. Fortunately, they did not guide him near her, instead led him to the VIP table. She took a table at the far end of the room from where she wouldn't be visible to Ashton. Gosh, what is wrong with them? Why did they bring him here now? She wanted to bang her head against the table. In a few minutes, Roderick came towards her. Gathy, what are you doing here? Your place is there, he pointed at the VIP table. I'm fine here, she declared without glancing at him. She pulled out a plate for her. Everyone is waiting for you over there, he groaned. Well, tell them I want to eat with my staffs. She began to stuff the noodles onto her plate. Roderick sighed and walked away giving up. He silently slipped onto a seat next to Harris and began to eat. The scene didn't go unnoticed by Ashton. In fact, the moment he entered the cafeteria, his eyes landed on Catherine. She looked damn sexy in her office attire. To Ashton, it looked like Catherine and Roderick were having an argument. Were they not happy with each other? Or was she not ready to eat with me? He began to ponder while his eyes were fixed on her. Catherine sat there waiting for Ashton and her evil brothers to disperse from the lunch hall so that Ashton wouldn't notice her. Now she understood for whom that room was being renovated. She wanted to pull out her hair and scream out loud. When she watched them walk out, she let out a huge sigh of relief that she wasn't aware she was holding. She literally tiptoed while passing his room. She rushed in and shut the door behind her. She was glad that she hadn't encountered him on the way back to her room. A couple of hours later, she heard a soft knock on her door. She was about to call in, but her breath hitched in her throat when she saw Ashton open the room. May I come in? He asked her through the small gap between the door and its frame. She stood up from her chair, panicking. What are you doing here? She asked through gritted teeth. Well, we didn't have a proper chance to say hello. She snorted at him. The least she wished was a hello from her ex-husband. How are you, Kathy? He asked concernedly. She cringed her face at his question. He has the audacity to ask me how I was after ruining my life. I'm good. She answered with a proud nod at him. She wanted to show him that she was happy in her life, even after he tried to ruin it. In fact, I'm great, she emphasized. Anger seeped through his veins, grinded his teeth tightly and fisted his palms. He wished to hear that she missed him so much, but instead she was telling him how happy she was without him. How could she be happy when I was leading a miserable life? How could she move on so fast when I was still stuck at the same spot? She noticed his jaw become hard as he strode dangerously close to her. Her chest began to heave up and down uncontrollably. She tried to look everywhere but him. How could you forget everything so easily and move on, Kathy? His voice was filled with sourness for her. He placed his hands on the table behind her, trapping her body within. I, I, she stuttered, but when she realized he was tried to blame her for everything, she snapped at him. Huh, what did you expect me to do, Ashton? Sulk over you forever? You were the one who slept with your best friend. You were the one who wanted me to leave. I never wanted you to leave. Ashton's hold on the edge of the table tightened when he heard her accusing of sleeping with Callie. He wanted to shout out to her that he hadn't cheated on her like she thinks but he was too outraged at her for submitting in front of her. You mean you could cheat on me for all you want and I'm not supposed to leave you? She gritted her teeth and stared at him angrily. Catherine noticed how his chest muscles were rippling up and down within his shirt. 
She wanted to run her palms over them like she had done a thousand times before. She wanted to leave behind this charade and jump into his arms, but she knew she couldn't do that. He belonged to someone else now. I am no longer have the rights to touch him. She tried to tame her crazy heart. Ashton wanted to pull her close, run his hands all over her beautiful curves and kiss her mindlessly, but controlled himself from doing so. He hadn't filled the divorce papers. On papers, they were still husband and wife, but she had a child with another man. He didn't want to do anything stupid that would break apart her family. Damn it! He cursed and walked out, slamming the door loudly. Catherine dropped herself on the floor as her knees gave up before sobbing into her palms. After their last close encounter, Ashton and Catherine had been ignoring each other with the misunderstanding of each one of them being married to someone else. Ashton busied himself with work. He tried hard not to think about Catherine, but it seemed like a Herculean task for him to not think about his ex-wife, whom he was still in love with. The real test was when he had to visit his office at the Mackenzie's company building at least thrice a week. They would have to attend several meetings together in which either one of them had to present their agendas before the others. It was impossible for them not to drool over each other when such a thing happened. Catherine would often have a hard time concentrating on her presentations when Ashton's hungry eyes roamed all over her with so much longing in them. It was Crystal's spring vacation, and she insisted on going to Catherine's office every day. She would quietly sit on her chair, drawing or playing with her toys. One morning, Ashton was making calls to his investors. He was standing facing the window when he heard a soft knock on his door. Come in, he called out while still on the call. When he turned around, he was surprised to see Crystal standing at the door, waving at him with the cutest smile he had ever seen. The smile caused the dimple on her right cheek to deepen further. I'll call you back. He spoke to the person on the line before ending it. Hey, little one, what are you doing here? Hi, Ashton. I saw you walking in here. She was dragging a trolley bag behind her, so I thought I would say hello to you. Ashton's lips curved up hearing her speak with a slight British accent. Please come in. He walked and crouched near her. Does your mummy know you're here? No, she's in a meeting. Can I be in your room till then? I'm getting bored sitting alone in mummy's room. Sh sure, Ashton stuttered slightly. Do you come here every day, Ashton? Crystal asked, walking away from him. I come here only when I have some work. What about you? Don't you have school or something? Ashton got up and leaned on his table while crossing his arms over his chest. I'm on spring break. He watched as she climbed on one of the chairs and started pulling out her art supplies before she arranged them neatly on his table. Hmm, have you eaten something? He was amazed at himself for being able to so easily converse with this little girl, something which he could never do with someone else. Yeah, Mommy made my favorite chocolate pancakes today. My tummy is almost full. She replied, rubbing her tummy, causing Ashton to chuckle. Ashton was a great cook himself, but when they were married, he loved to eat whatever Catherine cooked for him. He remembered how she used to cook meals with lots of love and care. His heart clenched at his chest suddenly as he terribly missed those days. I haven't had those pancakes in a long while, he murmured. Do you also like chocolate pancakes? I love them. Ashton huffed loudly. Anyways, what do you want to do now? He took a seat next to her. How about we color Elsa Nana? She began to turn the pages on her coloring book with her tiny fingers until she got the page she was looking for. All right. He picked up a red crayon and was about to color on it. Ashton, wait. Don't you know Elsa's dress is supposed to be light blue in color? She caught his left wrist to stop him from coloring her favorite figure in red. How am I to know what color dress she wears? He mumbled while picking up the light blue crayon. Haven't you watched Frozen? Crystal asked curiously with wide eyes. Uh, n nope. He answered shamefully since he thought he must have looked like the dumbest person to the little girl for not watching that movie. Uncle Harry and I have watched it a hundred times. She averted her eyes on her notebook. Don't you have kids at home? Ashton swallowed hard before answering Crystal. No, I stay alone. Oh. He could see a little trace of pity in her blue eyes. Why don't you come to our house? We can all watch it together. Sure, Ashton said laughing at himself. How pathetic was his situation to have this conversation with his ex-wife's daughter? But Ashton had to admit she was a bit funny and entertaining. He didn't know time could run so fast with this little girl's company. Suddenly, his eyes caught some. Are you left-handed too? Huh? Crystal didn't understand what he meant. 
Ashton was about to open his mouth when he heard an impatient knock on his door before it was thrown open. Oh my God, Crystal, you scared me to death. Catherine barged in, placing her palm at her wildly beating chest. I'm sorry, Mummy. I was getting bored at your room. That's why I came to Ashton's room. Catherine froze on her spot, hearing his name. That's when she noticed him seated next to her daughter. She slowly turned her gaze at him. They looked so adorable together, she thought. How much she wished he had known that Crystal was his own daughter. I'm sorry for the trouble, she mumbled. I didn't know she was here. That's no problem. She wasn't troubling me. We were just coloring. He looked down, pointing at the picture they were coloring together. Catherine's heart began to swell with overwhelming emotions. She didn't understand why Crystal, out of all the people in the building, had to grow so fond of Ashton. Thanks for looking after her, she turned to Crystal. Honey, we should go home now. She started clearing the table while Ashton got up and walked back to his seat. She could feel his eyes that were boring holes on her, and she suddenly began feeling hot inside the air-conditioned room. She hurriedly shoved Crystal's things into her bag and carried her on her hip as she made her way out of Ashton's room. Bye, Ashton. See you later. Crystal waved at him and he waved at her back. He leaned his back against his chair as they disappeared from his room. The rest of the evening, he imagined how life would have been if they had been still together. They would have had a child just like Crystal or even more kids with the amount of love they used to make. He remembered something that they had discussed long time ago during their honeymoon. Ashton had told Catherine that he wanted to have lots of babies with her, and she looked so happy that day. She even had stopped taking her birth control pills after that night. Ashton smacked at the table with his palms loudly. He wanted to scream and cry, thinking about his once beautiful life that he had ruined with his own hands. After dinner, Catherine gave Crystal a warm bath before tucking her into her bed. Mommy, do you know Ashton doesn't know what colors Princess Elsa's dress? Crystal was still surprised about how someone could not know about her favorite movie. Everyone she ever talked to knew about it, including both her uncles, grandfather, and great-grandparents. He said he's never seen that movie before, she continued, and he said there are no kids at his home with whom he can watch it, so I invited him here to watch the movie with me. Catherine's eyes widened at her daughter's confession. What? No, baby, you're not supposed to invite strangers to our home, Catherine shrieked. Mommy, but he's not a stranger. He is my friend. Catherine didn't know how to make her daughter understand of her situation, but she knew emphasizing more on it would only make Crystal upset. Okay, enough. Now sleep, sweetheart. She tried to distract her, hoping Crystal would leave the topic right there. And she was correct, because in a few minutes, Crystal fell asleep. Catherine kissed her daughter's forehead lovingly before she covered her with her blanket. She remained by her side and began to think about what her daughter said earlier. Doesn't he have children with Callie yet, she wondered. Why didn't they have kids if they were so much in love with each other? Were they not able to have kids? She thought of all possibilities before she fell asleep. In the next few days, Harris accompanied Catherine to the district court, since her IDs, which she used in Manhattan, were still under the name of Catherine Schwimmer. All her IDs in London had a name change from Schwimmer to Mackenzie. She remembered signing the divorce papers that Ashton had given her five years ago. She no longer was his wife, and hence, that name didn't belong to her. Are you sure you want to do this? Harry asked, getting down from his car. I should have done this a long time ago, she told him, making her way inside the lawyer's room. They were seated opposite to the female lawyer, who had buried her eyes into her computer screen. Catherine Schwimmer, let me check. She typed her name and waited for several minutes before looking up at Catherine. Miss Schwimmer, why do you want to change your name? She looked confused. Um because I couldn't change my surname after my divorce, Catherine explained. The woman stared at her for a whole minute. Is something wrong? Harry asked her, noticing her confused look. Yes, your profile shows that you are still married to Mr. Ashton James Schwimmer. What? That's impossible, she yelled. Are you sure you had a divorce? The lawyer asked. Yes, of course, I remember signing the divorce papers the night I left Manhattan. There is a possibility that your divorce papers were not processed or submitted to the court, the lawyer explained. Were you called to the court for the hearings? Catherine shook her head negatively. She felt like a bucket full of cold water was dropped in her. Does this mean I'm still his wife? But he was the one who demanded for the divorce. Then why didn't he process it further? Catherine began to think. Does that mean he hadn't married anyone after that? Harris asked with full of hope in his eyes. Yes, he was married only once till now. She looked between the two. Kathy, Ashton never married anyone else after you. He turned to her excitedly but that doesn't change the fact that he cheated on me, Harry. 
she whispered, looking lost before she stormed out of the court. Catherine was in her office with her daughter playing beside her. She was beginning to get a bad headache by the afternoon thinking about the earlier incident. To say she was confused would be an understatement. She wanted to know why he hadn't married Callie after she left. She was sure until now that Ashton and Callie would have been happily married after he divorced her. Then what was this new piece of information she got today? Why hadn't he processed the divorce till now? Why hadn't he married Callie yet? Were they still in a dating relationship then? But it has already been five years since she left. There was no way Ashton could have broken up with her because that would only break his friend's heart, and she knew he would never do that for anything. Was she missing something crucial? God, why do you always put me in such situations? She buried her face into her palms and mumbled, forgetting about her daughter who was staring at her. What happened, Mommy? Catherine jerked upon hearing her voice. Nothing, baby. Mommy is just tired. Catherine smiled at her daughter. A day later, Crystal was eager to meet Ashton again. She requested Catherine to make some chocolate pancakes for her and pack them in a box. Why are you packing it, baby? Her mom asked her. Mommy, I will eat this when I'm hungry. She lied tactfully. Catherine hated to admit, but Crystal had a sweet tooth just like her daddy. It only made her blush when she remembered how Ashton used to pack her pancakes to office when they were together. When Ashton opened his office room, he was stunned to see Crystal already sitting in there. Morning, she waved at him, gaining a smile from Ashton. I have got something for you. What is it? As Ashton walked near her, he noticed her pulling out a tiffin box from her bag. She handed it over to him, motioning with her eyes to open it. Pancakes, he whispered when he opened the box. Yes, I asked Mummy to make some, but she doesn't know it is for you. Crystal said proudly as she swung her small legs. Thanks. Ashton chuckled at her in mischievousness. But your mommy is going to be mad if she knows about this. Yeah, but she doesn't have to know. She giggled before cutting the pancake into a small piece and brought it near his lips, making Ashton stiffen. He slowly opened his mouth and took the piece between his teeth as it melted in his mouth. It felt like heaven to taste the food prepared by Kathy after so long. Is it yummy? Crystal asked, anxiously waiting for his answer. Ashton couldn't gather to say anything and just nodded at the little girl. Your mommy is an amazing cook. Your dad must be a lucky man to have her in his life, he huffed sadly. My daddy? She asked, confused. Yes. I don't have a daddy, she declared plainly. Ashton couldn't help but blink at her words. What was she saying? As far as he knew her, she was smart and sensible way beyond her age. She could never joke about something like that. What do you mean? He wanted to clarify. Roderick is your dad, right? Rodri? He's not my daddy. She scratched her forehead, looking as jumbled as Ashton. He is my uncle. Uncle? Ashton held both her shoulders in his hands and asked her again. If he is your uncle, then who is your daddy? I don't know. Crystal shrugged. Mommy has never told me about daddy. Now she suddenly wanted to ask her mother who her dad was. She began to wonder why she doesn't have a dad like her other friends. She wished she had a daddy like Ashton. He was strong like a superhero. He was funny at times, and moreover, she liked him a lot. Ashton got up and began to run his fingers into his hair. Then he suddenly remembered a conversation from the night that turned his life upside down. He closed his eyes tightly, trying to recollect it. Baby, the work is done. We are starting tomorrow morning from Paris. Wow, I can't wait for you to get here. I have a good news to share with you, darling. Good news? No, it is actually beyond that, and you are going to love it. Oh, dear. Now I just want to hop into a flight and get there as soon as possible. You better be here soon, Ashton. Yes, madam. Love you. Love you so much, Ashton. He stumbled upon opening his eyes from the memory as if hit by a hurricane. He was so heartbroken and sad after Catherine left that this memory never popped into his mind ever. What was the surprise she was planning to give me? He held his head between his hands, trying to think of something. He began to ponder deeply about it, and he remembered Catherine being sick prior to his travel to Paris. Then she sounded too excited over the phone when she told him about the surprise she had for him. He too was very anxiously waiting to get back home that night. Could it be possible that... Oh my God! He gasped loudly. Ashton? She spoke in her childish tone. Are you all right? Crystal was now standing near his chair with her tiny palms over his hand. Now that he looked at her closely, he noticed the dimple on her right cheek, which was eerily similar to his, and then he remembered her being a left-hander just like him. Crystal, baby, can you go back to your mommy? I have somewhere to go right now. He stood up from his seat before he hurriedly packed her things into her bag. Oh, okay. She quietly followed him out before entering into her mommy's room, while Ashton ran into the elevator. 
Ashton didn't bother waiting for the traffic signals as he drove fast to his apartment. He barged into his bedroom and opened Catherine's closet, which still had her clothes and accessories since he always believed she would come back to him someday. He pushed down all her clothes and pulled out the gift-wrapped box that had been lying there for too long now. He had seen it a thousand times before, but he was scared to open it since he wasn't sure if what was inside would make him or break him. He was certain after opening it, his already broken heart would be shattered into a million pieces. So he had been keeping himself away from it, but now he wanted to open it. He knew the answers to his questions were within this small box. He slumped on the bed, impatiently tearing and tugging at the gift wrapper. He took a deep breath as he prepared himself for a blow before opening the box. His eyes began to well up at what he saw inside it. His hands shivered as he picked up the small scanned copy of an ultrasound. His tears rolled down his cheeks uncontrollably, and then his eyes landed on the small romper that had Daddy's favorite written over it. Then he picked up the pregnancy stick, which had a small note attached to it. You are going to be a dad soon, it was written in Catherine's handwriting. Damn it! He screamed at the top of his lungs. The whole world began to spin around him. Why didn't I see this before? He held the box closer to his chest. His whole body shook violently as he cried hard like never before. This whole thing simultaneously made him a little happy as he now knew Catherine wasn't married to anyone like he believed. How could I not know Crystal was my baby girl? It was clearly written all over her. Of course she was a spitting image of his own self. He had foolishly believed her to be someone else's daughter. I missed so many years of her life. He whimpered as he pulled out his hair in frustration. He fumed in anger when he thought Catherine had kept him oblivious to his own daughter's existence all these years and made him believe she was somebody else's child. He grabbed his car keys from the table and dashed out of his apartment furiously. Catherine was in the middle of a meeting when her door was thrown open with a loud bang, causing everyone present there to flinch. Ashton stood there with his hair unkempt, his jaw set sharp, his piercing cold eyes staring at Catherine, clearly fuming at her. She betrayed him. She shattered the trust that he had on her. He knew he was partly responsible for all this, but she could have told him about their baby girl. She had kept him away from his daughter for so many years. How could she do that to him? Never in a billion years had he thought that she would betray him like this. What is he doing here? And why is he looking at me as if he is going to kill me? Her blue eyes stared at him in utter shock. She knew something was definitely wrong. Adrenaline began to rush through her veins wildly. Her hands began to tremble and her legs couldn't handle her weight anymore. Well, what are you doing here? She wanted to look unaffected by his presence, but she failed miserably when her fear kicked in. Ashton didn't bother answering her as his eyes remained stuck onto her, causing her to gulp loudly against the sudden dryness in her throat. Can you give us a minute? He asked everyone with an expressionless look. Catherine's heart began to drum loudly against her chest when she noticed the blankness in his face. She anticipated that something terrible was going to happen. What was he angry about? Everyone started leaving the room silently. Catherine winced when Ashton slammed the door behind him too loudly. She watched him stride forward towards her, crossing his toned arms over his muscular chest. She swallowed and began to move backwards until her back hit the table behind her. She was glad her daughter wasn't here to witness this. Well, wh what do you want? She asked, trying to hide her fear. His closeness caused her insides to twist uneasily. When were you going to tell me, Catherine? He asked through gritted teeth. His chest muscles were heaving up and down impatiently. What is he talking about? Did he by chance find out about Crystal? She mentally shook her head. But that is impossible. There's no way he could have figured it out so soon, she reasoned. What do you mean? She raised her chin, squared her shoulders, and spoke loudly. Stop it already, Catherine. She flinched back at his harsh tone. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Catherine's eyes widened, and her breathing became uneven. How could you do this to us, Catherine? His voice was a mere whisper at first, but then suddenly raised an octave higher. Tell me, goddammit! How could you keep me away from my own daughter without an ounce of remorse? He held her arms firmly and shook her. Catherine whimpered slightly, but she made no attempt to answer him back. I never thought you would be such a cruel woman to separate a child from its own father. He accused her, which made her snap at him. What did you just say? Cruel woman? She chuckled angrily. It's funny how shamelessly you can blame others when you are the one at fault, she countered. 
His features softened at her words and his hold loosened around her wrist. She took this chance to push him away, creating a safe distance between them. I wanted to tell you the moment you were back from Paris, but you were clearly not ready to talk to me. You avoided me for three weeks straight. What did you want me to do, Ashton? How did you expect me to tell you about my pregnancy when you slammed the divorce papers right on my face? Catherine's anger flared. Get this through your thick head, Ashton. You were the one who cheated on me, and it was you who wanted the damn divorce. So don't you dare put the blame on me. She screamed at his face. Ashton's jaw clenched and palms tightly fisted. That didn't mean I didn't deserve to know about my child. He could have denied her accusations of cheating on her, but he instead chose to argue with her about his child. I could have been there for her, but you were so selfish to let her grow without her father. He bellowed, his cold eyes piercing into her skin. Yes, that's because I never wanted you to be part of her life after what you did to us. She spat venom at him, staring back at him with an equal intensity. Damn it, Catherine. He wanted to let out his anger on something, and he punched his fists onto the table, harshly making her wince. You may want to deny it, Catherine, but remember Crystal is equally mine as she is yours, he declared arrogantly. No, she is mine. How much ever she tried to control, she couldn't stop her tears from rolling down. I had her within me for nine months when you didn't even have an idea about her existence. And who was responsible for it, huh? Ashton was once again close to her. His fingers were digging into her arms and she was sure it would leave a bruise. Sister? Do you know what just happened? They were interrupted by Harry's voice. He stopped midway when he noticed Ashton and Catherine looking like they wanted to kill each other. Then his eyes fell on her arms. The bruise on his sister's milky white skin didn't go unnoticed by him, and before Ashton could turn around, his face met with a harsh punch from Harry. What the fuck do you think you're doing, Ashton? Harry raised his hand to land another punch on his face. This time, Ashton was fast enough to block him and shove him away angrily before throwing a punch back on Harry's face. Oh my God, stop it, Catherine shrieked, trying to peel them away from each other. What is wrong with you both? Harry, stop it for Christ's sake. Let me kill this asshole right now for hurting you, he tugged at Ashton's shirt collar. Harry, please, let go. She had successfully dragged him away from Ashton. This is not like what it looks, she shouted to calm him down. Then explain what it is. Harry groaned, straightening his crumpled shirt. Ashton, too, did something similar with his own shirt before pushing his bangs off his forehead. Catherine had to stand in between these two crazy people, fearing they would pounce on each other any minute now. She looked at Ashton and observed a cut on his lip, before shifting her gaze onto her brother. His nose was beginning to bleed. She sighed. He found out about Crystal, she mumbled. Well, that doesn't give him the right to touch you, Harry growled at Ashton. You would have done the same in my position, Ashton spat out. I wouldn't have cheated on my wife in the first place, Harry replied. You don't fucking know anything about me, so stop talking nonsense. I know what to do to get back my daughter. His eyes gleamed wickedly as his lips curled up into a ruthless smirk. Catherine choked on her own saliva. She could tell it was a warning from his cold tone. Dread filled at her heart, thinking he would use everything in his power to get to her daughter. Ashton, no, he wouldn't do that. She grasped his arms tenderly. She wasn't ashamed to beg him. After all, she was doing it for her daughter. You better be prepared to face the consequences, Catherine. Ashton pulled away from her hold and pointed his forefinger at her. Kathy, stop begging him. I will make sure he never wins the custody battle, Harris assured her. No, Harry, no. This is what I was scared of putting her through. She's still a baby. She doesn't have to undergo all these things at such a young age. She tried to make the two understand. She turned to Ashton. I am ready to do anything in return, but please don't drag this to the court. Crystal doesn't deserve it. Please, I beg you. Ashton inhaled deeply and closed his eyes. She was right. Crystal did not deserve any of this shit. All these years, she was deprived of her dad's love. He didn't want Crystal to hate him for the rest of her life for separating her from her mother. He didn't want to do it, first of all. All he wanted was to be with his daughter and Catherine. He turned his gaze and looked at Catherine's tear-stained face. He could never tolerate seeing her cry. It was never his intention to make her cry, but somehow he was always the reason for her pain and agony. He knew the levels of hatred that Catherine had for him, but he wanted to earn her trust back. After all, he had missed her so much for the past five years. Agreed, he was pissed off at Catherine for keeping her daughter a secret from him, but it wouldn't change the fact that he loved and missed her so much. It would be difficult to make her fall in love with him again, but not impossible. 
and he was willing to do anything to get her back. He snapped out of his thoughts when he heard her sniffle while she wiped her tears off. All right, I will give you another choice, he spoke. What is it? Catherine asked eagerly. I'll do anything. If you don't want me to take Crystal away from you, then you will have to agree on staying with me in my house, he said sternly and gave her a determined look. Catherine's eyes widened. What's he up to now, she thought. What? She was stunned to hear that from Ashton. Has he lost his mind? How could he ask me to stay with him after everything that happened between us? How is he expecting me to share the house with Callie? That is impossible, Ashton. She shook her head negatively. Okay, you leave me with no choice. He began to walk away. See you at the court. No, wait. Catherine grasped his arm, stopping him from walking away. Give me some time, she said, staring into space. Okay, you have time till tomorrow morning to come up with a decision. I have already missed so many years of my daughter's life. I don't want to waste a day more. He mumbled before walking out of her office room. Circumstances couldn't have gotten worse than it was right now for Catherine. There was nothing to think much. She was left with a choice. Now that Ashton had known the truth, there was no way he would let this pass without a dirty custody fight. She was certain that her father and brother would be able to help her win the case, but it would only ruin Crystal's childhood. All she wished for her daughter was a peaceful and happy life, not a life juggling between her mom and dad in different homes. She sighed and ran her palm over her face. Kathy? Harry walked into her room. Hey. She smiled at him sadly. Harris perched next to her on her bed. What have you decided? She blinked back her tears. I don't want to go back to him, Harry. I'm scared he would break my heart over and over again, she cried against his chest. Shh, you don't have to go back if you don't want it, Kathy. He caressed her hair. I promise he would never get Crystal. I know. She pulled away from him slightly. But I don't want her to go through the custody battle, Harry. If there is a way to stop this, it is only by agreeing to his offer. She told him, wiping away her tears. Will you be okay living with him? He quirked his brow up. I would do anything for the sake of my daughter, she huffed. He nodded, understanding her feelings. But promise me you would come back if you don't feel comfortable with him. Catherine nodded with a smile. I promise. The next thing she had to do was tell her daughter that they had to shift again. She didn't know how she was going to take it. She was very attached to her uncle and grandfather. How was she going to live without them? Catherine thought. Baby, I wanted to tell you something. She began carefully after putting her on her bed. What is it, Mommy? Promise you will not be upset with Mommy. Okay, Mommy, she said innocently. Well, we are going to shift from here. Catherine informed her. Are we going back to London? No, baby, we're going to live in another house, but this time Uncle Harry and Grandpa won't be coming with us. Catherine immediately noticed her daughter's lower lip began to quiver slightly. I don't want to go. She began to cry into her mother's chest. Catherine's throat began to clog with sorrow, looking at her daughter. Please don't make this difficult for Mommy. Catherine whispered as her tears began to stream down from the corner of her eyes. Noticing her mother's tears, Crystal sniffed and controlled her cries. Mommy, please don't cry. She wiped Catherine's tears with her tiny fingers. It's okay, as long as you come with me, Mommy. Catherine couldn't help but let out a wet cry as she heard her daughter. I love you so much, my baby. She placed butterfly kisses all over her place. She hugged her closer to her chest until she fell asleep. She still had to inform Crystal about who her father was, but that was for another day, she decided. The next morning, she was woken up by the shrilling sound of her phone. It was a call from an unknown number. H hello She groaned sleepily. What have you decided? Her droopy eyes shot wide open when she heard Ashton's cold and terrorizing voice. I, I agree to stay with you. She replied silently, trying not to wake up her daughter. Good. I will come to pick you up at ten in the morning. Be ready before that. The line got disconnected even before she could reply. She observed it was still dark outside, but she couldn't go back to sleep after his call. She got up and started packing her things with a heavy heart. Ashton couldn't sleep more than a wink that night. He was 100% positive with Catherine's decision would be. He felt a little guilty for blackmailing her with their daughter, but he had no other choice to bring her back home. He was very happy his child and wife were coming back home. Wife? Of course they were never divorced, so she was technically still his wife. He grinned, thinking about it. He spent the whole night cleaning the house all by himself. He changed the sheets and curtains. 
He went grocery shopping and he sighed in contentment when he saw his fridge full once again after a long time. The next morning after his call to Catherine, he didn't waste another minute as he took a shower and got dressed neatly. At 10 o'clock sharp, he was outside Catherine's mansion. The butler asked him to wait in the living room while he went in to inform his boss. Soon, he saw Harold Mackenzie come out from his room on his wheelchair. Nice to meet you, sir. Ashton extended his hand. I am Ashton Schwimmer. Harris had informed his father about what had happened the previous day. He wasn't very sure about sending his daughter and granddaughter to Ashton's home, but he also knew that his stubborn daughter wouldn't listen to him. He had no choice but to let them go with him. Harold stared at him for God knows how long. If you hurt my daughter, I wouldn't hesitate to kill you, he warned ferociously. You're free to do that, sir, but I promise I would never hurt her again. Harold saw nothing but honesty in his eyes. Within a few minutes, Harry carried out Catherine's luggage and ordered the servants to place it into Ashton's car. Catherine walked behind him, carrying Crystal, who had buried her face under the crook of her mother's neck. She had been crying since morning. She didn't want to leave her uncle, grandfather, and her great-grandparents. Catherine shot Ashton an angry glare when she noticed the annoying smirk on his face. He stood up to say hello to her daughter. Crystal, he called her softly. Crystal immediately stopped crying on hearing Ashton's voice and turned around anxiously. Ashton? Hey, ready to go home, sweetie? He cooed to his daughter. He was way too close for Catherine's liking. She could feel his peppermint breath near her. Mommy, are we going to stay with Ashton? She asked excitedly. E yes, she replied uncertainly. Mommy, why didn't you tell me before? She got down from her arms and lifted her chubby arms in front of Ashton, gesturing to lift her up. Ashton bent down to scoop her up in his arms happily before he shot his brow up at Catherine as if he was trying to taunt her. Harry, Catherine's father, and her grandparents were stunned to see the previously crying child suddenly wanting to go with Ashton. Did he cast a spell on her? Catherine wondered with her mouth wide open. Grandpa, don't be sad. I promise to come and see you often. Crystal kissed her grandfather's cheeks. Promise to take care of my daughter? Harold whispered at her ears. I promise, Grandpa, she squealed. I will miss you, Christy baby. Harris hugged her closely and kissed her forehead. I will miss you too, Uncle Harry. Then don't go. Stay with me, he told her, even though he knew what her reaction would be. No, I want to go, she replied with a pout. God, this is why they say never to trust a woman. Harry mumbled before letting her go down. She ran next to Ashton before he lifted her in his arms. Harry wondered how Crystal would react when she got to know that Ashton was her father. He walked near him. Don't hurt my sister again because she isn't alone this time, he warned lowly. As much as he hated to admit it, Ashton was glad that Catherine had these people who loved her dearly when she was alone, and he was grateful to them, though he didn't feel sorry for throwing that punch on his face. Ashton smirked when he noticed the bruise forming on his nose. Catherine hugged her grandparents, Harry and Roderick, one by one. She tried hard to control her cries, but it was becoming impossible. She was going to miss them all badly. She threw a sad glance at her father before she walked out, leaving him crying. Ashton opened the passenger door for Catherine after buckling up Crystal at the back seat. He jogged to the driver's side before driving back to his apartment. He kept glancing at his daughter through the rear mirror as she kept talking with him the whole way. He turned to Catherine, who didn't utter a single word and kept looking out of the window. When Ashton was sure his daughter wasn't looking at them, he slowly stretched his hand out to hold Catherine's palm. As soon as his hands came in contact with hers, she snapped at him and jerked away his hands roughly. Stay away from me, she seethed before turning her gaze away from him. He was taken aback, but what else did he expect from her after breaking her heart? He remembered how hard he had tried to win her heart the first time, and he was ready to do it all again. He knew it wasn't easy to gain her love back, but he wasn't the one to take no as an answer. Welcome back home. Ashton grinned at Catherine as soon as he unlocked the door to his apartment. Catherine rolled her eyes and walked past him into the living room. Hey, little one. He lifted Crystal in his arm while he carried her bags in another. Welcome. He couldn't wipe the smile off his face seeing his daughter at his home. Actually, he was still in shock. Until a few days ago, he wouldn't have the slightest thought that he was a father to a four-year-old. He walked behind his daughter who ran into every room to check the place. I like your house, Ashton, she commented, jumping up and down. It's our house now. He ruffled her hair and bent down to kiss her on her cheeks. 
Crystal giggled as his stubble tickled at her cheeks. It tickles. Ashton couldn't help but chuckle at his daughter's cute chortle. Catherine watched them in wonder. She still couldn't understand how her daughter had grown so close to him in just a few weeks. It usually took a lot of time for Crystal to loosen up with strangers, but then Ashton wasn't actually a stranger to Crystal. She decided to leave them alone for a while and entered the bedroom. Old memories, both happy as well as tragic, flashed back into Catherine's head. She looked around and tears began to fill her eyes. She had found and lost so many things in this very place. Her room still looked the same. She wondered why Callie hadn't changed anything in here. She hesitated, opened the closet, and was surprised to see her clothes still in it. Did Ashton and Callie live in another house? She wondered. Of course, he wouldn't want his sweetheart Callie to live in the same house in which his unwanted ex-wife used to live. She stiffened when she sensed Ashton's presence at the doorframe. Ashton stood there a whole minute, drinking in her beauty. He wanted to hug her from behind and run his lips over the exposed skin on her neck, but he knew Catherine wasn't ready for this yet, but at least he felt a shred of happiness, thinking she was back to him. He regretted forever hurting her, and he was even remorseful for what he did. How many times she had tried to warn him about Callie. If he had chosen to believe her even once, they wouldn't have been in this situation today. But it is still not too late. I will try everything to get her love back, he promised himself. Mommy? They heard their daughter walk in behind them. I'm hungry, she said, patting her tummy. Catherine looked at Ashton for a split second as if trying to ask if she can use the kitchen. He ignored her and went near his daughter. Do you like white sauce pasta, honey? He chose pasta because he knew how much Catherine loved his chicken pasta. I love it, Crystal squealed. All right, then pasta it is. He carried her with him to the kitchen and placed her on the kitchen counter while he began to cook. Within half an hour, Ashton arranged the food items on the table with little help from his daughter. Let's go and call your mummy. Okay. She ran and Ashton followed her. Crystal was like a bouncy ball, he thought, and chuckled. Catherine was standing in the balcony, lacking the will to face Ashton when she heard her daughter call her. Mommy, lunch is ready. She didn't have an appetite to begin with. All she wanted was to be left alone for the rest of the day, but unfortunately for her, Crystal began to tug at her arm. Ashton crossed his arms over his chest and leaned his side on the wall, watching his daughter do the trick for him. Okay, okay, I'm coming. She started following her daughter quietly, trying hard to ignore Ashton. They took a seat while Ashton began to serve the pasta onto their plates. I can help myself. Catherine stopped him and plated some for her. He shrugged, and due to his lack of experience with small kids, he stuffed so much on Crystal's plate that it seemed like a mountain of pasta. He enthusiastically pushed the plate near his daughter. Come on, eat now, baby girl. Crystal stared at her plate with wide eyes. What's wrong? Ashton asked worriedly. Catherine sighed, shaking her head and emptied some of it onto Ashton's plate. She cannot eat so much, she explained. Ashton nodded, rubbing the back of his head foolishly. Sorry, he mumbled and made a mental note of how much his baby girl can eat. Catherine controlled the urge to moan at the yummy pasta that he had made. In fact, even better, since he had so lovingly cooked it for his daughter. Ashton secretly stole glances every now and then at Catherine, who kept her head low, eating her food silently. Do you want some more? He asked when she was about to finish it. She shot him a glare and walked near the sink to wash her plate. He felt a little agitated for being ignored by her. He was trying to be nice to her, but all she had to do was avoid even looking at him. It pissed her off that Ashton was trying to be cheerful as if everything was normal between them, when in reality, their relationship was like a shattered glass, which cannot be fixed. After a little nap, Crystal insisted on watching a Disney movie, and Ashton happily agreed to her. He wanted to compensate for all the lost time with his daughter. Lately, when she got bored, he decided to take her out for a little shopping. Kathy? He tapped on her gently when he saw her napping on her bed. Yeah? She sat up groaning. She noticed them both dressed neatly to go out. We are going out. Do you want to join us? He asked, even though he knew what her answer would be. N no, I'm feeling tired, she lied. All right, let's go, he gestured to his daughter. Where was he taking her? Was he going to Callie's house? Catherine began to panic. What if she hurts my baby girl? Oh my God. No, no, her mind wheel began to work. No way I'm letting my daughter near that vicious woman. Wait, she jumped out from the bed. Ashton stopped walking and turned around. Where are you taking her? She walked near him, crossing her arms over her chest and asked angrily. Mm, shopping. He didn't know what came over her for the sudden outburst. Why? What's wrong? 
He cocked his brow at her. She didn't believe in his words. I am coming with you, she announced and went to get ready. Ashton couldn't stop himself from smirking. Catherine came out wearing a floral dress that accentuated all her curves. Lord, save me, he mumbled as soon as his eyes landed on her. It would be pure torture for him to not touch her in ways he wanted, when she was so close to him. How was he even going to control himself? He thought worriedly and walked out. In a few minutes, he parked his car near a toy shop. Wow, toys! Crystal screamed happily. Catherine stared at him. Good I came with them or else he might have taken Crystal to his lover's home. She accused him mentally. He had no idea why she was staring at him this time, but she was looking so damned hot. When she was fuming with so much anger and all he wanted was to kiss her juicy lips until she fell out of breath. He watched as her hips swayed while she walked away, carrying their daughter into the shop. This woman is going to be the death of me. He cursed lowly and took a few deep breaths to calm himself before getting down from his car. Ashton bought all the toys that Crystal laid her eyes upon. He picked up some bedspreads and curtains that had her favorite cartoon characters for her room that he was working on. Catherine stood there, uninvolving but observing Ashton's every move. She felt a pang of jealous, watching her little girl who was glued to her dad, even without knowing he was her daddy. On any other day, Crystal would seek Catherine's attention for everything, but today, all she did was to roam behind Ashton, forgetting her mummy completely. When they were done, Ashton took them to an ice cream parlor on their way back home. He ordered Crystal's favorite strawberry flavor and chocolate mudslide for Catherine. This one's for you. He handed over her ice cream before taking a seat next to her. She looked down at the ice cream and wondered how he still remembered that it was her most preferred flavor. I don't want it. She pushed it back to him. Isn't it your favorite? He asked. Well, my choices have changed over these years, and it's not my favorite anymore. An ugly scowl creased on Ashton's forehead when he understood what she meant by her double entendre. I will be waiting outside, honey. She told her daughter and picked up her bag before she dashed out. He didn't look quite happy after that, and a gloom etched on his handsome face. They reached home, and Crystal unpacked all her toys. With Ashton's help, she arranged them neatly in her room. They both changed the bed covers and curtains. Wow! She clapped her hands, looking at the changeover. Catherine was making a cup of coffee when she heard the bell ring. She looked around for Ashton, and when she thought he hadn't heard it, she went to open it. Her eyes widened, and her hands flew up automatically to cover her mouth. When were you planning on telling us about your return? Oh my God, Catherine whispered and let out a soft whimper seeing Laura standing at the door. She observed Hudson, Anne, Ashton's parents and grandma standing there too. Uh, how? Well, what? She stumbled since she felt like she was out of words. Ashton told us if that's what you want to ask, Anne said crossing her arms in front of her. How could you just forget us all? Anne asked angrily, but her tears were betraying her. Catherine couldn't stop her tears as well. She wanted to meet them all from the moment she came back to Manhattan, but she couldn't gather her wits to do so. They would only remind her of Ashton and all the pains she had suffered because of him. I wanted to meet you, but... She began to explain. Keep your lies to yourself, Hudson interrupted. You wouldn't even have tried, I'm sure. Catherine, honey, how are you? Ashton's mom, Kate, hugged her tightly. I'm fine, Kate, she sobbed. You didn't have to leave, sweetie, she cried, shaking her head. I'm sorry, I had no other choice, Kathy replied, wiping her tears. When Ashton had informed them about Catherine's return, they all couldn't wait to meet her. He hadn't yet informed them about his baby girl. He wanted to see everyone's reaction when they got to know the biggest surprise of their life. He carried Crystal to the living room hall and everyone's eyes almost fell out of its socket as soon as they saw the cute little girl in his arms. Hey, everyone, meet my baby girl, Crystal, he said proudly only to escalate their shocks. They heard loud gasps from everyone. Honey, say hi to everyone, he coerced in her ear. Hi, she waved at all of them shyly. When Ashton's parents snapped out of their stupor, they rushed to their granddaughter. Kate snatched her from Ashton's hold and placed loving kisses all over her face. Her body shook as she began to sob, burying her face into her neck. Ashton's father wound his hands over his wife and kissed Crystal tenderly. They wanted to be angry at Catherine for not informing them about their grandchild, but it wouldn't have happened if not for their son's foolishness at the first place. She looks just like you, Ashton, Kate remarked, looking at Crystal closely. It was also overwhelming for Ashton that he couldn't say anything in return except for a simple nod. He hadn't seen his parents so happy in years. Where is Grandpa? Catherine asked no one in particular when she noticed his absence. 
Ashton stiffened at her question and gulped loudly. Grandpa passed away last year. Catherine slumped on the couch and broke into a fit of cry. So many things had happened in these five years, and she had been clueless about everything. It took them all a few minutes to console her. She had to calm herself down for the sake of her daughter, who had become nervous, seeing her mummy cry all of a sudden. Ashton ordered food for everyone while everyone spent their time talking and playing with Crystal. Ashton's parents were so smitten by her already that he feared they would take her along with them. She is so cute, Laura told Catherine while they were seated on the couch. Thanks, Catherine smiled at her. How are you, Kathy? We missed you so much. Anne's tears were beginning to well up. I missed you all, too. I had a hard time in London to not think about you all, Catherine confessed. They kept talking for a while. Catherine got to know that her friends were all married now. Hudson had a two-year-old son. Laura and Anne had daughters of same age as her daughter. Where is she? Catherine asked out of the blue. Who? Anne's asked, noticing the sudden seriousness in Catherine's face, and immediately understood whom she was referring to. Did you really have to remind us all about that bitch? Laura asked, clenching her teeth together. She is dead to us, she declared. She had never seen Laura being so furious on somebody before. They weren't angry on Ashton. Why were they all so mad at Callie alone when both of them were equally at fault, she wondered. Didn't Ashton tell you anything about Callie? Hudson asked her curiously. N no, she shook her head negatively. What happened to her? Her heart began to pound loudly in her chest. It is for Ashton to tell you, Kathy, Anne said, taking her palm in her hands. But I assure you things did not go out of hands like you think. She flashed an assuring smile at Catherine. What did she mean by that? Why did she say that things didn't go out of hands? Was she missing out something? Her mind became chaotic just in a few minutes. She shifted her eyes at Ashton, who was laughing at his daughter's jokes. Her eyes kept on studying him. So much had happened. How did things come to be like this? She pondered. Ashton laughed and turned away. That's when his gray eyes met with her blue ones. His breath hitched at his throat when he noticed a soft look in Catherine's eyes for him. She was looking into his eyes for answers. They stared at each other for they didn't know how long. They both tried to understand the other, and they could sense a hint of longing in each other's eyes. All they could hope was for time to heal them. Catherine and Ashton's friends left one by one after dinner. Catherine promised them to visit often like old times. Ashton's parents didn't have the heart to go home after seeing Crystal sleep so soundly in Kate's arms, but eventually left after a little while. Ashton carried Crystal to her bed and laid her very gently before pecking her forehead. He stood beside her bed for a whole minute admiring his baby girl's sleeping form. He couldn't be any more proud when his parents praised his daughter for being very smart and well-behaved. He had to admit that Catherine had done an amazing job in raising her all alone. His only regret was he couldn't be there with his wife to see his girl grow. He wasn't even there when she was born. He switched on the night lamp and closed the door behind him silently. Catherine was getting ready to bed when she watched Ashton enter the bedroom before getting onto the bed. What are you doing? Her eyebrows shot up. I'm going to sleep, he replied nonchalantly. He had no plans other than sleeping for this night since he was so dead tired. He hadn't had a proper sleep the previous night nor this whole day, but if Catherine had other plans, he wouldn't mind sacrificing a little more sleep for her, he thought naughtily. Why, don't you want me to sleep, honey? He turned to his side and propped his head on his palm. He flashed a grin at Catherine that caused her heart to skip a couple of beats, but she quickly snapped out of her daze. She rolled her eyes at him. Yes, she paused while crossing her arms over her chest. Ashton's eyes widened for a microsecond with anticipation. I don't want you to sleep here, she emphasized the last word cleverly. What do you mean? He asked her a bit confused. Catherine huffed. I can't share the bed with you, Ashton. But why? We've always shared the bed before. He tried to reason with her. What nonsense is she talking, he thought. That was before, Ashton. We can't do it anymore. I don't understand, he shook his head. We are still married and we are supposed to sleep on the same bed. All right, I don't want to fight over this right now. I will better take the guest room. She began to grab a pillow and a blanket from the bed when Ashton caught her wrist. That one touch from Ashton sent sparks flying all over her body. She had to fight hard against her own body to stay calm and not melt into his touch. Fine, I will go, he said with a poker face before snatching the pillow from her hand. Catherine heard him mumble inaudible words all the way to the guest room before she closed the door behind him. She laid on the bed and couldn't help but think about all the times when she used to be snuggling into Ashton's chest. 
she couldn't explain how much she missed being in his warm embrace. Her heart began to ache, and unconsciously, her tears began to roll down her eyes. He was so close and yet felt so distant to her. She silently cried into her pillow. Ashton twisted and turned on the bed. He was tired, but he couldn't sleep, and it wasn't because of the bed, he was sure. Catherine was being so stubborn with him. He was aware that she still believed that he had slept with Callie, and knew that he had to clear that misunderstanding from her head soon. He couldn't go on like this forever. The next morning, Catherine woke up with a bad headache. It was still too early for Crystal to wake up, so she decided to take a shower before preparing breakfast for them. When she came out from her shower, she was shocked to see Ashton sleeping on her bed with his stomach down. His unruly hair was falling on his face, and his lips were slightly open. Catherine remembered that Ashton always had trouble sleeping on a new bed. He probably wanted to sleep on his bed for a few minutes, she guessed. She couldn't take her eyes off his naked upper body. They looked so toned now, and her body began to heat up uncontrollably. She hated to admit, but her body was behaving as if it had a mind of its own. She tried to avert her eyes from him fearing she would be caught staring at him. That would be so embarrassing. She looked down at herself, and she was only wrapped in a towel. After making sure Ashton was really sleeping, she walked near her closet trying to be as quiet as a cat. She grabbed her clothes and wore them as fast as she had never done before. She left him sleeping and went to the kitchen to prepare breakfast. She rummaged into the fridge and got whatever she needed. When she was halfway into the process, she heard Ashton and Crystal's voices. Good morning, darling. She greeted her daughter with a smile on her face, but got a reply from Ashton instead. Good morning, honey, he said, smirking. She glared at him before trying to take Crystal from him. She was still sleepy with her face buried into her dad's neck. Did you sleep well? Catherine asked her baby lovingly while placing a kiss on her cheek. Yes, mommy, she replied groggily. Ashton took a seat on a nearby stool at the breakfast counter. He placed his chin on his right palm and looked at his lovely family. He could have lost them forever because of his imprudence, but he was lucky that life had given him another chance to be with them, and this time, he wouldn't do anything to ruin it. Crystal got down from her arms and climbed on Ashton's lap. She is such a daddy's girl, Catherine thought while pouring some milk into a glass. She could sense Ashton's intense stare on her back. When she turned around, he winked at her, which affected her so powerfully that she felt it was impossible to stand anymore. She was certain that she must be blushing from the roots of her hair. Ashton smirked when he saw her blush so wildly. He had witnessed her flushed cheeks a million times before, but still, this seemed so different from all those times, and he was glad he still had these effects on her. Catherine wondered why he hadn't gone to meet Callie yet. She remembered how Callie used Crave for his attention when they were married. There wasn't a single day that Callie missed to call Ashton, but she hadn't seen him even on call with her after they returned. What was going on? She suddenly remembered what her friends told her. Something about things not having gone out of hands. What did they mean by that? Did Ashton and Callie break up or something? Is that why he wants to get back with her? She began to think. She wanted to ask him about Callie, but she did not know where to start. Don't you have to go somewhere? She asked him, taking a seat opposite to him. No, I'm not going anywhere, he said while feeding his daughter. Why? She asked curiously. Because I want to be with my baby girl, he told her, nuzzling into Crystal's cheeks, causing her to giggle loudly. I've taken off from work till Crystal's spring break ends. Catherine's heart warmed at his words, and she could only nod at him. The next few days, Ashton remained at home with Crystal. They both did everything together, and he would take her to the park in the evening, where she had some new friends from the same neighborhood. Catherine took leave for a couple of days to be at home as well. She spent her time unpacking and arranging her things. There were certain moments when Ashton made Catherine's heart flutter. She couldn't deny how her heart did funny things when she saw Ashton, but then her mind would remind her of what he did to her. She would recall his betrayal. It wasn't easy for her to forget about it and move on. Even after everything, she knew she still loved him and her feelings were unchanged for him. She hated herself for that. Ashton would watch her every day, her every move, her every activity, and couldn't help but crave for a little attention from her. He was aware that she hated him for betraying her, but what she didn't know was that she was the one woman and would always be the only woman in his life. A week later, Crystal started going to school and they both resumed to work. Even though Ashton saw her every day at home, he would eagerly wait for those three days when he had to visit the Mackenzie's office. He decided to maintain a good relationship with Harris and Roderick after all they were not only his partners, 
but also his brothers-in-law. Catherine decided she would have to talk to her daughter about her father when she felt she shouldn't be delaying on it anymore. On the following Friday, Catherine left from work earlier than usual and picked up her daughter on the way. She made chocolate milkshake for Crystal and a cup of coffee for herself. She made her sit in the balcony, facing the setting sun. How is school, honey? Good, Mommy. I made new friends today. Wow, that's great. She kissed the top of her head. She waited a couple of minutes thinking how to begin, but she knew she had to do it now at any cost. Honey, do you like Ashton? She began after swallowing hard. Yes, Mommy, I love Ashton. Catherine could notice the spark in her eyes. Why do you love him? She grew a little curious now. Because he is my best friend and he plays with me. She tapped her forefinger on her chin as she thought of more reasons. He is funny and, oh yeah, he's strong like Ryder. Catherine broke into a fit of laughter when she compared Ashton to Ryder from Tangled. All right, then let me give you another reason to love him. She mumbled as she placed Crystal on her lap. Have you wondered who your daddy is, Crystal? She asked her carefully and Crystal nodded in return. Well, Ashton is your daddy, honey. Ashton is my daddy? Crystal asked with wide eyes. Yes. Catherine could feel a lot of questions bubbling up inside her little head, and she wanted to ease it for her. She had to give her some time to absorb it all. What are you thinking, baby? Nothing, mommy. She shook her head lightly, but Catherine was sure she was a little confused with the new piece of information. He would be happy if you called him Daddy instead of Ashton, she said with a warm smile. Daddy? Yes, would you like to call him Daddy? Catherine asked her, eager to know what she was thinking. Yes, mommy. Crystal flashed a grin at her. Though Ashton had a spare key with him, he always knocked on the door and waited for Catherine to open it. How many times had he imagined to be welcomed by his sweetheart, and now that she was really back, he wanted everything that he had yearned for in her absence. Hey! He stretched the bouquet of yellow lilies in front of her like he had been doing for the past few days, but today he was taken by surprise when she took it in her hands, unlike the other days. Her expression was blank. Nevertheless, he was happy about the progress. She walked into the living room and placed the flowers in a vase. He followed her mindlessly until... Daddy! He heard his baby girl's voice. He froze. On the outside, he didn't react much. But inside, a rupture exploded at his heart. He couldn't find his breath. Unable to balance his weight on his legs anymore, he grasped the table near him. He stared at Catherine and she stared back at him with anticipation. When it registered in his brain, his eyes widened and slowly he turned around. Daddy! She called him again. This time it hit him like a hurricane and he fell on his knees in front of his daughter. Well, what did you call me? His eyes began to well up with unshed tears. Daddy? And before she knew it, he slammed her small frame into his body. Catherine observed how his back began to vibrate as he cried silently into Crystal's body. Her throat began to constrict the sight in front of her. She could understand the sweet pain at his heart, but couldn't do anything to help him other than stare at them with a heavy heart. Love you, my baby. He placed soft kisses all over her face. His heart was overwhelming with unexplainable emotions. He didn't expect this from Catherine in a million years. He threw a look at her that expressed his gratitude to her. At bedtime, Crystal asked her daddy to sleep with her on her bed and he happily obeyed her. He read her a book to her and when he was about to turn off the lights, Crystal called to him. Daddy? It still gave him goosebumps whenever she called him daddy. Yes, sweetie? Can you call mommy for me? Why? What happened, honey? I want mommy also to sleep with us, she told him. Ashton didn't know if Catherine would agree to that, but he wanted to try his luck. All right. He walked into the kitchen and saw Catherine doing the dishes. Kathy, he watched her body stiffen at that, but she didn't turn around. Crystal is calling you. She wiped her hands with a towel and walked past him to Crystal's bedroom. Hey, baby. She cooed to her daughter. Mommy, can you sleep here with us for tonight? Catherine shot a suspicious gaze at Ashton. This must be his doings, she thought. I swear I didn't do anything. He shook his head in denial. Catherine could never break her baby's heart. She knew she had no option other than to sleep with them. Okay. She climbed on the bed and laid beside Crystal while Ashton took a place on the other side. Catherine began to pat on her chest gently to make her fall asleep. Since the naughty kid she was, Crystal grabbed her dad's hand and placed it on her mummy's hand over her chest. Catherine gasped and shuddered under his touch. Ashton, too, was shocked at the sudden contact at first, but gave in eventually. She didn't dare removing her hands. She shut her eyes tightly and lay motionless. She felt her heartbeat going into an overdrive. His scent permeated through her nose. Her stomach was twisting into knots. I love you, Mommy. I love you, Daddy. 
Crystal muttered before closing her eyes. Catherine was afraid to open her eyes. She was just waiting for her daughter to fall asleep so that she could escape from this room, and when she was sure she had slept, she slowly opened her eyes. She let out a shaky breath of relief when she noticed Ashton, too, sleeping. She carefully tried to pull her hand from his grasp, but stopped when it only tightened around her hand. Stay, she heard him say. His eyes were still closed, but his fingers began to stroke the back of her hand gently, sending tingles throughout her body. She was torn between running away and staying there. Her hopeless heart won at the end when she decided to stay. He knew she liked it because her previously tensed body was slowly beginning to relax under his hand. He smirked triumphantly before giving in to his drowsiness. Ashton was getting ready to work when he received a call from Harris. Hey man, what's up? He chirped. After a few seconds, Catherine watched his eyes widen as his smile began to be replaced by panic. Kathy, he shoved his phone into his pant pocket and walked near her. I it's your dad. Harry is taking him to the hospital. Catherine's pulse began to hammer and she felt a surge of unfamiliar feelings blazing inside her. She had hated her father for leaving her when she needed him the most. All she had for her father was hate and anger. Even after meeting him, she loathed seeing him for the first few years, but somewhere over the years her anger was replaced by pain. He was a dying man, and being the kind-hearted person she was, she could never bring herself to hate him completely. She came out of her trance when she felt Ashton's hand over her shoulder. We need to go, baby, he told her. She tried to remain calm and followed Ashton to his car. The drive to the hospital was quiet. Ashton kept looking at her to check if she was okay. He was aware of her severed relationship with her father, however. He could sense a trace of grief on her face. As soon as they reached the hospital, she was met with Harry's distressed face. Kathy. He rushed to her and she engulfed him in a comforting hug. Ashton hurried behind her. Catherine could feel the wetness of Harry's cheek against her neck. Their perspectives about the same person were very contrasting, and unlike his sister, Harry had loved and admired this man his entire life. She knew he must be heartbroken right now. He will be okay, Harry, she whispered, patting at his back. I spoke to the doctor. It's bad this time, Kathy, he mumbled. What did the doctor say? Ashton asked. He needs an immediate liver transplant he said, pulling away from his sister. But we haven't found any matching donors, he sobbed. Harry, please calm down. We will see what we can do. Ashton placed his hand on his shoulder and tried to calm him down. Harry nodded and looked at his sister. He wants to see you, Kathy. He had been asking you since yesterday night. Catherine stood there like a rock. She guessed why he would want to see her now. He would beg her for forgiveness in these last moments of his life, and she would have no choice but to forgive him. He didn't deserve her forgiveness. She didn't want to forgive him just because he was dying, she thought. No, I don't want to see him, she refused bluntly. Kathy, for God's sake, he is dying. Will you put your ego and anger away for just this once? Harry begged her. How can she be so heartless, he wondered. Please, Catherine, after all, he is our father. He tried to make her understand. I can't, I can't. She shook her head vigorously before walking out of the hospital. Ashton shifted his eyes helplessly between the siblings. I will be back, buddy, he told him before jogging out towards Catherine. Take me back home, she demanded. Oh, okay. He wanted to make her stay, but no one other than him knew how stubborn she was, so he decided that for now it was better to take her home. As they reached home, Catherine walked into her bedroom and slammed the door shut from the inside. She fell on the bed and began to cry her eyes out. She recalled how she had yearned for her father's love when she was small. She remembered all the nights she felt lonely and ostracized in that orphanage. As a young girl, she wondered why she was abandoned by her father. Was she a bad girl for him to have left her here? She blamed herself for her loneliness until she learned to hate her father for leaving her. She sobbed loudly. Her mind screamed at her that her father was supposed to suffer for what he did, but her heart wanted to let him free from his guilt. She was certain that she would definitely forgive him if she saw him in such a vulnerable situation and she didn't want that. She heard a tap on the door and hurriedly wiped her tears. Ashton walked in with two cups of coffee in his hands. Kathy, you haven't eaten anything for morning. Have this cup of coffee at least. He brought the cup in front of her. She took it in her hand without throwing a fit of anger. He studied her face. Her cheeks were stained with tears. Her nose was cherry red and her lashes were still wet. He moved closer to her on the bed and pushed away the wisp of hair that was sticking on her wet face. 
He ran his thumb over her cheeks to wipe them dry. He could feel her stiffen under his touch, but that didn't stop him from touching and comforting her. She didn't want to cry or scream, so weak in front of Ashton, but at the same time she couldn't cease those treacherous tears from rolling down her cheeks. Shh. Pulled her closer to his chest and astonishingly, it felt so calm and uplifting for Catherine to be back in his arms. She buried her face into his chest, and once again, her waterworks began. After a few minutes, he pulled away and cupped her cheeks. Kathy, honey, I know you hate him, but you need to see him this once. He told her which caused her to slap away his hands from her face. You know nothing about him, she whined. He had no rights to say this to her, she thought. Yes, I may not know him well, but I'm sure he must have regretted his whole life for leaving you. What he did was in the past, and he must have suffered for it beyond you can imagine, Kathy. He said, stroking her soft cheeks. Forgive him, honey. Let him free from his guilt and agony, he coaxed her. Surprisingly, the mist around her mind began to uplift and she began to think clearly. He was right. She had seen her father suffer with her own eyes. No amount of hatred or anger would take the pain away from her heart. He had somehow ruined her childhood, but she was a better person than this. She couldn't hate anyone even if she wanted to. That's how she was, but the question was, was she ready to forgive him? As if sensing her mind, he spoke again. Your pain may be gone once you try to forgive him. She pulled away from his touch. Why do you care, Ashton? Aren't you happy seeing me like this, broken and hurt? She asked, looking into his eyes. That's because I love you, baby. He blurted out with pondering much. I never meant to hurt you. I always wanted to see you smiling and happy. She stared at him. She wanted to laugh at him for what he was saying. Was he even in his right mind for saying it? She sneered at him. Then why did you leave me, Ashton? She shot at him. I never did. You were the one who left me, he countered. Yes, I did, she nodded her head angrily, because you asked me to. I didn't. I wanted you to stay here, he whispered, causing her to snort. You wanted me to be stuck here forever when you were leading a happy life with your lover? She questioned him furiously. Ashton fisted his palms to his sides and clenched his teeth together to control himself. Her words felt like a spear piercing at his heart. I never would have lived a happy life without you, Kathy, he said softly. His eyes deeply gazed into her blue ones. He noticed how her eyes began to glimmer with unshed tears. Ashton sighed. He had been looking for a moment to confess the truth to her, and he knew he wouldn't get a better chance than this. I never slept with her. His voice was a mere whisper that she almost missed it. She blinked several times to absorb his words. She couldn't bring out her thoughts in words. Kathy, please say something, he pleaded her. You are lying. She tried to push him away. Angry tears escaped her eyes. He gazed at her pain-filled eyes, and his heart felt like being torn apart forever hurting her. He caught her wrists firmly and kissed her knuckles gently. I swear I didn't lay a finger on her that night. He held her palm and placed it against his beating heart gently. My heart has always belonged to you, baby, and will always belong to you, I promise. Catherine gasped at that. She didn't understand what he was saying. Is this what their friends meant to say to her? But that night, you said, she murmured. I remember what I said. He was unable to look into her soul-piercing gaze and lowered his head. Now this was going to be the most difficult part he was dreading to face. After the day he found about Callie's betrayal, he had hated himself for ever considering her his best friend. He tried hard not to think about her and her betrayal, but it was almost impossible. Callie was the reason they were at this point of their life. It was because of her. He had lost his wife. How could he not think about it over and over again? It almost haunted him every night, and doing nothing about it meant he didn't love Kathy. He wanted to do something. He wanted to hurt Callie. He wanted to take his revenge against her. That's when he remembered that Callie's father had unwisely given him all the legal documents of his company, thinking he was going to be his future son-in-law, and he used this opportunity to make them go bankrupt. He did everything he could to ruin all David Jones had ever built. Callie had come to beg Ashton for his forgiveness, but he never let her near him. Catherine kept staring at Ashton expecting answers from him, and when he seemed immersed in his own thoughts, she became impatient and shook him out of his reverie. Ashton! I'm sorry, he snapped out and gulped loudly. It was Callie. She used her cheap tricks to make me believe that I slept with her that night in Paris. He didn't want to go into details. Now Catherine felt her anger for Ashton skyrocketing out of this world. And you believed her, she shrieked at the top of her lungs. This only meant that they had wasted five precious years of their life for no reason. She grabbed the lapel of his shirt into her fist. How could you believe her so blindly, Ashton, huh? How could you not know what she was capable of? She choked in between her sobs, 
and hit at his chest with her fists. He sighed, slumping his shoulders, and let her hit him. He deserved more, he thought. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's all he had to say and kept repeating it. A single tear rolled down his cheek. The more she thought about it, the more it ached at her heart. The fact that he didn't sleep with Callie gave her a sense of relief, but the fact that he had foolishly decided to believe that snake didn't sit well at her heart. You could have avoided all this. She dug her forefinger at his chest. I know, he admitted wholeheartedly. I'm sorry for not believing you, Kathy. He hugged her tightly and buried his face into her hair. Please forgive me, baby. Please. She wanted to laugh and cry at the same time. She didn't know whether she had to be happy or sad. They could have lived happily together. Ashton shouldn't have believed Callie, but then she herself had rashly decided to leave him without giving him time. She didn't understand whom to blame. Her evil fate couldn't be any more cruel to her. It had punished them for the sins they had never committed. She kept sobbing into his chest, and he let her cry until she had no more tears left. She realized that her anger had caused a lot of problems in her life, but hadn't solved any one of her problems yet. There were certain things that were beyond a person's understanding. The hate she had for her father had always been a burden on her shoulders, and she thought it was time to let it go. She could never find rest if she didn't learn to finally let go of the hatred and hurt that lives in her heart. She slowly pulled herself out of Ashton's hold, wiped her tears, and looked at him. I want to go back to the hospital, she mumbled. Ashton nodded and pulled her up with him. Within the next hour, they were at the hospital. Harry was surprised to see them back. She didn't mind him and went straight into the doctor's office. Harry and Ashton walked beside her, panicking. What's going on? Harry asked Ashton. I don't know. Ashton had no idea what she was up to. She hadn't said anything to him on their way to the hospital. He thought she had finally decided to see her father, but it shocked him when she dashed into the doctor's office. Hello, doctor. I'm Harold Mackenzie's daughter. She took the seat opposite him. I am willing to donate my liver to my father. Kathy, she heard Ashton and Harry's shocked voices behind her. That's great news. The doctor beamed at her before turning his gaze at Ashton and Harry. Gentlemen, please don't worry. The liver is an amazing organ which has the ability to regrow into its original size within months. Miss, first we need to run certain tests on your body to check if your liver is the right match for this. If everything works out, then this might be his only chance to live. He handed her over the consent sheet. Baby, are you sure you want to do this? Ashton asked concernedly. If he could, he would have given his own liver instead of Catherine's, but unfortunately his blood group was different from Harold's. There must be another way. No, this is my way of forgiving him, and I'm 100% sure about this, she said determined. Can you please pick Crystal up from school, she asked Harry. Sh sure, I will do that. The next two hours were spent in taking various tests on Catherine's body, and surprisingly her liver was a perfect match. The operation will take place at 5 o'clock tomorrow morning. Is that okay for you all? The doctor asked. Yes, doctor, Catherine said confidently. She was aware that forgiving her father wouldn't change the past, but it would definitely give her the peace that she deserved. Daddy, when will Mummy come home? Crystal asked Ashton. Soon, honey. Why don't you go home with Grandma? Everyone was waiting outside the operation theater for four hours. Now, Crystal was beginning to miss her Mummy already. Okay, Daddy. She nodded and got down from his lap. Come on, honey. Ashton's parents were really happy to take her home and spend some time with their granddaughter. Call us if you need anything, son, Kate said before carrying Crystal out of the hospital. To say Ashton was nervous would be an understatement. He didn't want to let Catherine inside the operation theater. Liver transplants are not always effortless, he knew that. He heard of complications after surgery for both the donor as well as recipient. But Ashton understood that Catherine had to do this no matter how much he was against it. He would have done the same if it was for his father. He was too worried for her. He had just got her back in his life, and he didn't want to lose her again. Before the operation, they were left alone for some time in her ward. Ashton hugged her against him tightly. I love you, Kathy. Promise to come back to me. He confessed wholehearted for the first time after she returned. Catherine didn't say anything in return, but stayed calm in his arms, feeling his heart beat so closely after so long. She too felt content to be in his comforting embrace once again. Take care of Crystal while I'm gone. She spoke in a low voice. I will. Catherine could feel his repeated kisses on top of her head and couldn't stop blushing secretly into his chest. He was glad to have finally revealed the truth to his wife. He could still feel her annoyance for him, but he could sense the severity of her anger had lessened. Soon afterwards, Catherine was taken into the operation theater. 
The nurse had to stop him from entering the theater. The operation began at five in the morning as per plans. During the operation, all he could do was to pray for the operation to be a success. Waiting for Catherine outside the operation theater felt like the longest six hours of his life. He felt edgy and restless without her, that he thought he would lose his mind if the doctor doesn't wind up the operation soon. He snapped out of his anguish when the door was opened by the chief doctor. Doctor, he hurried near him. The operation was a success, the doctor informed, and Ashton let out the breath that he didn't know he was holding for so long. Thank you, doctor. Can I see her? She will be shifted back to her room in a while. You can see her after that, but she will be unconscious for another four hours. Even though she was going to be unconscious, Ashton wanted to be near her. After she was shifted back to her room, Ashton didn't leave her side even for a minute. She could wake up any time, and he needed to be the only one she sees when she woke up. He held her palm in his fist and had placed his head on the bed beside her. He was very alert, and when he heard a soft sigh, his breath hitched at his throat. Kathy. He stood up, and without wasting another second, he rushed to the door to call someone. Harry, call the nurse. She is awake. Soon the doctor was called in, and he checked her vitals. She is perfectly fine. She needs to be under observation, and if there are no complications, she can leave the hospital in a week. As for Mr. McKenzie, he is still under sedation but there is no sign of rejection to the donor organ. So for now, he is safe. Thank you, doctor. Ashton walked the doctor out. Hey, sis, how are you? Harry asked his sister. C good. Catherine smiled at him weakly. W where's Crystal? She went home with Ashton's parents. Catherine nodded. How's dad? Harry was surprised to hear that from Catherine. She had never called him dad before. He, he hasn't woken up yet, but the doctor said he is fine, he stated. He didn't know why Catherine had this sudden change of heart, but he was sure it had something to do with Ashton. Harry watched Ashton walk in. He walked near him and he gave a brotherly hug to him. Thanks, Ashton. He knew if he had to thank someone, it had to be Ashton. I'll go and call everyone. He excused himself to give them some alone time. Ashton walked near Catherine's bed and sat on the chair near her bed. Hey, baby, how are you feeling now? A little sore, but I guess that's normal, she replied. Ashton nodded. You should have plenty of rest to get back to normal he said, caressing her hair and placing a tender kiss on her forehead, which made her stomach turn upside down. A while later, Ashton's parents brought Crystal back to the hospital. Mommy! She began to climb next to her mommy. Hey, baby girl. Catherine cooed to her. Baby, you need to be careful around mommy. Ashton said, placing Crystal up on the bed carefully. Crystal looked up at her dad and then at her mommy. Mommy, does it hurt? A little, she mumbled, ruffling her hair. I missed you, Mommy. I missed you too, baby. She kissed her cheeks. Mommy, we got a new teacher today, and I like her a lot. Crystal informed her mother excitedly. Really? What's your new teacher's name? Crystal looked up trying to remember her new teacher's name. I'm sorry, Mommy. I don't remember her name, but she said I remind her of her old friend. Catherine laughed at her adorable daughter before she shifted her gaze at Ashton, who was looking at his two lovely ladies with so much love. His heart warmed, seeing them both interact with each other like this. Catherine lowered her gaze, immediately unable to hold an eye contact with his deep ones. Crystal kept telling her parents about her day at school until she fell asleep on Catherine's bed. Mom, take her home, Ashton said, carrying his baby girl from the bed. Rest well, Kathy. Ashton's mom patted her shoulder gently. Thanks, Kate, for taking care of Crystal. Come on, you don't have to thank us, sweetie. After all, we are taking care of our grandchild. Catherine nodded at her. Good night. Kate left the hospital with Crystal and Catherine was left alone with Ashton. Aren't you going home? Catherine asked him. Harry had told her how Ashton hadn't left her side while she was unconscious. He looked very tired and she knew he needed some sleep. I can't leave you alone here, he muttered, sitting near her. You look tired, she remarked, looking into his eyes. I can sleep over there. He pointed at the small couch placed for the visitors. Oh, okay. She watched him cover her with a blanket before he went to lie on the couch. She tried to close her eyes to get some sleep, but with Ashton in the same room, her heart couldn't be at rest and she slowly peeked through her lashes. He was lying on his back, facing the ceiling and had his eyes covered with his arm. The couch seemed uncomfortably small for him, that he had to bend his knees to fit on it. She had successfully forgiven her father and she realized it was time to forgive Ashton also. He might have been responsible for all the miseries in the past, but she couldn't deny the fact that she was happy that he hadn't actually cheated on her as she believed. She sighed and closed her eyes once again. This time she fell asleep due to the painkillers in her system. On the fourth day, the first thing Harold did after he opened his eyes was to ask about his daughter, and surprisingly within a half an hour, 
Harry managed to bring her to his father's room. Harold broke into tears seeing his daughter come into his room on her wheelchair. He grabbed her hand and began to cry hysterically. You are my angel. I never thought you would forgive me. He cried into her hands. After your mother died, I came back to Manhattan in search for you. I swear, I wanted to take you back with me, but you were nowhere to be found. Catherine's heart clenched at hearing his words. Again, she had been wrong in judging a person. Dad. She called out softly, which made him look up at her with teary eyes. It was in the past. Let us leave it behind. She said, patting his hands, and Harold, for the first time, saw his daughter smiling at him. Catherine was discharged after spending eight days in the hospital. She felt sore and slightly groggy for the first two days, after which she started to feel herself again. However, she still felt fatigued at times, and she was prescribed oral medicines to lessen her pain. She was slowly encouraged to resume normal activities and stay active, making sure not to lift heavy weights. Ashton drove them back to their apartment, and as soon as she got out from the car, he carried her in his arms. I can walk, she whined. I know, sweetheart, but I'm not letting you walk. He grinned at her before he began to walk into the elevator. She huffed and crossed her arms over her chest. She looked so adorable to Ashton when she acted like she was mad at him. Reaching the door, he placed her on her feet and opened the door. He helped her into her bedroom and placed a few pillows behind her back for her comfort. Kate insisted on taking care of Crystal until Catherine was back to her old self. Catherine didn't want to agree to it, but she had no other choice than to agree when Kate promised to take good care of her daughter. I'll get something for us to eat. Ashton left her in her room and went to the kitchen to prepare lunch. He came back with two bowls of warm soup. He placed the bowls on the side table and helped her sit up. She groaned as she still experienced some pain and discomfort at the incisions. Are you okay? He asked worriedly. Yeah, just a little pain, she said, holding her abdomen. I'm okay, don't worry. She assured him, seeing the scowl on his face. All right. He placed the bowl in front of her and brought the spoon near her mouth. I can eat. Catherine tried to grab the spoon from his hand, but being the stubborn one, he refused to let her eat on her own. Come on, open your mouth now. Catherine sighed loudly before opening her mouth as Ashton began to feed her. In the evening, Ashton watched her get up from the bed. I want to shower. Do you need my help? He asked casually without thinking much. He truly wanted to help her. N no, I can do it myself, she said shyly while her cheeks blushed. Okay, just be careful with the wound. He instructed and she nodded before locking herself inside the bathroom. She couldn't help but smile at her reflection on the mirror. She thought of all the times that Ashton was being close to her. Her heart fluttered every time he came closer, but she knew he didn't have any lustful thoughts in his mind and he was genuinely taking care of her. Sometimes it was hard for Ashton to believe that they were back together. A few months back, he was sulking over her for leaving him. He thought he had lost her forever, but here she was, back in his life. Even though his company required his constant attention, Ashton decided to stay at home with his wife until she was fully recovered. Meanwhile, Harry and Roderick were requested to take his place in the office. With his continuous love and support, Catherine was recovering at a faster rate. As promised, Ashton's parents took good care of Crystal. Kate would bring her to Catherine after school and she would happily spend her time with her mummy until dinner, after which they would take her back to their family mansion. It was painful to watch her daughter leave every time, but Catherine knew that she wouldn't be able to look after her in such a situation. She was grateful to her family, especially to Ashton for taking such good care of her. She felt the wall that she had built around her heart crumble every time she saw Ashton, and she knew she wouldn't be able to resist him for much longer. Ashton handed over the tablets to Catherine and watched her gulp it. Good night. He kissed her forehead and was about to go to the couch where he had been sleeping for the past week when he felt a tug at his wrist. You can sleep on the bed if you want, Catherine said, trying to keep a straight face. She had noticed that he wasn't comfortable on the couch and he was stubborn enough to not leave her alone, to sleep in the guest room. Huh? He thought he heard wrong. There was no way Catherine would ask him to sleep next to her. You heard me. The couch is too small for you, she repeated. Are you sure? He asked with a raised brow. Yeah. She placed a pillow in between them and turned to her side, controlling herself from laughing at his cute expression. Ashton felt like screaming at the top of his lungs. He couldn't believe he was being so close to her again. His hand itched to touch her and he knew she would give in to his touches, but he was aware that right now she was physically very weak for any intimate moments. It had been a week and every night they lay next to each other with the pillow in between them. Every morning, the pillow would be lying somewhere on the floor while Catherine would be snuggling into Ashton's chest. One night, Ashton was helping her with removing her bandage from her wound when suddenly, 
she had the intense urge to look deep into his eyes. Catherine didn't know what came over her as she inclined near Ashton's lips, clutching at his shirt tightly. Ashton didn't see it coming, and he was shocked at first, but eventually moved closer to meet her halfway. He reached forward, but waited for her permission. When he noticed her lips being parted slightly, he took it as a green signal and pressed a gentle closed mouth kiss. Soon his lips pressed harder against hers. She felt his hand slowly creep up from the sides to her waist. Her mind was clogging with lust as her body began to react to his touches. His electrifying touches were making her heart drum against her chest. When she looked up at him, he had his gaze at her and suddenly she felt herself pulling him over her. She closed her eyes, letting Ashton take control over her body. She gasped as his lips trailed down her neck and her body began to heat up instantly. Her kisses were conveying all his pent-up emotions that she needed to know. When she finally opened her eyes, she noticed his eyes were full of want and desire just like hers. She wanted this to happen. She wanted him to take her. She didn't want to resist any more. She wanted to give herself to him. She squeezed her eyes as her breaths became labored. His hungry kisses were driving her crazy, renewing the passion that she thought was over a long time ago. Before they knew, their clothes were peeled off from each other's bodies. His body pushed her further into the mattress as he hovered over her. Her hands wound across his neck, pulling him closer to her, and the next moment they were one. She closed her eyes as lust took over her sense of reasoning. Ashton, faster, please, she cried out, frustrated with his gentleness. Baby, I don't want to hurt you. You aren't fully recovered. He looked at her and spoke to her in a soft voice. He had lived a life of celibacy for five years without Catherine, and he wanted her with all his heart, but at the same time, he couldn't lose his control over her. Ashton, please, I'm sure you wouldn't hurt me. She buried her face in the crook of his neck as he began to pick up his pace. After much hesitation, he untethered the beast within him. He rode her throughout her climax until he found his own pleasure. When they were done, Catherine noticed that Ashton's eyes were wet with tears, and so were hers. I missed you, Kathy, he said wholeheartedly, and Kathy felt his muscular arms engulfing her under him. I missed you too, Ashton. She kissed his lips and wiped his tears with the pad of her thumb. No words were spoken after that. Only emotions were being conveyed through their eyes. Catherine had woken up just a few minutes before him. Taking in his sleeping form, she supported her body over her elbow. He looked so peaceful, sleeping with his lips slightly apart, and his stubborn bangs were falling over his forehead. She very badly wanted to push back those thick threads of hair, but she didn't want to wake him up and decided to keep still. It had been a month since the operation, and life was coming back to normal for Ashton and Catherine. This was becoming regular now. Every morning she woke up next to him and she still couldn't believe that he was with her. She couldn't help but be drawn to him every second of the day. She already had been through a lot in her life. She loved him more now. Every day she prayed that she doesn't have to go through any more nightmares. As he woke up, Ashton's lips immediately twisted into a wide grin at the sight in front of him. Every morning it felt like a dream for him and he was scared that she would disappear into thin air. What are you looking at, Mrs. Schwimmer? He cupped the side of her cheek and pulled her into a passionate kiss. I'm looking at you, Mr. Schwimmer. She flashed a small grin and kissed him back. He looked deeply into her eyes. She recognized that look as his eyes deepened a shade darker. As if on cue, Ashton pushed her flat on the bed as he climbed on top of her. Ashton, she whined, I can't believe you have the energy to do it again after so many rounds. I told you I missed you so much, darling, and I'm going to make up for all the time we lost. He whispered, nuzzling into her neck. Ashton, hmm. We are getting late to work. She managed to remind him in between her soft moans, however, she could already feel the pleasure building at the pit of her stomach. Damn the world. All I want is you, baby. He spoke against her lips. She couldn't do much to stop him because she was already at the edge of losing her control. She felt a familiar spark tingling at her core as he nudged at her thighs. She moaned loudly as she felt his length against her thighs his hand buried under her silky strands that further drove her hunger for him. Ashton, she kept calling his name. She shivered under his intimate touches and her cheeks turned beet red with every second. He pulled away and gave her a crooked smile. He was satisfied by her flushed cheeks and droopy eyes that looked like they were drugged with desire. He didn't waste another minute as he unbuttoned his shirt that Catherine was wearing before burying himself deep inside her. His eyes lit up like a thousand-watt bulb. 
I miss us so much, baby, he said in a raspy voice, his bulging arms corded around her small frame. Looking into each other's eyes, they began to move, and the heat gradually began to increase between them with each thrusts from Ashton. Her moans were turning louder as desire shot through her veins. His powerful strokes made her reach the heights of her pleasure. Soon he grunted as he spilled his seeds inside her and collapsed on her. As they came down from the tide of passion together, she felt him kiss on her forehead. I love you, baby, he claimed and tucked her hair gently behind her ear. He looked at her deeply. Her lips were swollen. Her skin was flushed and her hair was splayed all over the pillow. She was the most beautiful thing Ashton had ever laid eyes on, he thought. Catherine stayed in his arms, trying to catch her breath. I love you too. She gave him a small smile before pecking his lips. Catherine had started going back to work. All these times, Ashton was the major source of her happiness, and also her baby girl. Crystal was back home and had so much to talk about her grandparents, Ashton and Catherine took her to their parents' home almost every weekend. Catherine was beginning to loosen up with her dad as well. The more she spent time with him, the more she got to know him. In fact, he was nothing like she thought him to be. Catherine was preparing breakfast and Ashton was helping her in the kitchen when they heard Crystal's sleepy voice. Daddy, how many days are left for my summer vacations? It was the last day before Crystal's summer holidays and Ashton had planned a trip to Sydney. Ashton chuckled. Crystal had been asking the same question every morning since he informed her about the trip. It starts from tomorrow, honey. He kissed her chubby cheeks. Yay, I will tell Miss Emily about the trip, she said excitedly. I wish I could see Miss Emily. You talk so much about her and it's a shame we couldn't meet her during the parents' teacher's meet, Catherine mumbled. Crystal stayed in her dad's arms until Catherine asked her to get ready to school. Love you, baby girl. Ashton blew a kiss from the driver's seat as he watched his daughter walk into her school. When he was about to leave, he thought he saw someone staring at him from inside the glass windows, but when he blinked his eyes to have a clear look, the person immediately disappeared from the place. He ignored it and drove to his office. He tried to wind up his work as fast as possible. They had a flight to catch that night, and he couldn't put his excitement into words. The last time they went on a trip was five years ago to South Padre Island, when they were newly married. So much had happened in their lives since then, the mere thought caused a scowl to form between his brows. In the afternoon, he parked his car in the parking lot and walked near the entrance of Crystal's play school. Ashton remembered how happy and thrilled their baby girl was this morning. She was eagerly waiting for this day to travel to Sydney. He looked into his watch, there was still some time left for her classes to end, and he decided to call his sweetheart. Catherine was almost done with her work when Ashton called her. Honey, I'm at Crystal's school to pick her up. Oh, great! I'm almost done and I'll reach home in another half hour. She informed, looking into her watch. Mmm, I can't wait to go on this trip with you. He spoke in a husky voice. Me too, she replied, blushing. Ashton kept flirting with his wife until he heard the bell ring. All right, I think she is here. Love you, baby. See you. He ended the call. He waited as the kids started walking out of their classrooms. He cocked his neck to see if his baby girl was anywhere in sight. But to his utter disappointment, she was nowhere to be seen. Excuse me, I'm Crystal Schwimmer's father. My daughter hasn't come out yet he informed the security nervously. Oh, she must be still inside, talking to her friends. Let me go and check. The security walked into the building to have a look inside. Oh, okay, he muttered. He was right. She must be inside talking to someone since the chatterbox she was, he thought with a small smile. Ashton anxiously looked behind when he saw the security coming out, but his heart broke when he didn't see his daughter behind him. His palms instantly grew sweaty and trembled with panic. Where is she? he asked impatiently. I'm sorry, sir, but there's no child inside the building. What do you mean? Then where is my daughter? Ashton roared at him. I don't know, sir. You can talk to the headmistress if you want. Ashton didn't wait for him to finish his sentence as he marched inside like an enraged bull, pushing him aside. Watching him enter her room so furiously, the headmistress stood up from her seat. She knew something was wrong with just the maddening look on his face. How can I help you? She asked, maintaining a polite tone. I came here to pick up my daughter, but she isn't here. He spoke angrily. Please calm down, sir. What's your daughter's name? Crystal Schwimmer, and she is in lower kindergarten. He gave her all the details even before she could ask him. She called in the same security guard and asked him to check the building thoroughly. This time, Ashton followed him to check each and every corner of the school premise. By the time he reached back to the headmistress's room, Ashton saw a small crowd of teachers standing out. She is nowhere, the security informed everyone standing there. Mr. Schwimmer, can you please check if she had already left with someone you know? Maybe her mother or grandparents, the teacher suggested. 
Ashton hesitated to call Catherine. He knew she would go crazy if she knew Crystal wasn't at school. So Ashton pulled out his phone and dialed Harry's number. Ashton, I'm in the middle of a meeting. Can I call you back? Harry spoke on the line. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. If Harris was in the middle of a meeting, then there was no way he could have picked up Crystal. With no other alternative, he dialed Catherine's number. Hey, did you pick her up? He heard her chirp on the other side. He swallowed hard. That only meant Crystal wasn't with Catherine either. Not yet. What's taking so long? The classes should have been over by now, Catherine commented. Uh, I guess she's talking to her friends. I will call you back. He ended the call immediately. Catherine could sense some agitation in Ashton's voice, but she tried to ignore it since she was in the middle of driving. There wasn't a slight possibility for Ashton's parents to take Crystal home without informing him, but he decided to check with him just in case. She isn't home yet, he growled at the school staffs after checking with his family members. What are you all doing? How could you all not know where she is? He ran his fingers into his hair for the hundredth time in the last few minutes. Mr. Schwimmer, please calm down. The teacher requested, which earned a glare from him. Seriously, you're asking me to calm down when my baby girl is missing? He demanded. I I'm sorry. We're doing everything from our side to find her, but please give us some time, she implored him. Ashton sighed, dragging his palm down his face. In a few minutes, Harry called him back and he hurriedly attended his call. Harry, where are you? I'm still at work. What's wrong? He could tell from Ashton's voice that he was tensed about something. I, I came to pick up Crystal from school, but she isn't here. His voice came out in distressed pants. Did Catherine take her home already? He inquired. N no, I just spoke to everyone. She isn't with anyone. Listen, Ashton, I'm on my way to her school, okay? Please hurry up and please don't tell Catherine about this. She will lose her mind. Okay, got it. When Catherine came out after freshening up, she looked up at the clock and still there was no sign of Ashton and Crystal. She must have coaxed him to take her to the ice cream shop, she thought, shaking her head. She decided to prepare something for an early dinner which they could have before leaving to the airport. Ashton was pacing up and down the corridor when Harry arrived at the school. Hey man, any news about her? Not yet, they are, talking to the school management to access the CCTC camera recordings. Where could she have gone? Harry muttered. I don't know. Ashton was on the verge of a breakdown. God, this is so frustrating, he said, slumping down on a chair. Ashton, please hold yourself together. We will find her soon. What am I going to tell Kathy? He began to dread just by thinking how she would react to this news. Harry took a seat near him and squeezed his shoulder lightly to calm him down. After a while, the headmistress came out of her room. She was on a call and looked equally distressed. Mr. Schwimmer, we have found out Crystal's whereabouts. Thank God, Ashton muttered to himself when Harry let out a sigh of relief. Where is she? Harry asked. She was seen going out of the school with her class teacher, she said, shivering. What? How can you let her go just like that? Ashton screamed at the top of his lungs. We are extremely sorry, Mr. Schwimmer. We will take full responsibility for this incident, and we will make sure this never happens again. Oh, don't worry about it, because you will be sued for this. Harry threatened her. Where is she now? We are trying to connect her teacher, but, but her number is switched off right now. She stammered slightly, knowing what his reaction was going to be. And that was it for Ashton. He lost his temper, his palms were fisted to his sides, and eyes were blood red. Harry had to hold Ashton in place to stop him from doing anything stupid that he would regret later. Listen, if something happens to my daughter, I will not leave any of you alive. He seethed at everyone present there. Can we have a look at the CCTV footage? Harry asked. Yeah, sure. She led him inside a room and turned the laptop screen towards him. Ashton silently followed behind them and took a futile peek at the screen. He watched Crystal walking out of the school gate, holding his teacher's hand. The video wasn't very clear and they could only see their retreating figures. Why did she have to take her in the first place? Harry demanded. We are not sure this is the first time that something like this has happened, she replied in an apologetic tone. Ashton turned to Harry. Should we inform the police? Before Harry could open his mouth to answer him, Ashton's phone began to ring in his pocket. It's Kathy. He mumbled and he could feel his heart thumping against his chest a thousand times faster. What should I tell her? He looked at Harry who looked back at him helplessly. With trembling hands, he swiped the screen. H hello Ashton, where are you guys? Don't forget we have to board a flight tonight, she grumbled. I, we, we are still at s school. His voice was low as a whisper. Still at school? But why? It's been more than an hour already. Baby, Crystal is not here. He uttered, feeling his heart ache and eyes beginning to well up. There was silence on the other end and his agitation grew more with each ticking second. What, what do you mean by that? She frowned. I'm still at her school and she is not here. He kept his voice leveled, but his pulse was racing like a wild horse. Where is she if she is not in school? She raised her voice and Ashton had to swallow hard to moisten his dry throat. 
Kathy, please calm down. Her teacher has taken her home. She should be home any minute now. I want to come there, she muttered, staring at the wall blankly. Kathy, Harry is with me. Someone has to be at home when Crystal comes back. Please be at home, baby. He tried to make her understand of the situation. Ashton, she's coming back, right? He knew she was about to cry and he desperately wanted to hold her and make her feel comfortable. Of course she is coming back, he managed. But his heart was clenching tightly at his chest with uncertainty. He sighed as he ended the call and rubbed his face. Where does she live? He inquired. Here, the headmistress handed him her address. Emily Johnston, 132 Kingston, Manhattan, 12401. They didn't waste another minute as they drove to the place. Harry ran out of his car and rang the bell. Even after waiting for more than 10 minutes, no one came out of the house. Just then, a middle-aged man who saw them standing out walked near him. May I know whom you are looking for? Hi, we are here to see Miss Emily Johnson. I'm sorry, this house is for rent and I'm sure no one lives here, he informed before walking away. Ashton panted, his chest heaving up and down. He was trying to be patient, but he was losing his mind every minute. Why in the hell did her teacher take Crystal with her? Did she have an ulterior motive behind taking her? He had heard so much about Miss Emily Johnson from his daughter and from what he heard. She seemed like a nice woman. Then why would she do all this? He wondered. He heard the shrill of Harry's phone. Hey, sister. Harry cooed to her. Did you find her yet? Not yet. But hey, don't worry. She will be back home soon, I promise. But when? You have been telling this to me for two hours now. Where is my baby girl? She was sobbing and her tears were running freely at this point. I want her back, Harry. She choked between her sobs. Kathy, please. Harry didn't know how to console his sister. Ashton, I will go to Crystal's school and handle it over there. You should be there with Catherine in this situation. Ashton nodded and he reached home in the next 15 minutes. He rang the bell and waited outside. Crystal? Catherine called out as soon as she opened the door and looked behind him. Where is she? Kathy. He walked near her. Please tell me she is with Harry. She is coming with Harry, right? Her tears were falling down her eyes one after the other. She was beginning to hyperventilate. Ashton swallowed and shook his head. No, we haven't got her yet, he mumbled. He didn't know how she was going to cope with this emotional turmoil this time. Before he could say anything more, he watched Catherine collapse on the floor with a loud thud. When Catherine opened her eyes, she was surrounded by her family and friends. Crystal? She flung her legs off the bed and frantically roamed around the house in search of her daughter. Kathy, honey, please listen. Ashton approached behind her and spoke softly. But where, where is she, Ashton? Where is my baby? She stammered and buried her face into his chest. She tightly clutched his shirt in her fists. Her knees began to buckle up and if not for Ashton's arms around her body, she would have fallen on the floor once again. It was almost nine in the evening and yet there was no information about Crystal or her teacher. Harry, with the help of the school staffs, had informed the police and a search team was set up by the evening. It seemed like a well-planned kidnapping to him, but what he didn't understand was why someone would want to kidnap Crystal. Everyone knew that she belonged to the two most powerful families in the country, and there were chances that she could have been kidnapped for a ransom. But what confused them even more? There were no threatening calls made to them yet. It was later found out that Crystal's class teacher was recently hired by the school, and whatever documents submitted by her were forged, including her name and address, leaving them with no idea what her real identity was. All they could do now was to wait until they got a clue or call from the kidnapper. Ashton's head was pounding with a very bad headache, but that didn't bother him much as he carefully carried her in her arms back to the bedroom and placed her in the middle of the bed. She didn't notice anyone standing beside her until she felt Laura's hand on her shoulders. Kathy, be strong. We are all here for you. I want my baby. She let out a wet sob. Laura hugged her and rubbed her back to comfort her, but it did nothing to soothe her heart. They are doing everything to bring her back, sweetie. Kate brought her some water and asked her to drink, which she refused. Hot tears flowed down her cheeks as she buried her face in between her knees. The pain in Catherine's heart was so intense that she felt like her heart was taken out of her chest and torn into two halves. She would be scared. She spoke in between her cries. What if they hurt her? I can't live if something happens to her, Ashton, she said, tugging at her shirt. Ashton's heart felt heavy at his chest to see Kathy in such a condition. Her tear-stained face was hurting him from inside. He had never felt so helpless in his life, not even when Kathy left him. He didn't want to think about what his baby girl would be going through. He had known Crystal only for a few months now, yet he was unable to overcome the grief. He understood how Catherine must be feeling right now, and he had no words to console her. Kathy, please calm down. He crushed her in his arms and mumbled at her ear. 
His own tears began to roll down his eyes. She cried more against his chest. Shh, I promised to find her, baby. Please stop crying. Was there even a god? Was he watching them right now? Haven't they suffered enough in the past? Then why were they again being put to the test? What was God punishing them for? His whole body shook as he silently cried along with her. I need to go now, Kathy, but I promise to bring her back to you, baby, he said, kissing her temple. He got up, wiping his tears away. She nodded and watched him literally run out of the room. He was on the way to the police station where Harry, Roderick, and Gabriel were waiting for him when Ashton stopped the car abruptly in the middle of the empty roads. All the beautiful memories that he had with his daughter flashed in front of his eyes. He wanted to feel her soft hands and her baby scent once again. He wished to see her crystal blue eyes and that toothy smile she would give him every morning, even if it was for a fraction of a second. He hit his palms hard against the steering repeatedly as fat tears brimmed his eyes. He screamed out loud and cried like a baby. He hoped with all his heart that she was safe and sound somewhere. Who could be so heartless to do something like this? He wanted to kill those who had kidnapped her. He was pulled out of his fury when his phone began to vibrate in his pocket. Hello? It was Gabriel. Ashton, where are you? I'm on my way to the police station, he said, sniffling. Why? Ashton, don't panic, okay? His voice was shaky. The, the police have found Crystal's school bag near the woods. Gabriel's words caused him to paralyze on the seat. He suddenly felt breathless, and his head began to spin. Ashton, please, hurry up. Gabriel's words were heard, but he couldn't react. Ashton, you there? Yeah, I'm coming. He threw his mobile aside and drove as fast as he could. Crystal rubbed her eyes with the back of her fist as she woke up from her nap. She looked around the room, which looked dark except for a faint yellow light. Mommy! She called out in a soft voice at first, but as seconds went by, she began to panic. Daddy? She screamed loud enough for someone to hear her. This wasn't her house. She felt scared to be in this new place. She recollected how Miss Emily had offered to take her to her parents earlier than usual when she informed that they were traveling to Sydney and she had happily agreed to her. Crystal was in Miss Emily's car when she gave her those bitter biscuits to eat and she soon fell asleep after that. She didn't remember anything and didn't know how she ended up here. She began to cry. Mommy, please come here. Daddy, please, I'm scared. She sobbed more when she heard someone walk in. They won't hear you. How much ever you scream, little one. She heard an old man talk as he walked closer to her. She watched him pull a gun out of his jacket and put it in front of her face. I want my mommy. She whispered, staring at the gun. Stop demanding, you brat. He spat at her, causing her lips to tremble with fear. Tisk, 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 dad. That is not how you talk to a child. Crystal looked towards the door and her eyes glint with relief. Miss Emily? Crystal muttered and the old man looked at Emily, cocking his brow at her. Emily? That's the name I used at the school. She snorted at him before turning her gaze at Crystal. Well, sweetie pie, my name isn't Emily. I want my mommy. Crystal sobbed lightly to her teacher in a futile hope that she would take her back to her parents. Oh, honey, but they don't want you, she taunted Crystal. You've been a very bad girl lately, and they left you here with me. Crystal's eyes welled up with fresh tears, thinking that her parents must have gone to Sydney, leaving her behind. She already was missing her mom and dad. How was she going to survive without them? Her teacher's lips split into a grin, looking at the crying face of Crystal. She reminded her of her mother. She must be suffering the same way right now, thinking about her daughter. For the first time in so many years, she felt elated knowing the person who had destroyed her life was suffering a hundred times more than she did. Ashton could have belonged to her if not for Catherine. This life that Catherine was living was supposed to be hers, but she had snatched it from her. Five years ago, she was finally so happy to have driven Catherine away from Ashton's life. Even though he was mad at her for what she did, she believed Ashton would accept her someday. When they were friends, there was not even a single week that Ashton hadn't missed to meet her. She was so close to him. It was heartbreaking at first, when he refused to see her after he found out about her tricks against them, but she believed that one day he would forgive her. She was angry on him for ruining her father's business, but she knew she deserved his wrath for what she did to him. She hadn't given up on him in these five years. She had been watching him from afar, following him without his knowledge. He was happy that there was no other woman in his life after Catherine, and she hoped with time she would be able to take a small place in his heart. It came as a shock to her when she saw Catherine again in an elite meeting with a little girl who was eerily similar to Ashton. She looked so different from what she remembered. She got to know that she was Harold Mackenzie's daughter, one of the richest men in Europe. 
she envied her even more after that. She couldn't believe that she had Ashton's child. She had tried hard to keep Catherine out of Ashton's eyes, knowing very well what Ashton's reaction would be, seeing her again, and not to mention if he came to know about his child. However, since the universe was always against her will, Catherine finally made her way to Ashton. Never did she ever think that Catherine would accept Ashton back in her life after the damage she had done to their relationship, but they resumed their love story from where they left it five years ago. She decided to do something fast, and that's when she used her old influence to get a job at Crystal School as her class teacher. She used fake IDs and proofs so that no one could ever trace her. Her anger turned into fury each time the little girl talked about her mummy and daddy. How badly she had wanted to gorge those pretty blue eyes that resembled her mother's. To her, Crystal was always a reminder of the life that she couldn't have with Ashton, the life her mummy was living in. Every morning her heart would shatter when she saw Ashton coming to drop his daughter at school. She had also seen Catherine accompanying them several times. She couldn't tolerate seeing them living happily once again. She promised herself that she would destroy Catherine, just like how she destroyed her life. If she didn't get to live with Ashton, then no one did, especially not Catherine. She made up in her mind very strongly. She grew close to Crystal, and it was an advantage to her that the little girl was keeping her well informed about everything that was going on in her house, including the trip that Ashton had planned for his family. She had been planning on this for days now, and she had to wait till this day to kidnap her. How much she wanted to see Catherine right now, she was 100% sure that she would be suffering right now. Crystal's small body shivered when her teacher let out an evil laugh at her. Your mommy and daddy are never going to come back for you. She enjoyed seeing her cry. It gave her a weird satisfaction. Dad, she looked back, I want you to book two flight tickets to Canada. Why Canada? He walked closer to her. Because it is not safe for us to stay here anymore. I am sure Ashton will have his ways to find his daughter, and I never want that. All right, I can arrange two tickets to Canada. He assured her. Mr. Schwimmer. Is there anyone, probably a rival or competitor, who would want to harm you? The chief officer asked Ashton. There are a few business rivals, but I doubt they would go to such extents, he said after thinking for a while. All right, we are looking into all the CCTV recordings from the school. Her teacher must be there in at least any of those. Ashton nodded. All he had, for now, was Crystal's school bag and nothing else. He went back home and saw Catherine lying curled into a ball on the bed. He hid the school bag in a closet which Catherine doesn't open usually. His mom had informed him that she hadn't eaten anything and had been crying the whole while. He grabbed a glass of milk and walked near her. Kathy, at least drink this, he begged her gently. I can't have it when my baby could be hungry and alone somewhere, she said without looking at him, but the tears that were rolling from the corner of her eyes didn't go unnoticed by Ashton. He sighed and walked out. He couldn't eat or sleep either. He kept pacing in the living room and all he could think about was what Crystal would be doing now. The next morning, he received a call from the police officer. Mr. Ashton, we have got an image of Crystal's class teacher. We want you to come look at it. Ashton didn't waste a minute as he drove to the police station with Harry. He saw the headmistress seated in one of the chairs. Mr. Schwimmer, Crystal's class teacher was cunning enough to avoid being captured in any of the photos and video, but we managed to get this image from one of the video from their school annual day. He handed the copies of printouts that had a clear image of Crystal's teacher. The headmistress claims that this woman is Crystal's class teacher. Do you know her? He asked. Ashton looked at it for a second and a shiver ran down his spine. He felt like his heart jumped out of his chest and blood froze in his veins that very instant. He sat there like he was hit by a powerful thunderbolt. Do you know her? He could hear Harry's voice from beside him, but he couldn't move or bring out his voice. Callie. That's what he could say when he finally found his voice. Ashton jerked up from his sleep when he heard Catherine's blood-curdling scream. Kathy, Kathy, look at me, Kathy. He sat up on his knees and tried to wake her up from the bad dream that she was having. For the past four days, she had hardly slept more than an hour. And when she did, she would wake up with a cold sweat, screaming and panting. Ashton, she is hurt. Oh no, my baby is hurt. Her body shook violently as she cried loudly. Ashton pulled her on his lap and began to rock her against his chest. No, it's just a bad dream. I saw it, Ashton. Crystal was crying when they heard her. She sobbed as she pulled away and looked into his eyes. He looked miserable himself with those dark circles under his eyes and days of unshaven beard. He came home only to check upon Catherine, whose health was deteriorating each day. She refused to eat anything. She just lay on the bed and cried for hours. When the police showed Ashton the photos of Callie, 
It didn't come as a shock to him because after everything, he was now well aware of what she was capable of. If before he hated Callie, now he wanted to kill her, but the problem was no one knew about her whereabouts. A few years back, Callie's family mansion was auctioned since David had debts piling up in his hands. The last time Ashton knew, Callie was living in a two-bedroom flat, sharing it with a roommate. The apartment was checked and her roommate was thoroughly questioned by the cops, but they got no leads. According to her roommate, Callie had vacated a few months back, probably soon after she first met Crystal. The phone number she gave Ashton was also not in use anymore. It seemed like this was all well planned and executed. Kathy. Ashton shook her until she regained her senses. Stop it, please. I beg you. Placed his face into the crooks of her neck. She stiffened in his embrace as she remembered who was responsible for all this. This is all because of you. She pushed him away roughly. I shouldn't have come back to you. We were doing just fine without you. Kathy. He whispered painfully. God, I should have known it better. She buried her face in her palms. She would never stop ruining my life, she mumbled. It's all your fault. Your fault, she shrieked. Go out, go out, don't ever show your face to me. She pushed him until he got up from the bed. Her words were piercing into his heart like a hot rod. He quietly made his way into Crystal's room. He punched on the tiled wall several times in anger and frustration. He himself was hurt and drained. Why was Kathy not understanding that? Crystal was his baby girl too. This was equally painful for him as it was for her. He didn't even sleep properly and hadn't had a decent meal in days. But he had no one to blame except himself. This was all his mistake. He shook his head in frustration. He should have known how Callie's mind worked after all these years, but instead he had taken her lightly. He had suffered for years. He was just beginning to live a happy life with his wife and daughter, but that had to be stolen away from him by none other than whom he had been considering his best friend for years. Never in his wildest dreams did he ever think that Callie would go to such extents of kidnapping a child from her parents. How and when did she change into this monster, he thought. Catherine was silently sobbing when her phone rang. She didn't bother attending it at first, but when it rang again, she got up slowly and looked at the screen. The call was from an unknown number. H hello Her voice was hoarse from crying. Mommy! She froze for a second there, hearing Crystal's voice, since she couldn't differentiate between reality and dream. The baby? Crystal, is that you? Mommy! From her voice, it seemed like she had been crying too. Catherine could hear her soft sobs. Crystal, honey, where are you? A slight trace of hope was back in her heart. Her baby girl was still safe somewhere. That's all she wanted to know right now. Are you hurt? Did anyone hurt you, baby? She began to weep and tried to hold it by covering her mouth with her palms. Ashton! Ashton! She shouted loud enough for him to run back into the bedroom. He stumbled upon entering the room. His heart began to beat a thousand times faster as he heard Catherine scream, thinking of all unpleasant possibilities. What happened? Mommy, I I'm scared. Crystal whispered into the phone as if she was trying to keep her voice low. Baby, please don't be scared. We are coming to get you. Just tell Mommy where you are. Is there someone near you? Catherine could hear some commotion on the other end. Crystal, baby, are you there? Kathy, what's going on? Ashton looked at her in confusion. Was she having another one of her dreams, he thought? Crystal? Crystal? She kept calling her out loud, but the line suddenly went blank on the other side. Ashton, I swear it was Crystal. She hurriedly showed him the call history, and indeed there was a call from an unknown number. He called back on the same number several times, but it was immediately turned off after the call. Dad, look at her. Callie alerted her father as soon as she entered the room. She had excused herself to the washroom, and when she came back, her eyes fell upon Crystal holding the phone near her ear. How could you be so careless, Dad? She bellowed out to her dad, who just came running into the room, hearing her angry voice. He noticed as Callie snatched the phone from Crystal's hand. I, I went out to smoke, he stammered. I, I thought she wouldn't be able to use a phone. Then you clearly underestimated her. Callie showed him the call history, which had an unknown number. She was clever, just like her mother. Crystal knew two numbers by heart, even before she started going to school. Harry had helped her memorize his and her mummy's number for safety purposes, and it came handy right now. Whom did you call? David asked angrily, clutching her arms lightly in his hands, making her cry out loud. Stop crying now and answer my question, he roared. I, I called my, my mommy. You little piece of sh- Dad, that's enough. We have better things to do, she said, pulling Crystal on her feet. We aren't safe here anymore, I'm sure. By now, Ashton would have informed the cops about the phone call, and now it is very easy for the cops to find out our location. We need to move out of here as soon as possible. David nodded. All right, 
Let's first get out of here. Move, Callie shoved her roughly out of the room. We need to first discard this phone, David suggested. They were seated at the back seat of their car while Crystal was crying nonstop, looking out of the window. She heard them both talk, and she got to know that they were taking her somewhere far away. She didn't want to go with them. She wanted to be with her daddy and mommy. She closed her eyes and muttered a silent prayer for her daddy to come and take her back. What are you praying, little one? Callie asked with an evil glint in her eyes. Praying for your daddy to come and rescue you. She cocked her perfectly shaped brow at her. But sorry, honey. They will never be able to find you again. She let out a loud, wicked laugh while she enjoyed seeing her fat tears rolling down her chubby cheeks. David sat, smirking beside them. For once, Ashton decided to believe Kathy blindly. Family, friends, and cops were called in soon after the call that she received. What did she say exactly? The chief officer asked her. She didn't say anything. She, she was just crying. And before she could say anything, the line went blank. Catherine recalled. I could hear some noises behind them. Hmm, what kind of noises? Like people talking, but it wasn't clear enough, she said. Okay. He turned to his boys who were working on the sophisticated computers to track the number. Did you guys find anything? Yes, sir. We got their location. They are moving towards the airport, one of them informed. Airport? Catherine gasped. Where is she planning to take my baby? Miss Schwimmer, you need to calm down. We will do everything to rescue your daughter from her. We will never let them go anywhere, he promised her. Boys, check if there are any tickets booked in the name of Kelly Jones and Crystal. Within minutes, they found out that there were two flight tickets booked from Manhattan to Ontario. Okay, so we have two more hours left before the boarding time. Let's keep moving. He clapped curtly and walked out without wasting another minute. Ashton, Harry, and Gabriel began to follow the cops while Ashton's parents and Laura decided to stay back with Kathy. I want to come with you, please. She begged, holding his arms. Kathy, the place where we are going could be dangerous, and with your health condition, it is seriously not advisable, Ashton said. Ashton, please, I beg you, take me with you. I will die if I keep sitting here anymore. She begged, looking into his eyes. He knew he could never be able to deny her plea, especially with those teary eyes. Okay, come, he said solemnly and pulled her along with him. When they reached the car parking, Harry glared at his sister in a questioning manner. Where are you going? I'm going with you. She said, confidently getting into the car. Harry shook his head before he drove out of the building. With the morning traffic, it took them an extra 30 minutes to reach the airport, and all the while, Catherine kept fidgeting her hands nervously. Ashton noticed it and grasped her hand gently. Don't worry, we will not let her take our daughter away from us, he said in a soft tone. Catherine nodded. Ashton, I'm sorry for what I said earlier. I, I didn't mean it. I know. You don't have to explain anything. It's all my fault, he said guiltily looking down at his lap. Catherine moved closer to him and touched his face tenderly. No, it is not. If anyone is to be blamed, it is her. Catherine's eyes were filled with hate for Callie. She had never felt this much of abhorrence towards anyone in her life. Callie had made her life a living hell in the past. At first, she had tried to take away Ashton from her life, and knowing or unknowingly, they both fell into her pits of lies. They had to spend five long years apart from each other. Now she wanted to take away her daughter from her, but this time Catherine wasn't as naive and weak like before. Never in a million times was she going to let her steal her baby from her. Ashton placed his forehead against her. He was glad that she wasn't mad at him anymore. He didn't know what the future had in store for them, but now that Kathy was with him, he felt like a surge of energy rushed through his veins. Callie had already done enough damage to his life, and now she wanted to hurt his baby girl. He had to stop her from traveling to Canada at any cost. He knew how difficult it would become to find out Crystal once they crossed the country. Moreover, he didn't want Callie anywhere near her baby any longer. Somewhere over these years, Callie had flipped into this crazy person who could go to any extent to fulfill her intentions. There was a great possibility that she could hurt Crystal if circumstances didn't turn out according to her plan. He wouldn't be able to forgive himself if something like that ever happened. He would never be able to face Catherine again, and he would die a slow and torturous death. What Catherine said early actually made sense. They were doing better off without him in their life. He should have stayed away from them. That way, Crystal could have been safe now. He was pulled out of his trance when the car came to a stop. Harry turned back at them from the driver's seat. Ashton, you two go inside. I will park the car and be there soon. Okay, hurry up. They hurriedly got down from the car and ran into the airport behind the cops. They had already intimated the airport authorities about the kidnapping of a four-year-old girl. Callie and Crystal's photos were emailed to them. 
They were asked to stop and hand them over to the police department immediately in case they were spotted anywhere inside the airport. Sir, the boarding has just begun. So far, we haven't gotten anyone suspicious, but we are still checking every passenger, the head of airport security informed. You can wait in the surveillance room. All right, please carry on. The police officer took a seat in the room, scanning through each and every screen. Ashton and others stood behind him, searching Crystal among the crowd. After 45 minutes, a flight attendant walked into the room. Sir, the boarding process has been done. Every passenger was thoroughly checked, and there was no passenger with the name Callie Jones or Crystal Schwimmer. But we have a David Jones. Do you want us to bring him to you? Ashton and Catherine's eyes widened at the words. David Jones is Callie's father, Ashton said nervously. But sir, he is traveling alone, and there is definitely no child traveling with him. The flight attendant spoke again. Anyways, get him out of the flight right now, the police officer ordered. Catherine's heart began to thump loudly against her chest once again. She felt like being in a roller coaster ride. Where could Crystal be if she was not at the airport? What game was Callie playing now? She kept thinking. What the fuck are you doing? Let me go, they heard a man's bickering as the cops dragged him into the room. Sit here. The officer shoved him into one of the chairs. Tell me, where is your daughter and Crystal? I don't know what you're talking about, the man feigned innocence. You are David Jones, right? Yes, he replied. Then Callie Jones must be your daughter, the officer asked again. Yes. Officer, Ashton interrupted. He is not Callie's father, he murmured slowly but clearly. What do you mean? David is Callie's father, if I'm not wrong. Yes, but this is not David Jones. The officer snatched his phone from his hand and dialed the last number from his call history. Catherine jerked as suddenly her mobile phone began to ring loudly in the quiet room. Shit, we've been tricked into believing that they are traveling to Canada, the officer smacked on his forehead. Who are you, huh? He asked the man, clutching his shirt collar. I'm David Jones, he protested. Take him under custody and check his documents, he commanded the other cops. He turned towards Catherine and noticed her teary face. Any slight trace of hope that she had earlier had been washed away from her eyes. She looked scared and helpless. Catherine Schwimmer reminded him of her daughter, and he had this urge to help the couple save their baby girl at any cost, but unfortunately, he didn't know how. He turned to Ashton, who looked equally broken and worried. Mr. Schwimmer, they aren't here, I'm sure of it. They have clearly misled us. What do we do now? He asked in return. We will be alerting all the nearby police stations. For now, that's what we can do. The officer said, pressing his lips into a thin line, causing Catherine to break into a fit of cry. Tell me why did you come to the airport with David Jones's phone? The cop asked, leaning himself on the armrest of the chair where the other driver was seated. I was asked to go to the airport, but I didn't know why, he replied, slightly shivering. The cop looked at him with piercing eyes. Okay, where are they now? I, I don't know, he stammered. I swear I'm just their driver. I had to do it, and they asked me to go to the airport. I don't know anything else apart from that. He had been questioning him for an hour now, but the interrogation didn't take them anywhere. Of course the driver was sent to mislead them from the investigation, but he had no other information about Callie and her father. You are their driver? He asked him, widening his eyes. Y yes, sir. Then you must know their car number. The driver's eyes widened with fear, and he stared into the officer's eyes. Answer me he roared, making the driver flinch. I do, I do, he admitted. Good. Everyone was seated outside the interrogation room when they saw the officer walk out with a tired look on his face. Catherine was leaning her head on Ashton's shoulder, crying, when he tapped her on her cheek before getting up. We have their car number. He showed them a piece of paper with a number written on it. I have an intuition that they are probably taking the roadways to get out of the city. There are 11 exits from the city, and if my guess is right, then they must be using any one of these routes. What if they have already left the city? Harry asked. Well, there are possibilities for that, but we can still find them out using the cameras in the highways. We will be able to locate them soon. So first, we will have to alert at all the toll gates and see if they have crossed any of them. In the next few minutes, the toll security department was alerted with Callie, David, and Crystal's photographs. They were instructed to check each and every vehicle, crossing the border since there was a possibility that they could have changed their vehicle. Sir... You may want to look at this, a young cop said, pointing at his computer. These are the images from the Tolls Plazas, which they have crossed, and it looks like they are driving towards Pennsylvania via I-80 West. The screen had lots of footage of red Mercedes with David on the driver's seat, but Callie and Crystal weren't visible in any of those. Where is Crystal? Ashton asked, staring at the screen. She must be on the back seat. We shouldn't be delaying anymore. Let's get going, Harry said, 
pulling Ashton along with him. Harry drove the car on its top gear with Ashton and Catherine sitting in the back seat. On any other day, Catherine would have asked Harry to slow down, but today all she wanted was for him to catch up to Callie as early as possible. It took four hours for them to cross Pennsylvania when the cops made a brief stop to inform them about something crucial. Callie looked at her father, who had stopped the car to attend a call from the man he had sent to keep an eye on his driver. Okay, that's good. You get away from there as soon as possible. Okay, okay. He nodded before ending the call. You are so clever, my dear daughter, he turned to Callie and remarked with a smirk. Callie smiled at him evilly. What did he say? Those fools were at the airport earlier as expected interrogating our driver. He laughed mockingly. Now they would never know that we are heading towards Toronto through roadways. Callie was behind the mastermind plan to send their driver with the phone to the airport to divert the cops and buy a little more time before they crossed the border. David's old friend was waiting for them in Toronto with a place for them to stay as long as they wished. I want her to suffer a hundred times more than I ever did. She doesn't deserve to be happy with Ashton. If I couldn't get to live with him, then no one should. Callie spat venom. Oh, I am sure they would never be happy in their life without their daughter, but what are you going to do with this girl? Are you planning to keep her with you? No way. I'm planning to sell her off and make sure she has an equally miserable life like her mother's. Callie answered, glaring at Crystal. Thank God I was worrying that you'd want to keep her out of the love you have for her father. As it is said, criminals have no idea of how the mind of a cop works. David started to drive leisurely, underestimating the police force. Dad, what's going on? When the car came to a halt, Callie asked, looking ahead at the sudden traffic jam. I don't know, he said, cocking his head to have a clear look on the road. Callie looked back at Crystal's sleeping form and sighed, leaning back on the seat. How much she wished that Ashton had acknowledged and returned her love back then. All this wouldn't have happened at all. She would have been a happy wife and a mother by now. Why was fate so unfair to her? Why did Catherine have to come in between them? Why did Ashton have to love Catherine instead of her? She could have loved him even more than Catherine ever did. For once, she wanted to be Catherine and desired to live her life. She always seemed to be the fortunate one. She had everything a loving husband, a beautiful daughter, caring family and friends, whereas Callie had nothing. She had even lost her mother recently. She came out of her days when she thought she saw a cop walking around a car. Is that a cop? she asked, narrowing her eyes. A cop? I didn't see any. David shook his head. Dad, I will go and have a look at what's going on. She got down from the car and started walking ahead. A few minutes later, David saw her running back hurriedly toward their car. What's wrong? Dad, it is the cop and they are looking for us, she said, panning. What? How do you know? He asked, panicking. One of the officers had our photos in his hand, and it seems like they are checking every car. She got into the car and locked it from inside. What do we do now? Shit. How did they even know where we are heading to? David wondered loudly. We'll be in trouble if we sit here, ideally, Callie told him nervously. David sat there tapping his fingers on the steering anxiously, thinking of an idea to get out of this problem without getting caught. Dad, let me drive, Callie suggested after thinking for a while. This was the only way left to save themselves. No way was she going to give up without putting a fight. But why? Please, Dad, I don't have time to explain. Just let me drive, okay? Callie got down to change their seats. David didn't understand what she meant. There was no point in changing seats because, anyways, the cops wouldn't let her drive anywhere once they got hold of them. David sat at the passenger seat and patiently waited for his daughter's next move. Crystal was still sleeping, oblivious to any of these. The cars in front of them slowly began to move as they let them one by one after checking. Callie tightened her palms around the steering, waiting for the right moment, and as soon as she saw the officer signaling the car in front of them to move, she huffed and stomped on the accelerator harshly. Before David could understand what was going on, the car crashed the barricade and roomed on the highways at the maximum speed. Callie, but what are you doing? He screamed. I'm sorry, Dad, I didn't have any other choice, she replied, paying her full concentration on the road. The sudden impact caused Crystal to jerk up from her sleep. She looked around and when she sensed something was wrong, she began to cry aloud. Mommy, Mommy, shut the fuck up. Callie growled at her, making her shut up instantly before she averted her eyes back on the road. Soon they heard the sirens from the cars that were chasing them. We cannot continue on the highways anymore, Callie said, looking at the rear mirror. Okay, take the next right turn. We will be able to exit the national highways, David suggested. It was becoming dark and Callie entered into the state highways, which looked a bit isolated. She could still hear the sirens at a distance, but it was a lot easier for her to drive fast in these almost empty roads. Where does this road take us? David looked into the GPS. 
We can still reach Toronto. Keep driving, he said. After a while, when she felt that they were at a safe distance from the police, she stopped the car abruptly on the middle of the road. Dad, I want you to drive without stopping anywhere in between. She began to get down and open the back seat door. What do you think you're doing? David asked her. I cannot come with you. The cops would never stop chasing us and they would be able to catch us on the next toll station. I'm sure it would be safer this way. She dragged Crystal out of the car. But where will you go in the middle of nowhere? I will manage, Dad. You take care. She started walking to what looked like the woods with Crystal in her hand. What's wrong, sir? Ashton asked the cop when he made them stop suddenly. They escaped at the toll and they were driving towards the Canadian border through the state highways, the officer said. Our team was able to chase them down, but Callie and Crystal were not in the car. David has been arrested. Ashton felt like his heart would jump out of his chest any moment. He had never felt so weak and vulnerable in his whole life, and why wouldn't he? His daughter's life was in such a dangerous situation. His instincts were screaming at him to save his baby girl's life at any cost, and of course he would do anything to save her. But Callie seemed always a few steps ahead of them. What should we do now? he asked. My guess is that she has gotten down somewhere near the woods and the policemen are there searching for them. He looked at Ashton and patted his shoulder. Don't worry, young man, we will get your daughter back. Callie cannot keep running forever. Ashton nodded before getting back into his car. Catherine noticed the silent tears making its ways out of Ashton's eyes. He was trying hard to conceal them by looking out of the window. She didn't know how to comfort him because she herself was broken beyond words. All she could do was pray for her daughter's safety. She didn't want her beautiful family to be shattered like pieces of glasses. A few miles away, the car came to a halt. It was pitch dark outside and Catherine noticed the cops were all over the place. As she got down from the car, she saw how they were scattered all over the woods in search of their daughter. The whole place was brightly lit by powerful headlights. Ashton too began to walk into the woods, calling out his daughter's name. Crystal! 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 Everyone's voice echoed within the silence of the woods. They kept walking deeper into the woods until they heard, Daddy! Crystal's cries. Everyone froze on their places. Did you hear that? Ashton asked Catherine. It's Crystal! Catherine nodded her head confidently. Baby, where are you? Crystal? Catherine screamed. Crystal, baby! Ashton called out louder. Shh! The officer shushed everyone with his forefinger on his lips. She has to be here somewhere. All of you, keep your voices down, he whispered to everyone. They began to walk as quietly as possible. All they could hear was the rumbling of leaves beneath them. Stop there. A chill ran down everyone's spine when they heard that. Ashton didn't have to turn back to identify the person because he knew the voice too well. They slowly turned around only to come face to face with Callie, who was holding a knife dangerously close to Crystal's throat. Drop your guns if you don't want me to slit her throat open. Miss Jones. You don't have to do it the cop said, bringing his hands in front of him. Then throw your weapons away. She threatened by pressing the knife closer to Crystal's neck, causing Catherine to gasp loudly. Callie, please, leave my baby alone, Catherine begged. Callie shifted her gaze on Catherine. Ashton was holding her shoulders firmly, and it only made Callie's blood boil in her veins. To be frank, I want to kill her right this moment, but I wouldn't do that. I have much more in store for her. I want her to suffer her whole life. Ashton clenched his teeth together to control himself. If she hadn't had that damn thing at his daughter's throat, he would have killed her brutally, but he had to be patient for Crystal's sake. Callie was a psycho, and it was impossible to predict her actions. He didn't want to put his daughter's life at danger by doing anything stupid. Callie, let her go, please, I beg you. Ashton pleaded her in a soft tone, trying to conceal his anger. And why should I do that? She raised her eyebrows, questioningly because I still consider you my best friend. Do you remember, Callie, for a long time, we grew side by side as friends, companions, and siblings, huh? He looked at her with pained eyes. Our lives were tangled with each other's. We were always there for one another when we had no one else. I've made a thousand friends in my life, but you were the only one who was always there for me in all my ups and downs, Callie. He spoke while walking near her. Callie noticed that his eyes were glistening with unshed tears. It is one of the hardest things in my life to lose a best friend. I have learnt it when I lost you, Callie. He continued speaking as he moved closer to her. Callie's tears were beginning to brim at her eyes. He reminded her how inseparable they were once. She remembered the first time they met as kids on the first day of their kindergarten. She had been crying, alone and terrified. But luckily Ashton came to her rescue. He wiped her tears and promised to be her friend forever. 
Indeed, he had kept his promise for a long time. It was she who had ruined it. She had never thought that there would come a day when she would turn into this person. Ashton had been there in her life forever as a best friend and a well-wisher. Then how could she do this to him? A voice in her head asked her. She was a good person. She had always wished him a good life when they were children. But when did she become this monster? She saw how his tears were rolling down his face. A pang of guilt stabbed at her heart when she realized that she was the reason for all his miseries and tears. She loved Ashton wholeheartedly and wanted to be happy with him, but over the years, her love had turned into obsession even without her knowing it. She wanted to hurt Catherine for coming in between them, but knowing or unknowingly, she was hurting Ashton all this time. She couldn't look at Ashton anymore and she lowered her eyes with regret and guilt. When Ashton observed her hold loosening around the knife, he took the chance to move swiftly, and before she could notice it, he was standing in front of her, holding her wrist firmly. He looked at Crystal to check if she was fine before pushing her behind his legs. You bitch! Snatching the knife from her hand, Ashton backhanded Callie hard enough to make her fall on the ground. Callie's eyes widened when she realized what was going on. He had tricked her to save his daughter. Now all she could see in his eyes was hatred and disgust for her. He pulled her up on her feet once again and landed another tight slap on her cheek. I'm gonna kill you this time. I should have done this a long time ago, he said clamping his palms tightly around her throat, causing her to choke. Not minding any of this, Catherine rushed near her daughter and kneed in front of her. Crystal, honey. She ran her eyes all over her body to check if she was okay. Baby, are you hurt? Mommy! Crystal's whole body was shivering. Her lower lips began to quiver, seeing her mummy once again. She thought she was never going to see her again. Catherine's heart broke when she saw her daughter in such a broken state. She looked scared and traumatized. This incident would leave an everlasting scar in her daughter's young mind. She hugged her tightly into her chest and rubbed her back to soothe her. Shh, shh, it's all over, honey. Mummy is here. She cooed at her ear. After a few minutes, Catherine's eyes shifted to Ashton, who looked like he was going to murder Callie, and she wished nothing less. The policemen were trying to pull him away from Callie, but he was uncontrollable, like a raging bull. Let me kill her once and for all. It was a good thing that Harry was holding him back, or else he would have killed Callie by now. Mr. Schwimmer, you need to stop. The officer came in between them and pushed him back. Ashton stumbled back, but his murderous eyes were still on Callie. His chest was heaving up and down. Arrest her. They heard the officer giving orders to his men. Soon both her hands were handcuffed at her back and she was shoved away. Her gaze was riveted on Ashton until she reached the car. Immediately, Ashton turned around to look at his wife and daughter. Catherine was kneeling on the ground, holding her daughter against her chest. Crystal's small hands were around her mummy's neck, as if she was scared to let her go. He jogged near them before falling on his knees and wrapping his big arms around them. Crystal loosened her hands from around her mummy, only to wrap it around her daddy's neck. Daddy, she sobbed. Daddy, I missed you. Baby girl. His voice cracked and he started to weep silently. He hugged her small frame tightly. His heart felt like it would jump out of his chest when he smelt her baby scent once again. He was glad that she was back safely. Hugging his daughter, he glanced at Catherine, who was weeping into her palms. Kathy. He pulled her closer and hugged her, too. They sat there and cried until they were out of tears. Harry looked at them and he prayed that they never go through anything like this in their life again. He turned to the officer. What about David Jones? He was arrested by the policeman a few hundred miles from here. We are taking him under custody, too, the officer informed. Thanks, officer. He shook hands with him. I don't know what we would have done without you. It's my duty. I am just happy that she returned to her parents safely. He flashed a small smile, looking at little Crystal. Harry thanked him once again before walking to his sister. He placed his hand on Catherine's shoulder to grab her attention. Catherine looked up at her brother, and her eyes welled up once again. Hey, baby girl. He called Crystal. Her eyes widened and her lips split into a grin for the first time in the evening, seeing her uncle. Uncle Harry! She threw herself into his arms. Oh my God, I missed you so much. He threw her up in the air, making her chuckle. Harry tried to lighten everyone's mood by joking around and making Crystal laugh. She was coming back to normal little by little, and he hoped this memory would be completely wiped off her mind with time. Ashton and Catherine stood there looking at their daughter with a gentle smile. All they wished that moment was for her happiness and well-being. Catherine's gaze slowly turned to Callie, who was seated inside a car. A chill ran down her spine when she saw the look in her face. Her eyes were on Catherine's family. 
she still had those vicious looks in them, as if she would hurt them more if she was given a chance. Ashton noticed the terrorized look on Kathy's face and followed her eyes. He had a feeling that Callie wouldn't stop here, and he wanted to make sure that she never came anywhere near his wife and daughter. He knew what to do, but for now, he decided to ignore her. Baby, let's go home, he said, placing a chaste kiss on her forehead, and felt her nod. They all walked to their cars before they left the place. Ashton and Catherine's parents froze when they saw Crystal at the door. At first, they couldn't believe what they saw since they had lost all their hopes. They cried their eyes out, hugging and kissing her. They were thankful to God that she had returned home safe and sound. Everyone left the three of them after a while. Catherine gave Crystal a warm bath before putting her on her bed. Ashton sat beside her daughter and kissed her repeatedly. He read her a story until she fell asleep, tucked under his arms. She looked peaceful. He caressed her hair and placed a loving kiss on her forehead. Catherine also kissed her baby girl. When Ashton saw that she was about to cry again, he pulled her out of her bedroom. Catherine was exhausted from all this, and all she wanted was a good night's sleep. She decided to take a quick shower before retiring to bed. Ashton took a place beside her on the bed after a refreshing shower, too. He laid on to his side with his right arm tucked under his head and looked at his wife. She threw a gentle smile at him, which he thought he would never see on her face again. She moved closer to his body, hugging him at his waist and bearing her face into his bare chest. She had missed this warmth in the past few days. She felt his large hands moving on her hips, pulling her closer to his growing desire for her. She pulled away slightly and looked into his eyes, which were dancing with contentment. He hadn't shaved his long beard yet, and she thought he looked devilishly handsome with it. I like your beard, she whispered, running her soft fingers over them. Do you want me to keep it? He asked in a husky voice. Hmm, was all she could bring out since he had started nuzzling at her neck, sending sparks all throughout her body. As you wish, darling. He hovered over her body, impatiently peeling her gown off her shoulders while devouring her lips savagely. He had missed this kind of intimacy with his wife lately. He was hungry for her, and he couldn't be gentle with her even if he wanted to. He kissed her passionately, tasting every corner of her sweet mouth. He started leaving open-mouthed kisses down her neck, making her moan with pleasure. He bit and sucked every inch of her body, leaving wet trails behind. She arched her back on the bed and gripped the sheets in her fist when he moved down her body. Her body twisted and turned to his knees on her core. She pulled him back up when she couldn't take his sweet tortures anymore and kissed his lips with the same amount of fervor. Ashton, please. She begged him and Ashton noticed her eyes were filled with lust. Without delaying anymore, he positioned himself on her once again. He kissed her mouth as his hands moved down to remove his track pants hurriedly. Soon he slid his length into her wet depths, intertwined their hands above her head. He buried his face into her neck, biting her bony beauty and beginning to pound into her mindlessly. She wrapped her legs around his waist and lifted her hips to meet his pace. She pulled her hands from his hold and gripped at his broad shoulders, digging her fingernails into his skin. Ashton, faster, please, she begged and he gave her want what she wanted. He kept going like a beast until he heard her scream his name repeatedly. When he noticed her lips parting, he began to chase his own pleasure. Her moans were enough to drive him crazy and his pace only increased further. I love you, baby, so fucking much, he said with gritted teeth before filling her up and collapsing on her chest. I love you more, Ashton. She hugged him tightly. They were panning with their sweaty bodies interlaced together. Ashton looked at her and smiled sheepishly. That was amazing, darling. She brought her hand up and wiped the sweat beads off his forehead. Isn't it always amazing? She teased him. Oh yeah, it is always amazing with you. He kissed her before pulling out of her and falling on his back beside her. She turned to her side and placed her head on his shoulder. She began to draw random patterns on his chest with her forefinger. She lay there silently thinking about all the ups and downs in their life. They hadn't had a smooth journey in the past, but all that mattered now was they were finally together. What are you thinking, sweetheart? He asked, looking into her eyes. Ashton, what if Callie gets out of the prison and tries to hurt our baby once again? I won't let that happen, darling. I will make sure she never gets out, how much ever she tries. He promised her and kissed the tip of her nose. Catherine believed him and nodded with a smile. Ashton laid back his head on the pillow and stared at the ceiling. He decided to see the chief police officer the next morning. 
he had to take harsh actions against Callie if he didn't want her to hurt his family again, and he was going to do it no matter who she was to him in the past. He couldn't afford to lose them again for anything, he thought, before drifting off to sleep. After three months, Crystal started going to school, a new one, of course. It was one of the finest schools in the country with maximum security to the students. Ashton had sued her old school like Harry had threatened, and they heard they were shutting down after the lawsuit. Catherine started taking care of the Manhattan branch with Ashton's help, while Harry decided to take care of the branches in Europe. It was hard for him to leave Crystal at first, but he knew Ashton would be taking care of them now, more than he ever did. Harold decided to stay in Manhattan with his daughter. He wanted to spend his remaining days with Catherine and his granddaughter, making up for all the time he had lost in the past. Few weeks into Crystal's return, Catherine fell very sick. Ashton insisted on going to the hospital, but she refused. Initially, she thought it was a stomach bug, but later she realized that she was a month late on her periods. She took a test the next morning and found out she was pregnant. Her heart began to thump wildly since it reminded her of her first pregnancy with Crystal. So many unpleasant things have happened after that. She remembered how she wanted to surprise Ashton, but she could never tell him. She didn't want that to happen again. Without waiting another minute, she rushed out of the bathroom to their bed where Ashton was sleeping on his stomach. Ashton? Wake up, Ashton! She shook him till he sat up nervously. What's wrong? What happened? He asked, panicking and looking around. She brought the stick in front of him with a grin, and he blinked at it, scratching the back of his head before his eyes widened. Is that? Are you? Oh my God, he screamed. He pulled her closer and kissed her lips passionately before hugging her. I love you, honey. You don't know how happy you've made me with this good news, he said, placing his palms on either of her cheeks. Catherine placed her hands on his and turned to kiss his palm. I love you, Ashton. Her eyes were glistening with happy tears. He pulled her on his lap and placed his forehead on hers. I would finally get to see your pregnant belly. You don't know how much I've desired for it. Catherine pouted. But I would become huge like a cow, and I would love you even more. He kissed the tip of her nose, no matter how huge you become. Catherine chuckled and hugged him. Later, when they informed Crystal that she was going to be a big sister, she couldn't stop jumping with excitement. She wished for a baby brother, and she promised to love him like how her mother loved Uncle Harry. During her fifth month of pregnancy, they got to know that they were having a baby boy just like Crystal and Catherine wanted. Ashton was okay with anything, as long as the baby was active and healthy. She took maternity leave while Ashton took over the company in her absence. He took great care of her, tending to her every needs. He avoided going on foreign trips and sent Gabriel instead. Most of the days he worked from home. Unlike what she said, she hadn't gained much weight except at her tummy and she looked more beautiful to Ashton's eyes now that she was carrying his child. One evening when Ashton returned from work, he noticed Catherine sitting with a long face. He ruffled his daughter's hair and spent a few minutes with her before sending her to her room to play. He sat near Catherine on the couch. Go away, she said angrily. He was getting used to her mood swings lately. What's wrong, baby? He asked, taking her hand in his. Nothing, she turned away. Come on, darling, tell me what's wrong, he asked softly, and she huffed before she brought a small bottle of nail paint in front of his eyes. I'm not able to paint my toenails, she complained with a pout. Ashton wanted to chuckle at his adorable wife, but at the same time, he didn't want to fall prey to his pregnant wife's fury, so he quietly nodded as he grabbed the tiny bottle from her hand. What am I here for, baby? He moved back on the couch and bent down to bring her feet on his lap gently. He began to paint her toenails, and when he was done, blew on it to make it dry. Catherine couldn't help but smile inwardly. Ashton was everything that she could ever wish for. He was so patient with her, and she loved him more for that. When the nail paint dried, he began to gently massage her feet. So, how's my baby boy doing today? He asked, rubbing her bump. He loved to touch and talk to her swollen belly. He's been playing soccer with my bladder. I couldn't sleep even for a minute, she replied, placing her hand over his. Ashton let out a proud laugh. Looks like he's practicing from now onwards to follow on his father's path. His laugh turned into an apologetic grin when he noticed an annoyed glare from Catherine. I'm sorry, honey. He kissed her cheek. What can I do to lighten up your mood? Can you take me out to have some pizza? She asked after thinking about it for a while. Anything for you, baby. He kissed her lips before carefully helping her on her feet. 
A few months later, it was raining heavily in the middle of the night when Catherine felt a stabbing pain in her lower abdomen. She sat up thinking it was just one of those false pains that she had been getting the past few days, but after a few minutes when the pain intensified, she was sure that she was going into labor. Ashton felt her toss and turned beside it. He jerked awake when he noticed the sweat beads forming on her forehead and the pained expression on her face. Baby, are you okay? No, Ashton. I think we may need to go to the hospital right now. She could hardly speak with the amount of pain she was enduring. Ashton had been preparing for this moment from the time he got to know about her pregnancy, but when the actual moment came, he couldn't stop panicking. Catherine had everything ready a few days prior to her due date. Ashton just had to carry them to their car. He placed his sleeping daughter at the back seat and buckled her up before helping Catherine on the passenger seat. Ashton, please hurry up, she cried out, holding her abdomen. Baby, please hold on. We are almost there. He had managed to call their parents and ask them to come directly to the hospital. Harry took a private jet to reach there as soon as possible. By the time they reached the hospital, her cervix was well dilated. Soon she was screaming out of pain and agony. Ashton's heart almost sunk when he entered into the labor ward and noticed her sweaty and teary face. Ashton! She stretched out her hand for him. I'm here, honey. He moved closer to her and caressed her hair tenderly. Ashton couldn't believe what he was witnessing. Catherine was enduring extreme amounts of pain for him. He regretted not being there with her during her first delivery. He held her hand throughout the labor and wished to take away all her pain if possible. He kept whispering soothing words into her ear. When nothing happened, even after an hour, he even went to the extent of swearing at the nurses for doing nothing to ease his wife's pain. Two hours into her active labor, she gave birth to a healthy baby boy. Ashton's eyes almost moistened looking at his son. He was covered in blood and mucus, yet he thought he was the most handsome little man in the world. The doctor placed him into Ashton's arms. He seemed so tiny in his hands, and he had never felt so nervous in his entire life. Ashton carefully leaned down to kiss Catherine. Thank you so much, my love, for giving me yet another little angel. Catherine smiled at him weakly with teary eyes. She touched her son's little feet. What are you going to name him? She asked him. Don't you want to name him? He asked her in return. I'm the one who named our daughter. It's only fair that you name him. How about Jeremy? He suggested without thinking much, as if he had already chosen a name. That's a nice name. It suits him too, she said. Where is Crystal? With all the pain, she had totally forgotten to ask him about their daughter. She is waiting outside with her grandparents, Ashton said without taking his eyes off his son. Very soon their baby was clean and Catherine was shifted to her room. Their parents were so happy to see their grandson that they almost cried with contentment. He reminds me of the day when Ashton was born. It seems like yesterday. Time does run fast. Kate sniffed, holding her grandson in her arms. Crystal was so excited to meet her baby brother. She couldn't wait for him to grow up and play with her. Mommy, look, he's holding my finger, Crystal squealed. Catherine had placed little Jeremy on Crystal's lap, and Ashton was standing beside her, keeping a close watch. He was scared that she would drop him down. Yes, honey, I think he already likes you so much. She smiled at her daughter. I like him too, and he smells so good, she said, making everyone laugh. Harry came the next morning. He looks exactly like Crystal when she was born, he said, rocking him in his arms. Unlike Ashton, who was still not very sure about carrying Jeremy, Harry seemed very confident when handling infants since he had first-hand experience with Crystal. Catherine was discharged the next evening. Ashton was so happy to take them back home. Ashton, where are we going? She asked when she noticed that he was taking a different route. We are going home, love. He threw an assuring wink at her. But this is not the route we should be taking. She looked puzzled when Ashton smiled at her before turning back his attention on the road. He stopped the car in front of a huge villa. He walked around his car and opened the door for his wife, who had their sleeping son in her arms. Where are we? She questioned him again. Why don't you go inside and find it yourself? Ashton answered, picking up her bags. Don't freak out, okay? He said before opening the door. Welcome home! Catherine's eyes widened and her jaw fell open. Her family and friends were all here. The house was finely decorated with balloons and ribbons. There was also a huge banner which said, Welcome home, little Jeremy. Home? She turned to Ashton for answers. Yes, honey, I'm sorry I didn't ask for your suggestions, but I wanted to surprise you. With our family growing, I thought this would be the right moment to get us a new and bigger house. He said, rubbing the nape of his neck. Do you like it? It's fantastic. You've done an amazing job, honey. Catherine said, looking around the house. 
Ashton spent the next few minutes taking her on a home tour. It was a five-bedroom duplex villa with a huge backyard and a swimming pool. He had planned everything so well, and the best thing about the house was, it was entirely to Catherine's liking. She remembered how he had asked her for her opinion, even without her knowledge. She had told him how she wanted her dream house to be, and this house looked even better than her description. I love it, Ashton. She wrapped her arms around his neck and kissed his lips deeply. Really? I was so scared that you would not like it and get mad at me for not consulting with you before buying the house. She laughed at him. I would never do that. You know it well, but I can't believe you have managed to shift everything within two days. Well, I got some help from our friends. Then I should go and thank them first. Catherine spent the remaining evening with her family and friends. Ashton felt elated thinking about these amazing friends that he had in his life. He personally thanked each and every one for everything they had ever done for him. They were the only source of light during the darkest moments of his life. His mind drifted back to a person in particular, but he didn't feel guilty for what he did to her because he knew she deserved more. Their friendship died the moment she tried to hurt his beloved ones. What are you thinking, honey? He missed to notice Catherine, who had walked in front of him with a glass of juice in her hand. He felt her soft palm on his cheek, and he pulled out of his own thoughts. I'm thinking how I got so lucky to have you in my life. He was leaning back on the kitchen counter when he pulled her closer. When I saw you for the very first time in high school, I knew you were going to make an everlasting impression on my life. I am so glad that it was you whom I decided to give my heart to. No one can make me happier than I am now, baby. You are my angel. I will always regret forever hurting you, and I promise to make up for those five miserable years of our lives. He kissed her forehead when he saw a single tear rolling down her cheek. You're making me cry, Catherine said, wiping her tears and burying her face into his chest. Ashton giggled and tightened his arms around her waist. I've always loved you, Kathy, and I will always love you for the rest of my life. I love you too, Ashton. They kissed each other until they heard the hoots from their friends. They laughed and pulled away before joining them for dinner. Metropolitan Correction Center Callie sat staring at the wall in front of her blankly until she heard the warden clanked on the iron bar with her cane. Your lawyer is here to see you. Callie looked at her lawyer. Did you find a way to bail me out? She asked the same question that she asked each time he came to meet her. No, Miss Jones. Ashton Swimmer has made it really difficult for us to plead for a bail. You are sentenced to 23 years in prison with a possibility of parole only after 10 years. That is only if you are in your best behavior, he said with a sorry expression. Callie gasped. 23 years? There was no way she could survive so long inside a cell. She clenched her hands around the iron bars and she wanted to scream at the top of her lungs. What about my father? He asked to serve 15 years in prison. What? She couldn't believe this. There was a chance that she could get out of the prison with her father's help. But with him, too, thrown into the prison, there was little to no hope for her to come out earlier than her serving period. I'm sorry, Miss Callie. I tried everything, but we will not be able to fight a person as influential as Ashton Schwimmer. So I quit, he said before turning his back on her. No, 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 wait, listen, please don't go. Come back. I would pay you double. Wait, wait. Her voice echoed in the corridor until she was silenced by the prison guards. The End This has been His Lost Love Written by Swaram Narrated by Owen Samuels